Johnny Dollar. Well, at long last. What? I say it's high time. It is, huh? Well, isn't it? I don't know. High time for what? High time he answered that phone. And listen. Well? This is Jimmy Bartell. Oh, Jimmy. You know, over here at Mono Guarantee Insurance. Of course I know. How are you? Well, what happened to you, Johnny? Where have you been? I've been trying to reach you for about four weeks now. Didn't you try my call service? Yeah, I tried you. Huh? Oh, no, I uh, I guess I kind of forgot about that. Oh, well, if you had, you'd have found out that last week I was at Grand Canyon, the week before in Corpus Christi, the week before that in Knoxville, Tennessee, and before that, up in Boston. Yeah, sure, Gil. I've been around the country while I've been sitting here up to my neck in trouble, beating my brains out, working my head off. <laughs> Sounds to me like you need a plastic surgeon. What? Huh? What's the problem, Jimmy? The Burma Red, Johnny. The what? You heard me, the Burma Red. Jimmy, uh, are you sure you want me and not the State Department? Yeah, I'm sure. All right, I'll bite. Who is the Burma Red? Not who, but what. Well? And listen, we carry the insurance. Half a million dollars worth. You hear that, fella? Half a million. I am deeply impressed. And baby, if you can't get it back for us, that's exactly what we're going to have to hand over. In cold, hard cash. Five hundred Gs. Well, maybe I had better get to work on it. Good. And I don't need to tell you what your commission will be if you do recover it. What else do you think I'm thinking of? Then the job is yours, Johnny. And, brother, I sure hope that you can find it and get it back. The Burma Red. Right. Uh, just one thing, Jimmy, if you don't mind. Sure, Johnny. Before I start gallivanting around the country, as you put it, looking for this thing... Yeah? Don't you think that it might be nice if I have some slight idea, some inkling of what it is, this Burma Red? I told you. I told you I... Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, come on over here and I'll... I'll tell you all I know about it. Okay. We interrupt this program to bring you a special message to the parents of schoolboy patrol members who were taking the Washington trip. The buses with the patrol will arrive at Durham Union Bus Station this evening about 7.15 to 7.30. We repeat, the Durham Schoolboy Patrol Washington buses will arrive at the Union Bus Station this evening at 7.15 to 7.30. Parents are asked to be present to pick up their children. The, uh... Or the parents, brother, are also asked to use the Sears parking lot. 7.15 to 7.30 the time. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Burma Red matter. Expense account item one. $1.20 for a cab from my apartment to Jimmy Bartell's office in the Spear Building, down on the square. Jimmy's specialty, incidentally, is property insurance, especially where fine artwork is concerned. And in this case... Yeah, Johnny, four solid weeks I buzzed that phone of yours, and what I thought of you for not being there to answer it wouldn't be fit to print. <laughs> All right, I'm here now, so stop bellyaching. But maybe you're too late, fella. He's already gotten out of country with it. The Burma Red. That's right, the Burma Red. Which is what? I told you, Johnny, it's... it's it. Oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't. Now, listen. I'm listening. It was brought over here a couple of years ago as part of a collection by some countess or other. Got written up in all the picture magazines. Do I hear a slight echo? Echo? Yes, from the case I had on my hands last week. Well, I don't know, because I, I don't know what you had a case of. But listen. Go on. Having been a part originally of the Buckingham Collection over there in England, you know, well, as you might expect, it was picked up here by Winkler and Winkler. The big jewelry outfit down in New York. The same? Oh, then I do hear an echo. So it's a piece of jewelry and it's been stolen from them. No. The same as the Otara's necklace I recovered last week. No, again. For Northeast indemnity. No? No, Johnny. It's just a single unmounted stone, a ruby. But so help me, it's big enough to choke a horse, and now it's gone. When did you say it was stolen from them? I didn't, because it wasn't. They'd sold it to that wealthy old Mrs. Harvey Larriman Brittigan. Lives out in the edge of town. Oh, I see. But four weeks ago, somebody neatly chiseled open her wall safe and walked off with it. Chiseled? Okay, blew it. What's the difference? Plenty. Knowing a safecracker's method can help a lot in pinning him down. No, the police think they know who did it, all right. Well, what do you need me for? To get that stone back. But if they already know who did but it... But they couldn't prove it. Sure, the modus operandi, the way the safe was blown, it pointed straight to him and nobody else. But also, he was known to be here in town. Who? But they couldn't pin it on him. He had himself a perfect alibi. Who, Jimmy? So maybe it was rigged. They couldn't break it. Jimmy... But, Johnny, it had to be Oscar Mayfield. Mayfield? They held him as long as they could. Went through everything he owns. Checked out every contact he made while he was here in Hartford. And all that got him was nothing. And not very much of that. Now, say this. 
If Oscar Mayfield, the old master, made that heist... So what could they do but let him traipse merrily on back to New York where he's been living lately? Look, Jimmy, but I figure, despite the police report and all the work they did, I figure that somehow Mayfield got away with that ruby. Jimmy, I'm inclined to think you may be right. I know Oscar Mayfield. He's clever. I've tangled with him before. And, uh, come to think of it, he made a promise to me once. Mayfield made a promise? Mm-hmm. What was it, Johnny? That if I ever tried to interfere with him again... Yeah, well, he'd see to it that I had a very nice funeral. Daycron is your best friend when it comes to staying wrinkle-free and neat all summer. Look for Daycron in lightweight suits, handsome slacks, good-looking sport coats, too. You'll stay well-pressed and well-dressed thanks to Daycron by DuPont. There's just no denying in the clothes he'll be buying. Daycron is a man's best friend. Expense account item two. Sixty-five cents for a cab to police headquarters where, uh, after some inquiries, I ended up talking with Sergeant Holly Holcomb. He wasn't very encouraging. Sure, Dollar. He was known to be in town. Known to have tried to leave right afterward. The trademark he left on the wall safe was his. Plain as a nose in your face. Mm-hmm. And we pride ourselves on knowing the M.O.s of all the safe men within a thousand miles. Yes, I know you do. And rightly so. But he couldn't pin a thing on him. All the direct evidence we didn't have on him because of his alibi apparently checking out all the way, you know. We simply couldn't hold him on nothing more than suspicion any longer. Yeah. Especially with that smart mouthpiece he dragged in. If he tried, he would have sued us from here to kingdom come. I mean, if you know Oscar Mayfield. Only too well, Sergeant. And you know what I mean. I suspect him just as much as you do. But until we have something definite, some real tangible clue... Well, anyhow, he went back to New York. Have you notified the police down there? Sure, sure I am. Lieutenant Singer at the 18th Precinct. And uh, isn't he an old friend of yours? Randy Singer? He certainly is. Well, I haven't heard a word from him, not in over a week now, so why don't you call him? Well, better still, go down there and see him. See what goes. All right, Sergeant. Maybe I'll do that. There was some more talk between us, and Sergeant Holcomb gave me every detail of the job. Told me what they'd found and what they'd done about it. And yes, all the completely unconfirmed evidence pointed straight to Oscar Mayfield. Unconfirmed and unconfirmable evidence because of the man's unshakable alibi. Item three, 85 cents for a phone call to Lieutenant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct, New York Police Department. You mean to say you just now found out about that heist? That's right, Randy, I just found out. You see, Johnny, if you didn't spend so much time gallivanting all over the place, you might be of some use around here. You, uh, you didn't get a promotion for all the gallivanting I did for you last week. Oh, darn it, I guess I should have worked that case myself. <laughs> well, how about this Mayfield? You've kept an eye on him? I've done everything but tap his phone line. And? Nothing, Johnny, absolutely nothing. You just didn't get on this one soon enough. I know what you mean. Unless he's changed these last couple of years... Oscar Mayfield is not one to hold on very long to whatever he's lifted. Right. And if he did snatch that stone, you can be sure he passed it on and collected for it long before this. And yet there's always the chance. So, in the case of a big hunk of rock like that, it means one of two things. The guy who bought it from him is either carting it out of the country and far away, or having it cut up into little ones that nobody will ever be able to identify. I guess Mayfield would have passed it along in one big fat hurry. I know we couldn't find it. Anywhere on or around him, we tried every trick. And I mean trick, Johnny. Until he started to yell at the D.A. and the D.A. started yelling at us. Uh, Johnny, I understand. Uh, I've just heard this, mind you. Yeah? Well, I understand that one of my boys... Oh, well, he was off duty, of course. So it was completely unofficial, you understand? Yeah. Well, I heard he even went so far as to roll Mayfield one night in the alley back of a nightclub. What? Not a sign of that, Ruby. Randy, if the department ever catches up with these unofficial tricks... Look, I told you, Johnny, I only heard that. 
But I know myself it isn't hidden anywhere in his apartment. Oh, you do? I do. Randy, didn't you and your clever little boys completely overlook the Otara's necklace that was hidden in the back of a camera just about a week ago? Oh, now that was different. So that I had to get lucky and find it for you? Okay, okay. So you happen to guess right. For once. <laughs> so maybe I better get on down your way and look around for myself. Tell me, where does Mayfield live? A hotel apartment over at 614 East 49th. But it's no use, Johnny. Why? Just because he's always gotten rid of things quickly in the past? No. Nope. Or because you knuckleheads couldn't find the ruby? No, Johnny. You haven't been able to hold him on suspicion and make a real investigation? I mean because by the time you can get here, he won't be. All right, then I'll grab the first plane I can and... What was that? Your pal Mayfield has paid up his rent and he's moving out. He's got himself a reservation on a plane to Mexico City this afternoon. Uh-oh. By the time you get to his place, he'll be gone. Randy. Yeah? Can't a genius like you come up with some excuse to hold him there for me? Oh, flattery will get you nowhere, Johnny. The answer's no. I've run out of tricks. Anything else I might try would only get me into hot water. No, wait, Randy. Yeah? Maybe I know a little trick to hold him over. Well, don't expect any official help from me or the department if you do come down it. What kind of a trick, Johnny? What's the difference? Now, look, if you're thinking of doing something else... Oh, Randy, how are you That would talking? only get us in order to clamp down on you. Don't worry about it. I'll be in touch. Illegal? I don't know why, but I'd suddenly remember that during my run-in with Mayfield a couple of years ago, there'd been talk about a man who was fencing his stuff. A man who had been only vaguely identified as Hugo. The last name had never come to light. Okay, maybe that name still meant something to him. If so, it justified item four. A dollar twenty-six for a telegram to Mayfield. It read as follows. Urgent that before you make any deal, you call me immediately at Plaza 3, 9970. And I signed it, Hugo. And I had them put a rush on it, hoping it would give me some much-needed time. Item five, six dollars for a cab to Bradley Field. Item six, ten dollars and twelve cents for a plane to New York. And when I got there, item seven is five eighty for a taxi to six fourteen East Forty Ninth Street. It was a smart, good looking apartment hotel, which is uh, more than I can say for the stuffy uniform doorman. Mr. Mayfield, did you say? Uh, that's right. Mr. Oscar Mayfield. I is he still here? Is he in? Uh, whom shall I say is calling, sir? Don't. Uh, don't. Just give me his apartment number. Your name, please. Now, don't worry about it. I'm sorry, but I must have your name, sir. It's Dollar. Now, what's the apartment number? Dollar. Hmm. Very well. No, 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 you don't. Just put the phone down. Huh? I beg your pardon. It's granted. Now, the number of his apartment. Not unless I announce you, sir. Now, look, I, uh, I am a special investigator. Oh, you are? Yes, and if you'd like to call the police and check on me, only I haven't time. Look. Look here, these are my credentials. And I tell you, sir, that unless I... Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, Mr. Johnny Dollar. That's right. The insurance investigator. Yes. I didn't know. Well, you do now. Well, nonetheless, Mr. Dollar... Just I'm give a... me Mayfield's apartment number, please. Now, what is it? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's uh, 7G. Okay, thank you. And I'll phone that you're on your way up, sir. You do, and I'll break your neck. Seven G. Hmm? Just in case he remembers what he once promised, I better make sure that this thing is working properly. Uh -huh. uh, here we are. Now let's see. Oh yes, seven A. Seven. Oh there. 7E, 7F, and 7G. Well, Mr. Mayfield, I hope you are still here. Mr. Mayfield? Mayfield? Oh, got it if he's already flown the coop. He left it wide open. Mr. Mayfield? Hmm. The well.
well-furnished living room was empty. And so was a kind of study off at one side and a little bar kitchenette beyond it. As for the bedroom in the back, well, as I started through the door, I caught sight of a couple of handbags in front of a chest of drawers. So he was still here. What I didn't catch sight of, though, was the gun shoved around the side of the door into my back. Just lift them up slowly, Dollar. Slowly. Well, I... See whether you're armed. Ah. Yes, here it is. Thank you. Okay, Mayfield. Now over there. Next to the bed. Go on. Sure. Sure, why not? Are you happy now? Dollar, I made you a promise once. It's kind of foolish of you, wasn't it? I'm going to keep that promise now. You're going to pull off a shot in a place like this? This apartment is absolutely soundproof. One of the reasons I selected it. I see. Well, are you ready? Have you tried the mild, kind taste of Kent? You should, because... You'll feel better about smoking with the taste of Kent. Kent with the micronite filter. Refines away harsh flavor. Refines away hot taste. It makes the taste of a cigarette mild as a balmy day in the month of May. Kent is the best for the flavor you like. Kent is the best for the flavor you like. Yes, Kent is the best for a mild, kind taste. Smoke a carton of Kent without switching. Discover the kind taste of Kent's blend of the world's finest quality tobaccos. Then try your old brand. What a difference in taste. Kent with the Micronite, Kent with the Micronite, Kent with the Micronite filter, refines away harsh flavors, refines away hot taste. You'll enjoy the mild, kind taste of Kent with the Micronite filter. And it looks like you were expecting me, Mayfield. Oh, yes, Dollar, I was. You see, I figured right from the beginning that you might be called in on this case. Then you do have the Burma Red, the ruby. Now? <laughs> oh, of course not. You should know that I wouldn't hold on to a thing like that. Let's say it's been uh, successfully disposed of. And why do you hang around here? Because I'm waiting for... Yes? I was waiting for you. Mm. To settle my old score with you. When I received that silly telegram, I was certain that you would be here. No? You mean I pulled a boo-boo? Your old pal Hugo is dead? I mean that ridiculous number you gave me to call. It's too bad. I thought it was a pretty good idea to keep you trying it until I could get here. Oh, I'll confess it did make me change my reservation to a later plane. But after all, when I got nothing but a busy signal eight times in a row, I uh, naturally called the operator. And she told you? Yes. That it's a number used for testing. That a busy signal is all it ever gets. Hmm. <laughs> Obviously a trick, then. Worthy of you. So I waited for you. And when the doorman, following my explicit instructions, called me, told me you'd arrived, I... Oh, but I'm wasting time. What's more, I'm expecting someone else. So, Dollar, this is it. Expecting me, man? What? Randy! Just drop it right there, Mayfield. Huh? Gently, now. All right, now Dollar's again. Now, sit over there in that chair next to the window. All right, anything you say, Lieutenant. Oh, Randy, you're like the U.S. Marines. Here, you, uh, you better keep this gun of his. You know, I'm just glad you got careless and left that front door open out. I thought I heard a door close just before you made your dramatic entrance. But how come, Randy? What do you mean, how come? Well, from what you said on the phone... So what? I'm off duty. Any reason I shouldn't just uh, kind of drop around for a visit? Oh, I'm glad you did. You know something, Johnny? What? So am I. Now, I'll probably hate myself in the morning for saying this, but <laughs> I've waited a long time for a chance to return some of the favors you've done me over the years. But I've done you. Well, Mayfield? I'm afraid your so-called visit is completely pointless, Lieutenant. You must know very well that you won't find the ruby around here or anything to even remotely connect me with it. Do I need to after the little party I walked in on? Yeah, that's right. Huh? You can stop smiling now. Oh, very well, very well, if you insist on booking me for an alleged attack on Johnny Dollar with a, quote, deadly weapon, unquote. Let us go down to your station house and have done with it. This Grand Central Station? Shall we? Shall we go, Lieutenant? You just stay in that chair, Mayfield, while I... No, Randy. 
while I answer the door. Okay, but leave this one open so I can hear. Right. Yes? Yeesh, what a fancy layout this is. Who are you? Uh, you Oscar Mayfield. Well, who did you expect to find here? Santa Claus? Yeah, well, no, no, no. Look, look Mr. Mayfield, you, you mind putting down a gun, huh? Not till I'm sure you're okay. Come inside. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. All right, now, what's your name? Yeah, uh, Rosie. Uh, Rosie Gilliam. Look, you can frisk me. I'm clean. And that package? Well, you know, it's from the boss. It's from Hugo. It's what you've been waiting for. Oh, it's from Hugo, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure, honestly. He said I should deliver it and get a receipt, then maybe you'd hand me a fin or a tenner. Oh, he did, huh? Yeah. Maybe I better make sure that it's, um, whatever he was supposed to send over to me. Well, do you think I'd meddle with it and maybe do myself out of these delivery jobs he gives me and pays me so good? You're on the level? Yeah, you're honest. If you hit it. Now, this contains and I think it does. By the way, uh, where does Hugo hang out? Well, how should I know? All I know is he calls me now and then, meets me at some place, and gives me something I should deliver. I guess you're okay, then. Sit down there while I take a look at this. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll just see now. You know, you're the first gent who ever opened one of those deliveries in front of me? Am I? Yeah, you're the very first... Holy jumping! Look at that loot! Where is he waiting to pick up the receipt, Rosie? I don't know. He only hunts me up when he's ready. Look at all that dough. What kind of a receipt, Rosie? He said you'd know what kind. Oh, man, would you look at that? Would you look at it? All right, I'll write you one. Yeah, yeah maybe uh, <clears throat> maybe I could have a 20 for bringing it. I'll give you a receipt to Mr. Hugo. Um, let's see, how is it now that he spells his last name? You don't know, Mr. Mayfield? Well, don't you know? I should know how to spell Hemperschlag. Hemperschlag. So that's it. And now, wait a minute. Listen, you you are Mayfield, ain't you? All right, Randy. Randy? Randy who? Lieutenant Singer of the police. Come in, Randy. The police? Oh, no, I've been talking. Mr. Hugo will kill me. No, Rosie, I don't think he'll ever get the chance. I just take it easy, Rosie. Oh, no, 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 listen, cop, I was... We'll give you all the protection you need after we sign you in at headquarters. Rosie, whatever your name is, you hairbrained idiot. Just take it easy, Mayfield, and sit down. You too, Rosie. Well, now, look at all this beautiful money. Randy, unless I'm awfully wrong, it's payment to Mayfield for the ruby. And if you can locate a Hugo with the unlikely name of Hemperschlag, or maybe you'll save us the trouble, Mayfield. After all, now that we have his name, and who knows, if you talk, maybe the judge won't throw the whole book at you. Well? <sighs> okay, Dollar. I know when I'm licked, I'll talk. Mr. Hugo Hemperschlag, believe it or not, turned out to be a gem setter for the famous jewelry house of Winkler & Winkler, where he couldn't help knowing about all the important stuff brought into this country, and with the know-how to break it up, after he'd arranged to have it stolen. Expense account total? Well, in view of the commission I'll get on this one, forget it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, I'll be back with a rather unusual story. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber, sound patterns by Joseph Cabibo. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were... Paul McGrath as Oscar Mayfield, Al Hodge as Lieutenant Randy Singer, Ivor Francis as Jimmy Bartell, Jack Grimes as Rosie, Santos Ortega as the Sergeant, Mercer McLeod as the Doorman. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roger Foster speaking. Derwood Kirby's favorite program, The Gary Moore Show, weekdays on the CBS Radio Network. CBS for Durham, Raleigh, WDNC. NC. It's 610. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Earl Foreman. Earl, how are you? How are things in Los Angeles? Why, didn't you know we moved back here to Sarasota in Florida? <laughs> no kidding. Yep, but uh, now we think we'll make another move. Where to this time? Oh, back to California. Why don't you make up your mind? <laughs> it's more fun this way. Say, why don't you come down here and see us? At whose expense? Companies. Another investigation? Mm, yes. What this time, Earl? Of a murder, Johnny. A murder? That uh, hasn't happened yet. But believe me, if I'm reading the signs right, there's certainly one in the making. Okay, Earl. I'll grab the first plane I can get. The 
The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. It never fails. Whether it's a party evening or an ordinary weekday, people always drink more light, bracing, clean-tasting Pepsi-Cola than you expect. That's why the smartest Pepsi you buy is the Extra Carton. Buy Extra Carton of the drink that lets you drink young as you think. Yes, get the right one, the modern light one. Now it's Pepsi for those who think young. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company office in Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the weather or not matter. Expense account item one, six dollars for a taxi out to the airport. Item two, ninety-seven ninety-six plane fare. And modern jet transportation being what it is, I got to Sarasota just before noon. Item three, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car, and 20 minutes later, I walked into the office at 1306 Main Street that Earl Poorman shares with another old friend, Don Boomhauer, a prominent realtor. Five minutes after the usual howdy-do's, Earl and I were tearing into a plateful of shrimps cooked in beer at the famous Plaza restaurant. Ah, oh, those are delicious. <laughs> Think you can manage another order of them, Jerry? Mm. Not a chance, Earl, but they are great. Specialty of the house, you know. Well, they deserve to be. Well, while you're making a pig of yourself, let me tell you why I called you. Oh, go ahead. Our uh, client's name is T. Rockway Mayfield, a wild old character who made his pile up in New England. Mm -hmm. He retired and moved down here last fall. He has a big home in St. Armand's Key. What's he do to keep busy? Fish? Golf? No, he spends most of his time with a jug beside him, sunning himself or feeding the seagulls, and then shooting at them with an air pistol. Isn't that illegal? Well, it would be if he ever hit one of them, but he never does. And he does throw uh, big parties, always lots of pretty girls around. And don't think he doesn't go for them, too, in spite of his age. <laughs> what a life. The point is, he tells me that he came down here to retire to get as far away as he could from his wife's kids. You know, stepped out on steps on names are Betty and Frank Merriton. How come, Earl? Well, as long as his wife was alive, she made him support them. I see. But he felt they ought to be out earning their own living, and Johnny, I happen to agree with him. If they're growing up, I agree with you. Anyhow, when his wife died and he retired, he left them flat. They're on their own until he goes, of course. So, what's happened? Well, tomorrow is old Mayfield's birthday, and that means another big party. Mm -hmm. And Johnny, the kids have told him that they're coming down here to celebrate. Told him that he can't refuse them now because they're standing on their own feet. You think that's true? No, sir. I think they're coming for something else. Like what, Earl? That nasty word I mentioned to you on the phone. Murder? Murder. Now, let me pay the check and I'll drive you over to see him, okay? By all means. Betty and Frank arrived here in Sarasota yet? Mm, I don't think so. I hope not. But you can understand why I was so anxious for you to get on down here. Well, Earl, if something should happen to him while they're here, wouldn't it be just a little too obvious? Would it? Those kids are no fools, not by a long shot. Well, even so. And with the drunken mobs that he has at his parties, where somebody could be knocked on the head and tossed into the swimming pool and nobody would pay any attention until it was too late, or... or you know, no, okay, okay. I, I could be all wrong. I think you must be. But is there any reason why you shouldn't stick around long enough to keep an eye on them while the kids are here? Well... On expense account. <laughs> I suppose not. Yeah. And then maybe after they've left, I'll... Uh... Break down and take you out fishing. Now, there is a sensible inducement. <laughs> On a look, there, there's this place just ahead now. Hmm? That? Mm-hmm. The big one. Oh, 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 brother. And you don't think money that can afford a place like that would be worth killing for? Oh, Earl. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have a point there. Uh... This 
this ever happen to you? You're driving down a long highway or working late, and then monotony makes you feel drowsy. Perk up with no dose. No dose keeps you alert with the same safe refresher found in coffee. Yet no dose is faster, handier, more reliable, absolutely not habit forming. The safe way to stay alert without harmful stimulants. No dose. Old Mayfield's home there on the Gulf of Mexico side of fashionable St. Armand's Key was quite a place. To ensure privacy, all three of the landward sides were protected by a high wall. The big house of concrete, stucco, aluminum, and glass was surrounded by a broad patio full of plants, tables, chairs, and lounges, and, more important, with a large, fully equipped bar complete with bartender even at this time of day. Beyond the patio, a swimming pool, and then a clean, white stretch of beach. It was obvious Mayfield did plenty of entertaining. As for the man himself... Dollar, did you say? Dollar? Uh, that's right, Johnny Dollar. A man with lots of sense, then, eh, poor man? Uh, what? What do you mean, what? What's the matter with you? It's a joke. A hundred cents to the dollar, aren't there? Oh. So if he's a dollar, he's got lots of sense, hasn't he? <clears throat> Get it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Besides, I know all about you, Della. I've oh. been listening to you on the radio for years. Hmm. So I'm glad to know you, Johnny. Thank you. Now, let's celebrate by having ourselves a little drink. Well, it's a little early in the day, Mr. Mayfield. I don't nonsense, think I... Nonsense. Nonsense. It's never too early for a drink. Uh, Samantha, where are you? Yes, Mr. Mayfield. Right here, sir. Uh, bring a scotch and soda for Mr. Dollar. And Mr. Poorman will have a gin and tonic. Yes, Mr. Mayfield. And how about you? Another one of what you've been having? Uh, no, no. This time I believe I'll have, uh... uh how does cognac and root beer with a dash of mint sound to you? That sounds terrible, Mr. Mayfield. Good, good. I'll have it. Yes, Mr. Mayfield. So that's that. Uh, by the way, poor man, you're bringing Johnny to my party tomorrow night, aren't you? Well, now, uh, I'll tell you, I... Good, good. And Johnny, my boy, you'll have the time of your life. There'll be more good-looking girls around here tomorrow night than you ever saw. <laughs> I really know how to pick them, boy. Really know how to pick them. Well, good for you. Yeah, but, uh... Oh, me. Do you know why they always come? The real reason? And why they always turn on their charm for me? Why, sir? Hate to admit it. Yeah, I really do. But all they want is to get their pretty little grasping fingers on my money, that's all. But they won't. Don't you worry about that. Nobody will, not until I'm dead and gone. Uh, did poor man tell you about those lazy, shiftless, worthless stepchildren of mine? Well, he, uh, he mentioned them. And you'll see him, too. They get in here tomorrow afternoon on the 4.30 plane. Oh, well, then perhaps I, uh... uh oh, oh uh, that reminds me. I'd better arrange for Samantha or Charles or somebody to meet them. Why don't yeah. you let me pick them up for you? Oh, yes, Mr. Mayfield, that's a good idea. Eh? Well, of course. Fine, fine. Pick them up at the airport. Bring them here if you can't lose them. And then stay on for the party. All right. And now, Johnny, uh, now let me show you my pride and joy. You see it there on the far side of the swimming pool? That, um, that sort of pool house with all the gadgets on the roof? Pool house? Yes, well, it's a bathhouse with a swimming pool, isn't it? Ridiculous, poor man. Utterly ridiculous. I mean, that's all you think of it. Well, what is inside that little building, then? You'll see. You'll see. Now, come along. Well, I'll be doggone. Yes, sir, a weather station. Oh, bother. Certainly fooled me. <laughs> Complete one, too. You see, Johnny? Rain gauges, electronic weather vanes, anemometers, barometers, paragraphs, charts with isobars, snow gauge. Snow gauge? Maps, everything. Everything a regular weather bureau would have. Everything. Even a correspondence school course in forecasting. Anything you want to know? Here's the answer. Well... It is interesting, to say the least. And why not, eh? How could I ever plan a party unless I know what the weather's going to be like, hey? <laughs> Answer me that. About this party uh, tomorrow night, Mr. Mayfield. Uh, Johnny, Johnny, tell me something. Yeah? How good a shot are you with a pistol? What makes you ask that, Mr. Mayfield? Answer my question, boy. Oh, I'm fair to middling, I guess. But listen... Good, good. 
Then maybe you can hit some of them the way I never seem to be able to. Hit what, sir? You'll see. Uh, Sir Mayfield? Yes, Mr. Mayfield? What? Now, why the devil did you bring me another drink? You want me to spoil my aim? Oh, no, Mr. Mayfield. But there's no point in letting it go to waste. <laughs> I swear, Mr. Mayfield, I don't know how you do it. Practice, poor man, practice. So for the next hour, in spite of a very uneasy feeling I was beginning to have about this whole assignment, Mayfield and I tossed chunks of bread to the seagulls, then blasted away in a general direction with a couple of air pistols. Knowing the law about such things, I deliberately avoided making any hits. And old Mayfield, although he handled that little gun like a pro, didn't make any hits either. Then, just as abruptly as he dragged me into it... That's all, gentlemen. That is all. Oh. I have to get to work now in my weather lab and make out the latest report for myself. Can't be disturbed. So off you go. Off you go. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, anything you say. Come on, Johnny. Right, Earl. I'll see you tomorrow night, poor man. And, Johnny, I'll see you when you bring my stepchildren, Betty and Frankie Merriton, here. And you ought to stay when they get here. I want you to get to know them. I want very much to. Now go on, will you? Go on. I got work to do. I picked up my rental car and dropped in on my old friend Sergeant Phil Phillips at police headquarters. I know, Johnny, I know. It just doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, Earl Poorman's worry about the old coot. Lord knows he isn't worried. And yet, if what he says about those stepkids happens to be true... Have you ever met Frank or Betty Merriton? All I know about him is what he's told me. And if it's true, he really should have protection while they're here. But doggone it, he says no. If we so much as show ourselves, he'll not only throw us out, but stop the party and get everybody down on us. I'll tell you what you better do then, just in case. Yeah? If you were to sneak a prowl car up to the outside of the wall around this place, uh, you'd have no trouble getting over the wall if need be. Good. In the meantime, you'd be looking after him inside. Right. Well, Johnny, he is just a crazy old coot all at loose ends. Does a lot of crazy things. I know, Phil. I know what you mean. That's why I'm really concerned about this case. On the surface, it looks like a waste of time, my coming all the way down here just to attend a party. And yet... Yeah. Yeah. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Smoke Kent, the micronite filter cigarette. Yes, people who want to get away from harsh, rough-tasting cigarettes know that the one to switch to is Kent. And there's a very good reason why. Kent, with the micronite filter, refines away harsh flavor. Refines away rough taste for the mildest taste of all. Yes, that's your reward for smoking Kent, the cigarette that made the filter famous. So when you want to get away from harsh, rough-tasting cigarettes, remember, the finer the filter, the milder the taste. And you'll decide to treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Smoke Kent, the micronite filter cigarette. Cocktails and dinner with the Foremans, a good night's sleep, and for most of the next day, I had little to do but kill time. I went out and hit some golf balls at a nearby driving range, paid a visit to the colorful jungle garden, saw the famous Ringling Circus Museum, and ended up chewing the fat with some of the boys at station WSPB. Then I met the plane, picked up Frank and Betty Meriton, piled them into my rental car, and started back to St. Armand's Key. The differences between the two of them were pretty striking. Betty was a beautiful girl with a head on her shoulders. Frank was a weak, wishy-washy, well-spoken nothing with a capital M. Don't tell me, dear girl. I think it's utterly ridiculous that he should expect me to sweat and slave and work my fingers to the bone when he has all that money that he doesn't know what to do with. I mean that. Utterly ridiculous. And I tell you that when Daddy finds out that you lie to him, Frank, that you don't have a job, that you've been chiseling off your friends and me all these months, he'll probably throw you out. Well, he won't find out. Unless you tell him. 
And if you do, dear girl, I shall be very angry with you. Just because you choose to work eight hours a day in a stuffy library five days a week. Why not? I like it. Well, that doesn't mean that I have... Frankie, all I hope is he gives you enough to get you off my back. Oh, he will, my dear. He will. I've figured out a sob story that would melt the heart of a statue. Good luck. You'll need it. Will I? You'll see. Just don't you interfere. I'm sorry, Johnny. Oh, that's all right, Betty. This silly squabble has been going on ever since we left the Boston airport. That's okay. I, uh... I understand that some of the party daddy throws down here are Lulu's. So I've heard. There'll be a big one tonight, you know. Good. I love parties. But, uh... Well, come to think of it, I, I won't know a soul who'll be there. Well, don't you worry, Betty. You'll have no problem in that department. Well, I hope not. But, uh, Johnny. Yes? Will you dance with me now and then? Just in case. Are you kidding? Without giving them a chance to unpack their bags, Mayfield dragged them into a study and shut the door. So I took a swim and dressed for dinner in the party. At dinner, incidentally, Mayfield and Betty yacked away at each other like a couple of happy kids. But not a solitary word passed between Mayfield and Frankie. Frankie sat there and pouted, hardly touching his food. Then, the party. So help me, I never saw so many good-looking girls gathered together in one spot in my life. And what if a lot of them were only looking for a shot at Mayfield's money? The point is, they were there. As for Betty... We not only danced like fools, but made plans for getting to know each other much better up north after this whole thing was over. <laughs> Meantime, needless to say, I kept a weather eye on Frankie, who spent most of his time at the bar looking very unhappy. Then about 11 p.m., between dances, Mayfield came over my way. Not drinking, Johnny? You're missing half the fun. Oh, don't you worry a bit, Mr. Mayfield. I'm having a fine... Hey, 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 wait a minute. The lights. What happened to the lights? Just a gag, Johnny. Just a gag. A gag? They'll be back on in a minute. I have a timer on the main switch that does it. Well, why? Why the blackout? What's the matter with you, boy? Now, the next time they go out, and they will, they will. Not if I can find that switch box. And when they do, you just grab the nearest, the prettiest girl you can find. Oh, come on. And if you don't know what to do then, well, you're not happy. Oh, not a truth there. They came on again too soon. Now, listen, Mr. Mayfield. But have fun, Johnny. Have fun. Mr. Mayfield, wait a minute. Johnny? Betty, what happened to you? Well, don't you worry. I slapped his face and hard. Only I still don't know who was there in the darkness. Well, that lights out gag has got to go. Come on, let's find the main switch box so it won't happen again. You mean the lights were supposed to? Oh, no. Oh, not again. Don Bonnie, where did Mr. Mayfield go? Well, I thought he was going over to... Johnny! Come on, Betty. That was over near his weather station. By the time we fought our way over there through the crowd, the lights came on again. And there, just in front of the door of the little weather station, lay a body. Johnny? Is he... Yes, Betty. Let me through. What is it? What happened? I was over there getting a drink and I heard a couple of... It's Frankie. That's right, Mr. Mayfield. Is he dead? Yes, sir. A couple of 38s through the chest. Well, I can't say that I'm sorry, Johnny. But who? Who did this? Call the police. Somebody call the police. Sergeant Phillips and his men were already over the wall, and they really did a job. In the next two hours, they, plus a dozen more he called in, made as thorough a search of that place as I've seen. But the result... Johnny, the gun that killed young Meriton has to be around here somewhere. Has to be, but we simply can't find it. You must find it, Sergeant. You must. And the killer, too. How about raking through the sand over there on the beach? No, it was all smoothed over before the party, and there still isn't a break in it. Mm. To haul every one of this mob down to headquarters so the boys in the lab... Wait. Yeah? Wait a minute. me like a ton of bricks, and I kicked myself for not having wised up before. Well, if what Mayfield told me about them was true, Johnny... What Mayfield told him? Yeah, Johnny. If what he says about those stepkids is true... Mayfield, of course. And that crazy drink of his yesterday. But I'd watched Samantha mix it out of the corner of my eye. She hadn't really put a single drop of liquor in it. And tonight? The same thing, probably. 
So actually, Mayfield was just as sober as a judge. And the one important piece of evidence, the gun. Now go on with it, go on. I've got work to do. Yes, in his weather station. And what had he said about that? Anything you want to know is the answer. The answer? It has everything a regular weather bureau would have. Everything. Everything? Like a weather balloon? A balloon big enough to carry a pistol far out over the gulf, never to be seen again? Now, if so, if he pulled that trigger... All right, Mr. Mayfield. Let's go down to headquarters where the lab crew can make a paraffin test of your shooting hand. Well? No. No, it won't be necessary, Johnny. I did it. I killed him. I'll say this. That was a clever way to get rid of that gun. A weather balloon. Clever. Was it? Mayfield Fortune will go to Betty. And I can't think of a more deserving girl. Or, come to think of it, a prettier one. Expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford, $247.92. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a complex and unusual story with a twist that will surprise you, I think, as much as it surprised me. Tune in, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If you drive a car, remember this. Almost anywhere in the country where you see the Sinclair sign, you can save up to four cents a gallon on gasoline by using Sinclair Dino. That's because in three out of five cars, regular-priced Sinclair Dino matches the performance of expensive premium gasolines, costing up to four cents more a gallon. Drive with care and buy Sinclair Dino gasoline. Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson, music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Ian Martin, Bill Kramer, Joe Hardy, Ivor Francis, Constant Simons, and Karen McCrary. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Art Hanna speaking. Worldwide Sports with Chris Schenkel is heard weeknights on... Johnny Dollar. Dollar? This is Larry Spangler. Hi. Spangler, did you say? That's right. Star Mutual Insurance Company. Oh, I see. I guess we've never met because I've only been here in Hartford about a year. Oh, well, what can I do for you, Mr. Spangler? Mr. Spangler? Mm Hmm? Well, don't make an old man out of me. Call me Larry, huh? Well, whatever you say. What can I do for you, Larry? Johnny, does the name Briscoe mean anything to you? Lloyd Briscoe? Runs some kind of a factory on the edge of town, doesn't he? Yeah, he and his partner. Do you know him? No, but I've heard of him. Why? Well, he's one of my clients. Pretty important one. I'm on my way out to his place now. I'll be driving right by your apartment. I thought it might be a good idea to have you come along with me. Anything wrong with him? His business partner just called me up on the telephone. Mr. Briscoe is dead. Oh, that's too bad. Sure is. You see, his housekeeper found him just a few minutes ago. With a bullet in his head. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Star Mutual Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. 
following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the oldest gag matter. Larry Spangler turned out to be one of the new generation of insurance agents with that Madison Avenue touch. You know, charcoal gray suit, white shirt, dark blue tie, well-shined shoes. And he had that freshly scrubbed look, as though he'd just stepped out of a barber shop. He was maybe 25 or 6, good-looking in an almost pretty sort of way, with well-tanned complexion, plenty of dark curly hair, and above all, that eager expression of the young man who's out to set the world on fire. Yeah, the Briscoe place is down on Live Oak Avenue, Johnny. On south of Hereaway. You're the driver. I'm certainly glad you were able to come along. Any idea who might have wanted to kill Mr. Briscoe and why? Oh, I have plenty of ideas. But uh, why don't we see what the police have to say when we get there? Hmm? Oh, then you've called them. Hmm? Uh, John Barber, the old man's business partner, called them. Same time as he called me. I see. At least he said he did. Well, any reason why he shouldn't have? Who? Uh, do you know John Barber? Never heard of him. Well, at least you'll be starting on him fresh then. I mean, no preconceived idea about him. Why do you say that? Don't tell me you suspect him of this. Oh, no, 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 no. Of course not. No reason at all. It's just that... Well, why don't we uh, see just what's happened before jumping to any conclusion? Look, Larry. And uh, see what you think of the others, too. That is, if uh, Barbara got a hold of them. What others? Well, there's Trudy, his ward. Trudy? Gertrude Wilson. But there's certainly no reason to suspect her of anything. <laughs> you try it, Johnny, and you'll have me to answer to. Oh, is that way, hmm? Well, we're uh, real good friends. Mm -hmm. And I know her well enough to know that... Uh, well, it'd be ridiculous, that's all. Would it? Sure. And as for Mike, though, uh, well, who am I to judge in a case like this? Let's wait and see what you think. Mike who? Briscoe. How's he related? Well, he's the old man's son, or rather adopted son. He lived with Mr. Briscoe? No, not with him, Johnny, but uh, certainly off of him. The way I get it, the old man threw him out on his own a few years back, but then apparently he uh, relented enough to keep feeding him plenty of good, cold, hard cash to play around with. Wait a minute now. Didn't I see Mike Briscoe's name in the papers not too long ago? Yeah, maybe it was just after that big nightclub ruckus at the Purple Jive when a bunch of drunks kind of wrecked the joint. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Yeah, but uh, now wait, Johnny. Nobody actually saw Mike there that night. And just because of his, well, his reputation is no proof that he was... I mean, after all, Johnny, why hang the guy unless you're sure he deserves it? Mm -hmm. He's supposed to have been treading the straight and narrow lately. Even got himself some kind of a job, I understand. So I really have no reason to... <laughs> well, you see for yourself. Tell me, did Briscoe have a wife? Uh, she died eight or ten years ago. Who benefits by his death? Well, if his will comes out the same way as the insurance, Mike gets one-third of everything and Trudy gets two-thirds. I see. Except for the business, of course. That'll go to his partner, John Barber. Oh, it will? At least that's what Barber told me one day when I tried to sell him some insurance. But surely you don't think... <laughs> Only what am I sweating over it for? You're the investigator, and it's... Well, it's all just sort of guesswork on my part anyhow. Why should I confuse you? Confuse me? Sure. <laughs> Larry, you may have been more help than you realize. <laughs> In charge at the Briscoe place was Sergeant Danny Gilbert, not the homicide man I'd have picked for a case like this. He was always a bit too sure of his usually wrong spot judgment. He sent Larry into the living room where a sad-eyed but good-looking girl sat quietly talking to a couple of men then led me directly into the study where Briscoe's body had been discovered earlier by the housekeeper. That's old uh, Mrs. Haskell, now. After I got all I could from her, I sent her up to her room to weep and wail it out all by herself. She was only in the way. I see. Well, there's the stiff, just the way she found him. Only, uh, don't you touch anything until the doc gets here. The body was slumped forward over a big mahogany desk. The right hand, with obvious powder burns on it, still held the old battered thirty-eight that apparently had done the job. There were powder burns in the forehead, too, where the bullet had entered at close range. There's no sign of a struggle or of anything in the room having been disturbed. Body's all so stiffened up, I figure it happened sometime late last night. Yes, very possibly. Uh, who was here in the house with him? Only the housekeeper. You sure of that? That's what she says, Dollar. I've got no reason to doubt her. Mm -hmm. And she didn't hear the shot? Hmm? Her room is away up on the third floor. Besides, she's kind of deaf. Uh -huh. Well, from the looks of things around here, Sergeant... Sure, Dollar. It's obvious. Plans the nose in your face. The old man committed suicide. Did he? 
You don't think so? I don't know. Well, I do. I'm betting the lab crew and the medical will back me up. I've seen too many of these things not to know the signs. What kind of signs? Briscoe's business hasn't been doing too well lately. Hasn't it? Certainly hasn't. Ask his partner out there, Mr. Barber. Yes, I will. And he's had that worthless kid Mike on his hands. And even that water, his Trudy Wilson, has been a worry to him ever since she stopped living here with him. And that's proof that he committed suicide. It's good enough for me. Well, Sergeant, don't bank on it. <laughs> of the fact that it was clearly indicated. But all I had to go on was what Larry Spangler had told me. And when Dr. Thaddeus Frambler and his lab crew got through, it looked as though I was wrong. They could find absolutely nothing to suggest anything but suicide. The only fingerprints on the beat-up old revolver, Briscombe's gun that he'd had in his desk for years, the only prints on it were his own. The angle of the shot, its proximity as indicated by the powder burns, the burns on his hand still holding the gun, all showed that it must have been his finger that pulled the trigger. But maybe, maybe, with a little help from someone else. Dollar, that suspicious mind of yours. Sergeant, what about the fact that the gun was still in his hand? Doesn't mean a thing. Well, wouldn't he have dropped it to the desk or to the floor when he died? Not if the bullet hit some part of his brain that caused the final spasm, made him tighten up. Mm. Ask the doc here, Dollar. Go ahead, ask him, will you? All right, all right, Sergeant. Doc, the law says uh, you have to do an autopsy in a case like this. I'd like to know the results of it. It's all right by me, Doc. You can tell him anything he wants to know as far as I'm concerned. But it isn't going to make any difference. We'll see. And, Dollar, you'll only be wasting your time talking to those people out there in the living room. Young Miss Trudy, that Mike Briscoe, and Mr. Barber. Well, maybe, Sergeant, but I'd like to talk with them anyway and separately if you have no objections. Oh, Dollar, that suspicious mind of yours. You said it. Suicide? Oh, no, Mr. Dollar. I'll never believe that. Daddy simply wasn't... wasn't the type to commit suicide. Never. Mm -hmm. Isn't it true that he was kind of worried about you, Trudy? Because of the way I left him, moved away from here to get along on my own. He didn't like it, if that's what you mean. Why did you leave him? I understand he was very good to you. I know, and it may have seemed ungrateful. Because he and his wife took me in when I was just a little baby. Mm -hmm. They fed me, they clothed me, gave me an education... And after Mother died, he even sent me to college. But he was such a tyrant. He wouldn't ever let me think for myself, do the things I wanted to do, go with the people I wanted to go with. He insisted on running my whole life. Even the man that I... I want to marry wasn't allowed in the house. I see. When Daddy had business with him, he went to see him at his office. Trudy. I'm not a child anymore, Mr. Dollar. I have a mind of my own. Oh, I can see that. I thought I had a right to use it to do the things I want to do. And I've done very well, thank you. Even he had to admit it and stop harping about the way I broke his heart by leaving him. You don't seem too upset over his death, Trudy. Well? No. No, I'm not. Because of the fortune that'll be coming your way now? Yes, partly. It'll make me free, independent. I can marry the only man I've ever wanted to marry, do exactly as I please without this stubborn old man breathing down my neck all the time. 
Trudy, you realize, don't you, that if he didn't commit suicide... Of course he didn't. ...that a statement like that might point the finger of suspicion at you as a possible murderess? Would you rather that I'd lied to you, Mr. Dollar? Suicide? A strong-minded, stubborn old codger like Frank Briscoe? Never, Mr. Dollar, never. You seem pretty sure of that, Mr. Barber. Well, I have reason to. If you'd been in business with him for nearly ten years as I have, you'd know it couldn't have been suicide, too. Even the worries about your business? He had no worries about it. Not really, Mr. Dollar. Don't you know how much Frank was worth? Nearly a million. I mean, of his own. Sure, the business hasn't done very well lately, but that's because of him. What do you mean by that? Uh, That stubbornness of his over his out-of-date, old-fashioned methods, his refusal to let me put in new, efficient equipment, inaugurate new procedures that could have made a fortune that could have put me on easy street, too. Believe me, things will be different now. Now that he's conveniently out of the way and you'll have the business alone? Yes. Yes, that's right, Mr. Dollar. In other words, then, Mr. Barber, if it wasn't suicide... And I'm certain it wasn't. You've shown a pretty good motive for killing him yourself, haven't you? Oh, no, just a... That's ridiculous, but I suppose I have now, haven't I? You certainly have. Would you rather that I tried to deceive you about my feelings in this whole matter? What do you want me to do, Dollar? Try and put on an act? Then you're not at all sorry, Mike. Why should I be? After all, he was no blood kin to me any more than he was to Trudy or her to me. So I understand. So I'm not one bit sorry the old man's gone. There's been a lot of times I wished I could have kind of helped him on his way. In spite of the fact that he was pretty good to you over the years? He's doing a lot better for me right now, Dollar, than he ever did before. You mean the money you'll inherit? Sure. A third of his money, one third of all that nice insurance. All in one nice big hunk. No insurance if it was suicide, Mike. Oh, now, wait a minute, Dollar. Well? Did you know the old man? No, I didn't. Well, if you had, you'd know perfectly well he'd never knock himself off. I don't care what that crazy cop says. You don't think so? I know he wouldn't. And another thing. Yeah? He took on a lot of religion the last couple of years, took it real serious. Oh? I guess that's why he kind of got charitable and started giving me some dough now and again. And to him, the worst sin he could do would be either to kill anybody or to take his own life. In fact, Dollar, he bored me with a lecture on that. Well, on that subject more than once. Mm-hmm. And if you'd known him, you'd know he was dead serious in that religion stuff. You said that you considered helping him on his way. Well, I said I kind of wished I could is all. That's all I said. And all that, and then I'm glad he's gone, yeah. Any idea who might have done it, Mike? Uh, besides you? Almost well, anybody might have done it. I, I mean, it would have got something out of it. Like who? Well, how about Barber? That gets the business now. What about Trudy? You really think so? I don't know. I can't see either of them actually doing it. You know, my only gripe, Dollar. What's that? Trudy gets two-thirds. I only get one-third. Now, maybe if I was smart and I wasn't so lazy, I'd make a big play for her, you know? (laughs) After all, we're not real relatives, so uh, I'd marry her and then, uh, well, I'd have my hands on it all. But I guess I'd never get her away from that guy she's going with. Larry Spangler. I'll do all right anyway. My share of all that dough, even without the insurance, is good enough for me. And you know, well, you know how much that's going to amount to, Dollar? Enough to kill him for, Mike? Sure. Absolutely. But I didn't do it. And Dollar, he didn't commit suicide. I'm beginning to think maybe you're right about that. About no suicide? Yes. But I didn't kill him. Somebody did. <laughs> If you ever suffer a touch of arthritis or rheumatism and you've never tried Mentholatum Deep Heating Rub, you can't know how good its deep heating action can make you feel. As you massage it into painful areas, you feel its deep heating action. You know relief is on its way. Mentholatum Deep Heating Rub is an extra strong combination of active ingredients for safe, temporary relief of minor arthritic rheumatic pain. Use greaseless, stainless Mentholatum Deep Heating Rub often. body was taken to the morgue. Then Sergeant Gilbert, still sure that it was suicide, felt there was no reason to hold any of Mr. Briscoe's beneficiaries and told them they could leave. 
told me to forget the whole thing. Then he left us there. And if you'll excuse me, I better get on down to the office. I'm afraid Frank's death is going to be quite a shock to some of the older employees who've been with him since he started the business. Yes, Mr. Barber, maybe you'd better get rolling with uh, some of those profitable new procedures that uh, you were telling me about. Huh? Now that you've got Mr. Briscoe out of your hair. I've got him out of my hair. Are you implying, Mr. Dollar? If the shoe fits. I get a little tired of hearing Sergeant Gilbert say it, but you are a suspicious man. All three of you swore it couldn't be suicide. I know, but... Uh, excuse me. I must go. You mind if I bum a ride with you? No. No, Mike. Come along. Right. And, brother, I'm going to the town and tie on one that'll make history in this burg. You would. Trudy? Certainly no reason for you to stay around. No. No, I'll be glad to get out of here. Uh, if it's all right with you, Johnny, I'll drive Trudy on home and you can take my car back to the office or the apartment if you like. Sure, Larry. Be glad to. You've held up under this very well, darling. Why not, dear? Johnny. Yeah? In spite of what that policeman and the doctor and those laboratory men said, do you think it was suicide? You worried about the insurance money that won't be paid if it was? Not Johnny. Of course not, Johnny. And do you know why? Because compared to the rest of the estate, the insurance doesn't matter. I'll be perfectly content without it. But you didn't answer me. Suicide or murder? Trudy? Yes? You know, that's a very good question. If motive alone were the answer, I'd surely say murder. But considering the circumstances, what little evidence there is... Of course, Johnny, it has to have been suicide. Because it'll save your company having to pay off? Well, that is something to think about, you know. Come on, honey, I'll take you home. See you later, Johnny. When the lovebirds drove away in Trudy's car, I took off in Larry's. Then I suddenly began to think about the route to his office. Something that he'd said about it earlier. Instead of going there, I drove to the morgue where Dr. Framler was finishing up his brief autopsy. No, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid of a suicide, all right. Not even any bruises, anything like that, huh, Doctor? Well, a slight one, yes. Where? On the forehead, at just about the point where the bullet entered. All right, then. But that could easily have been caused when he fell forward on the desk. Maybe, but I'm betting it wasn't. I say that old man was struck on the forehead enough to knock him out. It wouldn't have taken much at his age. Oh, well, I know. Then he was uh... shot in the same spot. So the bullet and the muzzle blast would cover up that bruise. Now, you've got to admit that's possible, Doctor. Uh, possible, of course, but the police found only his own prints on that gun, although it may have been wiped clean quite recently. Sure, sure it was. Easiest thing in the world is to pick up a gun with somebody else's hand, somebody unconscious, and make it pull the trigger, and that's exactly what happened. But who, Mr. Dollar? On the way over here just now, I suddenly realized my apartment was nowhere near the route between his office and the Briscombe place. In spite of the fact that he'd said it was. That was just an excuse to pick me up so he could talk to me. Uh, what, sir? And that corny, real friendly bit right from the beginning. Call me Larry. Real palsy. Larry? Yes. And all that dope he gave me on the others. That would make any one of them suspect. Why? In case the job hadn't been done well enough. That it might look like the murder it really was? Of course. I'm afraid I don't understand. As for calling me in himself, that's the oldest gag in the world. As a cover-up to take away any possible suspicion from himself. And as for motive, he had all the motive in the world. Mr. Dollar... Look, Doc, if there's no real evidence to pin it on him... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes? Maybe if I tear into him, act convincing enough, I can make him think there is... No, Johnny, you're out of your mind. As for motive, Larry, who had a better one? The girl, that fortune, even without the insurance, would be enough to keep a bright-eyed young opportunist wealthy for the rest of his life. Now, listen. Too bad, isn't it, that your lack of experience in crime tripped you up so easily? Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't I? You're out of your mind. You're crazy. Oh, not I, Larry. You have no proof of anything like you're suggesting. Haven't I? No. Didn't you know that your latent prints would show up on that gun even after carefully wiping it? And I... That your prints would show up on the back of old man Briscombe's hand just as clearly as they did on the arm of the chair you sat in there in the living room? That a simple comparison down at police headquarters... My fingerprints on the back of his head... That's right. That's impossible. Is it? Yes, because of a pair of cotton gloves that I wore. Cotton gloves, Larry? Oh. Oh. 
Like I said, Larry, you're a complete inexperience. Hedge, Johnny, not, not well, only I... the rankest amateur would have let himself be tripped up like that. <laughs> And only the rottenest kind of insurance man would have tried a thing like that. Thank heaven there aren't very many of them. Expense account total? Wait a minute. Of course, there isn't any. And you know what? I'm glad there isn't. This kind I wouldn't want to collect on anyway. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And oh, what a beautiful flavor. New instant tender leaf tea. Instant tender leaf, cold water, lots of ice. You've got it made. Richer, brighter, livelier iced tea. 100% pure tea. New instant tender leaf tea. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, do you remember who the Lorelei were? Look it up, hmm? Then join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were William Mason as Larry, Charita Bauer as Trudy, Raymond Edward Johnson as Barber, Ivor Francis as Doc, and Ralph Bell as the... Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, eh? That's right. Who are you? Uh, insurance investigator. Well, are you that Johnny Dollar? That's right. Freelance investigator. Oh, but now freelance. who... I want the man who works for the Star Mutual Insurance Company, not any freelance. Well, I work for Star Mutual. You what? On occasion, at least. On occasion, eh? Well, if one of their clients has some trouble, you have to get on the job for him, don't you? Well, that depends. Who are you, sir? Depends. Saying? What are you talking about? Do you work for him or don't you? On assignment, yes. Then get yourself an assignment, then get yourself over here right away. Over where? Here at my apartment. What's the matter with you? Are you an idiot? Where else could I possibly want you? Has it by any chance occurred to you, sir, that I might not have the least idea who you are? Well, what difference can that possibly... Oh, oh, oh yes, that, that, that's right. Yes, that's right. Uh, very well. My name is Timothy Jarrett. Now, get over here immediately. Do you mind if I check with Star Mutual first? I'll be wasting your time. Check with them after you get here. If I get there. Look, what Mr. Jarrett. What do you mean, Jarrett, if you do? You haven't even told me what your problem is. Do I have to go out and shout murder from the housetops murder. to get you to pay any attention to me? Did you say murder? Of course I did. Whose and when? Do you suppose I'd be talking to you if it had already occurred? Oh, I'm sure I haven't the least idea. Of course I wouldn't. How could I? But if you're not over here right away, I'll call that insurance company and have you fired. All right, you do that. I'll be waiting for you. You will. Hello. Hello. Well, it may be a nice long wait, Mr. Jared. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Star Mutual Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Lorelei matter. It was pretty obvious from that phone call that Mr. Timothy Jarrett was a crackpot of the first water. And I was all set to forget about him and go on about my business. 
But I had some errands to do in town, and one of them took me into the building where Star Mutual holds forth. So I made that my first stop and barged in on Ed Williams. Johnny! Well, how are you, boy? Glad to see you. Hi, Ed. What brings you here? Don't tell me you're having to go around digging up assignments these days. <laughs> Sit down. Thank you. Cigarette? I don't mind if I do. Here you are. Thank you. Yeah, I got a lighter. Right. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Well? Ed, I uh, believe you have a client by the name of Timothy Jared. Oh, yeah, Johnny. I'm afraid so. What's the matter? Why the groan? Well, I ought to be grateful for him, though, I guess. After all, that life policy of his has a face value of nearly two million bucks. Two million? Wow. I thought maybe he was just some old nut. Oh, he is, Johnny. No question about it. Just about as wacky as they come. Don't you know who and what he was? The famous all-or-nothing Gerard? Was or is? Oh, he's still alive, if that's what you mean. But, Johnny, about 40 years ago, Gerard was one of the cleverest stock manipulators ever hit the scene. No kidding. Made himself millions and millions. Mm. And in those days, you could keep what you made. Really loaded him. Well, he was. What do you mean by that? Oh, he still has enough to get along on, plenty. But after the five or six beautiful dolls that he married and divorced, well, you know what they can do to a man and his money. Well, let's say I've heard. Thank goodness this present one seems to have a little sense. Oh, she's young and pretty enough, all right, but... Well, maybe you've heard of her. Name is Lorelei Lambert. She's an artist, and I understand a pretty good one. Came from Quebec originally. Oh? Spends a lot of time out of town, away from the old coot. But I'm sure it's just on account of her sketching and painting. I see. Matter of fact, the last time I talked to Mr. Gerard, that was, uh, uh, day before yesterday, she was off on another of her field trips. Well, what about the old boy, Johnny? Well, I got a crazy phone call from him. Hmm. Sorry, I, I guess I was kind of responsible for it. You were? Another of his complexes working on him. And I promised if it proved to have any basis, I might call you in just to shut him up. But I certainly didn't expect him to call you. What do you mean by complexes? Nothing else to do, so he worries about himself. Mm. A couple of weeks ago, it was a persecution complex. Before that, he was certain he was going to be robbed. Ah, but he wasn't. Of course not. Before that, he was sure that his apartment, the whole block maybe, was going to burn down over his head. And so on for the past couple of years. Well, what did he tell you it was this time? Well, he mentioned the word murder. I hope you laughed in his face. Who would ever gain anything by killing off that old character? You tell me. Who's the insurance beneficiary? Pretty little Lorelei, his wife. But he knows better than to think she'd ever raise a hand against him. He's given her everything, Johnny. Everything she can possibly need or want. Besides, she isn't a type. Is there a type for murder? Well, you tell me. If he was such a stock manipulator, how about some old enemy showing up? Maybe somebody he might have defrauded him. After 40 years? Uh, I guess you got a point there. It's just another one of his complexes having something to do, something to worry about. Okay, Ed, I'll just forget about him. Oh, no, Johnny, Johnny, don't do that. Why, what do you mean? Got to keep him happy. Old Buzzard wouldn't hesitate to cancel out that policy in a minute. And I don't want to lose those nice big premiums. No, as long as he's asked for you, Johnny, you'd better go and see him. Hold his hand, promise him anything you like, and then you can forget him. But you go see him, Johnny. Here, I'll give you his address. Okay, Ed. Whatever you say. Democracy. Why should such a type of society and government be considered the best? For at least one very good and important reason. Because the people who choose to live in a democracy have decided that they want to be able to tell themselves how they want to work and live. People who have decided that a democratic society is the best one have taken a tip from nature. For the law of nature decrees that all men are born free and equal and are the best judges of how they wish to live. When men band together and form a society, it is their desire that the majority of them set the rules for all. This is democracy. And that is what makes democracy mankind's greatest gift, a legacy of freedom. The Fleur de Lis apartments, out on the edge of town, are the old-fashioned ultra-deluxe. A solid building of native stone built like a fortress. The two uniformed doormen looked over my credentials carefully, then told me to go on up that I was expected. The old-style elevator with its open cage was somewhere else, so I walked up the two flights, found suite number 3A, rang the bell a couple of times, then when I got no answer... Mr. Jared. Oh, now, please. Don't batter down the door. 
I beg your pardon. Wow. Standing there, just off the elevator, a purse and kind of an attache case in one hand and a suitcase in the other, was one of the most beautiful girls I have ever seen. Not just pretty, but beautiful. In her mid-twenties, I'd say. Petite, dark hair, dark brown eyes. Eyes with an amused kind of a twinkle in them. She wore a dark blue suit, cute little pillbox hat to match, dark blue shoes, white gloves. Mmm. Is there something wrong with me? I, I, oh, I beg your pardon. Well, you said that. I, uh, I guess I did. Is there something I can do for you? I'm Mrs. Jared. And that is the door of my apartment you've been knocking on, you know? I know. I, um, I came to see Mr. Jared. Oh? But why? Do you mind telling me who you are? No, I'm sorry. My name is Johnny Dollar. I represent your husband's insurance company. Oh, dear. Has Timothy been pestering you people again? Well, he called, that's all. He asked me to stop by. I might have known it. The minute I go away for a few days, the sweet old soul conjures up something to worry about. He always does. Yeah, so I understand. I've been up to Cape Ann in, in Massachusetts, trying to paint some seascapes. Oh? But I just knew he'd get himself all bothered over something or other. That's why I came back today instead of next Monday. As planned, I just got off the train. Oh, it's pretty obvious you've been traveling. Horrible traveling in this weather. I, I, I probably look a mess. Hardly. But now that I'm home, I can... <laughs> Only, what do we stand out here? If you just take this bag... Oh, yes, sir. And this little case full of paints and brushes and paper and things. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Good. Now, if I can find the keys... Ah, here we are. Oh, let me, hmm? With your hands full? <laughs> I guess you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Only, well, Mr. Dollar... Yes? Yeah? Well, before we go in, what was it this time? And you must excuse me if I gave you a kind of suspicious look when I stepped off the elevator and saw you standing here. You look nothing but charming, and you still do. You're lovely. If I didn't know you knew I am married, I'd probably have to slap your face for that. Oh, you would, would you? Just to keep up with the propriety. <laughs> well, then I would, I would blush and I would apologize and I would try to date you for the evening. Oh, méchant. <laughs> <laughs> but really, now, what was it this time, Mr. Dollar? Mr. Dollar? After getting my face slapped, verbally at least, and for only telling the truth? Oh, who is being the charmer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But seriously, Johnny, what is it this time? I mean, his reason for calling your company. I don't know, really. He just said he wanted to see me, it's all. All right, if you want to be so mysterious about it, I'll ask him myself. Just put those things anywhere, Johnny. Sure. Timothy? I'm home to Timothy. His afternoon nap, I suppose. I hope so. Oh, now, what's that supposed to mean? Shall we look for him? Of course. This way. Timothy? Timothy, dear. Maybe he stepped out for a minute. Oh, well, well, yes, I guess he must have. Timothy, are you... Oh, here you are, dear. Laurel, I don't go in there. But there he is, Johnny, asleep in his bed. Oh! Asleep? Oh, no. Oh, Johnny! <laughs> Just one solid blow behind the right ear with the heavy crystal ashtray that lay at his feet. There wasn't the least sign of a struggle of any kind. Nor was there any look of fright or surprise on his face. Obviously, somebody had simply sneaked up behind him, aimed carefully, and struck just once. He was a rather frail old man, and the one blow had been enough. Laurel I, after that first scream of anguish, sank into a chair, facing away from the body, and sobbed pitifully but quietly. Her face was pale and drawn, but even in this moment of shock, she was still beautiful. I called the police then, and during the wait for them, looked around for some clue as to who might have done this. Nothing. Nor was one of the doormen any help when I had him come up. No, sir. You were the first one to come here to see him today. You are sure of that? Yep. First it was you, and while you was going up the stairs, the missus come in and went by the elevator. There's the back entrance to the apartment, to the kitchen? Hey, yeah. But any delivery boy would have seen him, sir, as he come around the driveway up the side. Mm hmm Tell me, are there any new, any relatively new tenants in the building? Well, of course, there's that Mr. Bascom, sir. Bascom? Yes, sir, he's the newest. Yes? Come here in 1937. Oh. 
But uh, nobody uh, came here to see Mr. Jarrett today. Not until you come in, sir. And Mrs. Jarrett came back from a trip right after. Well, the fact remains that somebody got to him. Oh, Sergeant, you made good time. Hi, Johnny. Come on in, Doc. Well, Private Eye, what have you got yourself involved in this time? Looks to me like a murder. Sergeant Barney Foster is one of the most able homicide men I know. After Doc Bennett, the coroner, examined the body and was satisfied death was due to that blow on the head, that it must have occurred only minutes before I got there, he left. Sergeant Foster and I went over that place with the proverbial fine-tooth comb, but the killer had apparently left no tracks whatsoever. The only fingerprints from the last few days were those of the dead man. And that means planning, Johnny. It was carefully planned. Have you talked with Mrs. Jarrett about any possible enemies he might have had? I tried, Barney. Look at her sitting out here. I'm afraid she's just too numb by this whole thing to make very much sense. Yeah, poor kid. Better get her out of here, Johnny, to a hotel or something. Maybe to some friend's house. Even if she wants to stay? Yep. Is that an order? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, we've been over every inch of this place. All we found is nothing. Not very much of that. Whoever did it must have been somebody the old man knew, let in here himself. Even the looks of his face, the relaxed position of the body, no signs of a struggle, all bear that out, right? Can't argue with you, Barney. So, as soon as I leave, I'm going to start a rundown on everybody that she and her husband have known or ever been seen with over the last five years. I have a lad down at headquarters who's really great at that sort of stuff. Good idea. Because the fact that apparently nobody could have come up here without being seen, but... Well, now, look. Yeah? You know, you could be the one suspect in this case, Johnny. Sure. Well, I'm not kidding. You're the only one known to have come up here before Mrs. Jared got back from her trip. Of course. And the motive? Put the old man out of the way to leave a free path to his beautiful wife. You think that isn't a common enough motive? It may have been somebody's, Johnny. Well, now that I've seen and talked with her, I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, and yet? Yeah. Well? Oh, nothing, Bonnie. Building up another one of your wacky hunches, Johnny? I don't know. Well, anyhow, you get her out of here. Let her stay in a hotel or something so that nothing will be disturbed until I can come back for another look. Make sure we haven't slipped up somewhere. She can take along her luggage, can't she? Just exactly what you yourself saw with her when she stepped off that elevator. Okay. Okay. Nothing else is to be disturbed. I'll seal off the back service door and leave orders downstairs that nobody is to be admitted to the place. Okay? Okay. Okay. Except me. All right, Johnny. What is it? This hunch of yours. Barney, I kid you not. I don't know. But there is something cooking in that so-called brain of yours, isn't there? I told you, Barney. Okay, okay. But when it gels, if it gels, instead of taking things into your own hands, you call me pure. Promise. Promise? Democracy. What does it mean? The word itself is of Greek origin. Demos meaning the people and kratos meaning authority. Thus, in a democracy, the people have the authority to rule themselves. But where does the authority come from? The authority comes from the people themselves. They put it in their constitution, and the constitution can't be changed by anyone except the people. That puts the supreme power of the government of a democratic country right in the hands of the people, and the people elect their representatives to run the government. In that manner, democracy gives everyone equal representation in the government. Democracy provides mankind with its greatest legacy of freedom. I took Lorelei Jarrett over to the Statler and got her a comfortable suite of rooms. Then I called up my best girlfriend, Betty Lewis, and told her what it was all about, and Betty agreed to move in with Lorelei for a few days to make sure she wouldn't go off the deep end. Also, I hoped that Lorelei might say something, perhaps name somebody that would give me a clue to work on. And Betty, of course, promised to keep her ears open. The silly feeling I had that a hunch was coming, a hunch that I couldn't pin down, bugged me for the next two days. During that time, there was no word from Betty and nothing but silence from Sergeant Barney Foster. Half a dozen times, I was on the verge of going back to that apartment for another look. But why? To look for what? Then on the afternoon of the third day, I decided the only way to make the hunch materialize was to go back there. But not alone. Well, now, I don't know, sir. The policeman said it was all right for you to go up there, but... I'll uh... be completely responsible. 
Very well, sir. Here's the key you'll need. Thank you. Shall we? You've been terribly, terribly kind to me, Johnny. Don't you think you've deserved it, Lorimer? And Betty. Such a wonderful girl. She's been a wonderful comfort. Mm, I thought you two would get along. If you and, and Betty ever get married, I can only hope you'll be as happy as... as happy as Timothy and I were before the... <laughs> You sure you don't mind us coming back here this way? No. Anything I can possibly do to help, Johnny. You know that. I wish to heaven I knew what kind of help I need. Well, maybe if we just talk about most anything... Uh, you were up at Cape Ann, you said, hmm? Yes, sir. Sketching. Oh, it's a mighty beautiful country up there, isn't it? I'd never seen it before, only heard about it. It is beautiful. I hope I can go back again sometime and sketch and paint some more. If only Timothy had gone along with me. Yeah, this this whole thing might not have happened. Yeah, but, but he knew the salt air wouldn't agree with him. So, do you suppose, Johnny, that... It would be all right if I took some of my clothes and things as long as I'm here. I'm afraid you'd better not, Lorelei. The sergeant wants to come back here, you know. Oh, yes, sir. I vaguely remember him saying that. I'm afraid I wasn't aware of much that, that day. No, I don't blame you. Lorelei. What, Johnny? It's kind of a strange name for a nice, gentle person like you. Is it? Why? Went the legendary Lorelei the... The sirens who enticed men to their destruction? Good heavens, Johnny. Oh, I'm sorry. Tell me, did you make any sketches up there, Cape Ann? Well, yes. Lots of them. Would you like to see some of them? Very much. I know that place pretty well. Well, here they are. Right here in, in this portfolio. Oh, you leave your masterpieces lying around here in the front hall? Oh, I wish they were masterpieces. Here, now, you recognize this? Oh, sure, sure. That's the big bay on the west side of the Cape. Uh-huh. And surely you've seen this, the, the Bunny Cottage? Oh, yes. And the two windows in front that look like eyes and the <laughs> white chimneys that look like ears sticking up. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's wonderfully quaint, isn't it? And it does look like a bunny, a big white bunny. <laughs> and you were never up there before, oh, No, never. But I'll go again. Oh, no, Lorelei, I'm afraid not. What? Lorelei. Lorelei, destroyer of men. It's a fact, isn't it? What, Johnny, what makes you say a thing like that? You were the one person to benefit by your husband's death. Johnny. And the one person who could get in here with your own key in that back door without being seen by one of those doormen came in by the back way and killed him. Johnny, please, you, you don't know what you're saying. How you found out I was coming to make such a nice alibi for you, I don't know. Maybe you overheard him on the phone just before you killed him. No, no, please listen to me. Don't, don't talk this way. Then you left by the back door again. You waited when you saw me arrive, came in after me, this time by the front door. Johnny, Johnny, no, I told you. You know it. I'd just come back from Cape Ann. You know that. You, you helped me with my luggage. I helped you with a suitcase and an attache case. But you were not carrying this portfolio full of the sketches you made at Cape Ann. In other words, you had to have been in here before... Well? No, no, I, I tell you... All right. Listen. Listen to me carefully, Johnny. Yes. Yes, I did kill him. I killed him. Because he was an egotistical, self-centered, crazy old man. Because of the money. Millions, Johnny. Millions of dollars. To play with. To have fun with. Enjoy life. Listen, Johnny, you and I, with all that wonderful money, just the two of us, Johnny. Nice try, Lorelei. But not this time. Oh, why do they do it? Why don't they learn? Don't they know it won't work? That sooner or later they're bound to be found out. And why a lovely little thing like Lorelei? Lorelei, destroyer of men. Expense account total? Oh, who wants it? 
Who wants anything out of a case like this? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Rita Lloyd as Lorelei, Sam Gray as Sergeant Barney Foster, Herb Duncan as Ed Williams, Arthur Cole as Timothy Jared, and Guy Rep as the doorman. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman. There's a welcome voice. Uh -huh. Hi, Earl. How are things down there in nice, warm, sunny Florida? Nice and warm and sunny. Oh, it's a lot more than you can say for up here in New England. We've just been hit over the head with a cold, wet spell, and anybody as wants it can have it. Well, what's even more important, Johnny, the fishing is red hot. Okay, all you have to do is cook up some excuse for me to hire myself down there on expense account. How about it? Well, I can try. Let's see now. Well... One broken ankle. What? I said one badly busted ankle. You think that'll do for it? For what? The excuse you want to come down here and take over a little chore I'd handle myself except for this bum ankle of mine. Earl, if you really have a broken ankle, I'm sorry to hear it. I really have. What is this little chore that you're talking about? A visit to one of our clients lives down the road a piece. You want me all the way down there just to call on a client? Why not? Well, you think the home office would okay all my expenses just for that? When I remind them of all the thousands, maybe millions you saved them over the years? Here, why here. <laughs> just a call on a client, huh? Honor bright. Well, I don't believe it, Earl. There's something fishy about this. Now, you know me better than to say a thing like that, Johnny. You mean I know you just well enough. <laughs> Not once have I gone down there supposedly to fish without running into a burglary or embezzlement, arson, murder, mayhem, or what have you, and been lucky to get back here in one piece. So come on, Earl, come clean. What is it this time? I told you, Johnny. Okay, okay. I guess there's only one way for me to find out. Good. I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company Branch Office in Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wrong one matter. <laughs> Expense count item one, 8770 for a cab to Bradley Field, then plane fare to New York to Tampa to Sarasota. Item two, three dollars for a taxi to the office on Main Street that Earl Pullman shares with Don Boomhauer, a prominent realtor in those parts. Earl, the lower part of his right leg in a plaster cast and a crutch under his arm, hobbled around pretty uncomfortably. Sit down, huh? Are you kidding? That's all I've been doing now for nearly two weeks, ever since the doc put this blasted cast on my ankle. Earl, uh, would you like me to autograph it like the kids do? No, thanks. <laughs> Seriously, Johnny, this darn thing has been driving me nearly crazy. I don't doubt it, Earl. I'm awfully sorry. Sitting around the house, doing nothing day after day, and Mike having to play nursemaid to me all the time. 
Uh, do you know this is the first day I've even been down here at the office? How is Mike? Be sure to give her my love, huh? Well, give it to her yourself. You'll be staying with us, you know. Fine. Anyhow, I suddenly got the idea that if you'd come down here and run the boat, well, we could go out in the Gulf, tie into some whoppers, and maybe it'd take my mind off this thing for a change. You know something, Earl? That is the best idea you have had in years. Yeah, well, I didn't think you'd object too strenuously. <laughs> that talk about a job for me to do while I'm here was just a bluff. Not a bit of it. Here, help me to sit down, will you? Sure, sure. Right, just, just take it easy now, now old man. Now, now don't give me that. Oh, you... you... all right, all right. Uh, I got it. I got the crutch here. I'll, I'll set it right here. There we are. Now, in the corner of the desk, that letter, you see it? This one? Yeah. Mailed only yesterday. You call this a letter? On a piece of wrapping paper? Read it, Johnny, if you can. Well, I can try. Dear... Dear, double E-R. Dear Mr... P-U-R-E. Pure man? Never mind the spelling. He means poor man. I hope so. You know, anybody who thought of you as being pure would be out of his mind, Earl. Oh, okay, okay. So you made a funny... No, I was absolutely serious. Okay, just forget the bad spelling and translate the best you can. All right. Dear Mr. Poor Man, if your company don't want to pay off my insurance real quick... Come see me real quick. Account of my... My pal... B-L-E-A-K. Bleak. Blake. Johnny Waldo Blake is beneficiary. Oh. On account of my pal Blake is a way... What? Gatorin. 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 And can't help me, so you better hurry. S-I-N... Signed. Mr... Emmett? Emmett Dennery, the client I mentioned over the phone. Ooh, I'll say this for your Mr. Emmett Dennery. He is no mental giant. Well, he is still a client. How much of a policy, Earl? Two thousand, straight life. Two thousand? That's a lot of money to some people. Well, I know it is, but is it enough to justify my expenses all the way from Hartford? Well, now you know the real reason why you're here. Ah, you are a good man. Who is the Earl? What's this letter mean? Johnny, Mr. Emmett Dennery is a client I've never even seen. All I know about him is what Pete Fisher told me. Fisher? Yeah, he held down this office before I took over. He died two or three years ago. Oh? Well, anyway, Emmett Dennery and his pal, Waldo Blake, were a couple of old crackers lived down in the swamps, down the Everglades. Mm Mm-hmm. Apparently, they scrape out a living, trapping and killing animals, and then selling the hides. Anyway, it looks like Emmett's pal is away somewhere, gator. Uh, that means after alligators. I thought it was illegal to kill alligators in this state. Well, sure it is. Anyhow, Emmett wants somebody to go to see him. Well, here you are. We can justify your expense account to the company. And after you've paid your little visit to him, you and I can do some serious fishing. Okay? Well, it sounds to me as though he's pretty scared of something. You know, it's, uh, you know, this part here. If your company don't want to pay off my insurance real quick... <laughs> Only thing he needs to be scared of, Johnny, is a game warden. I'd bet on it. I wonder. Do you know where he lives? Well, here, I can show you. On this map, the Fisher had the foresight to pin on the policy. Uh, here you are. You call this a map? Here. here. Sarasota. I'd never know it. And there's Fort Myers, so this has to be the main highway, the Tamiami Trail. Mm-hmm. And this, well, maybe it's only a wagon track right into the Everglades. And right here is where Emmett's supposed to live. Think you can find it? Well, I can try. Okay. Now, you take my car, drive me home, and then get on your way. And as soon as you get back here, if it's still daylight... Earl. Yeah. If I remember right, this Everglades country can be pretty dangerous in spots for uh, somebody who doesn't know his way around. Oh, oh, you make out all right. You did the time before, didn't you? Oh, sure, sure. So, what do you got to worry about? You tell me. Yes, on my previous expedition into the Everglades, I had made out all right. But that time, I'd had a guide, a young Indian boy by the name of Ben Osceola. Which, by the way, brings up an interesting point. 
Nearly all the Indians who inhabit that section of swamp call themselves Osceola. It's a long, famous name among the members of the Seminole tribe. At any rate, if I could find him again... And uh, according to the map Earl had given me, the chances were pretty good. So, after dropping Earl off at his home on Oyster Bay and staging an impromptu, passionate love scene with his wife, Mike, who is a living doll, and Earl on his crutch couldn't do a thing about it anyway except howl with pretended rage, I got behind the wheel and headed south on 41, the Tamiami Trail. At Fort Myers, I turned left on 82 into the Everglades and headed right into the middle of the big Cypress Swamp country. A few miles below Sunnyland, I found a pair of wagon tracks that the map had shown barely passable in the car I was driving. But this was all to my liking because I was in the same part of the swamp that I'd been in once before during the previous assignment. There in a clearing on the edge of a sort of a bayou was a little unpainted house. And from it a tall, husky young Indian emerged. And his hands, aimed straight at the car and at me, was a 30-30 rifle. Wait a minute. Aren't you Ben? Ben Osceola? You call me Ben? Sure. Don't you remember me? Mr. Johnny. That's right. Johnny Dower. Remember? Yes. Our old friend. I welcome you, Mr. Johnny. Well, thank you. It's nice to see you again, Ben. And I wonder if, if you can help me again. If I can, Mr. Johnny, I will be glad to. Ben, I'm looking for a man by the name of Emmett Dennery. You, uh, want to see that old man? Yes. Does he still live around here somewhere? So far as I know. Well, good. But he is not our friend. Oh? You Indian people, uh, been having some trouble with him? No, but we have nothing to do with him. Why is that, then? Because he and the other, the one they call Lefty, Will that be Waldo Blake? Yes, Lefty Blake. What about him? They do not obey the law. They take much game they should not take. They live and hunt on our land. Our Seminole land. I see. Ben, um, have your people been getting rough with them? No, Mr. Johnny. But we stay far away from them. We do not wish to soil our hands or minds by any contact with them. They are taboo. What you're saying, then, is that if somebody is bothering Dennery, it is not your people. That is right. And you say that in spite of the way you seem to feel about him? Yes, Mr. Johnny. When did you last see him, Ben? Many years ago, as a child. At least I think it was. How do you mean? They looked so much alike that few could tell them apart. Oh? I see. Ben, if you still have an airboat that can ride out over this swamp, have you? Back of my house. Well, can I hire you to take me to where Emma Dennery lives? No, Mr. Johnny. No? I must not go there. It's taboo among my people. I see. Um, well, look, uh, just just look here now, uh, Ben. If this, uh, this map means anything, it can't be too far from here. And you can take my airboat yourself. All right. And I'll pay you for it. Well, that is not necessary. Oh, it is as far as I'm concerned. Here you are. Uh, would 20 be enough? Thank you. You will buy many shoes for my children. Well, I'm glad, Ben. Uh, you can give me some directions. Uh, this map, I'm afraid, isn't too good. Oh, yes. I am sorry I cannot go with you, Mr. Johnny. Well, it... It might be better if I could. What do you mean by that, Ben? From what I have heard about these men, you must be very careful. Every ride, one of those airboats, it's a flat-bottomed aluminum hull about 12 feet long, and the bow is squared off instead of coming to a point. Two precarious little seats are propped up high in the middle of it, and at the back is a motor with an airplane propeller. They're safe, all right, but, but tricky, if you know what I mean. 
Anyhow, I climbed aboard and took off. And brother, I mean took off. It's quite a ride, believe me. That that half planing, half skipping over the shallow water. Perched up there on the spindly seat, I, I kept waiting for it to flip as I tore on out across the bayou, then wove my way through a network of narrow little rivers, over spots that in some places were nothing more than wet swamp grass. No wonder an ordinary underwater propeller couldn't be used. The darn thing would be hung up in the weeds and grass in no time. Every now and then I had to swerve quickly to avoid a half-submerged log. Or was it a huge alligator? There were more rattlesnakes and cottonmouth moccasins out there than I'd ever seen before. All sorts of animal life and thousands of birds that rose in alarm as I fairly plowed through them. Finally, I came to a couple of acres of high ground, of brush and trees that stuck out like an island there in the middle of the swamp. At one end of it was a decrepit old clabbered shack, surrounded by row after row of drying frames with skins on them, mostly the hides of raccoons and alligators, curing in the sun. There was no one around. At least there was no one inside. As I beached the airboat as close to it as possible, jumped off, and headed for the old cabin. I wondered if Emmett Dennery, like his pal Lefty Blake, was somewhere out in that swamp, gatoring, collecting game. The reason Dennery had given in his letter for being alone, for needing help. I didn't have to wonder for long. Mr. Dennery? Mr. Dennery? Anybody here? Hello? Well, let's see now. Oh, good. Seems to be open. A dank, fetid odor met me as I pushed open the rickety door into the dark, windowless, one-room shack. It was almost nauseating. And after the bright sunshine outdoors, it took my eyes nearly a, nearly a minute to see anything in that dark, gloomy interior. There was no covering on the floor except the dirt, of which there was plenty. For a table and chairs, there was nothing but old crates and boxes clumsily nailed together. On one side, near the door, was a beat-up old wood stove with half a dozen filthy pots and pans at one end of it and a stack of dishes, long unwashed. As I half stumbled over an old rusty bread box lying on the floor, a huge rat scurried out of it and ran out the door. I wondered what sort of slovenly so-called humans could possibly live in such miserable, reeking squalor. Then I noticed the ragged draperies hanging across the far end as a sort of divider for the room. I felt that even to touch them would be to contaminate myself, but nonetheless I pulled them aside. There, on a rude cot dressed in tattered jeans, a dirty shirt, and a pair of high-top lace boots, lay the body of a man. I'm no expert at such things, but even a cursory examination told me that he'd been dead for several days. There was a torn, grimy coverlet on the floor, and I started to pick it up to lay it gently over him. And... Don't you move now, mister. What? Unless you want me to blow your head off. Whether you move or not, I think I'm doing it anyhow. Hi, sports fans. This is Pat Summerall, glad to be back with the frost on the pumpkin and other signs of the football season. Monday through Saturday nights on this CBS radio network station. Let's join forces for a sports time rundown on the grid scene and the other major sports. Don't forget now, every night but Sunday, this is your address for sports time, presenting all the latest in the world of sports. The name of the game, again, sports time, right here.
When I heard the voice in back of me coming from the doorway of the old cabin, I half turned, reaching for my gun, but I found myself staring into the barrel of an ancient high-powered rifle with the hammer of it pulled into firing position. And in back of that gun, one of the most disreputable-looking characters I've ever seen. He was about 60, I'd say, maybe five feet three or four, a wrinkled, weather-beaten face, scraggly, dirty gray beard. He was dressed in khaki pants and shirt so badly worn it was the one they held together on his wiry little frame, and his eyes peering out from under the remains of an old army hat under long, bushy eyebrows reminded me of the eyes of a snake. And there was a hint of madness in them. You got a gun. I've seen you reach for it. You just turn around now and keep your hands up real high. Sure. Why not? I'll take it now. That gun of yours. Like right, right this. Well? Mm-hmm. Hey, is this a pretty one? I'm glad you like it. Now, you, you sit down right there on the floor. Beside this? Yes, sir, beside him. Count of you the one that killed him, ain't you? No, that's where you're wrong, old timer. Sit down. You see this gun? Sit down. I guess I have no choice, have I? You've got no choice. Okay. On right. it. With both your hands, you keep them flat on the floor now. Go on. You're holding the gun. I know. Stay out in the swamp too long. All week I stay out in that swamp. I come back here to find my pal. Find you killed him. You killed him at dinner. Now, wait a minute. Yeah, so, so, so now... No, now I, I said, wait a you. minute. I kill now, you. You take a good look at that body and you'll see that he's been dead for days. Four or five days at the least. You say that. Now, shut up. So this is Emmett Dennery, hmm? Yes, sir, my pal. You're Waldo Blake? I'm Waldo Blake. Well, then you're his beneficiary. I be his what? You mean to tell me you didn't know Emmett carried a lot of insurance? He never tell me that. All right, then you listen to me. Well, sure, I listen. But, uh... Don't you move from here now. Look, I'm from the insurance company. Emmett Dennery's life was insured for $2,000. And if you're Lefty Blake, that money goes to you. We $2,000? $2,000. But uh, I, I know you're really from the insurance. Would you like to see the money? Uh-huh. All right, then. Here. Uh, you be careful now. All right. All right. I still got this gun right on you. All right, here, here now. You, you just look through this wallet and see for yourself. You just drop it gentle on the floor. All right. Now go ahead. Count the money. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Only, uh, only look, look. You ain't got no two thousand here. You ain't got you ain't no boy. You ain't got no gun no more. Let go me. I know. Say that. Right there in the corner, you crazy old coot, and don't move. Uh, now, 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 you listen. Now, you listen to me, and for your sake, I hope a coroner's examination doesn't show this man was murdered. Murdered? Yes, because you'd be the only suspect. No, no, I, I, I never killed him. I didn't. I, I didn't. Well, frankly, I don't think you did either. It was probably a natural death. Well, yes, it, it really was. It, it really was. You're sure of that? Well, oh, what I mean is... Yes, you're sure, all right. That's what gave you the big idea, isn't it? You just couldn't miss a chance at that $2,000 insurance that you've been paying on all these years. Me? Yes, you. I knew there was something wrong the minute I saw this body because of that letter to the insurance office. Because it was only mailed yesterday, wasn't it? Well, how, sh- uh, how should I know? Stop bluffing now. It's a little late for that. That letter signed Emma Denry asking somebody to come out here was mailed only yesterday. But you know as well as I do, this man has been dead for two, three times that long. In other words, you wrote that letter. And I hope we'd come out here and pay you off on the so-called death of Emmett. No, no. Sure, no. with the two of you no. living out here alone, cut off from the rest of the world, nobody really ever sees you. You figured nobody know it was really Lefty. Lefty Blake who had died. You you can't prove it's Waldo. Can I? Well, let's see now. For a starter, uh... Well, let's take the laces on his high-top boots. Huh? The way they're tied, the direction of the knot. You ever see a right-handed man who tied a left-handed bow knot like this one? Let's see what else we can find. No, no, that's, that's, that's enough. But don't you see? After all the years of me paying out on that insurance, ha- having Waldo die first... Nobody else to leave it to. You could have cashed in that policy legitimately and probably have got back most of what you put into it. But now, after the switch you've tried... Oh, me. What'll they do to me now? For attempted fraud? 
Bloody. But that's up to the company. Oh, Lordy, what, what, what will they do to me? You better come along with me and find out. Emmett Dennery. <laughs> Like I said to the old rascal, it's up to the company now. As for the total on my expense account, uh, well, let's wait until I can sort up the cost of all the fishing we're going to do. Okay? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. our star to tell you about next week's story. Before I do that, I'd like to extend a word of welcome to a new radio station joining the CBS radio network today. It's WNEB Worcester, Mass. An important new link in our coast-to-coast family of CBS radio network stations. For WNEB listeners starting with this broadcast, a Sunday workout with us, and throughout the week, the listening only the CBS radio network has to offer. Welcome. WNEB Worcester. Next week, a fishing guide who turns out to be a guide to murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced by Bruno Zerato Jr., directed by Edward Oates, music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Martin Blaine as Earl Poorman, Bill Lipton as Ben, Jim Bowles as The Man. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. History from where it breaks nightly in the world tonight on the CBS Radio Network. This is WROW Music, Albany, New York. Do you know a new family just moving to your neighborhood? Welcome Wagon would love to welcome them. Welcome Wagon helps all new neighbors to feel welcome and wanted here in the Capital District. Each gracious Welcome Wagon hostess brings baskets of gifts from Tri-City Merchants. She brings greetings from the community to these newcomers, answers questions everyone wants to know about the Tri-Cities. You can make sure your new neighbors benefit from Welcome Wagon service. Just call State 59640 and give the Welcome Wagon hostess the name and address of your new neighbors. She'll call on them and present them with a basket of gifts from civic-minded businessmen. You'll be helping your neighbor and your Welcome Wagon hostess who carries on this valuable community service. In the Albany Troy Schenectady metropolitan area, call State 59640. That's State 59640 for Welcome Wagon. Johnny Dollar. Oh, I beg your pardon. This is Earl Poorman's residence. Well, it better be. Who's that, Earl? Who else? Now, listen, Johnny. What's the idea I... sneaking out of the house on me this way and at the crack of dawn. Where are you, Earl? Down here at my office. What? Well, why not? I thought you and I were going fishing this well, morning. We are. We are. Now, look, when you got down here to Sarasota, when was it? A week ago today? That's right. And you well, promised me this was one trip to Florida for nothing but fishing. Well, now, Johnny, So what happened? I wasn't here more than 15 minutes before you had me involved. Well, I know. And as soon but as I the... cleared it up, what happened? You turned on a few days of windy, rainy weather, and all I can do is sit no, here. Well, you listen to The one to me. sunny day you picked to spend there in your office, my pal. Did I say I've come down here to work? What else? Well, now, you, uh, you remember that item in the Herald Tribune the other day about your being here? Yes, and the one in the evening paper and the blurb on WSPB, and I thank you for the publicity. All right. Well, what has that got to do with the weather and the fishing? Well, I said, will you listen to me? Okay. And it better be good. Well, it is, and you're going to love it. Now, all that publicity you just mentioned, as every fishing guide within miles make an office to take you out on the Gulf, you know, to prove to you once and for all that the fishing down here is just as good as Todd Swam and his Chamber of Commerce advertised. So? So I came down here to look over these offers and decide which one we'd take advantage of today, now that the weather's cleared. And have you? I have. Old Captain Barney B. Good. He runs a half-baked fishing camp down at Lemon Bay and is not only a good skipper, but he happens to be a client, a policyholder. Uh-huh. And he guarantees to find us snook, sea trout, blues, bonito, pompano, kings, anything you want. 
So if you'll hop into my car and pick me up, we'll be on our merry way. Now, you're sure there isn't some teeny little unimportant insurance matter that maybe I'd better just kind of look into before we head for the briny deep? No, sir, Johnny, I swear it. I promise. Cross my heart and hope to die. Well, you coming? Okay. I'm coming. But if he tries to get me involved in another mess... <laughs> The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company branch office in Sarasota, Florida, where I thought I had gone for a few days of fishing. But following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Guide to Murder Matter. Expense account item one. Well, after all, as long as I was on expense account, why not be nice about it? So item one is 4.38 to fill up the gas tank on Earl Poorman's fancy air-conditioned car. Five minutes later, I walked in on him at the office. All right. Come on, Johnny. Help me up on my crutch, and we'll go fishing. I'm with you. Captain Barney Beale down there at Lemon Bay was quite a character. About 65, I'd say. Tall, lean, and wiry, and his skin tanned to the color of cordovan. His deep-set eyes were that peculiar bluish gray that made you wonder if they were looking right on through you, and sharp enough to spot a seagull diving after bait a half a mile away. His boat, the Barney B, looked as well weathered as he did, and the faded lettering across the stern showed the old craft had come from Gloucester Mass, which helped to account for his speech. Instead of a southern drawl, it was pure New England. Yeah, born in New Hampshire, Mr. Dollar. But I learned my sea fishing down off the Cape. Cape Cod, Captain? Yes, sir. Off the George's bank and the dang tuck of shoulders. To bet it's the kind of instinct in a man it does. Well, I hope that instinct's working today. It hasn't failed me yet. Not in all the seven years I've been a-guiding down here to this country. Now you see that long stretch up ahead with the mangrove islands on either side. Yep. Snook Alley, they call it. Now then, let's see if we can hook up one or two. One or two, we took no less than seven fighting snook out of that spot and all of them over ten pounds. Then out in the gulf, there were Pompano and Jacks and Kings and just about everything else you can think of. By mid-afternoon, I was completely and happily exhausted from hauling him in. Earl, meantime, had laid himself across the floor and slept. So we went on back to the dock, selected a couple of nice Pompano to take home, then trudged wearily over to where I'd parked Earl's car. That's a mighty pretty car you got there, Mr. Foreman. Oh, a lot of good it's doing me these days with this busted ankle. Having to depend on Johnny here, the speed demon, to get me around. <laughs> Not more fancy than my old Maxwell it is. Did you say Maxwell? Yep. Drove it all the way down here from New Hampshire, and I did. 1922 Maxwell. And it's still running? Yep. Had it up to Venice after groceries just a week ago last Saturday. You'd like to see it? I sure would. Earl, would you mind waiting? No. Go ahead, Johnny. Right over here in the garage, Mr. Dollar. 1922, hmm? Yep. And the finest car I ever owned. Hmm. Time to think of it. The only one. Real cheap to run, too. That's why I keep it. Now then, here we are. Here now. Well, sir, there's it. My, oh, my, Mr. Dollar. Who is he? What's happened to him? The he that Captain Barney spoke of was slumped there in the front seat of the ancient Maxwell. His face against the wheel and turned in our direction. The face was gray. A mask of death. <laughs> Proud we are, we being the CBS Radio Network, to be able to bring you on this station each weekday the songs of Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney. 
In addition to the sparkling Bing Crosby Rosemary Clooney show, we're equally delighted to present at this same time each weekday the assorted talents of Art Linkletter, the house party man, Gary Moore and Derwood Kirby, and the rousing Arthur Godfrey time. There's no business like show business, and nowhere else such a fine sampling of same than on this blockbuster CBS Radio Network Entertainment Fest. The nicest thing about it is, should you miss any or all of these great stars on a Monday, you can catch right up with them the next day, or any weekday you're so minded. Remember, nowhere else can you enjoy, each and every weekday, the Bing Crosby Rosemary Clooney Show, the conversational gifts of Gary Moore and his foil, Derwood Kirby, the kids' comedy and cut-ups of Art Linkletter's house party, and the air of glee with gusto that's a specialty of Arthur Godfrey time. A quick examination of the body made it pretty evident that the man, whoever he was, had died of carbon monoxide poisoning. What's more, the ignition switch of the old Maxwell was in the on position. The gasoline gauge said empty. More important, I could find no marks on the body that might have indicated a struggle of any kind. My, my, Mr. Dollar, this is a terrible thing. Terrible? Do you know who he is, Captain Barney? No, can't say I ever saw him before in my life. But he's certainly dead, isn't he? He's certainly dead. Handsome man, too. Can't be more than maybe 50, 55 years of age. Mm Mm-hmm. Ah, look at that beautiful head of hair. Ah, nice clothes, too, yeah. You better not touch him. Oh, don't you worry about that. When did you say you last used this car of yours, Captain? A week ago, last Saturday. Did you fill the gas tank then by any chance? Yep, filled it up the top. You see, huh? Empty now. Yes. And the garage has been locked ever since? Ever since, Mr. Dollar. Nobody else but me has a key for it. Ah, but now, look here, sir. Don't touch anything, Captain. Oh, I won't. I won't, sir. I won't. You see here? Latch on this window is open. Let's see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See these spider webs all over it, though. So this must be the way that he got in to, uh, to do this to himself. I, uh, I know that I should have always kept the keys in the scar. Captain, do you have any idea who the coroner is for this neck of the woods? Yep. Old Dr. Hill lives over to this side of Cape Martin. Then you better call him. Have him get over here right away. Yes, sir. Do that right away. And ask Mr. Poorman to come in and have a look. Yeah, I'm oh. right here, Johnny. Earl? That's all excitement. Look for yourself there behind the wheel of the old Maxwell. Hmm? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> been dead? Well, sir, Mr. Dollar, I'd say about a uh, day. I see. Or maybe two. Oh? Or maybe even three. Mm. So for the sake of the record, I'll say it's been uh, two days. Yes, sir. And the cause? Well, exactly what you said, Mr. Dollar. Carbon monoxide poisoning. No question of it, sir. That's what it is. That's what I'll put on a certificate. Any idea about who he might be, Doctor? No. And I'll tell you this, sir. There's no patient of mine would ever commit suicide this way. You're sure it's suicide? Well, well, of course it is. You don't see any marks on the body to indicate otherwise, do you? No. Well, of course you don't. But I assume you'll do an autopsy anyway, won't you? Autopsy? No, sir. No need for it. No need for it at all. No. I'll be on my way. Oh, just one minute, Doctor. Now, you just stop worrying about it, Mr. Dollar. I'll have the boys come along over here and pick him up and take him to the morgue at Cape Martin, where I keep my office, and anybody wants to claim him, all well and good. Well, just the same, sir. If I... nobody claims him, why, uh, they'll see that he gets a decent burial in the potter's field. And that'll be that. So you just stop worrying about him, huh? Okay. You're the doctor. That's right. <laughs> good day. Good day, Mr. Poorman. Captain Barnett. Bye, Doctor. Bye, Doctor. Good day, Doctor. Well, Mr. Dollar. You're absolutely sure you don't recognize him, Captain Barney, now that you've had another look at him? Absolutely certain, Mr. Dollar. Well, I know he isn't any client of ours, so uh, the doctor says, Johnny, why worry yourself about it? No point in it. Yes, yes, maybe you're right, Earl. Sure, leave it up to local police if there is anything to investigate. And you don't really think there is, I hope. (laughs) 
Uh, come on, come on, Johnny. Let's get on back to Sarasota before you start trying to blame me for getting you involved in something. Earl, why don't you and Captain Barney load those fish into the car? Hmm? While well, I take just one more look at this. Instead of wasting time on further examination of the body, I went back for another look at the window that Captain Barney had pointed out where the dead man had apparently made his entry, carefully closing it after him. One of the panes was a brand new one, put in only recently. By whom? And why? There were several shards of glass from the old pane there on the floor, so I picked up one of them, cleaned it very carefully, and then by the simple expedient of moistening the corpse's hands, took a set of fingerprints. Then I joined the others at the car. Well, at least let me pay you something for the trip today. Not a bit of it. Oh, I thank you, Mr. Foreman. It was a pleasure and a privilege to be a guide for a famous man like Mr. Dollar. Writ up in all them papers and all, and on the radio. Well, we're certainly much obliged then, aren't we, Johnny? Of course. Next time, I'll have to make my regular charge. Well, don't you worry, Captain Barney. We'll be down here again. Right. Maybe very soon. That was a fine way down to Pleasant Day. But I told you I'd get you some good fishing, Johnny. And if you meant that about coming down here again, I'm all for it. Of course, that means you'll have to stick around a bit longer than you may have planned, because tomorrow I thought we might take my boat out and maybe just... just... Johnny? Hmm? You listening? Oh, no, of course, sir. Um, see Captain Barney again, you said. Oh, well, that's uh, almost what I said. Look, what's bothering you, anyway? You mean maybe the kind of casual way that he took the finding of that body in his own garage? Among other things. Hey, wait a minute. We better go back there again. We forgot to look and see if there was a wallet or any papers or anything to identify. No, the doctor and I both looked very carefully. There was nothing. Well, I suppose a suicide wouldn't want anybody to know who he was. That's wrong, Earl. Most suicides practically advertise their identities, and almost all of them leave a note of some kind. But if you're thinking in terms of murder, Johnny... Are you? I'm not sure yet. But you said yourself there were no marks on the body or anything like that. I know. None that showed. If only that old Dr. Hill would make an autopsy after I find out who that body belongs to. Oh, now, look, Johnny, what's the point of it? And you're supposed to be down here on vacation, and you're supposed to... T- what? what? What's the matter? What the devil is that you have in your pocket? Oh, careful, Earl. It's a little piece of window glass I picked up on the floor of the garage. A little piece of what? Who knows? Maybe it'll give us the key to a murder. Back in Sarasota, after leaving Earl at his home on Oyster Bay, I drove into police headquarters. The man I went to see was another Barney, Lieutenant Barney Phillips. He'd been of tremendous help to me many times before, and I knew that he would be again if he could. Why, sure, Johnny. Be glad to cooperate. All we can, all of us. But aren't you kind of shooting in the dark on this one? Well, maybe and maybe not. The point is that unless the police down there show a little more interest than old Dr. Hill... Look, if you can have your lab crew photograph the prints that I have on this sheet of glass... Will you? Well, then send them on to Washington? Yeah. It might take a little time, Johnny, to get a report back on them. Good. I'll spend it profitably. Fishing. It was two days later that Lieutenant Phillips called and asked me to drop in on him again. Yes, sir, your suicide had a record all right, Johnny. His name was Maury Spencer. Maury Spencer? Yes, sir, he used to operate up in New England along the coast, dealing mostly in fishing boats. I see. Haven't heard from him, or uh, well, that means he hasn't been uh, caught in trouble, though, for a couple of years. And you said dealing in fishing boats, hmm? Racket as old as the sea itself. He'd steal a boat, sneak it into a yard, repaint it, and disguise it pretty well, and pass it off on some sucker who thought he's getting a bargain. Must mm-hmm. well, have been pretty active, too, because, well, he sure had enough aliases. Now, you look at this. Maury Spencer, alias Spencer Morrison, alias Rusty Spangler, alias Baldy Spangler, alias... Did you say Baldy? Oh, here. I completely forgot to show you this picture of him. This man, your suicide? What? Well, there, uh, there is some resemblance here, but, um, 
I'm uh, not sure. I see a little bald spot on top of his head. I'm good. Well, now, look, Johnny. If those prints were his, this has to be him. Of course. It's plastic surgery. What? If he had the record you say he had, why not plastic surgery? Well, sure, an awful lot of crooks have done it, you know. Now, wait a minute, though. Here in the picture, this this bald spot, that body had bushy hair all over his head. Well, I never heard of plastic surgery for that. Captain Barney even went so far as to mention it himself, that nice head of hair. Okay, Lieutenant, thanks a lot. Well, where to now, Johnny? Maybe to prove that suicide was a murder. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, sure. You can look at him again, but uh, there's not much point in it any more than there is in the autopsy you suggested. Yeah, right in here. Hope you don't mind the cold in this place. <laughs> Where's the light switch? Right here, sir. Mm-hmm. No, sir, an autopsy would be just a waste of time. Would it? Uh, which drawer, Doctor? Uh, right here. Well, well, let's see now. Hey, hey, there's no point in you trying to pull the hair off his head. Isn't there? Well, look, Doctor. Oh, great day. This man had himself a top piece. That's right. A small toupee, just big enough to cover that little bald spot. But it's such a good one. Do you see what's under it, Doctor? Well, that's a hole. That's a wound there in the skull, like from an ice pick or something. Or maybe from the point of a gaff. A gaff hook of the sort of big game fisherman would use. It could be. Or a fishing guide, and it wouldn't necessarily have killed him instantly, would it? In that particular spot? Well, no, sir, unless it was deeper than this seems to be, but it certainly would have rendered him unconscious. Yes, so that he could be propped up in that old car, the engine turned on, the garage closed up, and the actual death would be as you said it was, due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Why, yes, sir. Okay. How would you like to round up a couple of the boys on your police force and have them follow us? Yes, sir. Us, Mr. Don? Well, Earl Perman's with me, waiting outside in the car. But follow you to where, sir? Well, I thought we might take a little run down to Lemon Bay again. To see Captain Barney. <laughs> It really was a murder. I'm afraid so, Earl. So help me though, Johnny, I never can figure what makes you suspicious in some of these cases. Well, there are half a dozen things, Earl. Captain Barney himself, for instance. Oh, well, how do you mean? The old shack he lives in. Falling apart at the seams. Broken windows filled up with cardboard, and it probably hasn't been painted since he moved in. Yes. Even his old wreck of a boat, in spite of the fact he depends on it for a living, held together with bailing wire. And his car, that old Maxwell. Do you see what I'm getting at, Earl? No, but go on. He doesn't spend a cent that he doesn't absolutely have to. Oh, no, I get the message. So he's not the type to be giving anything away, not even a fishing trip. Right. Unless he has a purpose. In this case, he wanted me around so there wouldn't be any suspicion of him, even when he led me to that corpse on the excuse of showing me the old car. And he's the one who brought up the subject of cars, remember? Yes, you're right, but even so, Jim, Other I... things, too. In spite of the way that he neglects the house and the boat and the car, he was very careful to replace the broken glass in the window of the garage to seal it up. Why? To hold in the exhaust fumes after he turned on that engine. Well, that's enough for me. I I suppose I should have known I couldn't fool a smart young fellow like you, Mr. Dollar. I don't think you really could have fooled anybody for long, Captain Barney. No. Maybe not. Kind of, I guess I didn't reckon on my conscience. And oh, dear. How it's been the torture in me. Yes, I kind of thought it would be. Seemed like such a smart idea. Having you around when I made out that I discovered his body. Such a good way to keep anybody from thinking that I could have done it. I guess I just forgot that... I would always know. Why did you kill him, Captain? Felt I had to, Mr. Dollar. When I thought of all the people he hurt, when I knowed him down east, that is, up to New England, all the fine old fishing men erupt 
and cheated, and then sweet-talked his way out of it, time after time. Then, when he come down here, as bold and brazen as he ever was, when he showed the nerve to suggest that I helped him in his filthy work. Well, don't you see, Mr. Dollar, somebody had to stop him. Somebody had to keep him from hurting all the nice, fine people that I've gotten to know hereabouts. Well, I guess I done the wrong thing, didn't I? Yes, Captain Barney, I'm afraid you did. Like everybody who tries to take the law into his own hands. The police will be here in a few minutes. Shall we go out and meet him? Yeah. Guess we'd better. I don't know. Who am I to judge? But I hope they handle the old fellow as gently as possible in spite of what he did and must pay for. Expense account total? Well, this time it's only plain fare and incidentals for the trip back to Hartford. Call it 85 bucks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a city held at bay by a single man with a time bomb. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Ivor Francis as Captain Barney Beale, Ian Martin as Earl Poorman, Lawson Zerby as Dr. Hill, and Jim Bowles as the police lieutenant. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hanna speaking. Complete, the most complete news in broadcasting, is CBS News on the CBS radio network. At row 59 on your Tri-Cities dial, this is WROW Music in Albany, New York. Many merchants and businessmen of the Capital District offer you expert services and a complete line of fine products. When you shop, we hope you patronize the civic-minded stores and institutions that display the Welcome Wagon sponsor emblem. That emblem identifies the prestige firms who are playing a vital part in the life of our community through their sponsorship of Welcome Wagon service. When the Welcome Wagon hostess pays a call, her basket contains a gift from each of these progressive firms along with a warm greeting to the newcomers. In this way, the Welcome Wagon sponsors help to extend the welcome of the whole community to the family in its new home. If you have new neighbors, call State 59640 and give their name and address to Welcome Wagon. And if you have any question concerning Welcome Wagon service, remember that number, State 59640. It's the Welcome Wagon number. WROW Music Time, 6.35 p.m. Johnny Dollar. Dollar, my name is Parnell. Hank Parnell. I live out here in Muddy Gap, Wyoming. Mr. Parnell. You just call me Hank. All right, Hank. What did you say the name of your city is? City? Why, it's only a little town, Dollar. Muddy Gap, Wyoming. Muddy what? Well, just what it sounds like. Muddy Gap. Muddy Gap. I see. Yeah, due west of Casper, south of Powder River. It's not too far from where the Poison Spider Creek begins. You look it up on a map, and, well, here we are. All right, I'll look it up, but uh, what seems to be your problem, Hank? Oh, Dollar, I'm the owner and editor and reporter and, well, just about everything else in Muddy Gap Weekly Tribune. Yes? I'm also the only agent for at least 50 miles around here for the Great Southwest Insurance Company. Oh, I see. Yes, sir. Now, I wonder if you could hightail yourself out here in one big, fat hurry. Well, that, uh... And that means on that little old expense account of yours... Can you do it? Well, that depends. You are talking about insurance business now, aren't you? Well, not yet, Dollar, but, uh, well, put it this way. Yeah? Unless you can give us a hand, Great Southwest is plumb liable not to have any office or agent or anything else out here anymore. 
afraid I don't understand. Well, then, let's put it this way. Yes? What I want you out here for is to keep the town of Muddy Gap from getting itself blowed right clean off the map. Well, sir? Well, sir, I'll be out to see you. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Greater Southwest Insurance Company branch office in the town with the unlikely name of Muddy Gap, Wyoming. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of... The Mad Bomber Matter. Expense account item one. 192.80 transportation by plane, train, and car to Muddy Gap. That includes a stop and bite of late supper at Casper, Wyoming, where I picked up a rental car. Muddy Gap is in the middle of thousands of acres of range land for beef cattle in what used to be Indian country where the Sioux and Cheyenne carried out many a bloody raid against wagon trains plodding along the old Oregon Trail. There's oil in this country, too. Muddy Gap consisted of a railroad siding, one main shopping street, and a surprisingly neat residential section, all of it pretty much surrounded by a tank farm. How many millions of gallons of crude oil were stored in those huge steel tanks, I'll never know. But it must have taken a mighty big pipeline to handle it. It was obvious that oil storage was the town's principal business. The combination insurance and newspaper office sat alone at the end of the street, and despite the late hour, Hank Parnell was there waiting for me. He was a long, lanky, not-too-bright character, dressed in jeans and open shirt, cowboy boots, and the inevitable white Stetson. Instead of a horse tied up out front, he had a battered old touring car, minus the top and covered with oily dust, to get out and around and dig up news items for his paper, he said. Oh, uh, and I guess I forgot to tell you, Dollar, I'm also mayor of this town, a sort of city clerk. And dog catcher as well, Hank? Well, now, you know something? If we had enough head of dogs around here to worry about, I'd probably be that, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I'm uh, also sort of acting police chief while Rafe Tucker's down to see his relations down in Texas. Mm-hmm. So, you see, I got plenty of reason to be worried about this nice little town of ours. Worried about what, exactly? You notice all them big oil tanks all around out oh, there? Oh, you sure got a lot of them. Yes, sir. Can you imagine what would happen if one of them just... Even one of them was to maybe explode? Dollar, there'd be just one long, continuous boom. And Muddy Gap wouldn't be no more. And maybe nearly 300 nice, fine people either be dead or, at the very least, homeless. Well, do you think something like that might happen, Hank? Unless you can somehow stop it, Dollar. No, rather, I mean stop him. Who? Billy Benbow's his name. Born and brought up right here in Muddy Gap. Yeah? A real bad boy. Always in trouble. Been a little older to spend most of his time in a jail. Mm-hmm. So when the last war came along, my father, he run this paper then. He got an idea for ridding us of Billy. <laughs> Yeah, so we wrote a couple of editorials or two to sort of pass on that idea. First thing you know, the draft board kind of caught on. The first thing he knew, Billy Boy was in the Army. Well, I'd say that was a pretty smart idea, huh? Hey? Yes, sir. Except that when Billy realized how he'd been kind of, well, railroaded into the service, he swore loud and long as to how he'd come back here someday and get even with this town. Well, I don't see why. What's wrong with the army? Oh, well, not a thing. Not a thing. Just the way he got put there that rankled him. I see. Anyhow, all the time he was on the other side, they had him working on explosives. He got to be a real expert. Every time he'd set off a charge, you know, to blow up a railroad or a bridge or whatever, he'd say, uh, Now, that's for so-and-so. Bahoom. And uh, this one's for so-and-so. Bahoom. And every time he'd name somebody here in this town, starting, of course, with a draft board. Became a real obsession with him. Oh, it was more than that. It was like a mania. <clears throat> yeah, Billy Benhow simply wouldn't forget. Now, surely, Hank, after all this time... Now, wait a minute, Dollar. All right, go ahead. Now, whether it was all the damage and destruction he was doing, or whatever it was, I'm not sure. But Dollar, there at the end of the war, well, 
Maybe it was shell shock or battle fatigue or whatever you want to call it. Billy went completely off base. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. The first thing he did when he set foot back in this country, back there on the East Coast, was to start blowing things up. So, of course, he ended up in one of them state hospitals back there. He never recovered. No, never got over it. Well, if he's in the hospital, Hank. Well, he was. But then a while back, he escaped. You see what I mean? You think he'll be coming here to carry out his old threat? Well, Dollar, a couple of days ago, I got a phone call right here in this office. Yes? All the voice said to me was, I haven't forgotten. And he hung up. The voice of Billy Benbow? Well, who else? Who else could it have been? I wonder. Well, I don't. It was Billy, all right. It had to be. And what he meant was, in his twisted way... Billy meant he's coming back here to get even. Well, now, Hank... Well, who knows? Maybe Billy's right here in, in town right now, hiding out somewhere. He's just waiting for a chance to blow us all to kingdom come. And don't you forget for one minute, daughter, he was an expert with them explosives. But, Hank, if it was this, this Ben Bow, why would he make a point of warning you? Well, daughter, a man with a mind like that, I don't... Well, you may be right. Tell me, uh... Have you mentioned this in your paper? Have you notified the townspeople? What, and got them all up into a panic? No, sir. But somehow, Dollar, somehow we got to stop him. All right. Now, um, listen, um... Yeah? I take it you, you haven't much of a police force here. Yeah, well, we never needed much of a force in a peaceful little town like this. Well, how about the county estate police or whoever's available? Oh, sure. What? Oh, they'd be glad to help. Yeah? Come right over here and help us all they can. When uh, and if Billy tries something... Well, by then it might be too late. Yes, sir. Because every day now, once a day, along about this time, this phone of mine is rung. And when I answered, there wasn't nobody there. So it's Billy, wherever he is, just adding up to that warning he gave me. Possibly. So... Well, you got any ideas, Dollar? Well, to be perfectly honest about it, Hank... Before I believe that after all these years, Billy would actually come back here, I think I'd like a little more convincing evidence. Evidence? Well, what's he got to do to convince you? You mean to say you won't believe it until he... Until he... Oh, no. There it is again. Well, maybe it's one of your subscribers. Now, you pick up that extension. Same time as I pick up this. All right, if you like. Okay? Yeah, now. <clears throat> Hello? Hello. I think I'd better prove that I haven't forgotten. Hey, Billy? Is that you, Billy? That's right. Billy Benbow. Uh, now, now listen, Billy. Uh, uh, hello? Uh, hello? He's hung up, I'm afraid. Hey. Now, you see now, Dollar? I told you he wasn't fooling. I told you that... Listen, what was that? I don't know. It sounded like it came from somewhere just outside of this... Place. Remember how much racket automobiles used to make? Time was you practically had to bellow to make yourself heard above the chatter and roar of the engine, the howl of the wind rushing by, and the rattling a rough road gave your poor old buggy and brains. Nowadays, with vastly improved automotive engineering and magnificent new superhighways, you literally purr along the road. This is a vast improvement, but one that can offer danger if you're not alert. You're sitting behind the wheel with the miles of highway unrolling smoothly beneath you, Suddenly a sharp curve jumps in front of you and you find that you have to use all the skill of a professional racer to navigate that curve without getting into real big trouble. Your car was so quiet that your speed had crept up stealthily during those long miles of straightaway. You were burning along without realizing it. The point here, a simple one, is this. Your speedometer was put there for a purpose, a purpose you can't afford to forget. Keep alert, take care, and get there. crawling out from under Hank's desk. Hank himself had tried to make a dash for the press room but was forced back by the blast and ended up beside me. As for the press room, it was a shambles. Oh, my. Why here, Dollar? Why in here? Why'd he pick to blow up my press this way? Hank, didn't you say it was your father's idea? That way of getting him out of town? Yeah, you're right. 
And he spread the word by putting the stuff in the paper. All right, then maybe this is all he wants to do. Put your paper out of business. Yeah, maybe so, Dollar. I hope so. But he's still got to be caught and locked up again. Yes, but where do we start looking for him? Well, he was here to set off this here bomb, wasn't he? Only seconds after you talked to him on the phone? Oh, yeah, you're right. If he was somewheres on the telephone, there's no other buildings here by. How could he be around here, too? Wait a minute. Look. Looks like this is the answer right here. Why, that's a clockwork. That's right. A little timing device. That means Hank that he could have been a hundred miles away. What is it, Hank? What's happened around here? Sounds like a big explosion. Yeah, that's... Oh, looks like one, too. Yep. It was all right, Pete. What happened? Hey, smells to me like dynamite in here. Dynamite? What's the matter with your smeller, boy? What? Well, just that big can of benzene I had for cleaning up the tap I used on the paper. It was, huh? Yeah, that's what it was. I had the dang thing up a little too close to the heater, and it blew up, that's all. Boy, sure funny it didn't start a fire then, Hank. What do you mean, funny? We were lucky, that's all. Well, I guess you were. I'll tell you this, though, Hank. I just uh, don't bother right now. It was uh, only the can of benzene. No, no, I mean about you saying there would not never be any excitement around here when I took on this job. Oh, yeah, yeah, it looks like I was wrong. What is your job, Pete? Oh, I'm sorry. I should introduce you to this is uh, Pete. Uh, Pete. Uh, uh, Pete Branson. Huh? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, him and Tony Batten are the rest of the police force here in Muddygap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, glad to meet you. What'd you say your name is? Uh, Johnny Dollar. But now listen, you, you hear the hoax out there? Yeah, Tony's out there too. Well, you and him just keep that mob out of here, will you? Tell him everything's okay. It was just that. Just that can of benzene, like I said. Uh, Sure, Hank. Now, go on now. You and Tony keep that mob out of here. Okay. It's it's okay, folks. Just had a little accident back there in the print shop. Everything's under control. But just to make sure, uh, Hank don't want anybody hanging around. Now, come on, Tony. Let's get him away from here. Come on. What happened to him, Hank? What, you you mean his face? Mm. The way it's all cut up that way? Yeah. Well, it tells me he once got drugged behind a horse. You know, foot caught in a stirrup. Oh, I see. So the one thing he won't ever do anymore is get himself on top of a horse. <laughs> me, I don't blame him. Mm. Um, Hank, that excuse that you gave for the explosion. Oh, you think I should have told him the truth and let him spread the word and get the whole town into a panic? I... Well, if we were sure, there won't be any more of them. That Billy's satisfied his yen for revenge by putting your paper out of business, okay. But if your fellow townspeople are still in danger... And uh, didn't you mention the draft board? Who are they? Oh, they're all long gone, daughter, except for old Grandpa Whedon. Oh, Lord. Well? Oh, Lord, that old house of his, it's, it's, it's right over near the terminal end of one of them pipelines off the tank farm. And if that place were to get blowed up and if one of the tanks were to go, why, there'd be nothing left of this town. Then if Billy is still around... Well, how can we know? Wait a minute, uh, telephone. What? It's the old-fashioned kind of... No dial, which means you have to call an operator. Oh, sure. Which but... also means that the operator has to call you. Come on, Hank. What are you, what are you going to do? We're going to find out where that... You know. Hello? Hank Parnell, whatever happened down there at your newspaper office? Listen, operator... Whatever you had blow up over there fairly shook me out of my chair. I haven't had such an explosion here in Muddy Gap since Ali Briscombe still blew up and everybody thought the whole tank farm was gone. Um... Look, miss. Look, Hank, you better tell me what happened so I can... Well, I I mean, you know, in case somebody calls in and wants to know... Operator, will you listen to me a moment? What? Who are you? I'm speaking for Hank Parnell. Anything happened to him? Is he all right? No, he's he's all right. Now, listen. Yes? Just before the accident, you rang this phone. Oh, that's right. I had a call for him. Do you know who was calling? No, he kept his voice low. What'd you say your name is? Well, I didn't, and it doesn't matter. But what I want to know is, where did... You know something? Hmm? You sound exactly like that Johnny Doll on the radio. Operator, listen, please. If you are, and you're in town... Miss... Well, the folks around here would sure like to know that they would. Now, listen, do you know where that call for Hank Parnell came from? Well, of course I do. Where? Well, the one outside phone booth we have over outside the drugstore. Okay, thanks. You heard? Yeah, Dollar. Then he is in town. I'm afraid so. Hank, you better take it. Okay. I'll listen in. Hello? You got the sample, Parnell. The big one's coming later. Hey, Billy. That's right. Later when? What do you mean by later? Maybe. Maybe tonight. Hey, Billy, listen. Hello? 
Dollard. Dollar, we got to get the people out of this town. 300 of them before he can strike again? I don't oh. know. I don't know. I don't know. But we got to try. It's too late. And you know it. Well, then what can we do? Dollar? It's a long chance, Hank. I know it is. What? But I'm betting that he's been around this town a long time. Maybe for weeks. Now, doesn't that mean anything to you? Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't get it. All right, listen. Now, this crazy hunch of mine may be all wrong. But if you'll let me handle this my own way... Will you, Hank? In spite of the fact that it may mean jeopardizing all the people in town. Mm, anything you say, Dollar, as long as we do something. All right. Those two boys on the force, do you know where to reach them right now? Who, Tony and Pete? Yes. Yes. All right. Call them up and have them come over here. Then if you and they will follow my orders to the letter in without question. Well? We'll do anything. Okay. Get them over here. It meant staking a lot on my limited knowledge of the criminal mind, possibly risking a lot of innocent lives. But I felt sure now that my hunch was right. Fortunately for my plan, Tony Batten got there first. When I told Hank and Tony what their job was, for a moment they couldn't believe I was serious. But they agreed to say nothing to anyone, not even to Pete. Tony went outside then, waited in Hank's old car. When Peter Branson arrived, Hank put him under my orders and he and Tony took off. Well, I guess I was right, huh, Mr. Dollar? That was some kind of set explosion in here, wasn't it? That's right, Pete. It was set, all right, by an expert. And you got some idea who might have done it? Either you and I are going to find out, or this town's in danger of being blown to bits. Are you kidding? Not a bit of it. I, uh, I see you carry a gun. Yes, sir, right here in handy. And if what you say is true, maybe you ought to have one, too. Well, you, uh, better let me have yours then, Pete. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute, Mr. Dollar. It's your idea. Well, yeah, I know, but... Well, let me uh... have it. Orders, Pete. You're under my orders, remember? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir, here you are. Good. Now, shall we go? Where are we headed? Out to see an old man. Old Grandpa Whedon. Oh, now, you don't think he had anything to do with this explosion, do you? Pete, I think this mad bomber plans to hit him next. Did you say mad? That's right. Oh, I see. We're going to go over Grandpa's place with a fine-tooth comb because a bomb may be planted, may be ticking away out there right now. And if we don't find anything out there... Well, we'll see. But why do you think this uh, this man would pick on him? Is it a man? Well, I, I certainly guess so. But why on Grandpa? Well, because once he was a member of a draft board. Well, now, <laughs> that don't make sense, does it? Maybe not, but does anything make sense where a madman is concerned? You're calling him that again. You don't like that word, hmm? Well, it makes no difference to me, but if there if it was a madman out on the loose out there... Pete, I'll... he might look every bit as harmless as you do, or as I do. Yeah, I see. Okay, then. Let's go on out there and have a look, but I'm betting we don't find anything. You don't think so, hmm? Well, I bet on it. Well, then maybe we won't. Um, it seems to me Hank had a little trouble remembering your last name, Pete. How long is it uh, that you've been on the force? Huh? Oh, a few weeks, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ever since you first came to town? Huh? Why, yeah, practically. Mm -hmm. And before that? Oh, you know, working around the ranches. And... Oh, I thought you didn't ride. <laughs> well, no, not anymore. Oh, what do you do then? Oh, you know, odd jobs. Well, why you ask that? Well, your hands. They look kind of soft to me, you know. Mm -hmm. Another thing, uh, come to think of it. Seems to me you immediately recognized the smell of dynamite when you came in here, didn't you? Well, look, you want to go out there, let's go. Uh, and, uh, those scars on your face? What you getting at? They're from an explosion, aren't they? I said what you getting at. I've seen too many of those kind of scars not to recognize them. And you knew that because of them, nobody around here would recognize you. Didn't you, Billy? Okay, Dollar, that's enough. You see this? You got another gun, hmm? That's right. So instead of reaching for the one I gave you, just you reach up high now, reach. I knew I'd have trouble when you come in town. Because you ain't dumb like the rest of these jerks around here. But not anymore, Dollar, because I'm going to kill you. You think so, Billy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I go back to my place and I get the rig. It's all ready, except for the setting of the clock on. Billy. Shut up. You know where I planted it then? Yeah, out by old Grandpa Weed. You hear me? 
out there by the tank farm. And I set the clock, so I only got time to get away. Get away in that nice car of yours, darling. Now, Billy, listen to me. No, no, no. You're only trying to stall me. So first it's you, and then I go get that rig. This rig, Billy? Huh? This bomb we found over in your room? You found it. You better drop that gun, Billy. No! Come in! Oh, you pull that trigger, Tony, I still get off a shot. He's right. Let me take care of this. Oh, no, Wow, we. <laughs> That's a mighty good left you got there, Dollar. I guess he was right, though, Hank, about you being pretty stupid. Well, well now, you just wait Didn't one Didn't you minute. think about what might have happened if Tony pulled off a shot right next to that bomb you have in your hand? Mm. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you should have. Remarks? Well, why bother on this one? As for the expense account, uh... Let's call it a total of 350 bucks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a beautiful girl, a handful of coins, and a mysterious disappearance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Court Benson as Hank Parnell, Lawson Zerby as Pete Branson, Cliff Carpenter as Billy Benbow, and Barbara Kassar as the operator. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Art Hanna speaking. The number one network for news, expanded CBS News on the CBS radio network. This is WROW Music in Albany, New York. A newcomer in town can feel mighty lonesome. Welcome wagon hostesses make these newcomers feel wanted when they make their cordial welcome wagon visits. Their baskets contain useful gifts from civic-minded businessmen, invitations to participate in varied social and volunteer activities of the many civic agencies in the community. In addition, every welcome wagon call recipient in the greater Albany or Schenectady areas, as well as Del Mar, Latham, or Scotia, is invited to attend the local welcome wagon club. This is an organization of newcomers all anxious to make friends. Various welcome wagon clubs vary from 30 to 150 members who meet monthly. Their interests include bowling, golf, cards, handcraft, and dancing. You can help to make your new neighbor feel at home. Call State 59640 today and make your neighbor eligible for the many opportunities in a welcome wagon club. Remember, State 59640. WROW music time now, 25 minutes before 7 p.m. Johnny Dollar. Tell me, old boy, how's the weather? Cold, wet, and miserable, and who are you? Charlie Warren, Johnny, out here in warm, sunny Southern California. Oh, you lucky dog. Ah, uh-huh, don't I know it. I spent too many long, cold winters at the home office there in Hartford not to know it. You're still with Worldwide Mutual? Sure am. Always will be, I guess, unless they try to move me out of this Los Angeles office. Boy, when I think how you must be suffering back there in New England with all that cold and snow and snow. Okay, rain. okay, Charlie, don't rub it in. We can't all be as lucky as you are and just think of all the beauty you're missing. Yeah? Like what? The clean, crisp, invigorating air, the sparkle of the sun on sleet-covered branches, the sound of sleigh bells, rolling fields drifted high with pure white snow. And all that mud and slush you have to <laughs> plow through there in town, and don't tell me otherwise. Okay, you've made your point. I'm feeling even worse than I did before you called. Now, what's on your mind? Any good reason why you shouldn't be out here enjoying the sunshine, the warm breezes, the smell of orange blossoms, the palm trees, and beautiful broads barging around bikinis, and all the other delights of this subtropical paradise, and I want a badge from the Chamber of Commerce? Yes. What? Money. Well, now, that's no problem. Oh, it isn't. Oh, why should it be? When the company's going to pay the freight. Provided, of course, you keep that crazy expense account within reasonable bounds for just once in your life. Oh, Charlie, you touched me to the quick. Have I ever done otherwise? Oh, no. I mean, except for an occasional nickel or dime here and there. Or an occasional C-note now and then. Well, after all, Charlie. Well, seriously, Johnny, I need you. I need your help. Are you free to fly out here? I don't know why not. 
Okay. Now, according to my watch, it's a little after 4 p.m. And according to the clocks here in the wilds of Connecticut, it's a little after 7. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's right. Now, look, suppose I take a prop job that'll give me time for a little sleep along the way, and I'll see you first thing in the morning. Okay? I'll meet you at the airport. Okay. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Los Angeles office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Cinder Elmer matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, 176.40, taxi to Bradley Field and a plane ticket. It was close to midnight by the time I could get a flight out of Hartford. I don't know why so many people have to travel this time of the year. And it was nearly three by the time my plane in New York took off and headed west. All my plans to sleep along the way went to pot. Not only because of the several stops we had to make, but because of the cute little brunette who occupied the seat next to mine. A real charmer on her way to L.A. for a winter vacation, and did I have any ideas for how she might enjoy herself out there on the coast? Did I have ideas? But after we landed, then she introduced me to the blonde giant who met her there at the airport and took her in tow. Well, who am I to argue with a man who plays right tackle for the L.A. Rams football team? Anyhow, I was sadly lacking in sleep when Charlie Warren finally found me at the luggage stand, picked up my bags, and led me out to a car parked at the curb. Oh, uh, here you are, Johnny. I'll just toss these bags in the back. Hey. Here, Johnny, here's the keys. To a nice, quiet room with a soft bed in it. Are <laughs> you kidding? To this car. Oh, Charlie, why don't you drive? Well, this is one of those rental jobs. Hmm? Sure, my car's over there in the lot. Oh, and I had him throw in a set of chains. What, oh, you mean skid chains? Yeah, up where you're going, you're going to need them. In sunny Southern California? Excuse me, let me get my glove compartment. Be my guest. You mind telling me just where I'm going and why? Now, here's where we are, see? L.A. International Airport, see it? I'd rather see a comfortable bed, Charlie. Now, you go north on Sepulveda Boulevard to Manchester. East to Harbor Freeway, turn north, then east on the San Bernardino Freeway. I do, hmm? Yeah. San Bernardino's maybe 65 miles or so. Then you turn north here up into the mountains, see? And there's Crestline. There you are. At least that's where you can get directions to Hillcrest Lodge. I can. Oh, boy, I wish I could go along with you. That's the most beautiful country up there this time of year. It really is. Hmm? 75 or 80 degrees of hot smog down here. And up there at 5,000 feet altitude, it's all covered with snow beauty. Oh, Charlie, you're a dirty dog. Huh? Over the phone, you give me the Chamber of Commerce pitch to get me away from an eastern winter. And when I get out here? Yeah, but this is different, Johnny. You'll love it. Skiing, tobogganing, magnificent view of all the peaks up there on the rim of the world drive. It's right near Lake Arrowhead, you know. No, I didn't know. And what's more, I don't care. Unless I can get a little sleep, Charlie. I can sleep. Johnny, up there in that clean, clear, crisp, cold air on that high altitude, you'll sleep like you've never slept before. You mean like sometime tonight? Sure. If I'm lucky. What do you mean by that? Well, you still haven't told me what kind of a case I'm supposed to be working on. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Disappearance, Johnny. Name is Bartley Harmon. Bartley Harmon? Uh Uh-huh. He and his wife, Nora, real good-looking doll, by the way, Mm -hmm. and his business partner, a man by the name of Elmer Wrightson. Yeah. Well, like they always do this time of year, they all went up to Crestline Hillcrest Lodge for a few days. So? Nora phoned me just before I put in that call to you. Seems the poor little shrimp took off. Poor little shrimp? Yeah, her old man, Bobby. Oh. Both he and his partner, Elmer Wrightson, stand about five feet three, about 115 pounds, ringing wet. Look almost like twins. I see. Go on. Well, not that, Nora. Bartley's wife. 
she's a good five feet eleven. But Johnny boy, I mean good. She's built like an Olympic champion, blonde, beautiful, and wow. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Now, what happened to Bartley Harmon? Well, he took off for a tramp in the snow, and he suddenly and completely disappeared. Oh? Sheriff's Department put out an APB in the whole area, but nobody's seen high in the hair of him. Go on. And Johnny, that's San Badu Sheriff's Department. Well, they know their way around out in that country. If they haven't been able to find him, Bartley Harmon is really lost. And with the way it gets cold up in those mountains, well... Anyhow, Sheriff's boys are expecting you. They'll cooperate. Just what is your stake in him, Charlie? Got him insured for 200000 mm. Accidental death, double indemnity. If he's fallen off a rock and busted his neck or into a chasm or something... Now, Charlie... And on top of everything else, heart isn't too awfully good either. Of course, if somebody... Well, you know what I mean. No, I'm not sure I do. Does the Bartley Harmon have a lot of enemies? Mm, not that I know of. For that matter, I don't think he has any real friends either. Tell me, who would benefit by his death? Well, of course, the business will all go to his partner, Elmer Wrightson. Mm -hmm. How do they get along? Only because they have to, I guess. Keep the business going. I see. And the insurance goes to his wife. All goes to Nora. And how do they get along? Well, she's a beautiful dame. He has a lot of money and, well, she's a lot younger than he is, you know. No, I didn't know. Now, wait a minute, Johnny. Somebody did murder him. Well, you mean... You think that maybe... You think that maybe one of them... Charlie, I think i better get on up to Crestline. Here's a friendly and important reminder from your postmaster. This is the time of year when the post office handles its biggest volume of mail. The extra load often takes extra time. So if you want your cards and packages to arrive at their destination before Christmas, mail early and often. Make sure addresses are clear and correct. Use postal zone numbers and send your cards by first-class mail. For a merrier Christmas, shop early, mail early. That long, hot drive through the valley to San Bernardino, San Berdu, as the natives call it, almost did me in. I really felt the lack of sleep. But then as I swung up into the mountains, and at the 4,000-foot level had to put on snow chains and turn up the windows, well, it really is beautiful country up there. Not only because of the white, clean snow, but the mountains, the magnificent big pines anchored to the sides of them, and the colorful, picturesque little cottages. At Hillcrest Lodge, I found that a young fellow from the sheriff's office, Roy Turner, was waiting for me. After helping me up to my room with my bags, he got right to the point. I can't say that I like this situation, Mr. Dollar. Not a bit. Why, Turner? Call me Roy. All right, call me Johnny. Well, Johnny, simply because of the people involved. Man falls in love with partner's wife. Does away with said partner? Not a chance. At least there's no chance you'd give him any kind of a break. I'd bet on it. Why? Because Wrightson is the same kind of homely, pedantic, facts and figures little shrimp as her husband Bartley is. And there's no question but that she's had enough of him. Enough to want to get rid of him, Roy? Well, Harmon's worth a lot of money, I understand. A lot of insurance, too. Yeah, that's true. And she's a much younger, good-looking, athletic... <laughs> well, where do you see her? I'd like to. You will. And don't think for a minute she doesn't make the most of it, of what she has. Johnny, for the few days they spend up here every year, she brings along enough expensive clothes to sink a battleship. In addition to snow and ski and skating outfits, I mean. She has a whole trunk full of shoes alone. Anyhow, we're making sure that she sticks around. Rights in two, for that matter. Roy, if they're all on such lousy terms, why do they come up here together? Only because she likes it so much. So Bartley tags along to keep an eye on her. And Mr. Wrightson? To keep an eye on him, I guess. Mm. I take it you've combed the hills around here pretty well. As thoroughly as we know how. Mm -hmm. What about all those little cabins that I've seen around? Been through them all. 
Apparently, Harmon headed over toward old Ironside. That's uh, just north of here. It has a sharp face on it where the snow doesn't stick. And beyond it, well, in order to save time, we have a helicopter out there looking over that big valley. Roy. Yes, Johnny? You know, over the years, I've investigated an awful lot of disappearances. Yeah. And you would be surprised at how many people disappear deliberately. Just to get away from things, once and for all. But leave behind that beautiful wife he's so jealous of? And his share of a prosperous business? It is a possibility, though. Isn't it? Well, oh, uh, that may be for me. I told the operator I'd be here. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Where? Okay. Leave it there. Uh, have him go back and pick me up at the port. As I started to say, it is possible, Roy. Not anymore, Johnny. Oh? The copter just found Bartley Harmon out there be beyond old Ironside. Or rather, they found his body. We got to the airport on the edge of San Bredou in less than 20 minutes. The copter was already there and waiting for us. We piled in, took off, and headed back to Crestline, then passed it, then circled the cold gray peak that was called Old Ironside. Beyond it was a long, narrow valley, edged on both sides by a heavy growth of timber, and a hundred yards or so from the tree line, out in the open, there on the cold, dry snow, lay the body of Barkley Harmon. I don't see any mark where you landed this freight, Steve. I didn't try to land, sir. Just took her down low enough to make a positive ID, then got on the horn and reported in. They told me to run back to Purdue and pick you up, sir. Looks to me as though you may have got down there too close. What, sir? I mean this chopper apparently blew a lot of snow on top of it. Hope it didn't cover any clues. All right, sir. Clues, Roy. Now find a spot to land us up there ahead of it. Right, sir. I can't help wondering what Harmon was doing way out here and alone. Oh, he and Wrightson believe that old legend about a cave full of gold out in this valley often came to look for it. You know, while his wife was busy skiing or skating or tobogganing. With his bad heart, Roy? Well, actually, it's only a mile or so from the lodge, so I guess he figured it wouldn't be too much for him. Looks like he figured wrong, though, doesn't it? Yeah. Kind of knocks my theories into a cocked hat, too. You've given up the idea of murder. Yep. Set us down here anywhere, Steve. Right, sir. And we shall see what we shall see. What we saw down there was more than we'd bargained for. The body was that of Bartley Harmon, all right. And there wasn't a mark on it. It looked as though the old boy overextending himself at that high altitude had simply had his heart give out on him. Until we found two things. One, another set of footprints leading to the spot. Much smaller prints that could have been made by a woman's snow boots. And second, beside them there in the snow, a cigarette butt with lipstick on it. <laughs> To me, Johnny, like this settles it, in spite of her alibi. Nora Hart. Alibi, Roy? That she was over in Arrowhead Village shopping when he took his little walk out here. Anybody try to check up on it? Yeah, but nothing really definite either way. Well, then that doesn't prove that she did this, Roy, that she or anybody else did anything. You mean because of no marks on the body? That's right. And, Roy, there's something about this whole setup that... I don't know, I'm... I don't know. Let's face it, Johnny. Why'd she say she was in Arrowhead when she was really out here with him? Or was she? And who else had such a motive? Did Elmer Wrightson have an alibi, too? Asleep in his room all that afternoon? And no reason to doubt him. I wonder. But Johnny, Johnny, the footprints. And more important, this cigarette butt with the lipstick. 
If a lab test shows it to be the same kind that she uses... Steve? Yes, sir? When you and Mr. Dollar haul the body uh, into San Verdu for the autopsy, have uh, Doc Hanley analyze the lipstick on this cigarette, too. Um, have him do that first. While we take the body in? I want to follow those uh, two sets of footprints back to the lodge. I'll meet you there, okay? What's the matter, Johnny? Hmm? Oh, nothing. Nothing, Roy. It's just that... Well, if we've overlooked something out here... Yeah? Like what? No, forget it. Uh, come on, Steve. Let's get the body aboard. Yes, sir. Doc Hanley told me that the lipstick was quite unusual. While he went ahead with the autopsy, I had Steve drive me up to the lodge. A five-dollar tip to a light-fingered bellboy got me one of Nora Harmon's lipsticks out of her room. When I got back and showed it to Hanley, he was certain it was the same as that on the cigarette. As for the result of his autopsy... Beaten to death, Mr. Dollar. Without a single mark on him? There were several intestinal and mesentery perforations, blood in the peritoneal cavity. So? You saw no external bruises because death occurred so quickly, the blood stopped circulating immediately. Mm. Without circulation, there can be no hemorrhage into the tissues. A uh, little known fact, my boy. I see. So it looks then as though Roy may have been right in spite of this hunch of mine. Hunch? In this modern day and age, don't be ridiculous, my boy. Look at the facts. She not only had the motive, but if I understand correctly, is physically capable of such an action. And with the cigarette butt as proof that she was out there with him, well, I'll phone Roy Turner at the lodge and tell him to charge her with murder. I wonder, though. Wonder? Why? What's there to wonder about? Well, Doc, unless she is pretty stupid. Well, I'm certain from what I've heard about her that she isn't. Far from it. Then why leave such obvious incriminating tracks, both the footprints and the cigarette? My boy, even the cleverest of criminals sometimes overlook little things like that. Little things? Doc, this is more like leaving a couple of neon signs. I'd better get back to the lodge. To assist Roy with the arrest? Maybe to keep him from arresting the wrong person. <laughs> into my room at the lodge. Roy was just hanging up the phone. Okay. Well, okay, Doc. Well, that's good enough for me. I'll, um... I'll bring her in right away. Roy, before you do that... Yeah, I know, Johnny. The doc told me what you said to him. And I agree with you. It was pretty foolish for her to leave such obvious signposts. Not at all like her. Okay, then. But following up uh, those sets of tracks out there really clinched it. How do you mean? Oh, he went for his little walk in the snow alone, all right, but she followed him. And every time he stopped to rest, she also stopped, but a couple of hundred yards behind him and well hidden by the trees. And more important, Johnny, yeah. every time she stopped, she lit up and smoked one of those cigarettes. And they are the same brand she uses. I've checked on it. Then when he took off again, she dropped the butt in the snow and followed him again. Until finally, when she had him far enough away to be safe... Bango. Now, wait a minute. One other little thing, too, Johnny. Roy. While you were down there in San Verdu, I compared those footprints with a pair of Nora's shoes. Same type. And size. Wait a minute, will you? Well, Roy, it has finally got through this thick skull of mine. The butt, the cigarette butt we found by the body, before you picked it up. Yeah, what about it, Johnny? Listen, did you find some more out there? Several, just further proof. Did you leave any of them laying around out there? Well, sure, one or two are all I need for evidence. All right, come on, we're going out there and look at them. What? Yes. Unless you can visualize exactly what that first one looked like lying there beside the body. Well, I don't know. Because I can. And, Roy, before you do anything foolish like arresting Nora Harmon, you better have a look at some of those others. Now, come on. In the first place she stopped is just ahead. Good. Glad it hasn't snowed for a while. But I still think this is a... Kind of silly waste of time, Johnny. And I tell you that both of us ought to be shot for not having been more observant. You still haven't told me what this miraculous inspiration is that... Oh, 
Ah, uh, here we are. And you see? That butt lying there with that same lipstick on. Here, I'll take it away. No, don't touch it. Huh? Just take a good look at it, Roy. Don't you see? It wasn't crushed out. It was simply dropped there on top of the snow. Well, sure, so what? Then what put it out? Well, the snow, what else? Did it? What do you mean? If that cigarette was still burning when it was dropped here on the snow... Don't you see, Roy? Don't you see? It would have melted some of the snow while it was going out. Wait a minute, Johnny. You're right. Of course I am. All those butts you found were smoked and put out somewhere else. No doubt by Nora Harmon because of the lipstick. Then somebody else carefully picked them up and saved them. And for only one reason, Roy, to plant them out here beside these footprints. Wrightson? Right. Elmer Wrightson, the only other person with a motive. But the footprints from her shoes. Didn't you say that she's a big girl? And that Elmer is a little shrimp? Yeah. And if he wears a snow boot like hers, we've got him. But if he doesn't, Johnny? Didn't you also say that she has a whole trunk full with her? Yeah. Well, wouldn't she have at least a couple of pairs of snow boots? Sure, I've seen them myself. Any reason then why he couldn't have borrowed a pair of hers and then put them back? Yeah, but if he didn't, Johnny... Well, let's try it, Roy. Let's try the Cinderella bit on him, hmm? Only it'll be, uh, Cinder Elmer. <laughs> we'll make him put on a pair of her snow boots, and if they fit... Well, are you game to try it? Nothing to lose, Johnny. Let's go. Her snow boots fit him all right. And little old Cinder Elmer... Oh, the dumb jerk should have known better. He should have made us come up with some really concrete evidence. But luckily for us, Elmer just broke down and confessed to the whole bit. So, once again, it's up to the courts. Expense account total, including the trip home, three seventy-seven eighty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the cleverest cover-ups for a fire bug I've ever seen. And believe me, I've seen plenty. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Cliff Carpenter as Sheriff Roy Turner, Eugene Francis as Charles Warren, Bob Dryden as Dr. Hanley, and Jim Stevens as the helicopter pilot. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Stuart Matt speaking. Enjoy the Gary Moore Show weekdays on the CBS radio network. At rule 59 on your Tri-Cities dial, this is WROW Music in Albany, New York. A newcomer in town can feel mighty lonesome. Welcome Wagon hostesses make these newcomers feel wanted when they make their cordial welcome wagon visits. Their baskets contain useful gifts from civic-minded businessmen, invitations to participate in varied social and volunteer activities of the many civic agencies in the community. In addition, every Welcome Wagon Call recipient in the greater Albany or Schenectady areas, as well as Del Mar, Latham, or Scotia, is invited to attend the local Welcome Wagon Club. This is an organization of newcomers all anxious to make friends. Various Welcome Wagon Clubs vary from 30 to 150 members who meet monthly. Their interests include bowling, golf, cards, handcraft, and dancing. You can help to make your new neighbor feel at home. Call State 59640 today and make your neighbor eligible for the many opportunities in a Welcome Wagon Club. Remember, State 59640.
Johnny Dollar. Bert Helfer, Johnny. Merry Christmas to you. Well, hi, Bert. Same to you. Thanks. Only what are you doing in your office on a Friday afternoon so close to the big holiday instead of out shopping? Well, I'll tell you, Johnny. Now, listen, Bert. I'm over not taking on any investigations till after Christmas. <laughs> okay, by me. Hey, Bert, you sound terrible. What's the matter? You got a cold? Oh, horrible one. I've had it for a week. Well, why are you still there in your office at this hour instead of home in bed? Well, I'm just cleaning up before I take a couple of weeks off. Johnny, can you come on over? Now? No. No. Any new assignment's going to have to wait till after the holidays. Well, sure. I mean, I would kind of like to have a few days free myself, you know, so wait till after Christmas, will you? Well, sure, I'll be glad to, but who said anything about an assignment? Well, isn't that why you called? Uh Uh-huh, not a bit of it, so come on over. You're not kidding me now, are you, Bert? I just thought you'd like to pick up the dough for that San Francisco job you did for us a couple of weeks ago. Oh. Oh, Don't tell me you're so rich you've forgotten about it. Well? (laughs) Ah, I'll see you there in your office in a few minutes. Right. Only, Bert. Yeah? You're sure now that's all you really want me for? (laughs) That's all, Johnny. Now, you won't try to finagle me into something, some job you just happen to think of after I get over there. Uh, honor bright. (laughs) Okay, Bert. I'm on my way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Democracy. It provides a more perfect country. It builds a greater economy and creates a higher standard of living. It enables men to fulfill greater ambitions. It secures the blessings of liberty for all who live under it. And democracy strengthens character. With strong character, the people who practice democracy can push forward to ever-widening horizons, to even more fruitful goals. The rewards are there for those who have the courage to work for them. This courage and strength of character give assurance that democracy can provide mankind with its finest legacy of freedom. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Trinity Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of... The phony phone matter. <laughs> Expense account item one. After checking out with my call service, a dollar twenty for a cab over to Bert Helfer's office, high in the tower of the Manley Building, overlooking most of the city. Lo and behold, there wasn't a soul in the place except Bert himself. Most of the lights were off. The rows and rows of typewriters and calculating machines were covered and quiet. The filing cabinets neatly cleared and closed. Even the telephone switchboard off in one corner was untended, although I noticed one patch cord plugged in, the tiny light above it burning. It was Bert's line in use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take care of it just as soon as I get back here in the office again. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be on Tuesday, January 2nd. Good. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you, and a Merry Christmas to you, too. Hi, Johnny. Sit down. Well, I'll say this for you, Bert. You are certainly the loyal company servant. Well, I just want to be absolutely sure everything's taken care of so they won't be calling me down there in Miami Beach to lay down my water skis and come back here before my vacation's over. (laughs) Oh, I can't say I blame you. And here you are, baby. Here is the money for that San Francisco job. You want to count it? How come in cash? Don't you still have some Christmas shopping to do? Don't we all? Mm Mm-hmm. And the banks will be closed by the time you get out of here, so... Well, I just tore up the check and pulled this out of petty cash. Well, good for you. And hooray for petty cash. Mm. I must say, though, there's nothing petty about the way you can run up an expense account. (laughs) Oh, Bert. Only trouble is, with all this dough in hand, I'll probably go out and spend a lot more than I ought to. Oh, sure. On all that flock of gals you keep on the string. Jealous, Mr. Married Man? Sure I am. (laughs) Only I'm not, really. Don't you kid yourself, baby. One of these days, you'll put on the halter, too. Fat chance. Now, here, if you'll just sign this receipt. Mm Mm-hmm. There you are. Good. Good. Oh, and here. Mm-hmm. I almost forgot, while you were on your way over, your telephone answering service called with this message. Oh? Yeah. Call Xmont 35770 immediately, urgent. Who is Xmont 35770? 
You don't know? No. Well, I'm afraid I do. Who? It's the home of a character by the name of Harvey L. Hallett. Harvey L. Oh, wait a minute. Any relation to the people who took over that little plant that I passed on the way over here? Hallett Industries? He is Hallett Industries. Oh? Yeah. Look. You can see the place out of this window. You see it over there? So? You know, I hate to admit it. One of the boys in the office sold him a lot of insurance when he took over that place about six months ago. Well, what's the matter with that? Oh, we've had a big headache with that account on the inventory insurance. How do you mean? Well, apparently they make a lot of electronic stuff over there, and a lot of it's kind of secret, I guess, you know, kept under lock and key. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it's been reported stolen. Half a dozen burglaries in the last six months, according to Mr. Harvey L. Hallett. And we've had to pay off through the nose. Why do you say according to Mr. Hallett that way? Because I wouldn't trust that character as far as you can throw this building. In other words, if I could, if I could, I'd just cancel out his policy, you know? I think a lot of those losses he reported were phonies. If I'd had any sense, I would have called you in on him. Well, so long, Bertie. As a matter of fact, I wish you would look into it for us after I get back. After? Okay, but not now. <laughs> all right, that's all right by me. I wonder why he's called me. Well, I'm afraid it was my fault. Why? How do you mean? Well, I'd kind of let your name slip out somewhere along the line, and yesterday Hallett called me, said he'd been thinking it over, asked me for your number, and... Well, I gave it to him. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Johnny, I shouldn't have. Especially since I want you to investigate him. So as for calling him back, if you don't want to, don't. If what you say about him is true, though, maybe I will. After the holidays. No. Right now. Why? Bert, you know, it's an old trick and a corny one, but a lot of people still think it's pretty clever. Trick? The cover-up. You know, a man kills somebody or he blows his safe or Uh. he tries an embezzlement, whatever. He's the one who calls in the cops or even tells them that he thinks it might happen. So that nobody will suspect him. Of course. Hmm. I never thought of that. So if what you say is true, if he is the kind of guy you seem to think he is... If he's back of his own burglaries on which he has collected a lot of nice insurance money... Oh, I'd bet on it. And if he's planning another such caper... Sure he is. Johnny, I think you've got something there. On the other hand, though, Bert, if he's clean, if he really does want to help... Oh, that I doubt. Let me have the phone. Look, why don't you wait till after the holidays? Nope. Okay, it's on your own head, then. This is home telephone number, did you say? Yeah, the factory is a Weatherby number. Weatherby something. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Hallett, please. Uh, This is Mary Hallett, Mrs. Hallett. Is Mr. Hallett there? Well, he's terribly busy at the moment. May I ask who's calling, please? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar, yes. Uh, He said he was very anxious to speak with you, but he's just about to leave for New York. Oh, just a minute. Here he is. Uh, Harvey, it's for you. Darling, I know, but it's Mr. Johnny Dollar. You said you want... Yes. Here, dear. Dollar? This is Harvey Hallett. Yes, Mr. Hallett. A Merry Christmas and all that. And listen, I'm very anxious to see you and to talk to you. Well, whenever you find... I've some problems over at my electronics plant, but I have to leave now immediately. Well, if it's... Uh, can re- I call you on Tuesday? Oh, well, sure. On Tuesday morning. It's say about... Uh, yes, I know, dear, I know. A uh, dollar. I'm sorry, but I have to hang up. I'll call you on Tuesday. Well, look, Mr... Hello? Hello? Well, that's what I call a man in a hurry. Yeah, I could hear him. Something about going to New York, he said... Or, uh, his wife did, anyway. Uh, where does he live, Bert? Anywhere near that little plant of his? Are you kidding? With an Exmont number? No, he lives a mile, maybe a mile. Holy smoke. What's that? Or some kind of explosion, it sounded like. Johnny, look. Hmm? Look out the window, right over there. Who? Holy smoke is right. I see. That's gonna be one big fire. Yeah. Don't you recognize that building, Johnny? Oh, you're right, Bert. Hallett Industries. <laughs> Item two, a dollar for a taxi over to the scene of the fire. I'll say this, that fire must have really taken hold with a bang, and I don't mean because of the explosion we'd heard. It was a small building, not more than a couple of hundred feet square, and by the time I arrived, there were flames pouring out of every window. And smoke, thick black smoke. The fire department was already hard at work, and by the time I'd singled out Police Lieutenant Billy Harmon to get his opinion of it, things were fairly well under control. Hey, Lieutenant, what brings you here? Only one thing, Mr. Harvey L. Hallett. What do you mean by that, Lieutenant? 
I'm the patsy got assigned to those burglaries that he had. You know something? No, tell me. I got just exactly nowhere on him. And you know something else? Yeah? Now, I can't prove this. Can't prove a thing for that matter. Simply because, well, I can't, that's all. But I also can't get over the feeling the reason I couldn't get anywhere was because our friend Mr. Hallett didn't want me to. Didn't want you to? You mean no cooperation? Just the opposite. Too much cooperation. Oh? So much, I couldn't make a move without finding him underfoot. Making like he was doing everything he could to help. I see. But actually, all he was doing was getting in the way. He'd suggest so many possibilities and demand I follow him up. I didn't have time or opportunity to follow up those I'd thought of. Not properly, that is. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Smoke. The old misdirection bit, if you know what I mean, Johnny. Johnny, I don't trust that guy. Seems to me I've heard somebody else give out with that same opinion. When I got the word this place was going up, well, you know what I think, Johnny? Arson? I bet on it. And if it is, you can be sure the boys in the torch squad will spot it. They're in there working on it already. You know, Hanley and Jimmy Beckett. Yeah. You ask me, they're the two best arson men a police department ever had. They're a pretty good pair. And if it is, arson, you can be sure my number one suspect will be none other than... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oral off! Conroy! Keep those people back in the line before... <laughs> Come on, keep him back there. Hey, you, mister. What do you think you're doing? It's... Oh, you. Lieutenant. Uh, Lieutenant Harbin. How did this happen? I heard the explosion all, all the way over at my home. I... Now, you claim you were at home, Mr. Hallett? Yes, yes, of course I was at home. Can you prove that? I, I beg your pardon? Yes, I'm afraid he can, Lieutenant. Oh, you're Mr. Dollar. That's right. You call off your trip to New York? Well, I was just leaving. I, I heard the explosion and saw the smoke, so I drove on over here. No, you just drove on over, huh? Yes, I did. What happened? Dollar, what started this? Well, I'd say that you know just as much as we do. Or a lot more. What's that? Excuse me a minute. Yeah, what is it, Beckett? Look at it, Dollar. The whole plant, the whole business, all gone up in smoke. Yeah, Pretty well insured, though, isn't it? Huh? You think that money can make up for all the time and work and worry that went into it? All gone up in smoke. Mr. Dollar. Yeah. The color of that smoke. That was the first thing I noticed, Mr. Hallett. The smell. The odor. Yes, I know. The storeroom, it's full of solvents. Highly volatile solvents. You think that caused the explosion? It must have. But how? The storage arrangement was approved by this very fire department. It was like a vault. There's no way that any heat could get into it. Well, you think then that maybe somebody did, hmm? But how? It was always locked. Wasn't there supposed to be a watchman on duty? Well, of course, old, old Ben Matthews. A dollar if he was anywhere near that explosion when it occurred... Oh, no, no. In other words, if it was arson by somebody the watchman may have seen... Arson? I said if. And if that watchman did see anybody it's around... arson, all right, Dolly. Boys are sure of it. They are, Lieutenant? I can't believe it. As for Ben Matthews, the watchman... Well, I don't think there's much question but that he did see who did it. And that he knew him. No? Then you mean Ben is still alive? That door had a dead latch on it. Took a key to open it inside as well as outside. I know. And old Ben had orders not Just to admit wait anyone. And that... Listen, Mr. Hallis. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lieutenant. Ben's key is still in the inside of that lock. So he let somebody in. Now that means somebody that he must have recognized. Why do you say that? I knew old Ben. I know he had orders not to let anybody in. Not anybody. Isn't that true, Mr. Hallett? Yes, of course it is. So I know he wouldn't. But of course, if his boss told him to open up... Now, just a minute, Lieutenant. If you're implying what I think you are... Yeah? Well, if the shoe fits... Don't worry, Mr. Hallett. You'll never be able to testify. Thanks to that bullet in his head. 
Good Lord. Breaks your heart, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You know something? Now, just a minute. Just one minute. Stop acting like a couple of angry kids. Lieutenant. Yeah, well? You say it was arson. With a murder on top of it. And Mr. Harvey... All right, all right. Now, what kind of a device was used? Device? What do you mean, What kind of a timer to set it off? Nothing. No device. Only a paraffin wick. Into a bottle or tank of some kind of that solvent in there. How long a wick? Only a couple of feet. And that means that somebody was in there only seconds before it went off. And that's somebody, Mr. Hallett. I tell you I was at home on the other side of town. That's that right, he was, you, Mr. Mr. Hallett. What did you say, Dollar? He was at home, Lieutenant. I know, because I called him on the telephone only seconds before this thing started. The slogan, join the Navy and see the world, still has the clang of truth to it, more than ever these days. But a more important aspect of the idea has been in operation in recent years. Let the world see the Navy, the United States Navy. Let the people know what a great bunch of guys there are in that traditional seagoing service. The men of the USS Providence, a cruiser in the United States Navy, did just that not too long ago. When the ship changed its home port from Boston to Long Beach, California, there was a chance to stop off at Veracruz, Mexico. Now... Mexico is one of the most fun-filled countries in the world. And the men from the USS Providence had a lot of fun making new friends for themselves and for the United States Navy. They heard that a hospital in Veracruz needed more deposits in its blood bank. A group of the Blue Jackets, on their own initiative, lined up and donated. Everybody likes kids, and the sailors from the Providence are no exception. They gave a shipboard ice cream party for the children from the local orphanage. A welcome aboard pamphlet was printed. A happy stream of visitors arrived to take a look at a small part of a great navy. For a dash of music, so close to the hearts of the wonderful Mexican people, the ship's band gave a concert of jazz in the town square of Veracruz. And the mayor said... Send us more ships like the Providence. It can't be denied that these men promoted understanding and freedom, the right of all men everywhere. Item three, ten cents for a phone call to Mr. Jonathan Buckley at his home. Luck was with me. The Hallett Industries account was in Mr. Buckley's bank. But now, look here, Johnny. You know very well I can't tell you that. Such matters are completely confidential between a banker and his client. Even though arson is involved, Mr. Buckley? Even though, Johnny. And a murder? Murder? That's right. Well? What if I were simply to say that, in spite of all the money originally transferred from his New York bank, that Hallett's financial condition is pretty bad? Oh, Would that be of any help, Johnny? It certainly would. Thanks. Another thing, Dollar. Yes, Lieutenant. After those so-called burglaries, I checked over every one of Hallett's eight employees myself. There isn't a cleaner bunch of people anywhere in town. Well, even so. I'm sure of it. What's more, I've known every one of them personally for years. Even went to school with a couple of them. Mm. So you see what I'm getting at? Hallett. Hallett is the only one we don't really know about. Where'd he come from, Lieutenant? Who knows? Do you think he'd tell us? <laughs> the truth, that is? Oh, wait a minute. Mr. Buckley, the banker. Huh? What's he got to do with it? Funds transferred, he said, from... Hey, you want to take me to a call to New York? phone call was to an old friend of mine, Lieutenant Randy Singer, Detective Division, 18th Precinct, New York Police Department. One of the best of his kind I've ever known. Okay, Johnny, let's have it. What sort of a jam do you expect me to get you out of this time? 
Now, what you doing down here in New York? I'm not. I'm up here in Hartford. Now, listen. Oh, I get it. You need an excuse to pad out that fancy expense account of yours, huh? To impress somebody. Uh, so Randy. running up a phone bill. Randy. Oh, so go ahead, Johnny. Talk it up. I'll make like I'm listening and everybody will be happy. How are you, anyhow? Randy, will you listen to me? Yeah? Does the name Harvey L. Hallett mean anything to you? Harrison Peterson. What? You heard me. Oh, come on, make sense, will you? You think we don't keep track of the crooks we've had to deal with even after they've been chased out of our fair city? Of course we do. Randy. And Paul Paraffin Peterson. Well, we couldn't get a thing on him, by the way. Randy, the man I'm interested in is Harvey L. Hallett. But we did make it pretty rough on him. We dubbed him Paraffin Pete because of his one and only method of starting a fire. And that's the name he took on after we showed him the way out of town. He and that doll of his, Mary. Only Ma would be a better word. The name, Randy? What? Oh. Well, the one you said. Harvey L. Hallis? Yep. Used to be known in these parts as Paul Peterson. Paraffin Peterson. Okay, Randy. Thank you. You hear it, Lieutenant? Sure did, Dollar. Looks like you were right. He's our man. Yeah. But you yourself are his alibi. I mean... If you were really talking to him on the phone the same time as that fire was set... Now, now, suddenly, I'm not so sure. Hallett Electronics, hmm? Well, maybe his product line includes something like... Come on, Lieutenant, we better get going. Yeah, where? Let's hope he hasn't got home from his fire yet. When we got there, Hallett was just walking into his front door, which means he didn't have time to put away the device that his wife, Mary, had been careless enough to leave sitting on a table not more than two feet away from the telephone. Oh, now, now, just a minute, Mr. Dollar. What... Yes, Hallett? You mind telling me why you two have bowled your way in here this way? <laughs> Tell it, will you... Please stop fooling around with our tape recorder until I find out what this is all about. If it's some music you want, I'll put uh, on the radio. There's nothing on that tape about a noise from a party we uh, had. Dollar, I asked you a question. Are you ready, Lieutenant? All set. All right, I'll turn it on. Oh, just a minute. Hold it, Alice. You pull that electric plug and I just might pull this trigger. This, this is ridiculous. I... Well, we'll see. There's nothing on that tape, I tell you. There's nothing oh, on it. Harvey Hallett. Merry Christmas and all that, and listen up. I'm very anxious to see you and talk to you about some problems over at my electronics plant. But I have to leave now, immediately. Well, I must... Uh, can I call you on Tuesday? On Tuesday morning, as it say, about, um... Yes, I know, dear, I know. Dollar, I'm sorry, but I have to hang up. I'll call you on Tuesday. So, Johnny? That's right, Lieutenant. Pre-recorded here, before he left to set the fire. So when I called in answer to his urgent message, all his wife had to do was hold the phone over next to this tape machine. No wonder I couldn't get a word in edgewise. Then, as soon as I hung up, she called him at the plant to go ahead. Any comment, Mr. Hallett? <laughs> Expense account total? Forget it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Fred Larkin, Johnny, at New Jersey Fire and Casualty. Fred. I hope I didn't get you out of bed. Well, you certainly did, but don't give it a second thought. How are you, Freddy? Pretty good. How are things in the grand old historical city of Trenton? Well, here in Trenton, fine. A little farther south, though, I'm not so sure. Like where, for instance? Like just outside of a little town called Woodbine. Remember it? Woodbine? Yeah, you handled a case for us down there three or four years ago. Oh, sure, sure, I remember some crook with a mattress factory pulled the old stunt of billing his clients more than they actually paid for the stuff he sold them. Right. Not knowing about that little trick, we'd give them insurance for the amount shown on those phony bills. Double what they paid. And when something happened to the merchandise... Sure, they collected twice as much from us as they were entitled to. Real nice people down there. <laughs> well, what goes this time? A couple of fires. Oh? Arson? That's what I hope you can find out. Any reason for suspicion? Yes, I think so. Like what? Why don't you run on down here and let me tell you all? Hmm? And Johnny... Yeah? If what I think is going on is going on, if you can put a stop to it before we have to pay for any more losses, 
Well, you can figure on not only your expense account, but a nice, big, fat commission to boot. Freddie, you speak the language I love to hear. I'm on the way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Jersey Fire and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Trenton, New Jersey. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the terrible torch matter. Expenses on item one, twenty dollars and a half, and that covers a taxi out to Bradley Field, then plane fare to Philadelphia, PA. Item two is fifty bucks deposit on a rental car. I headed north on Lucky 13, crossed the Delaware at Morrisville, and George Washington did, I might say, and landed in Trenton, the Jersey State Capitol, shortly after noon. Since Fred Larkin's office is right there on State Street, I made like a starving Armenian. He took the cue and hauled me over to Hildebrecht's for lunch. What makes me believe it was arson and there'll be more of it? Well, I'll tell you, Johnny. You think there'll be more of it, Freddy? Unless you can throw a monkey wrench in the works. How well do you remember Woodbine, Johnny? Oh, I don't know. It's mostly farm country down there, as I recall. That's right. And acres and acres of sandy soil, scrub oak, and pine trees. But in the little town itself is a hat factory, a couple of dress factories, and the Golden Bedding Corporation, the plant you investigated before. And which one of them burned? Uh, no, no. The two fires that we've had to pay for so far. Two? Two. They occurred just outside of Woodbine, about halfway between Woodbine and Dennisville. Mm-hmm. Uh, because those plants in town I mentioned seemed to have done pretty well, some promoters came along, bought up a couple of hundred acres, and promoted a little industrial section big enough for nearly being the factory. I see. Well, it's sort of a funny place for that kind of thing, though, isn't it, Freddie? Well, that's just the point, Johnny. It's a lousy place for such an operation. Mm. Too far for many of the regular supply sources. A long, long way to ship their finished goods. All their fuel and power have to be imported. Labor's hard to get and so on. Yeah. In other words, the big pitch for those companies to get out of the high rent, high labor cost area didn't mean a thing. They've been slowly but surely going broke. Mm. And there's nothing like a good fire to pay off the bills, provided there's plenty of insurance. Right. And like I said, there have been two of them so far. And I'm afraid there are going to be more. Why, Freddy? Well, simply because an idea like that, when it pays off so nicely, and when it can be gotten away with, can be very catching. You have a point there. Mm. When you say gotten away with, does that mean the police were able to find no signs of arson? Right. But when you talk about the police, don't forget how small that town is now. Uh, when was the last fire? About a week ago. A week? And you wait till now to call me? I know, I know, I know. But I only found out about the second one yesterday. Uh, afraid that means a pretty cold trail. But I'll see what I can do. Good. Now, how many factories are there in that little complex? About a dozen, did you say? Eleven, Johnny. And here's the point. Yeah. Eight of them are owned by people who are one way or another related to each other. Hmm. No wonder you're afraid the idea might spread. Right. All right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. I'm going to call in some help. In the form of Smokey Sullivan. Smokey Sullivan? That's right. Smokey? Yep. <laughs> uh, that sounds like the name of somebody who'd commit arson. <laughs> He's one of the best, Freddy. What? Smokey probably has set more successful fires than you and I ever heard of. He got away with it for years. Well, then I, I, I don't understand. Well, since doing time, he's gone legit. And is of more help to me over the past four years than anybody else I can think of. Well, just the same, Johnny. But he knows more about firebugs, their methods, their eccentricities, the little trademarks that some of them leave behind than any man alive, believe me. That's why he's been of such use to me. Hmm. Okay, Johnny, if you say so. You know what his job is right this minute? What? He's a kind of consultant for an arson squad up in Boston. 
It's been made a matter of public knowledge. As a result, arson up there is pretty much a thing of the past. No kidding. No kidding. Well, in that case, of course. He's on the payroll, too? Oh, whatever you say. Good. Uh, one more thing, friend. Yes? Is there any kind of a bank there in Woodbine? I don't know. I, I, I imagine not. But there's a, a loan office that I guess kind of serves as a bank. Mm -hmm. I know that some of our checks have been cashed through it. Good. Not much more than a one-man operation, though, I understand. All the better. Is it? Why? Well, could be a mighty good source of information for me. Oh? Yep. How? And for what kind of information? Let's just wait and see. Item three is a total of 4140. Covers a long-winded phone call to Boston, then Smokey Sullivan's plane fare, and finally dinner and hotel accommodations for the two of us there in Trenton. Yeah, but uh, Johnny, we could not drag it down there in South Jersey in such a little one-horse town like that. Well, why not, Smokey? Without a smart metropolitan police force to contend with, be a cinch for a good torch man. Sure. I mean, for him to get away with it. And certainly a whole string of factories, no matter how small could promise enough loot to make it worthwhile for him. Mm. Another thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, Johnny. A lot of those plants are owned by people related to each other oh. who got suckered into setting up and operating in that unlikely place by some smart promoter. Now, if that family group all came from one place, like, well, from one big city, maybe that'll give us the key as to where they dug up their fire button. Who knows? Maybe that gang has used an arsonist before or wherever they operated before. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe so, yeah, yeah. Smokey, the point is that if a couple of them have found out what they think is the answer to their financial troubles, the rest of them are liable to try it, right? Well, yeah, if it was awesome, John. That's what you've got to find out for me, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Early the next morning in my rental car, we headed south through what's known as the Piney Country, passing towns with such colorful names as Mount Holly, Indian Mills, through Hamilton, Mays Landing, and Tuckahoe. Finally, Woodbine. After signing into the motel, I gave Smokey the car keys and told him he was on his own while I paid a visit to the loan office. Smokey understood and took off. As for the loan office, it was just what Fred had thought, a one-man operation. And as for the owner, Mr. Hanley M. Becker... What's that, what? You, you, you want to know what, Mr., uh, Mr., uh, uh, Dollar, did you say it is? Dollar? That's right. Johnny Dollar. Uh, what's your business here? Well, huh? I'm a special investigator, Mr. Becker, for the company that's insured a lot of people and property down here in this section. Uh, investigator, That's huh? right. And I want to know the financial condition of every one of the 11 factories at that little industrial complex outside of town. Well, then, uh, why come to me? Well, don't you function as a kind of a bank for some of these people? Well, of course I do, but... <laughs> What's the matter with you, young man? Don't you realize that anything like that is 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 uh, completely uh, confidential? Is um, is 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 nobody's business but the banks and the uh, the the the, uh, the 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 companies? <laughs> Why? What kind of a banker do you think I am? Eh? I'm beginning to wonder. Well, you can keep right on wondering. Besides, there aren't eleven of them out there anymore. There's only nine. Thanks to a couple of fires. Yes, blasted. And if the insurance company doesn't pay off on those 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 those, those, those fires, now uh, don't you worry, boy. I'll, <laughs> I'll collect on those loans somehow. Then you have loaned those factory owners quite a bit of money. Hmm? Well, of course I have. Of course I I I I I, I, te I tell you it's none of your business. Well, I think it is. Well, you just just tell that insurance company of yours to pay off, pay off on those losses, so so I can get back to back back. Get back my money on the on the two that that burned down. Even if those fires were set. Yes, even if they, if they were. What? What'd you say? How do you know? Well, I don't. Well, how do you know they were? What? What was that? What? I said I don't know. Not for sure, that is. But I intend to find out. Yeah. Because yeah. if they were, Mister Becker, and if the owners can be tied into it. Or you or anybody else concerned. Me? Believe me, there will be no payment of insurance. You can bank on that. But, 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 but uh, <laughs> there's no insurance in the... Well, then what will I... Well, that is to say, if they, they don't... They, well, what I mean is... And, and, and you're accusing me? No, no, no. Just, just calm down. Oh, yes, yes, sure. Calm down. Well, but these, 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 these things you're saying, now, Mr. Dollar... let's take I... things one at a time, shall we? I said you've loaned them a lot of money. Haven't you? 
Well, yeah, yeah. Well, they 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 had to pay off on the property when that p -p -p promoter up north threatened to put them out of business. And what about the workers? The 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 the, the help. They had to build a lot of living accommodations for them, didn't they? Well, did they? From what I understand, Mr. Oh, yes, Becker. yes, 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 yes. You're right. There are no workers anymore. Well, <laughs> that is, there's not enough workers to mm, speak of. You mean they're out of business? Oh, yes, practically, practically. Nothing much in use out there but the warehouses where they keep their goods. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff they'll probably never use now. But... If, if, if they, they, they don't pay off on their loans, well, oh, I'll just have to take over and get what I can for those plants. Here's the ones that are, 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 are left, that is. Not if they burn down first. Not? Huh? What'd you say? Huh? Use your head, Mr. Becker. If they're burned out the way the first two were, and if we find out that there was arson involved... You, you really do think that there might be other fires? Oh, but, 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 good heavens, Mr. Dollar, don't you, don't, don't you see what, what that would mean? <laughs> I mean, if, if they're arson, like you say, why, 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 why don't you real, that would ruin me, ruin me. Possibility, isn't it? Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Oh, oh please, please, now, don't let it happen. It, it mustn't, mustn't, mustn't happen, Mr. Dollar. Listen, I'll, I'll tell you anything you want to know, anything, anything you, 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 you want to know. Just, just, just please, please, ask, ask me. Well, Mr. Just, Becker, for the moment, I think I've learned enough. Oh, but I, 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 I haven't told you anything. Oh, you haven't, hmm? I went back to the motel and waited for Smokey to come in with a report on what he'd learned at the scene of the two fires. Noon came and I went out for a bite of lunch. That's item four, a dollar ten. At 2 p.m., he still hadn't returned. It's funny. He can usually take one good look at the remains of a fire and know almost immediately if it had been sent. So perhaps he had found something to really get to work on. I hope so. But to go ahead without telling me? That wasn't like him. When he hadn't appeared by 5 o'clock, I left word where I'd be and went back to the loan office. Mr. Becker was just about to lock up for today. Oh, uh, hold everything, Mr. Becker. Eh? Who's that? Oh, oh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Oh, it's, it's it's quite all right, Mr. Dollar. Here, come in, come in, come in, please. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I've been thinking about what you told me this morning, Mr. 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 Dollar. And, yes? And, and if you're right, if you're right, why, come in, come in. Oh, oh, you, uh, you are in, aren't you? Uh, yes. Just a couple of other things I need to know, Mr. Becker, and then a favor that I want to ask. Oh, anything, Mr. Dollar. I mean, I mean, All right, now, these factory owners that you loan the money to. Yeah, for labor, housing, and uh, plant improvement. For uh, additional trucks and, and materials. Thousands, Mr. Dollar. Thousands. Oh, I'm sure. Yes, yes. And they just didn't realize, well, none of us realized that they wouldn't be able to, to make a go-go go, go of things like the hat factory, the, the clothing factories here in town. Yes. These uh, old established factories have, have no labor problem or a, a housing problem because they use people, people you know, from, from right here, the, the, the people the people here in town, yes. unlike these, these new newcomers. All right, now, Mr. Becker, these newcomers, where did they come from? What? Oh, come from? Oh, well, uh, from uh, up in, in, in North Jersey, from up around Patterson, you know, when all the, the mills, the, uh, the silk business and all the others, when they, when they went into a, 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 a slump up there. All right. Now, if I remember correctly, there were several big arson jobs up there. That means torchmen were available. That means these people would know about them, but know where to contact them if they wanted to. Well, I... Uh, so if Smokey's yeah, yeah. found out what I suspect he has... Uh, Smokey? My co-worker on this case. Oh, And oh. apparently, Mr. Becker, he's found out something... But where and what it is, I don't know yet, because he has my car with him. Oh, you need a car? Oh, here. Here, please. You use mine. Hey, you see? It, it's it's the one out there in front. Here, take the keys. Well, thank you. And and if you need me, if I can be of any help to you... Just I... give me some directions. I wondered. But no, it didn't make sense. He was no actor, and his worry and excitement looked genuine. Yet, of course, you can never be sure. Following directions, I headed south on 557, and after a couple of miles, cut over toward the old Dennisville Road. And there it was. 
The group of nine factories, obviously not in operation, and a couple of storage buildings and warehouses, all with weeds growing up around them. The same applied to a group of cottages. Shacks would be a better word, scattered out among some pine trees nearby. And then I saw my rental car. Not beside one of the burned-out buildings, but next to a big, windowless warehouse. There was no sign of Smokey Sullivan. But a metal side door on that storage building was open. Had he found another setup for a fire there inside of it? Well, there was one way to find out. Smokey! Smokey, are you inside there? Smokey? You in here? What if there's a light switch around here somewhere? Oh, oh. Smokey? Smokey? Smokey, can you hear me? Are you still alive? Smokey? Good Lord. This year, the YMCA marks its 50th anniversary of its work with and for foreign students in this country. This is just one of the countless valuable services the Y performs in your community. Right now, during National YMCA Week, your local Y invites everyone, boys and girls, young men and women, and family groups of all races and creeds to join in its activities. The Y also needs volunteer leaders. Get more out of life. Join and support your YMCA. There was still a light in Smokey Sullivan. I carried him gently to the car and drove him back to the motel in Woodbine. There, thanks to the ministrations of Dr. Rosenberg, a local medico, well, I still can't believe it, but by the time the doctor left, half an hour later... Johnny, you think... Now, uh, take it easy, uh, Smokey. You were badly beaten. Well, do you think some stupid torch man like him could knock me off, huh? Smokey, will you lie back now and relax? <laughs> I'm too tough, John. I don't care how tough you are. You've got to take it easy for a while. It was Pete. What? Pete Larison, Johnny. Larison? Yeah, from up in Patterson. Oh? Yeah, yeah. They all ties together. Yeah. Why did he do this to you, Smokey? Does Pete Larison know that you're working with me now? Well, I guess... <laughs> I guess he thought I was trying to muscle in his territory. But if he saw you go there, Johnny... And if he knows, if he knows who you are... Well, how could he? Well, you think he wouldn't? They all do. Oh, Johnny. Now, listen. If you know him, if you know what he looks look, like, as Johnny. soon as we get you back on your feet... Look, better yet, just give me a description of him. No, no, now listen to yeah. me. Tonight, he's going to fire that warehouse tonight. Tonight? Yeah, yeah, and listen. Well, it's after dark right now. I better get going. But Johnny... Smokey, I want you to settle back and rest. <laughs> About the others, Johnny. Forget it. If I stop him on this one, there won't be any others. No, no, what I mean by the others. When I got back to the warehouse and with a flashlight, now there wasn't a soul around the place. I thought. But as I slowly opened that side door again, I was almost knocked over by the smell of gasoline fumes. Then as I quietly swung the door closed and flattened against the wall, feeling around for a switch, suddenly all the lights went on. Don't reach for anything but the ceiling, Johnny Dow. That's right. I see. You're Larison. That's right. Pete Larison. And you'd pull that trigger inside this gasoline-loaded place? Be a lot better than giving you a chance to draw and pull off a shot at me. No, wouldn't it? Walter. Yeah, Pete? What? Right here in back of you, Dollar, so don't try nothing. You feel this? Oh, yeah, I feel it. Take his gun away, Walter. I'm sure he has one. Sure. Okay, I got it. Have you seen, Dollar, the elaborate preparations I've made for the little fire that we're to have here tonight? And because of all the heavy upholstery material that's stored in here, it looked to the stupid police as though it all went up because of spontaneous combustion. The 
of preparation was right. Long, narrow strips of heavy felt soaked with gasoline spread out from where he stood like the rays of a spider's web. And the strips led to various stacks of upholstery material and piles of cardboard cartons he'd also soaked with gasoline. Then moving toward me, he unrolled another heavy strip of felt, the main fuse for his operation. And you see, Dollar, all I have to do now is set a short candle on the end of this fuse right here by the door. So, then after planting you in here, I light the candle. And don't you see if they can identify what's left of you? <laughs> and if they do by any chance suspect arson, they'll think that you set this off. You, the great Johnny Dollar. Don't you know that Smokey Sullivan is still alive? They'd take his word against my perfect alibi. What alibi? By the time the candle burns down and starts the blaze, Walter and I will be sitting at his home with poor, foolish old Hanley Becker playing pinochle. Then he doesn't know about this. Becker? He doesn't know anything. He thinks we're just a couple of suckers from the city who might buy some of his overpriced farmland. No, Dollar. The only ones who know are the plant owners who've hired us. Well, thanks for that information. It's too late to do you any good. Walter. Yeah, Pete? While I take care of Dollar, you get those gasoline cans out to where we hid the car. Oh, yeah, sure. Just these two of them, ain't there? Yeah. Sure. Things happened then much faster than I can tell you about it. As Walter hosted his gun and turned to pick up the gasoline cans, I shifted my weight, and then as he passed in front of me and kicked open the door, I spun around against him. Grabbed away one of the cans, threw it over at Pete, and rolled out the door tight against the ground. Oh, and that's where Pete made his big mistake. Get away, in that room full of gasoline fumes, he pulled off a couple of shots. And went up. rolled me a hundred yards or so across that sandy ground, and I came to only a couple of minutes later. Walter, who was blown against the side of my car, ended up with a concussion. It's for Pete. Well, I don't think I need to tell you. And that's it, Freddy. The company can prosecute the factory owners any way it seems fit. Expense account total, including a chunk for Smokey, damage to the rental car and the trip home, Call it 1500 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the biggest blunder that I've ever made. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Leon Janney as Hanley Becker, Sam Bray as Fred Larkin, Mason Adams as Pete Larison, Larry Haynes as Smokey Sullivan, and James Dimitri as Walter. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. Get the news firsthand and in full, the expanded CBS News on CBS Radio Network. Johnny Dollar. This is Mary, the operator at Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Mr. Dollar. Yes, Mary. I had a call for you, but now he seems to have picked up his other phone. Oh, Les Wallace, no doubt. Oh, excuse me. Worldwide Mutual, mm -hmm. good morning. Yes, he is. I'll ring Mary? for you. I'm sorry, not you, Mr. Dollar. That was another call that came in, and I'd left your line open. Oh, okay. Look, if Les Wallace wants to call me back a little later... Oh, here you are. I can ring now. Oh, hello. Hey, you're a bum. I, I beg your pardon. I said you're... Uh, wait a minute. Who is that? Are you Johnny Dollar? That's right. Good. Dollar, this is Jonathan Harmon of Worldwide Mutual. Mr. Harmon? Uh, that's right. You sound surprised. Yes, yeah, yes, I am, Mr. Harmon. I was expecting a call from Les Wallace there in your office. Oh, I see. <laughs> and that explains your reference to a, a, a big bum, did you say? <laughs> well, I thought you two were the best pal. Oh, we are, we are, sir. But he was supposed to call me early this morning about going down to New York tonight to see a hockey game at the Garden to uh, celebrate my birthday, belatedly. Oh, I see. If, that is, he could get away from his wife for the evening. Well, I uh, hope everything's all right there, don't you? What's that, sir? I mean about Wallace and his wife. And she's such a charming little lady, too, isn't she? 
Yes, indeed, very. But he's what not you... here, and what I called you about is... Oh, I'm sorry I interrupted eh? you. Uh, no, I guess I interrupted you, Dollar, but uh, what I called you about is this, and I think perhaps you'd better get out there right away. Yes, sir. About an hour ago, shortly afternoon, a client of ours, a Mr. William Willoughby, insured for some $70,000, was found dead in his apartment over at 19525 East Maple. Oh? What was the cause of death, Mr. Harmon? As the very unfunny police officer put it, when he called, it was a case of lead poisoning. There's certainly nothing funny about that. So I think, daughter, that perhaps you'd better get right on out there and see what's what. Right away, Mr. Harmon. And if Les Wallace... Uh, fine, continue... daughter. Goodbye. Hello, Mr. Harmon? Hmm. I wonder what he meant about Les and his wife. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the can't be so matter. Expense account item one: two fifteen for a taxi to nineteen five twenty five East Maple Street. There was a prowl car out front, a small group of thrill seekers, and a patrolman with his hands full, keeping them from entering the smart new apartment building. When I showed him my credentials, he told me to go up to 5B where I'd find Sergeant Tommy Bravo in charge, and I did. Sorry, Dollar, but you got here a little too late. The boys just hauled young Willoughby, what was left of him, off to the morgue. Was it you who called the insurance company, Sergeant? Yeah. See, I knew he had a policy with him. You did? How come? Oh, we've been kind of keeping an eye on Willoughby ever since he moved back here to Hartford and put up in this fancy place. Why? You, uh, know him when he lived here before? No, I didn't. Well, he wasn't much use to himself or to anybody else. Wanted the best of everything, but wouldn't do an honest day's work to earn it. I know the type. The chief even wondered there at one time if uh, he might have had some connection with a narcotics pusher that we nabbed and set up the line. Narcotics? Well, I couldn't prove it, though. Anyhow, what he left here was to get out from under a lot of bills he owed, that sort of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. And so then when he came rolling back a couple months ago, apparently rolling and go, well, it just made the chief kind of suspicious is all. So we kind of kept an eye on him. But he stayed clean, so far as we could see. Just what happened here, Sergeant? No signs of a fight or anything like that? No. And the lab boys, before they left, well, Dollar, they, they figure it was somebody he knew pretty well. How come? Because Willoughby himself must have let him in, for one thing. Him? Uh, him, her, what's the difference? But it was probably a him. Was it? See those chalk marks on the coffee table? Mm-hmm. Lab crew made them, where a couple of drinks were sitting. Willoughby's next to that chair, and the other guy's next to this one. How'd they figure that? Well, that one had Willoughby's prints on it, and this one didn't. Did it have any prints? They were all smudged pretty badly, except one. Looked like they were deliberately smudged. So they took the glass to the lab for good look. Anyhow, there was no sign of lipstick, so it must have been a man. Hmm. And he shot Willoughby. With a cannon. I'll find out for sure down there at the lab, of course, but it looked to me like it was a forty-five at least. A forty-five? Hmm. Yeah. But Dollar, that's just about all we know so far. No other prints around or nothing. Nobody was seen entering or leaving. And if the man three doors down hadn't stayed home from work with a virus and heard the shot, uh, how did you find out about this? I got a call from Les Walters at the insurance company. Walters? Well, I should have said from Mr. Uh... Walters, huh? Yeah, why? Isn't he the one with that tall, good-looking blonde wife, name of Constance? That's right. Connie. Why? Nothing. Just that I saw her having lunch with him one day last week. Lunch? You know, in one of those intimate little joints out on 44. With Les? 
What? No. What? With our now departed pal here, Willoughby. Then I remembered. Willoughby's name was familiar. I'd never met him, but he was the one who'd made such a play for Connie before she married Les. But Les do a thing like this? Impossible. Yet Connie had been seen having lunch with Willoughby at a quiet little place out on Route 44 where the chances were they wouldn't be recognized. Had Les found out about that? Is that why Willoughby was now very dead? No, of course not. I knew Les too well. He simply wasn't the type. And the police apparently saw no reason for suspecting Les, so why should I? What's more, there wasn't a single solitary clue that might point to him. Not yet, anyway. Item two, a dollar seventy-five for another taxi. This time into the Spear Building and the office of Worldwide Mutual. No, Dollar. I thought I told you that over the phone. Lester Walters isn't here today. As a matter of fact, that's why I myself called you about the Willoughby matter. Did Les come in at all today, Mister Herman? No, eh? no, not to my knowledge. But then he pretty much keeps his own hours, you know. Sometimes when he's out selling or calling on some of his clients, he. Doesn't come in here for two or three days at a stretch. Well, he hasn't even called in or anything like that? Well, not that I know of. You can check the switchboard, however, if you like. But now, about this uh, Willoughby thing. Mr. Harmon. Uh, yes. When you talked to me on the phone earlier... Uh, yes, my boy. You said, or you indicated, you were a little concerned about Les and his wife, Connie. Well, you know how it is, Dollar. I... Well, in spite of the size of this organization, I have a real personal interest in all of my people. I'm sure you have, sir. The boys all know it, and they never hesitate to come to me with their problems, and I always try to help them if I can, financially or any other way. I'm sure you do. They always tell me everything. Oh? Except where their wives are concerned. Oh. That's the one thing they like to keep to themselves, so I never meddle. So, well, yes, I I can always tell them. Yes, I know them better than they think. But you have no real knowledge of anything wrong between Les and Connie. Oh, there's some little worry there. There's no question about it, but... Now, about the... If you'll Willoughby. excuse me, Mr. Harmon, uh, there are a couple of things that I have to do right away. Well, have you found out anything? I'm not sure. But don't worry, I'll give you a full report. Yes, I'm sure you will, my boy. I checked with Mary, the switchboard operator. No, she hadn't heard from Liz Wallace all day. But he usually checks with me, you know. I mean, when he doesn't come in this way. Excuse me. Good afternoon. I told her then where I'd be, and that if Les did call in, she was to let me know immediately and from where he called. I told her she was not to mention this to Les, the fact that I was looking for him under any circumstances. Item three, a dollar even for a cab out to the little apartment that Les shared with his wife, Connie. Joe, Johnny! Well, happy birthday, whenever it was. Hi, Connie. At least I think I heard Les say you had a birthday not long ago. Mm Mm-hmm. But what in the world are you doing in this part of town, this time of day? Well... Oh, come in, Johnny. I'll put on the percolator and we can have ourselves a coffee club. Oh, sure, Connie. Thanks. Uh, Les around? Oh, no, he isn't. You tried the office? He isn't there. Oh. Well, then he must be out selling people insurance or something. Why, Johnny? All right, it's just that we talked about uh, maybe taking in a hockey game tonight, and I haven't heard from him, that's all. Oh. Connie. Yes? Um. But come in. Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Connie, does, um... Does Les keep any kind of a gun here in the house? Oh, now that's a funny question. Especially from you. You're the gun collector. Listen, Connie... Have you added any to that beautiful collection of yours lately? No. Oh. Connie, listen to me a minute. Incidentally... You know why he wanted to take you to the game or, or, or something, don't you? Why? Well, maybe you don't realize it, but he's been trying for months to find some way of thanking you for solving that embezzlement case that got the promotion for him. When was it? Last fall? Where is he, Connie? But you know something? I'll bet he forgot all about it. I know I haven't seen any tickets around. Where is he? I'll bet he completely forgot to send for them. I just like him, too. But he'll think up some excuse or something or... or something. Connie, where is Les? 
You say he isn't at the office? Well, he, he, he did say something about some errands when he left this morning, but I, I don't... What's the matter, Johnny? You're acting very peculiarly, you know it? Maybe I, uh... Maybe I better lay things right on the line, Connie. What? Do you know a Bill Willoughby? Oh. Well? Yes. Go on. Bill, you sort of had a crush on me, Johnny, before I married Liz. And? That's all. Is it? Have you seen him since he moved back here to Hartford? Now, why should I want... Well, he, he called me a couple of times. Have you seen him, Connie? Johnny! Please tell me. Yes. Yes, I have. But these questions, Johnny... Tell me. Well, I, I, I don't see what... All right. One day last week, Thursday, I guess it was. I, I was way out on Albany Avenue. That's Route 44. Yes. Uh, a seamstress who lives out there did some work on a dress for me. On the way back, I stopped at a gas station and... Johnny, what's all this about? Just go on, Connie. Well, Bill Willoughby was also there getting some gas. He insisted on taking me to lunch in one of those little places way out there and... Well, that's all. That's all? Oh, well, he talks some nonsense about still being in love with me and wanting to see me again, but... Have you seen him again? Well, I certainly have not. When he started talking like that, I, I just got up and left him there. After all, I never really cared for him, and... Johnny? Connie, did Les know that you had this date with Willoughby? But it wasn't a date. Not really. Not at all. Well, did Les know about it? Did you tell him... What difference do you possibly make? Well, Les can be pretty jealous, can't he? Les? Of course not. You say that as though you don't really mean it. Of course I do. Well, where is he, Connie? Where's he been all day? Johnny. Johnny, how should I know? I think you do. Will you please tell me what this is all about? Will you please tell me why you're being so evasive. But I... Uh, oh, excuse me, that's the telephone. Hello? Why, yes, he is. Uh, it, it's for you, Johnny. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. This is Mary at Worldwide Mutual. Oh, yes, Mary. I just found out, Mr. Dollar, there was a call from Mr. Lester Walters. Oh? Phoebe took it early this morning before I came on duty. Yes? He was checking in to see if there was any messages for him and to say that he wouldn't be in today. Or I maybe see. even tomorrow. Or maybe the next day, the day after. Oh, and, and that call was collect. Uh, from where, do you know? Oh, yes, we always check. It was from Equity 30114. That's over in Waterbury, you know. I know. And it sounds familiar. Thank you, Mary. Johnny. Now, listen, Johnny, will you please tell me... Later, what... Connie. Later. I went to a phone booth at the nearest gas station and spent item four. Forty cents for a call to that equity number that had sounded so familiar. I hoped and prayed that I was wrong about it. That it wasn't. A back off gun shop. Who? Backoff's gun shop. Gun shop? Can I help you? Uh, did a Mr... A Mr. Lester Walters buy a gun from you recently? Lester Walters? Uh, yes, yes, just this morning, early this morning. What kind? It was a handgun, a forty-five. Forty-five. Yeah, it was one that we... Now, now, wait. Who are you, if I may ask? Never mind. Not everyone is as lucky as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, who has an unlimited expense account. In many communities throughout the nation, though, 
high school youngsters are learning to conduct profitable businesses. They're learning by doing, running their own miniature business firms under the sponsorship and guidance of Junior Achievement Incorporated. To find out more about this unique project and how you may help it expand, write to Junior Achievement Incorporated, 500 Fifth Avenue, New York 36, New York. I still couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. And yet all the evidence, every bit of evidence I had. Sure, it was circumstantial, that's all, every bit of it. But it all pointed to only one person, to my friend, Les Walters. I still couldn't believe it. Yet there it was. His failure to check in at the office the way that he usually did, didn't he know that would arouse suspicion? His slip-up on our date for the hockey game, didn't he know that would make me suspicious? Connie's having been seen with Willoughby. If the cops knew about that, why not Les? And then Connie's evasiveness about Les's whereabouts. But did she really know about what finally happened to Willoughby? And the gun. A forty-five did it, Sergeant Bravo had said. A forty-five, the gun shop owner had said. That was sold to Les only that morning. All right, there it was. Okay, now what? Go to the police? Tell them what I knew? Well, let them find out for themselves. Why not? They had as much to go on as I had. Almost. It was their job to run down Willie's killer just as much as mine, wasn't it? Yes, and it was my job just as much as theirs. My dirty, rotten, lousy job. Why? Why did it have to be? Couldn't I? Couldn't I just... No. No, I couldn't, and I knew I couldn't. If Les did commit that murder, if, if, I made another call there in the phone booth. Sergeant Bravo. Uh, Sergeant Johnny Dollar. Hey, Dollar, have I got news for you? Real progress. Oh? So much so, the lieutenant took it right out of my hands. And, Dollar, you'd never guess who's the guy they've got a lead on. Wouldn't I? Ought to be wrapped up real pronto. And like I promised, I'll call you just the second I've got anything real definite for you. Are you at your apartment? No, uh, you can reach me at Les Walter's place. At Walter's? That's right. Well, now, what do you know? Too much, Sergeant. Too much. Now, I don't know, and I don't know when he's coming back. And, Johnny Dollar, you just sit yourself down here in the den and tell me why you're acting so strangely. Now, sit down, Johnny. Please. Sure, sure, Connie. Look, would you like a drink? <laughs> maybe that would help whatever it is that's bothering you. Yeah, maybe it would. All right, then. I'll go get you. Oh, now, who could that be? Uh, excuse me. to find you here waiting for yes. me, Johnny. Kind of spoils all the big surprise. Johnny. But here you are, baby. Catch it. Thanks, Johnny. Les. Well, uh, don't you like it, Johnny? Should I? Oh, now look. Yes, after seeing that gun collection of yours and seeing what was missing from it and after what you did for me last fall and with that birthday you had, well, listen, I've been negotiating with the old man uh, Berghoff over in Waterbury for two weeks to get this for you and I, What's the matter, Johnny? Hmm? Johnny? Oh, yes, Connie. That uh, phone call is for you. Uh, 
Sergeant Bravo, I think he said. Oh, uh, th- thanks. Uh, Johnny? No. Johnny Dollar. Well, it's all wrapped up, darling. Well, yeah. Yep. Prints on that glass led the lieutenant straight to him. Well, what was that? The killer, the one that knocked over Willoughby. It was Shorty Scarpone, one of his pals in the dope bracket. Broke down and confessed the whole thing when the lieutenant busted in on him. And Dollar. Oh, brother. Oh. Johnny. Okay, now, what is bothering you? What's bothering you, anyway? Me? Yes. Yes, you. Not a thing. Believe me. Not a thing. Connie, where is that drink and we'll celebrate? Good. My birthday and a lot of things. (laughs) I can only tell you this. I was never so glad to be wrong in my life. And I mean all wrong about a kiss. Expense account total? What expense account? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a talisman. A good luck charm that proved to be anything but. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Mason Adams as Sergeant Bravo, Margaret Draper as Connie Walters, Arthur Cole as Jonathan Harmon, Pat Housley as the telephone operator, Casey Allen as Les Walters, and Sam Gray as Mr. Burkhoff. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hanna speaking. Durwood Kirby's favorite program, The Gary Moore Show, on the CBS Radio Network. WROW All Bank. Welcome wagon hostesses rate their work as the most fascinating public relations job in the whole world. In the United States and in neighboring Canada, too, you will find thousands of welcome wagon hostesses who do a vitally important job every day of the week. Right here in the Capital District, there are more than 20 welcome wagon hostesses, your neighbors and mine, each one a charming ambassador of goodwill. We'd like you to meet one right now. I'm Lenny Gannett. I welcome all the newcomers in the McGonville, Gibbon area. I try to make new families feel at home. The basket of gifts I bring is just a small part of my welcome. I'd like to call on your new neighbor. All you do is tell me who she is. Call Welcome Wagon at State 59640. Give the hostess the name and address of the newcomer you know. She'll call on them with a basket full of gifts from civic-minded businessmen. Call State 59640 for Welcome Wagon. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Ted Newberry over here at good old Union States Casualty. Well, hi, Ted. What's this I hear about you going off the deep end a couple of weeks ago and getting yourself engaged to, uh, what's her name, uh, Mary Ann Hooper? Idle rumor, son. Just idle rumor. Oh, since when does an idle rumor hit the society pages of the Sunday paper? Oh, that. You mean this was just another false alarm? Just a sly bit of skullduggery by Mary Ann's mother. <laughs> she figured if it hit the papers, then I'd have to pop the question to her darling daughter. But Johnny, my boy, it backfired on her. How do you mean? When Mary Ann saw that blurb, she got so mad, she not only won't speak to her mother, she won't even see or talk to me. <laughs> Instead of you having to worm your way out of a romance again. Right. 
Thanks to dear old mama, and without having to go through any soppy farewell scenes, I'm back in circulation and ready to play the field. Well, just you wait, though, Ted. Huh? When you do fall, and I mean all the way, including the marriage route, you are going to fall so hard the crash will be heard halfway around the world. No, Johnny. The only girl in this world I could ever really take seriously who has the looks and figure and brains and wit and charm and all the other attributes. Oh? Who that? Uh, Pandora. Pandora Peters, the most beautiful, most charming, most everything gal I ever knew. So when she does finally come to see me, see and talk to me, okay, what happens? Oh, tell me. All she wants to know is how and where and when she can see and talk to you. Well, you can't win them all, you know. What was that? You heard me, so it looks like you're the lucky one. And, uh, she's really everything you say she is? Everything. So I smothered my feelings and set up a date for you, subject, of course, to your confirmation. When? Today, okay? Why not? What time? 2.30. That's about a half an hour from now. Great. Now, let's think about the place. It's all set. Oh, it is, hmm? Where? In this cozy, quiet little office of mine. Oh, now, wait a minute, Ted. That's what I suggested. That's what she agreed to, so that's the way it'll have to be. Oh, Teddy, you're a bum. Take it or leave it, Johnny. Well? I'll be there. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Union States Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the nugget of truth matter. I shaved, showered, put on a clean shirt and a new tie, taking my time about it, then spent item one, a dollar thirty, for a cab into Ted Newbury's office at Union States. Ah, here he is, the answer to a fair maiden's prayer. You look like a million, Johnny. Hi, Ted. Sit down, huh? Sure. But I thought I said 2.30. You mean I'm late? Late? Let's see, it's only 2.18. Oh, you really made time. <laughs> After that pitch you gave me, what did you expect? Ah, uh, that Pandora. Well, yeah, where is she? Oh, but there's one thing I just plain forgot to tell you. Yes, Teddy, like what? Johnny, uh... She's married. Well, no reaction? Mm. Well, I suppose I could take off my jacket and mop up the floor with you. Well, let's say you could try. And certainly it is the very least you deserve. But what's the use? All that build-up was just to drag me out of my nice, comfortable apartment and down here to take on some kind of assignment. Now, just wait till you see her. Sure. But what's it all about, Teddy? Well, the guy to whom she's happily married is young Philip Truesdale Peters. Good family and all that, but no money. Mm -hmm. That is not much at the moment. But Johnny, thanks to some electronic gadget he's invented and with her dough to get him started. Wait a minute, Ted. Is that the new little plant about ten blocks east of here? That's the one. And one of these days, maybe he'll make it. Well, good for him. Good for that money of hers, you mean. Oh, she's loaded? No, but she has enough. Anyhow, they're both clients of ours, straight life policies. How much, then? Something over a hundred thousand apiece. Hmm. And each of them is the other's beneficiary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, don't get any wild ideas. In spite of the fact that he needs money to push this invention of his? Well, don't worry. He doesn't need her dead to get it. Well, just the same, Teddy. It's... Oh, now, come on, Johnny. Give that suspicious mind of yours a rest for a change. The way you talk sometimes, you'd suspect your own mother of murdering for a couple of bucks. Well, maybe I do go overboard once in a while. Hey, what's the matter? Through this portal, it's about to pass the most beautiful girl in the world. What? You said, you Barry, are the biggest flatterer in the world. <laughs> if only that handsome husband of yours wasn't bigger than I am. But come in, my lovely, come in. Thank you. Mrs. Peters, Pandora, this is Johnny Dollar. Well, hi. Johnny. <laughs> I'll say this. 
what I stood there staring at was worth staring at. 25 or 26, maybe. Tall, willowy, blonde. A faultless complexion with just enough makeup to enhance her natural beauty. Eyes are kind of gray-green with little smile wrinkles at the corners. A cute little tilt of her nose and soft, full lips. Mm. And a darn attractive figure in a dress that didn't hurt it one bit. But there was something missing. Or maybe it was the other way around. Something there that shouldn't have been there. In her voice, in her eyes, I'm not sure. But there was a subtle coldness there that wasn't quite right. Not with all that beauty. The calm, calculating female that's invariably more deadly than the male. I wondered. I said hi, Johnny. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. And did I lie to you, Johnny, about this gorgeous, glamorous creature? Oh, now, Teddy. What so help me how anybody like you could ever have any problems? Pandora, I... But just... I do have one. And I'm afraid it's a pretty serious one. That's why I wanted to see you, Johnny. Well, what is it, Pandora? Johnny, somebody is threatening to murder me. Really? Uh, Here, Pandora, you, you better sit down and tell us what this is all about. Yes, thank you. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I am. Just the key to the Peters family car. Yeah. Thank you. Wait a minute. What? A little charm on this keychain. How about that? A little golden skull. Mm, very unique. Looks hand carved. Well, it is, Johnny. From a single nugget that my grandfather found out in California back in the 1800s. Oh? It's my good luck talisman. Well, if you're being threatened, honey, you'd better hang on to it. Don't you worry. I will. But now, let me tell you. Yes, I think you'd better. Well, it started about two months ago. Little notes dropped into the mailbox. We live out on Barkley Drive, you know. Better put that down, Johnny. It's 128 Barkley Drive. Oh, I'll remember it. Go on, Pandora. It was right after Phil got the final patent on his invention. Uh, just what is that invention, by the way? Oh, it's some kind of an electronic battery, I guess you'd call it. Mm -hmm. Just a tiny little thing that might be used in rockets or something. Mm -hmm. And Philip hopes to make a lot of money with it. You don't sound too enthusiastic about it. Well, I wasn't. At first, Johnny. It looked to me and my lawyer like just a waste of time and money for him to work on it. But when those notes started, well, I told Philip to go ahead with it. At least until the money ran out. So he put up that little factory building and he's buying machinery and all sorts of things for it. The threatening notes made you change your mind. Yes. Why? Because I'm just plain stubborn, I guess. Well, what'd they say? Well, the first one started out with a quotation. A kind of a religious thing. What was it? Do you remember? What profit is it a man if he gain the whole world but suffer the loss of his own soul? Uh -huh. And then it went on to say that for one person alone to profit from such a device was all wrong. Was sinful. Unless you give it to the whole world, you'll be sorry. That sort of thing. That doesn't seem like such a dire threat, Pandora. And what's more, it was meant for your husband. Well, that's what we thought, Johnny. And Phil just laughed at it. He said it was the work of some crackpot. Just the same, Pan. He should have taken it to the police. Well, he did, Teddy. And their opinion? They agreed with Phil. Because of that word sinful, they said it was probably some religious fanatic that such things happen all the time. Mm. But then more of them came. And they got more threatening. Threats against my life, Johnny. Your husband's life, you mean? Well, we still thought so. And the police gave Philip a sort of a bodyguard for a while. But then yesterday, another one came in the mail. It was addressed to me. In my name. And it said... Yeah? It said that... Oh, here. Here, Johnny. I, I made this copy of it. Well, let's see Blind, foolish woman, it is you who are guilty because of your money and that device of the devil. It is you who must die, and very soon. Do you see, Johnny, why I'm worried now? Oh, well, darn well I'd be, you poor gal. Pandora, yes. the police have the originals of the notes? Oh, yes, but they say it's just the work of some fanatic who's trying to scare us. 
I don't think so now. Now I'm frightened. Now? What? You weren't frightened for your husband when you thought they were meant for him? Oh, well, no. Because, well, he just sort of passed them off. He laughed at them. The way the police did. But now, well, don't you see? Yeah, um, maybe I do. Now, what do you mean by that, Johnny? Or, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I am getting all upset over nothing. Maybe it's just some crackpot. But won't you find out, Johnny? Won't you make sure? Pandora, you very well. What are your plans for the rest of the day? Well, I, I can, can't just stay locked up in the house all the time. Of course not. At least not unless you've got some police protection out there. Yes, well... Where's Phil now? Over at the new plant. Huh? It's in operation already? No, but he goes down every day in case they deliver machinery and furniture and things. And what time does he get home? The bus always drops him off in front of the house about 5.15. And your plans meantime? Well, I have to do some shopping and have a fitting here in town about 3.30. That'll take about an hour. Yeah. Then I'll drive out to that farmer's market on Spring Road where I always buy the meat. I promised to a steak tonight. And then? Then it'll be time to go home and get dinner ready. At least that's what I planned. But what should I do? Well, until I've had a talk with the police, I see no reason for you to change those plans. Now, listen, Johnny, she needs protection, so if there's anything I can do... Well, no, it's all right, Teddy. With Johnny on our side now, I think everything will be all right. You don't feel that you need police protection? Well, do you? I mean, until you find out how serious these threats really are. Unless the police convince me otherwise. I'll be in touch, Pam. Good. Thank you. I feel better already, Johnny. You're a darling... And thank you, too, Teddy, dear. Bye. What a gal. I don't get it. Huh? What do you mean you don't get it? Teddy, there is something very fishy about this thing. Very fishy. Expense account item two, a dollar twenty for a cab back to my apartment where I picked up my own car and then headed out in the direction of the Peter's home, way out on Barclay Drive. But after driving all of half a dozen blocks, the car suddenly conked out on me. By the time I got a tow from the auto club to a service station and a repair job on my carburetor by the slowest mechanic I ever saw, it was after five o'clock. So instead, I drove to police headquarters and talked to Sergeant Bill Budd. Johnny, I've been on top of this thing from the very first of those notes to Peter's. Or to his wife. And the last one apparently was addressed to her. The last one, yeah. Well, if I were you, I'd put somebody on that gal 24 hours a day, Sergeant, until we find out where those notes are coming from. Now, you listen to me, Johnny. Go ahead. That's just what we did for him right in the beginning for nearly two months. Good men do not even he had any idea they were on him looking out for him. What happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You figured the notes were just the work of some nuts? That's what I told them. Meantime, we nearly broke our necks trying to find out where they were coming from. We bore down on every fanatic, every troublemaker in the town, and we know them all. Nothing. Then, suddenly, I got wise. How do you mean? You know very much about those two, the Peterses. Well, frankly, no. Well, in the first place, they aren't as lovey-dovey as they look. Oh? No? no, sir. And she has the money, Johnny. Some money, anyhow. Yes, so I understand. And I know it for a fact that she didn't want to sink a lot of it in that crazy invention of his. Crazy? Well, he couldn't get any of the big companies interested in it. I know that. But he was bound he'd go ahead with it. You know what I think? What, Sergeant? I think she started writing those notes in the hopes of scaring him out of it, out of spending her dough on it. You see, if he did scare and quit by himself, then he wouldn't blame her for his giving up on it. And, uh, Johnny, yeah. that would explain how those notes were getting to him, in spite of all our attempts to locate the source. See? Well, it's a possibility, I suppose. But what about the one addressed to her? She hoped that would be the clincher, that's all. Mm. Of course, your little theory might explain why she didn't jump at the chance to have a bodyguard. You suggested that to it? Yeah. But uh, there is still another possibility, Sergeant. You mean that he's been writing them? Mm-hmm. So nobody suspect him if he knocked her off to collect all her nice insurance money. Right. In other words, until we can clear this thing up... Wait a minute, Johnny. You think I'm going to put tails on both of them, on the house, on that plant for 24 hours a day? No. Uh, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Bud. Uh, Mr. Peters. Sergeant, I knew it. I told you something like this would happen. And don't you see, after that last threatening letter, it was Pandora. It was she. This killer was oh, after. Now, wait, wait a minute. Because it's been... Her money going into my invention, into the plant, and oh, this is terrible, terrible, now, terrible. Now, wait, wait a minute. What do you want, Conroy? I'm sorry, Sachin. I try to keep him from barging in this way. What's the matter with you? Aren't you going to do something about this terrible thing that's happened? Or... Well, what terrible thing? 
You know what he's talking about, Conroy. Uh, yes, sir, Sergeant. You see, I'm the one that found the body. The what did you say? The body. Yes, don't you understand? Don't you understand? My wife, Pandora, she's been murdered. Frontiers change rapidly today. Mostly, they seem to expand. Lately, they show even promise of expanding right into outer space. CBS News is presently covering the effort to break into space, and when the time comes to report news out in space, CBS newsmen will be looking for space helmets with room for microphones. Through the facilities of the CBS radio network, expanded CBS News, brought into your home hourly, combines with this station's local reports to give you up-to-the-minute accounts of events that change the world. Listen to expanded CBS News every hour on the hour, weekdays, here. Your wife was murdered, Mr. Peters? Yes, yes, Pandora. Somebody killed her. When, Mr. Peters? Where? How should I know? I'll ask this policeman. He's the one who found her. You didn't see her? No, ask him. He's the one who knows about this horrible, terrible, awful thing. Come on. If only you'd taken those letters seriously, we could have prevented now, this. Mr. Peters, if you want our help, you've got to calm down and pull yourself together. Right here. Here now. Maybe you better take a slug of it. No, 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 no. I'm... Now, take I'm a drink. Sorry, I'm take sorry, a drink I'm of this sorry. brandy. Now, go on. Go ahead. All right, all right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Please, officer, tell tell them what, what you found. Yes, go ahead, Conroy. Well, I was out in my prowl car, you see, in the Spring Road section, my regular beat. Yeah. Well, somebody reported there was a car blocking that little side road into the woods about half a mile this side of the Spring Road shopping section, you know? Where, uh, Pandora went to the meat market. Yes, yes she always bought the meat at the same place out there. And she said that for dinner tonight... Oh, okay, would... okay. Now, I can't... It's all right, now, wait. Go ahead, Tom. Yes, sir. Well, I investigated, and I found this car parked there with nobody inside of it, and the motor was still running, you know. Go on. So, well, I decided maybe I'd better look around, so I did. And that's when I found her, over at the side of that little pond that's out there. Her head all bashed in. Oh, terrible way to catch us, Sam. Some other other way you... Now, come on, please, please. Go on, Conroy. Well, I went on back to her car, cut off the engine, and then went back to the prowl car. Got on the horn to headquarters to Lieutenant Briggs. He's in homicide, you know? Yes, yes, I know. Well, him and Doc Campbell arrived at the scene a few minutes later, and I told them all I knew, and they took over. To the best of my knowledge, you're still out there. Well, did you find the weapon that was used on her, Conroy? Oh, no, 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 sir. You asked the sergeant that got thrown into that muddy little pond. You'll never find it in there. Yeah, it may be. No, sir... I mean, with all the mud in the bottom of that thing? Yeah. Must well, be a layer uh, of it, 10, 12 feet deep in the bottom, yeah, you know? Yeah, okay. I mean, with all the trees around it. Okay, Conrad. And I know. Account of some kids trying oh. to swim in it last summer. Conrad. One of them got stuck. I had to haul them out. And if I hadn't have gotten there when I Conroy, did... Conroy, where and when did you find Mr. Peters? Oh, I drove right out to his house, Mr. Dollar. I figured somebody ought to tell him. I see. You were uh, home by then, Mr. Peters? Yes. I was... Worried sick when I found she wasn't there and had left no message. It wasn't like her. And, well, after those threatening letters, I'd, I, I knew something was wrong. I knew it. And, well, when this officer came and told me what he'd found, Pandora. Yes, sir. That's when he insisted I bring him right here to see you, Sergeant. Yes. You, uh, you didn't take him to the spot out there in the woods. No, sir. He had me bring him directly in here. And, Sergeant, if you if you don't do something about this, if if, if you don't find this now, killer... Look, we're going to do everything we can now, Mr. Well, if you'd done something before instead of just just talking about it, this wouldn't have happened. Mr. Peters... No, no, there's nothing to worry about. It's only some crackpot, some troublemaker. It was a killer. I can understand that. It was a killer. I'm telling you, we're going to do everything we can. Mr. Peters... Now, excuse me, i got to take this... Sergeant Biden. My wife has been murdered. Yes, he is, Lieutenant. For you, Conroy. Me, huh? Okay, thanks. Now, yes, sir. Let's see now. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess I. Well, well gee, I'm sorry. Well, now, what has he done? Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Sure, whatever you say. I'll be out there right away. Did you pull another boner, Conroy? Well, I, uh. 
I stuck the keys to that car in my pocket after I turned off the engine. The lieutenant wants them. Well, go ahead then. Take them out to him. Wait a minute. Can I see those keys, Conroy? Oh, sure, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Yeah. What? Just an ordinary set of car keys, Dollar? Yeah. And that's why they give us the answer to this whole thing. Yes, sir. Oh, I hope so. You have a set of these, too, haven't you, Mr. Peters? Why, yes, of course. May I see him, please? Yes, of course. Here you are. Thanks. Hey, will you look at that, sir? Yeah, that's some gold nugget carved to look like a skull. It's just a, a sort of a, a good luck talisman. Good luck? Yes. I'm afraid, Mr. Peters. Not for you. What? These are the keys your wife had early this afternoon when I talked to her. That means that to get hold of them, you had to be with her. Between the time I saw her and the time her body was found. Dollar. That also means, Mr. Peters, that... Well, do you want to tell us? But I had to. Don't you see, I, I had to kill her. Because of the money. Because I, I needed the money for my invention. I had to kill her. Sergeant, don't you think somebody better take this all down? I sure do. Thanks. Thanks. So, with that full confession, complete with signature, there'll be no problem. He did it. He'll pay for it. Expense account total, and I may as well include the work on my car. Do you think you can afford all of 20 bucks? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the most unlikely crook I've met in a long, long time. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Rita Lloyd as Pandora Peters, Jim Stevens as Ted Newberry, Don McLaughlin as Sergeant Bud, Court Benson as Philip Peters, and Bill Lipton as Conroy. Be sure to join us next week same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. Durazuto's Sports Time scores for the fans Monday through Saturday on the CBS Radio Network. By any chance, happen to remember a case you accidentally got yourself involved in just four weeks, three days, and 13 hours ago? What? In the course of which you saved a man's life. Well, if you're talking about that federal man, the fellow from the Bureau... Wait a minute. Hal? Yeah. Hal Leonard. That's right. You're okay again. I sure am. Hale, hearty, and back to normal. Well, thank goodness for that. But if you hadn't just happened to walk in from the back room of Becker's print shop that night, Johnny, I'd be pushing up the well-known daisy. Oh, I don't know about that, Hal. Well, I do, and I'll be eternally grateful, Johnny. Oh, forget it. But you, uh, you didn't answer my question. Do you remember just what happened that night? Well, of course. The miracle is that you remember now. Yeah, I guess it is. Believe me, complete amnesia is nothing to laugh at. Yeah, the wallop on the head that character gave you must have been a dilly. One more like it would have killed me. But then you walked in like the U.S. Marines. Would you forget it? Forget it, huh? Sure. I mean, after all, it was just a matter of luck, my being there in the back room of that shop. 
And all because I had the mistaken idea that Becker was fencing some loot from a burglary job. Instead, you uncovered his real racket, the one I was investigating. Well, let's say I stumbled on it. So, what happens? I don't know. What happens? You, one Johnny Dollar, the real hero of that fracas, end up eligible for a nice long prison term. Well, that's just a matter of... What? Sure. Prison term? That's what I said. For what? Possession. Possession of what? Of evidence. Evidence? Yeah, think now. Weren't you busy packing a lot of the stuff you'd found in the, into the back of your car when you heard him slug me and came barging in on us? Holy smoke, Hal, you're right. So, where is it now? Still in the back of my car. And you know the penalty for possession, so maybe I'd better fly up there and take it off your hands. Oh, I'll be waiting, Hal. I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Takes a Crook matter. So help me, I've forgotten all about that evidence I picked up at Becker's shop. And of course the federal boys would want it, would need it, to prosecute their case. The reason I'd forgotten it was because I hadn't used my car for some four weeks. All my investigations had been out of town. Well, it would only take Hal a couple of hours to get up from Washington. I could simply meet his plane and... Hmm. Johnny Dollar. Les Walters, Johnny, over here at Worldwide Mutual. Oh, of course. How are you, Les? Uh, you want to take a run over here to see me? What about? Well, you ever hear of the More Madonna? The what? It's a painting, an oil painting, and a pretty famous one. Oh, sure, sure. It was the pièce de résistance in that exhibition over at the Manhart Galleries. Yeah, that's the one. Painted by Marcel More and worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Hal, hmm? why anybody would ever pay $200,000 for an impressionistic atrocity like that is something I will never understand. Uh, well, the point is, friend, somebody did. We insured it to the hilt and... Now it's gone. Uh-oh. Yeah. Can you get on it right away? Well, almost right away. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, Les, I have to stick around for a while to meet one of Uncle Sam's boys coming up from Washington. Aha! Uh -huh, they finally caught up with you. Happy <laughs> days in the clink. You know something, Les? Yeah. For what I have in my possession, I could be locked up for life. You're like what, Johnny? Well, I don't think I'd better go into it. But as soon as he gets here and picks it up... Well, when will that be? Well, according to a timetable, he should pull into the airport around 7.05 p.m. Well, now, look, uh, I'm working late on this thing, so, uh... Well, in the meantime, why don't you come on over here and let me tell you what I know about this stolen painting? Good idea. Why not? Okay, good. I'm on my way. Well, looks like a busy evening ahead. Instead of calling for a taxi, the usual procedure when I was on expense account, I decided to use my own car. It would give me a chance to make certain that all important evidence in the federal case was still safely locked up in the trunk. Matter of fact, on the way down to my garage, I decided that it might be a better idea to take the stuff out, take it back up to my apartment where I could check it over. Now remember this. It was nearly 5 p.m. of a dark and cloudy day. My unlighted garage is at the back of the apartment building but faces out toward the sidewalk in the street. And it has one of those quick lift doors on it. There wasn't much in the way of traffic or pedestrians. Here we are. First, we make sure the stuff is still in here. Yep. 
Yep. Sure is. Now, if I can just pile these stacks together, and carry them upstairs in one load. There we are. Ooh, brother, when I think of all the people who would like to hear my friends. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. Who slammed down the door out there? Not out there, mister. What? I'm right in here. Ah! It's fun to get your adventure vicariously from programs like yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But you can have the real thing, adventure in far less dangerous form, by joining the Peace Corps. Helping the people of the new and underdeveloped nations of Africa, Asia, and Latin America is an immensely satisfying adventure. The Peace Corps needs qualified teachers, engineers in all fields, and farm experts. If you're interested in a fascinating life, write to Peace Corps, Washington 25, D.C. Just when I came to, I'm not sure. But as I lay there on the floor of my garage, I wondered for a few minutes if my skull was still in one piece. It was, but there was a very fancy lump on the back of it, and I was so dizzy I could hardly get to my feet. I managed to feel my way to the door, painfully pushed it up and open, and in what little light came across from one of the street lamps saw just exactly what I expected. The trunk of my car was still open and very, very empty. I must have been hit pretty hard because I passed out again for a few minutes. Then I got up again and staggered around to the front door of my apartment house, though I could barely make out where I was going. I half remembered stuffing something into the pocket of my jacket. Something I'd all the while had tightly clenched in my right hand. foyer, I clumsily stumbled against a man who was pushing a doorbell under one of the mailboxes. Oh. Oh. Hey, take oh, it easy, old man. I'm sorry, I, uh... Have yourself a little too much... Johnny! What? Johnny, what happened to you? Oh, oh here. Uh, let me give you a hand. Hell. Yeah. Here now. Yeah, let it... Uh... Yeah. Say, it looks like somebody really worked you over. Listen. Now you listen. Let's get you upstairs to your apartment and find out what this is all about. Got away with all of it, huh? Yeah, I, I'm afraid so, Hal. Oh. Now just lie still and take it easy, will you? Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, sure, Hal. You, uh, want another little snort of this? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 oh. All I want is just to lie here and sleep for about three weeks, that's all. Well, you do that while I run this thing down. Now, Johnny, you're sure you, you didn't get a look at him? Oh, how when he when he yanked the door to when he yanked the door down behind my back, he, inside the place was just dark as pitch. But you left the garage open. Yeah. And wait a minute, somewhere somewhere in this pants pocket here. Yeah. I have the keys to the garage. And the keys to my car in case you need it. Okay. Now, you get some sleep. I'll be back in time to get you some breakfast, if not before. Oh, thanks, Al. You are a good man. You know something? I think I might have slept for three weeks. If it hadn't been for the telephone there beside my bed. You know something else? That darn instrument gets me up and going like nothing else in the world. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, where under the sun have you been? Les. Yeah, that's right, Les Walters. I waited around my office until after 7 o'clock, then I left word with a watchman and came on home. Oh, and I still didn't hear from you by, uh, well, let's see, it's, uh, it's after 10.30. What happened to you anyway? Oh, plenty, Les. I just couldn't make it. Well, I hope you can now. Sure, sure. Uh, well, look, uh, to save time, instead of coming over here to my place, you go see Mr. Thaddeus Brittingham, the man the painting was stolen from. Uh, he can tell you more than I can. Uh, let's see, he lives in uh, apartment 7B at the Selfridge. The Selfridge? Yeah, you, you know, that fancy, big, new apartment building over on the other side of town. 
Seven B. That's right, Seven B. I'll phone him and tell him that you're coming. Yeah, yeah, Les, you do that. But instead of going over to the Selfridge, I ran up item one. Item one? At this stage of the game? Anyhow, it's 90 cents for a taxi to a rooming house of a character who calls himself Little Willie. To put it bluntly, Little Willie is a stool pigeon. One of the few that even the police don't know about. And they know most of them. The reason I picked on him was because of his almost uncanny knowledge of art thieves and their activities. Oh, hiya, Johnny. Willie... I've got 50 bucks I thought maybe you might find some use for. Only a hundred, Johnny? When I've been just sitting here waiting for you to pay me a visit? Oh? About what? That Maureen Madonna. What else? And ain't it worth a hundred if I can tell you where to look? <laughs> All right, Willie. A hundred. You see, I know there was something up when I seen him sitting there day after day. Who, Willie? Sitting where? At that gallery. The gallery, hmm? But just looking wasn't enough, I guess. So that's when he took it. Took it home to copy it. Who, Willie? And him being one of the best copiers ever lived. Why, Johnny, he could almost fool the artist himself. But listen. Yeah? You better get on him pretty fast. He never made a copy unless he had a customer. And with the one he'll get for a copy of that Madonna, well, he ain't going to stay around. He'll get out of the country. Willie. 150, did you say, Johnny? And that painting worth a couple of hundred grand? Okay, okay. Okay. Old Charlie Starkey. Charlie Starkey? Out of the pen again, hmm? Yeah. Hmm. Where'll I find him, Willie? He's been renting a room at 324 South Crocus. Good. But if he's already finished his copy and made a sale... Willie, let me worry about that. Item two, the $150 I mailed in cash to Little Willie on the way out of my apartment. I should have waited, because item three is $1.70 for a taxi over to another dingy little rooming house at 324 South Crocus. But I got there too late. Yep, old Charlie Starkey, his mission accomplished, had paid off his landlady, a character by the name of Sally Botts, and had taken a powder. Yeah, he's gone. Not more than a half hour ago. I see. Well... Okay, Mrs. Butts. And I'll say this, mister. He sure left in a big hurry. Oh, I don't doubt it. Left all his paint pots and stuff and all his extra clothes behind. Oh, all sorts of stuff. Oh? Wait a minute. Yeah? Now, what's the matter, mister? Don't you believe me? Mrs. Butts. Well, look. Look at here. Here's the money that he paid me off with. See? Okay, but the only thing I want to look at now is... Wait a minute. What? That money, let me see that. Just let me have that a minute. This money? Yeah, let me see it. What's the matter with it? You think maybe it's marked or something? Marked? You bet it is. And Mrs. Botts, you don't know how well. Hey! Come along. I want to look at his room. Sure enough, carefully rolled up and parked in a closet where sooner or later it was bound to be discovered was the Mare Madonna. Okay. Part of my job was done. Item four, another dollar seventy for a cab back to my apartment where I stashed the painting away. And then, now, uh, don't try to get ahead of me, ahead of this report, I mean, because it couldn't have been old Charlie Starkey who'd made the attack on me to get the stuff out of the back of my car. He wasn't the type. He wasn't strong enough to have laid me out that way. And the voice I'd heard certainly hadn't been his. But I suddenly remembered... So when whoever it was slugged me the first time there in the dark garage, I'd made a grab for him and had torn away part of his clothing. And what I had clutched in my hot little fist was still in the pocket of my jacket. I took a look. It was a small piece of paper, a receipted bill issued to a Mr. Harvey Twiller, a name that didn't mean a thing. But it was a receipt for rental paid for an apartment. And where? At the Selfridge. Then things started adding up. Item five, two dollars for a cab across town to the Selfridge where the uniformed doorman had ideas that didn't quite fit into my plans. 
207B, Mr. Brittingham's apartment? Uh, no. Uh, well, no. Well, yes, uh, of course, uh, sir, because I know that he's expecting you. I know he is, it, but you see... But I can't let you go up to see Mr. Twiller, who hasn't told me that he's expecting you, unless I call him up and announce you. Now, look, uh, take a look at my credentials. Yeah. Special investigator? That's right. Well, well I, I, I suppose that does make it a little different, sir. So where is he? But are you sure I hadn't better announce you first? Yes, I'm quite sure. Well? Very well, sir. He's in 5A. Okay. Come in. It's open. Come on in. Well, Scotty... Scotty Bagney. You're surprised, Dollar? That means my alias Harvey Twiller did fool you. Did it, Scotty? Well, it must have, mustn't it? Or you'd be the one holding a gun instead of me. So you're out of the pen, too, hmm? For quite a while now, Dollar, quite a while. I knew I should have recognized your voice there in my garage. Ah. Oh. When I saw you here at the door just now, I thought you had. That you'd seen through my alias. But now, since I do hold this gun on you, I suggest that you come in, close the door, and uh, carefully remove your own gun and drop it on the floor. I suppose I haven't any choice, have I? None whatsoever. That's the good lad. Now, uh, kick it over here. Thank you. Now, sit down, please. Why not? But tell me, Scotty... How I happen to know what you had in the trunk of your car? Mm-hmm. I heard about the job in Becker's print shop, so I've been telling you. And since I occasionally have need of that sort of thing that you had in your car trunk, I uh, belted you and purloined it, as we say in the trade. Mm. I'm sorry, though, that you found me. Oh, you should be. Well, you misunderstand me. I mean, because I've got to kill you now, Dollar. Now. Don't, Scotty. Uh, Hell. Don't drop the gun. Ah, uh, very well. Who are you, sir? Well, so you found him first, huh, Johnny? Oh, I'm mighty glad you did too, Hal, but how come? There's prints on the door of your garage. Here's your gun. Thanks. I got an ID on the prints. The local police steered me to a couple of stoolies who knew about them, and here I am. You found the stuff? No. Nor will he, my friend. You see, I made a little purchase with it, uh, with uh, most of it, that is. Purchase? Don't you get it, Hal? I'm afraid not. The painting. The Moray Madonna? Or rather, a copy of it. Copy? What are you talking about? One of the oldest gags in the world. You see, Bagney here somehow got next to another old crook by the name of Charlie Starkey. Yes, yes, I met him in prison. But uh, what do you mean when you said that the painting I have... Hold it, Scotty, and listen... Yeah, very well. Now, go on, Johnny. He found out, of course, that Charlie had been sent up for stealing fine artworks, that he knew his stuff and was one of the best. Until he got caught. Yes. But, uh, go on. What Scotty didn't learn, though, was that old Charlie was not only an artist himself, but a copyist. As good as they come. A copyist? So here was the deal, and you can call me on it if I'm wrong, Scotty. Well, no, no listen, please. Just I... shut up, Scotty. Go on, Johnny. Scotty, with his fancy manners and good clothes, was a pretty successful fence for good artwork. He always knew enough of the spoiled, filthy rich who'd buy, even though they realized the stuff was stolen. And when he learned that old Charlie was a master at lifting such things, well, he just couldn't wait to team up with him and get a hold of the Moray Madonna. What he didn't know, though, was that Charlie was more of a nut than a crook. That he'd only steal the stuff long enough to take it home and copy it. A dollar. No I... kidding. And later, he'd sneak it back. Or just let it be found somewhere. Meantime, of course, he'd pass on the copy for a price... To a sucker like Scotty here. Oh, I don't believe it. Dollar, look at the painting. It's there in the closet. You admit you have it. Well, now you've tagged me. You'd find it anyway. So go ahead. It's there in the closet. You mean the copy is? No, no, no. The original. It has to be. Don't you see? I already made a deal to sell it to a millionaire down in New York. Well, well, go on. Look at it. I don't need to, Scotty. The original is locked up in my apartment. It can't be. It can't be. And it is the original. So that is that. Okay, good work, Johnny. You've done your job, but now what about mine? Where is the evidence from that operation in the printing shop that I came to get from it? 
Oh, that'll show up, pal. And that's what I'm afraid of in dribs and drabs all over the country. Oh, no, I mean right here. Why? Sure, thanks to our good friend Scotty. Thanks to me? I'm afraid I don't get it, Johnny. Well, I'm sure that I don't. I'm only surprised it hasn't already shown up. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe some of it is right here now. Why? Why don't you take a look through Scotty's pockets? He said that most of it went for the painting, not all. In that case... Now, be quiet, both of you. Over here with me, Hal, but keep that gun on him. Right. Scotty, don't move. Don't, don't worry. Now, come in. It's open. Come in. Scotty, you crook. This money, this money you gave me for the painting. Look, look at it. There's your evidence, Hal. Uh, what's the matter with it? What's the matter? It's counterfeit. That's what it is. Counterfeit? Look at it. All of it. Counterfeit. Phony. Just like the painting you sold him, Charlie. What? Uh, who are you? You'd be surprised, my friend. Now, don't move, either of you. Thanks, Johnny. Yep, there it is, Hal, your evidence. Yeah? Except for whatever Scotty may have held out for himself. It's kind of a quadruple play, wouldn't you call it? Dollar to Scotty to Charlie to you. Happy now? <laughs> Real happy. It's a kind of a complicated mess, I know. But the painting is back to its owner. The counterfeit money is recovered. I'm in the clear with Uncle Sam. And all is well. Expense account total? Why not just pay me the commission on that lovely Madonna? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a couple of sweet little old men. Real characters. Especially one of them. The killer. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Martin Blaine as Hal Leonard, Ralph Bell as Scotty Bagney, Jack Grimes as Les Walters, Leora Thatcher as Mrs. Botts, Bill Kramer as Little Willie, Guy Rep as the doorman, and Louis Van Ruten as Charlie Starkey. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. Where songs are king, hear Richard Hayes sing weeknights on the CBS radio network. At the crossroads of the Empire State, this is WROW Music, Albany. Hello, I'm Beaven Horn, one of your welcome wagon... Johnny Dollar. Uh, hi, Johnny. This is Charlie. Charlie Warren? Right. Worldwide Mutual out in L.A.? None other. Charlie, you're a bum. I don't even know you. Huh? <laughs> now, what brought that on? That last case you handed me out there back in December. Now, take it easy, pal. Why not come out here to nice, warm, sunny Southern California, Johnny, and get away from all that freezing New England weather you said? Well, sure I did. So where did I end up hunting for that killer? 7,000 feet up in the mountains where I nearly froze my ears off. I am only just beginning to thaw out, so I say it again, Charlie, you are a bum. Okay, okay then, Johnny. Come on back here and I'll make it up to you. How? Another assignment. Oh. This time right out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Yeah? Matter of fact, it's over near an old stamping ground of yours. Lake Mojave? Lake Mojave. Say no more. I'll pack a razor, a clean shirt, all the fishing tackle I can find and be on my way. And a thirty-eight pistol, maybe? You just telephone Ham Pratt over at Lake Mojave Resort to have a room for me and... What was that last crack you slipped in there? Bring along a what? Uh, just just uh, kidding is all, Johnny. Oh, yeah? What kind of an assignment, Charlie? Uh, meet you here at L.A. International. Give you the whole story. Yeah, I think you'd better. <laughs> The 
CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Los Angeles office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the mixed blessing matter. (laughs) Expense account item one. $199.27 for a cab to Bradley Field, a plane to New York, then a jet to Los Angeles. Thanks to good connections, it was only about 6 p.m. Pacific time when I arrived at L.A. International Airport. True to his word, Charlie Warren was there and waiting. After helping me load my luggage, including the fishing tackle, into a rental car, he led me up to the flight deck restaurant and we ordered cocktails. Your health, Johnny. May we never grow old. Oh, I'll drink to that. Ah, I can use this. Hmm. I'm the little man who's had a busy, busy day. So let's eat, drink, and be merry, Johnny. Oh, tomorrow we may die? What? Or is this big dinner bit just so that you can say the condemned man ate a hearty meal? (laughs) Whatever the son of you... Oh, you mean that crack I made about being sure to bring along a gun? Yes. Honest engine, Johnny. I was only kidding about that. Oh, you were. Hmm? Honest engine. Oh, you said that. But it got you curious enough to come out here, didn't it? Well, thought of a chance to break up a long, hard winter with a little warm water fishing is what got me out here. Nothing else but... So, if you want to make up for the freezing I took on your company's behalf last time and keep me happy... Johnny, I told you I'd make up for that, and I will. All right. I telephoned your friend Ham Pratt and told him you'd arrive there sometime late tonight. Mm-hmm. He promised to have not only a comfortable motel unit for you, but a boat and 75-horse outboard, complete with electric starter, electromatic drive, a tank full of gas, and a bucket of live bait. Sounds great. The works for as soon as you can get yourself out on the lake. And that, Charlie, my boy, will be at the crack of dawn tomorrow morning. Uh, Johnny, just tell me. Well, isn't the fishing over there supposed to be uh, a lot better in the late afternoon? And what is that supposed to mean? Uh, how's about another drink before we order the food, huh? Charlie. Uh, another of the same, Johnny, okay? All right, Charlie, let's have it. Have <laughs> what? I don't know what you mean. The reason I am not supposed to go fishing tomorrow in spite of all your sweet talk. Did I say that? Well, didn't you? Well, I meant, uh, not tomorrow morning is all. Why not? Well... There's just one little thing maybe you ought to sort of take care of first. One little thing? Yeah. Like arson or murder, burglary, embezzlement? One little thing like that? No, sir. What then? We'll just pick up some money over at our branch in uh, in Kingman. You know our man over there, Jake Kessler? I know him very well. But don't tell me you're going to pay me off in advance. Well, no, not exactly. But, uh, well, let Jake tell you what it's all about, what the money's for. Well, don't you know? Let him handle it. He's the one that seems to be worried. How much? Oh, about 40000 What? In cash. You know, to pay off a retirement policy. Charlie, what's the hitch? Johnny, all I know is the payment's due. It's been okayed by the company, and for some reason, Jake doesn't want to or can't make it himself. Why not? Well, you know Jake, the old worry wart. Well, sometimes his worries pay off, Charlie. Well, anyhow, after a good night's sleep at Mojave, go on over to Kingman, Arizona, pick up the dough, and deliver it. Then you can spend the rest of the week fishing on expense account. Okay, pal? Sure, sure. Okay. Why not? There's only one trouble with it. Trouble? What do you mean? You know as well as I do, Charlie. It all sounds just a little too easy. Planning to send your children to college... How would you feel if you found that your son or daughter couldn't get in because there was no room? You'd feel doubly bad if you learned only then that there was something you could have been doing about it all along. In less than ten years, the number of college applications will have doubled. Now, support the college of your choice. And for more information about this problem and what you can do to help, write Higher Education, Box 36, Times Square Station, New York 36. Higher Education, Box 36, Times Square Station, New York 36. Jay Kessler, over there in Kingman, Arizona, is quite a character. He's about 55, tall, angular, long-legged, well-tanned by the desert sun. 
His office there on the main street is on the second floor above the Conroy Mercantile. Johnny! Johnny Dollar! Jake, you old son of a... <laughs> hey, what happened to you? I made a gall dang fool of myself, Johnny. Sit down. Well, tell me what happened. After all the ribbon I've took from these natives over the years about the, the clothes I wear... I know. Well, yesterday morning I finally took a dare and tried getting up on top of a horse. Oh. And what happened? <laughs> God darn critter ended up on top of me. Oh, Jake. Busted one ankle, threw a knee out of joint. So I got to be carried up and down those stairs by a couple of the boys at the mercantile, and all in all, I'm a gall dang mess. Can't even drive my own car. Oh, well, Jake, all I can say is I'm sorry. And that's why I have to send for somebody who could represent the company officially to pay off old man Blessing when he suddenly up and demands the whole thing in one hunk of cash. Did you say Blessing? Yeah. His name's Barney Blessing. Mm-hmm. 41,000 cash. And I'm sure glad you're the one to sent to do it for me like I asked him to. You, uh, you suppose uh, the company got suspicious too, Johnny? Suspicious of what, Jake? Well, about why, in spite of setting up that policy for him to get paid off something every month after 65 and for as long as he lives, now he wants it all at once. Well, do you think there might be something fishy about it? That name of his uh, doesn't ring a bell? No, I don't think so. You're old enough to remember Prohibition, all the bootlegging and racketeering in those days? Why, sure. Well, Barney Blessing was a gunman back then, but he never got caught. Oh? Then about a year ago, he moved out here to uh, worked out hunk of land the other side of Hackberry. Mm -hmm. Him and a fellow named Harry Higby, and a beat-up old dog named Vicky. Oh, who is this Higby? Just a friend of Barney Blessing's? A friend. Not on your life. Hated him. You see, that Higby back in those days, well, they called him the twin. Yeah? He was the reason Barney never got caught. I don't follow you. He was just a, a hanger-on. He wasn't a killer. He, he wasn't of much use to that mob except for one thing. Higby looked so much like Barney Blessing that when Barney was sent out to do a job, then they'd plant Higby someplace where... A lot of people that see him would swear that he was Barney. So that he was kind of Barney's alibi. Right. Mm. He was how come they could never pin a thing on Barney. I see. Well, why did he bring Higby along out here? Well, don't you see, Johnny? Blackmail. Ah. Yeah, maybe you have something there, Jake. Sure, that Higby knows enough to send him up for life. All he has to do is open his mouth and start singing. So Barney's not only had to keep him around and feed him, but even made him beneficiary of this policy, too. If Barney dies before the policy matures. Right. Tell me, uh, when will Barney be eligible to start collecting on it? Well, that's just the trouble. He's 65 right now. And Johnny, the old coot must have read all the fine print. Why you say that? All of a sudden, now that I'm all uh, busted up and can't get around anywhere, all of a sudden he telephones me from, uh, uh, well, wherever it is he gets to a telephone, with this demand we pay him off in cash, deliver it to him in hand. Mm. That's uh, the way that fine print reads, in hand. But you don't want to pay him off? No. Why not? What's all this all fired big hurry about all of a sudden? Why this sudden change to wanting the whole thing in one lump sum without letting us know beforehand? Have you seen him and talked to him at all since he moved out here? No, I've never seen him. Like a darn fool, I just never got around to it. Never even met him. Mm-hmm. Well, who around here does know him, Jake? Not anybody. He or Higby or whichever it was used to come here to Kingman for groceries at first, but for nigh on, uh, on to a year now, there's been no sign of him. Jake? Yeah? If you've been able to have yourself uh, holed up to this office every day, you could have got out there to Barney Blessing's ranch. Well, uh, so what? Well, so instead you sent for me. Why? Johnny. Johnny, do I have to lay it out to you? Go ahead. 
Well, you just ought to know by now that I have me a nose for trouble. And when I think of what Barney was once and how he said over the phone that if I showed up at his place to, to give any argument, showed up uh, without the money, well, well Jake, uh, you old rascal, I think you pulled your accident on purpose that you're scared. <laughs> Probably for no reason at all. You just want me to stick my neck out for you. I tell you, I got an instinct. Mm. Always have had, and it's always been right. But now, Johnny, if, um, you know, if you just want to duck out of this one and... Duck out? Uh, yeah, stay away from those two ex-mobsters and go over to the lake and do some quiet fishing instead. Okay, well, okay, Jake, just tell me how to get there. By golly, Johnny. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't let me down. Mm. So, now, here. Yeah. Uh, here now. You'll have to take this along with you. That's the $41,000. Yeah, in cash money. Mm. Had the bank deliver it to me just before you got here. I thought that kind of payoff had to come from the main office of a company like yours. I wish it did. But you know worldwide, immediate payment on any claim at any place in the world. That's the slogan. Yep. That's why even a little local office like this one has to come up with it. That's why I can't give Barney Blessing any argument. Well, if I do find any grounds for your wild suspicions, whatever they are... Maybe I will. Now, uh, you listen, Johnny. Yes, Jake. Well, here, uh, here's the receipt and so on, uh, that uh, he'll have to sign. Um, okay. Now, wait a minute now. Is that a copy of the policy itself there? That's right. Well, how about if I borrow it for a little while, Jake? Just long enough to have somebody make a copy of it, hmm? Then you are thinking the way I am, aren't you? Am I? So, here... Just in case, I, uh, well, I had this extra photostat made for you. Good. All right, Jake. Give me some directions and I'll be on my way. Sure. But now, Johnny. Well? Well, like you say, maybe I'm all worried up about nothing at all. Sure you are. But, uh, be careful anyway. Will you, Johnny? Sure. <laughs> Jake had told me the ranch was near the old mining town of Hackbury. Population about 100. But from Hackbury, I had to take a narrow, crooked, dusty little road some 20 miles further to the foot of the Cottonwood Mountains. Believe me, this was really desolate desert country. But the tiny ranch was like a sort of oasis out there. Five or six acres, I'd say, all of it surrounded by a barbed wire fence, except for the driveway up to the house. Thanks to half a dozen windmills busily pumping water, old Barney had managed to make himself a tidy little farm with vegetable gardens enough to supply all his needs and then some. And over in one corner, fenced off by themselves, were a dozen or so beef cattle making the most of a surprisingly green, lush growth of alfalfa. The house sitting there in the middle of the property was a small but well-kept building of concrete block. As I pulled up and stopped, the front door opened just a crack. And then slowly, a man emerged. An old man, weather-beaten, but husky and healthy-looking. As I started toward him, he slowly raised and aimed a high-powered rifle at me. Didn't you see that sign out front there? It says no trespassing? I saw the sign. Well, that's what you're doing, Buster. This is my property. Now get out. Your property, hmm? That's right. Then you're Barney Blessing? That's right. So what? Now, you get out. Sure. If you don't care about getting your insurance money. Huh. Well, then I'll uh, wait a minute. Oh, well, that's better. You saying you're that Jake Hessler I talked to on the phone? No. I don't sound like him. Who are you? My name is Dollar. Here now. Oh, watch it, Buster. What? What you reaching for? My credentials. You want to lower that gun and have a look at them? Did you say Dollar? That's right. Johnny Dollar? Right again. You're some kind of detective, ain't you? What you doing here? Well, if you'll put down that gun, I'll tell you. When I'm ready. Okay. Jake Hessler is laid up. He couldn't make it. So I've brought your insurance money. Yeah, my 41 grand? Where is it? Right here, Mr. Blessing. $41,000. Okay, okay. Give it over to me. And then get out of here. 
Before you sign the papers for it, the receipt and so on? Are you kidding? Okay. Come on inside here. I don't trust you until I get the dough. Now, let me see them papers. Put them here on this table. All right. Here you are. If you're Barney Blessing, just go ahead and sign them. Sure. Why not? Barney, don't you want to see my identification or something? Make sure who I am? Well, that depends. After you've signed. Here now. Uh, uh, watch it. As I was about to say here, you can use my pen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're pretty jittery, aren't you, Mr. Blessing? I, I don't like strangers around here, see? You no, know, I can see that. Well, are you going to sign? Sure, sure, sure. Only I'd say if I get my money, don't you come any closer. All right, all right. Okay. Now, Barney Blessing. You always have that much trouble signing your own name? What are you talking about? Yeah, okay now? Uh, before you sign those others... I said watch it. I don't like the way you keep reaching inside your coat that way. I don't like the way you keep waving that rifle around. Now, look. Yeah. What's the matter? Just compare your signature with the one here on the policy. Yeah? Well, what do you expect after all these years? After all these years you've had to practice? What are you talking about? Will you put the gun down for a minute? No, sir. All right, then tell me this. Where's your partner, the man who came out here to live with you? You mean Higby? Harry Higby? That dirty, rotten, blackmail. What do you want to know for, huh? What's he got to do with this? They called you the twins, didn't they? So what? Uh, so much alike that nobody could tell you apart? Certainly nobody out in this country ever knew which was which. Now, now you could wait a minute. You saying I ain't Barney Blessing? I said, where is he? This partner of yours. Well? Okay, so I'll tell you. Dirty, chiseling stooley. I finally got fed up with him. I, I throwed him out. You did, hmm? Yeah, it cost me a lot, though, but I paid him off and made him get out of here. Okay? Uh, now, now, let me sign the rest of these here papers so you can give me the dough and you can get out. One more thing. Then now what? What about the dog? Huh? Oh, you mean Vicky? Well, whatever her name was. Now, what's that stinking, lousy, free bitten hound dog got to do with it? You say that about her after the way you brought her all the way out here from Chicago, was it? Okay, okay, okay. So I'm all upset on account of Vicky died a couple of days ago. I at the barrier. Well, you did, hmm? Well, you don't believe it. Look outside the window there at the back. See that mound over the place where I laid the poor little pooch away? Mister, that mound of freshly turned earth is one of the first things I noticed when I drove in here. You know something? I'd like to see what's really under it. You know something, Dollar? I don't like you. I think you're trying to pull something on me. I mean, I won't stand for that. You see this? You think I don't know how to use it? I'm sure you do. Okay. I'll sign all your papers just to make it legal. But in the meantime, you reach inside your pocket and lay down that 41 G's where I can see it. You hear me? Now go ahead. I guess I haven't much choice, have I? You got no choice. Go ahead. Well, how about this instead? Oh, no, you... Oh. Oh. Shot the gun out of my hand, will you? All right, now, don't make a move. Now, now, now listen, listen. You me. listen, and don't forget that I'm holding a gun now. Okay. Okay, you win. Well, maybe I got excited. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, let me sit down. I'll sign the rest of the papers. You, you can give me the money and get. I'm afraid not. Not yet. Huh? Not until you've done a little digging for me outside where that mound of earth is. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? I, I tell you, all you're going to find is the body of that poor little Vicky, the dog. We'll see. Now get going. Okay. Okay, you satisfied now? See, Dollar, it's only what's left of poor old Vicky. Yeah. Yeah, I see. In spite of the size of the grave. Well, Vicky was a big old dog. 
Well, you satisfied now? And no. Uh, we'll go back. Why? Looks pretty convincing. Would fool almost anybody, but I think you better dig a little more. What are you... No, no, sir. No, I won't. Oh, I said dig. Now, you go ahead and dig. No, no, I won't do it. I, I showed you Vicky's body ain't dead enough. It's whatever may be underneath it that I want to see. Now, dig. Now, listen. You, you listen to me. He didn't die soon enough to leave it to you, did he? What? And then you somehow found out he was going to take it all in cash, enough to let him get away from you, out of a country where your blackmailing couldn't touch him anymore. You don't know what you're talking about. You couldn't about. take that, so you killed him. Then you thought that you'd collect instead, that nobody would know the difference, and nobody could prove that you aren't Barney Black. Listen. Now listen, Dollar, please. Didn't listen. you know his fingerprints are on file that when you dig down there to him, all we have to do... Okay, okay. Okay, it's, it's Barney under there. I give up, huh? I give up. But don't you see, Dollar? I... Dig, Mr. Higby. Dig. <laughs> You knew it, Jake, didn't you? <laughs> well, just a hunch, Johnny. And even if it was a right one, I didn't know how I could prove it. But that feeling I had, a couple of punks like them, and nobody around here could prove which one was really which, and with all that money at stake, well, Johnny, I... <laughs> I just... I just kind of had me a hunch, is all. And Jake... It looks like that instinct, that nose for trouble of yours, is something that you had better hang on to. Now, darn it, because of the call from back in Hartford, I again had to miss out on the fishing. But I'm going to keep trying. You can depend on that. Expense account total, including mileage in the rental car and the trip home, four ninety-seven forty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case that could be marked top secret, that blows wide open in more ways than one. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Louis Van Ruten as Harry Higby, Cliff Carpenter as Jake Hessler, Maurice Tarplin as Charlie Warren. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hanna speaking. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Johnny, this is Len Walker at Surety Mutual Insurance. Out there in the wild and golden west? Yep. Still holding down a desk out here in San Francisco. Well, how are you, Len? What goes these days? Goes off. It's more like it, Johnny. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? Three neat, tidy little explosions that have cost us well over a million dollars apiece. Wow. What kind of explosions, Len? Rocket fuel type of stuff. Oh? Yeah. Where? The Bascom Development Company. It's hidden away along the coast a few miles south. Bascom, hmm? So if you want to grab your space suit and pop on out here, well, <laughs> who knows? Maybe they'll oblige by sending you aloft on their next blow-up. You make it sound very attractive, Len. <laughs> I'll tell you this, Johnny. If you can find out the why of this and put a stop to it, we'll pay you enough to let you fly high and wide and handsome for a long time to come. Now you do make it sound attractive. Well, Len? Okay. I'll start practicing on the first plane I can get. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Surety Mutual Insurance Company, San Francisco office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the top secret matter.
That's got item one, 10927. That covers a taxi out to Bradley Field, the hop to New York, and from there a one-stop flight on out to the West Coast. At New York International, I thought I was the last one aboard before takeoff. But just as the big jet started taxiing out to the runway, a well-dressed gentleman with a well-stuffed briefcase plunked it into the seat beside me. Well, looks as though I just made it. By the skin of your teeth, and you better fasten your seatbelt because... Hey, hey, George! What? Why, it's Johnny! Johnny Dollar! In person? Well, this is an unexpected pleasure. Well, how's the prosperous businessman? Just fine, and you? Couldn't be better. You on your way out to the coast, too? No, just going as far as Chicago to our main plant and office. Oh, it's been a long time, Johnny. It sure has. Tell me, uh, are you still a vice president of that big chemical outfit? I certainly am. Oh, that's good. You're just the man I want to talk to. I want to ask some questions. Oh, why? Hasn't your company got a hand like uh, all the others in the liquid rocket fuel racket? Certainly has. Or I should say had. Mm Hmm? Well, right now we're in the process of trying to turn down a contract. (laughs) No kidding. How come? Well? Well, I I shouldn't have mentioned it. Oh, top secret? No, not quite. Not exactly uh, top secret. As a matter of fact, it'll hit all the papers in just a few days now. So if you want to find out what it's all about... Now, wait. Yeah? Didn't you used to have a top security clearance? I still have, from OSI, CIA, CIC. You want to see my credentials? Why not? Okay, anything to get you off this big Mysterioso kick? Here, here, and here. Okay? Okay. Now, what's the big secret that's about to hit the headline? A new solid rocket fuel. Well, I thought a lot of companies were working on that. Had even developed some of it. They are, and they have. But, Johnny, we now have a radically different one that was developed in our place through sheer luck. How do you mean? Well, there's a young East German fellow, a scientist. I don't even remember his name. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, he has enough degrees in chemistry from European universities to choke a horse. Yeah. Came to us for just a run-of-the-mill job in one of our labs. But a few months ago, entirely on his own, he came up with this solid fuel formula, handed it over to the company Lock, Stock, and Barrel. Mm. Big boys checked it. Now, thanks to him, well, Johnny, it looks like we're going to be light years ahead of the hammer and sickle competition. That's good. Well, that's about all I can tell you about it. Whatever you say. Now, why'd you tell me I'm just the man you wanted to see? Because maybe you can tell me something about a company out on the coast that is also in this field. Oh, Johnny, out there there must be hundreds of them ranging from the big important ones like Air Search and Rocket Dine to little one- and two-man operations. Now, which is it? The Bascom Development Company is somewhere near San Francisco. Bascom, huh? Yeah. What do you know about them? Well? Nothing. You sure? No, Johnny. I'm afraid I never even heard of them. (laughs) Oh, you're a lot of help. I'm sorry. All right. What will we talk about now? Politics? Religion? Women? Sex? Or something sensible like fishing? The way those jets traveled, there wasn't time to talk about much of anything before George got off the plane in Chicago. By the time I had an afternoon snack and prepared to settle down for a nap, we circled and landed at San Francisco International. Item 2, 470 for a cab into Len Walker's office. That's across from the Sheraton Palace and my pals at KCBS. Now, where do you plan to stay while you're here, Johnny? At the Huntington, up on the hill. Fine. So grab yourself some dinner, get a good night's sleep... You can take off first thing in the morning. Take off again? Mm Mm-hmm. I'll have a rental car sent around to you there at the Huntington. Len, aren't you going to tell me first what this is all about? Bascom Development Company. Yes, you said that much on the phone. Well, now, look here on this map. Yeah? Now, you go down here on 101, then cut over to Route 1, then down the coast to here few miles south of Big Sur. Wait a minute now. If memory serves me right, that highway is chiseled out of the side of a lot of cliffs that rise up out of the blue Pacific. Right. So what can be there but a lot of rocks and trees and the ocean? A little well-hidden side road that goes down through the trees to a leveled-off spot on the very edge of the ocean. Hmm. That's where you'll find the Bascom Development Company. Only for security reasons, it's been made to look like a cluster of summer homes. 
You say they've been having explosions? Three, Johnny. And as a result of them, three deaths. That's where we've had to pay off through the nose. Why? Well, the men, they were chemists or engineers he had working for him, all had insurance that Bascom paid for a cool million apiece. And he was the beneficiary? Half to him, half to the families of those men. Oh. It's common practice where people of great importance to a company are concerned. Yeah. Tell me, uh, just how much do you know about the explosions? I think you'll do better by getting that from Baskin himself. I told him you're on your way. Oh? Yes. Okay, Lynn. Whatever you say. Item three, 1280 for cocktails and dinner at the Fleur de Lis. After all, I was on expense account. Why not live it up? After a good night's sleep at the Huntington, I took off. After passing through San Jose and Salinas, I cut over through Monterey and Carmel and hit California's wonderful one. Highway number one. It took me through beautiful wooded hills and forests and then along the edge of the sea. It's a narrow, tortuous road with nothing but high cliffs on the left and a sheer drop-off on the right, sometimes for several hundred feet to the ocean below. And it is a beautiful, beautiful drive. At Point Sur, that's S-U-R, means south. The cliffs are almost perpendicular, so the highway goes a bit inland for a stretch. And then I found the sharply slanting little side road that Leonard indicated on the map. I had to make my way down it in low, low gear. And there at the ocean's edge was the group of... Well, Len was right. They did look like harmless summer cottages. But there was an armed guard at the entrance gate. I showed him my clearances. He made a phone call, then directed me to the second building down the road. However, as I started to pass the first one, a small, white, clabbered sort of building, it looked like, I heard a sharp, strange, crackling sound like timbers breaking. I looked up. The side of the building seemed to bulge out momentarily, and then... purely instinctively, shoved hard on the accelerator. But by the time that explosion really took hold, I was almost past it. Nonetheless, my rental car rolled completely over with me inside. Shook me up a little, but otherwise I was okay. From a building down the line, several intelligent but very angry-looking men came running over, hauled me out as roughly as possible, then shoved me unceremoniously into the next-door private office of Mr. Horace Alderworthy Bascom. Bascom, a slight, gray-haired man of about 60, sat quietly behind his desk holding a gun on me in a way that indicated he could and wouldn't hesitate to use it if it became necessary. Until I produced my credentials and told him why I was there. Then he dismissed the others, shoved the gun back into the drawer of his desk, and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. The office is a bit on edge these days, and no doubt Doctors Harvey and Welcome and Young Franklin thought that you had caused the explosion there in Unit 1. Doctors, Mr. Baskin? Of science, chemistry. Best I've been able to find. Oh, I'll tell you this about them. They not only have brains, but muscles. They're all experts in the field of explosives. Are they? The best. I wonder after what just happened. You were very fortunate, Mr. Dollar. Had that explosion occurred just a fraction of a second earlier... I wouldn't be sitting here, would I? Your body and the remains of your car would have toppled over the edge of that narrow spot beside Unit 1 and ended up on the rocks some 200 feet below. No question of it. I don't doubt it. But now, aren't you concerned about what's happened to that Unit 1? From this window, it looks like a shambles. Yes, like a few others that have gone before it. Do you want to take a look and see if you can figure why it blew up? I know I do. I'm afraid it would take far more scientifically knowledgeable minds than ours to determine the cause of this latest misfortune. And as you can see, Dr. Welcome and some of his aides are looking it over very carefully. Well, I still want to look. Of course. And I sincerely hope you can accomplish something. 
Thank heaven this time there was no one hurt. We've lost three, Mr. Dollar. Three of our finest chemists during the past three months. So I understand. And each of them, I'm convinced, just when he was on the threshold of a solution to this tremendously important project of ours. Just what is this project, Mr. Baskin? Creation of an uncommonly efficient semi-liquid rocket repellent that will, I am convinced... Semi-liquid? Yes. Yes, an almost unbelievably powerful gelatinous substance with all the energy of the complicated liquid fuels and the stability of a solid. Mm. If I can develop it, Mr. Dollar, it will be the greatest triumph in the history of space rocketry. And I will have made it. I alone will hold the secret of it. And yet you're not a scientist. Well, in the purely academic sense, no. But without my aims and my ideas, without my money to provide the means for their experimentation, these men I employ could accomplish nothing. And that means that... Look, what's the matter, Mr. Dollar? You are all right, aren't you? Oh, yes, sure. But as long as this last explosion just happened, I'd like to get out there and see if we, or maybe your Dr. Welcom, can pin down the cause of it. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Believe me, if anyone can determine it, Welcom can. <laughs> But Welcome couldn't, nor could I. In spite of Mr. Bascom's health in combing through the ruins, and we really combed. A lot of theories got aired, but none that led to any definite conclusions. Then, early that evening in his quarters, I talked at some length with Dr. Welcome about not only this, but the three previous explosions. No, no, I don't think so, Mr. Dollar. It's, it's simply that some of the materials the components used are so unstable, so highly volatile and shock-susceptible that... And yet every possible precaution is taken, not only in the handling, but in the storage of them. Mm -hmm. So unless someone were setting them off deliberately, as you suggest might be possible... An awful lot of people don't want to see our national rocketry program succeed. Don't you forget that, Doctor. Yes, but, but someone here in this closely knit organization, no, I, I can't believe it. Another thing, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Williams, Thornbury, and Brenner. Are those the three who were killed? Yes, now, certainly you don't suggest they deliberately caused the explosions that caused their own deaths. Well, it's hardly likely, I guess. Not a bit likely. And, Mr. Dollar, each of them was entirely alone in the laboratory when the accident occurred. You sure of that, Dr. Wilkins? Oh, absolutely. Tell me, was there anybody in Unit 1 this afternoon when it went off? Or anywhere near it? No, you were the only one near it. And you sure of that? Absolutely certain. Tell me something else, Doctor. If I can, yes. How close are you fellows to this this rocket fuel? Well, Mr. Dollar, I believe that Williams and Thornbury and Brenner were very close to it, each in his turn. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bascom and a couple of the other chaps and I felt they had found it. But now, of course, we'll never know. So, all the rest of us can do is keep on trying. You don't sound very confident. Well, sometimes it's very discouraging. And with the cutbacks in salary we've been obliged to take. But it's a challenge, and challenges are what make a profession like ours worthwhile. They and the opportunity to serve this country. Who sparked this whole idea in the beginning? Oh, I understand it was a young German chap that Mr. Bascom found somewhere abroad. What? Yes. What was his name? Um... Kellerholz. Hans Kellerholz. Kellerholz. I see. All right, Dr. Welcome. Gentlemen. Oh, Mr. Bascom. Well, have you found anything? Anything to indicate what No, might... it, uh, it doesn't look as though we have, Mr. Bascom. Not a thing. Oh, What's bad. more, I've suddenly remembered that I'm supposed to be back in San Francisco tonight, so uh, I'll have to run. If, uh, that is, my car is still usable. I understand it isn't. But if you'll wait a moment, I'll bring mine around. Oh, I appreciate that. But your investigation here... Oh, don't you worry. I'll be back. Well, I certainly hope so. San Francisco? No. I drove Mr. Bascom's car out to the highway and headed south to the first filling station I could find. And there, after parking out on the far edge of the highway, I ran up item four... $21 even in telephone calls. And what I learned from them, figuratively, blew this whole case wide open. 
My first phone call was to George Langley, the man I'd met and talked to on the plane at his home in Chicago. Thanks to his information, the second call was to the young German chemist who developed the solid rocket fuel that they were about to announce. You guessed it. His name was Hans Kellerhaus. What Kellerhaus said to me about his reasons for having left the Bascom Project to work at one of America's big, established, reputable chemical firms told me more than I'd even hoped for. And then, to top it all, well, let's face it, it was mighty lucky for me that I hadn't taken the drive up to San Francisco. Because when I stepped out of the phone booth there at the little gas station... You know, I sure hope you don't need any more of my small change, mister. No, that was the last call I had to make, and thanks for the use of the phone. Well, it don't belong to me. It belongs to the phone company. Well, thanks anyway. <laughs> uh, say, now, uh, maybe you want to drive your car over to this side of the road and fill her up, maybe? Might not be a bad idea. <laughs> Though why you parked along that edge over there, so close to that drop-off, I'll never know. <laughs> hey, look! Uh, look, you see? I see, all right. Uh, one of the tires must have went, you see? Well, she's rolling on over down the cliff. One of the tires? Oh, no. What'd you say? Did you hear that little explosion? See the way that car sagged over? Uh, well, yeah, I guess I did. It must have had a time mechanism. Huh? If that happened the way it was supposed to while I was tearing up this crooked highway on the way to San Francisco... Nobody would ever have known. Uh, listen. Yeah? Uh, is that your car over there, beside the station? W w sure. Look, here, uh... Here, here's a hundred bucks for the use of it just for tonight. Okay? Are you kidding? Sure it's okay. Okay, then. Give me the keys. <laughs> Luckily, the same guard was on duty, and he let me through the gate to Bascom's setup without question, and more important, without announcing me. In the darkness, then, I slipped the lock on the door of Bascom's office, went inside, pulled down the shades, put on a light, and looked around. And I finally found it. A small switch under the sill of the window facing out to where Unit 1 had been. And if those wires on it had led underground to some kind of a detonator there in Unit 1 this afternoon... Dollar. Better come in, Mr. Bascom. Yes, I certainly will. Just sit down. There at your desk, anywhere. Well, of course, if you like. Did you break your way in here? You, uh, want to tell me why, Mr. Bascom? Why? Why what? Afraid I don't understand. I want to know your reasons for the explosions. Well, you're implying that I was responsible for them, Mr. Dollar? Entirely. And you honestly think that you can prove a wild assertion like that? Yes, I honestly think I could. Otherwise, instead of sitting here talking with you, don't you think I'd be out and around investigating further? Yes, I suppose you would. Let's look at some facts. Like the explosion this afternoon that nearly killed me because you knew I was coming here. The switch I found under the windowsill... Well? Yes. And your help in combing through the ruins? Help? Or careful misdirection so I wouldn't find the detonator you'd rigged up nor a trace of the wiring from that switch. Of course. Those cutbacks in salaries. You needed money, didn't you, Mr. Bascom? Like all that insurance you collected. Yes, very true. And something you said this afternoon... I and I alone will hold the secret of this fuel. So when you thought that Williams and Thornbury and Brenner had it, to keep it for yourself, you killed them. Is that about it, Mr. Bascom? Just about, I guess. And all because of a young chemist I brought over here. Hans Kellerhaus. Yes. I was supposed to be over there in Germany on a vacation. Actually, it was only in order to establish contact with him and hope that I could uh, capitalize on his knowledge of missile fuels. It took a lot of time, a lot of money. Most of it spent in bribes to East German authorities. But I finally got him over here. I see. He was so glad to be free for the first time in his life, so grateful for an opportunity to work in this country, that he was willing to agree to anything. Which means what, Mr. Baskin? I was to have complete, complete control of anything he might create and develop here. And what happened? Did he find out you were in this thing only for personal gain? Yes. So he came in here one morning and told me that he was leaving. 
that he would keep his word, however, and relinquish claim to whatever he had developed here. My demand, he put that in writing. So I let him go. Like an idiot. Why do you say that? Well, I thought he'd completed the fuel, that I could go ahead and produce it and sell it and make millions. Millions, Mr. Dollar. And without having to share with him. But I was wrong. He hadn't finished it. Mm -hmm. I hired other men, the best that I could find from all over, in the hope that they could carry on from where he'd left off. But all it did was cost me money. Money, money. And the only way I could think of to get enough to keep going was, was by collecting that insurance. By committing murder? Yes, I know. The first one was very difficult for me. But the second, when I meant another $500,000 to carry on with, and the third, because all the time I kept hoping, hoping to get that rocket fuel. Uh, I, su I suppose I should have known, I never would, that my misdeeds would catch up with me. Yes, you should have known. Are you ready to leave, Mr. Bascom? I don't have to, Mr. Dollar. Oh? Here in this open drawer beside my hand is a thirty-eight revolver. Loaded. What are you thinking of, Bascom? For you or for me? Would it make any difference? Would it really solve anything? No. No, I guess it wouldn't. Shall we go? It's almost unbelievable. I mean, the length to which some people will go to promote their own selfish interests at the sacrifice of others. Don't they know that somehow, sometime, there has to be a showdown? Expense account total, including repair charges on the rental car and the trip back to Hartford, $993.70. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a tale of the problems, at least one of the problems, that go with the owning of a gold mine. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Melville Ruick as Bascom, Court Benson as Dr. Welcome, Frank Campanella as George Langley, and William Mason as the gas station attendant. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hannah speaks. Johnny Dollar. Hi there, Johnny. This is Jake. Jake Hessler, out here in Kingman, Arizona. Well, hi, Jake. How are you? And how's Worldwide Mutual doing these days? Me and Worldwide Mutual just fine. But it's, uh, it's one of my greater Southwest clients got me worried. Well, I wish you'd make up your mind which one of these insurance companies you're really working for, Jake. You want to know the truth, Johnny? <laughs> Let's have it. Neither one of them, really. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to retire and take it easy out here in God's country that I just don't. Why, do you know I myself haven't bothered to get out and sell a single policy in over six months now? No kidding. But as long as those two companies are willing to pay me good money just to head up an office for them and to <laughs> try to keep an eye on the boys they do have out selling for them, well, why not, huh? <laughs> why not? <laughs> Only one trouble. What's that, Jake? Any problems come along, you just guess who gets them jump right spang in their lap. Well, what's the matter with that? Huh? Well, what do you mean? Well, all you do is turn around and dump them in my lap. Oh. Well, now, Johnny. Well, it's the truth, you old reprobate, and you know it. What is it this time, Jake? Young fellow that was insured by the uh, San Francisco office. Yeah? Old mine. One of those old ones over toward Lake Mojave. Uh-huh. Yeah, and he's, um, he's up and disappeared. So uh, maybe you can come on out here and see if you can find him. Okay. Well, as long as it means a chance to warm some of this winter chill out of my bones, and as long as I always manage to get in some good bass fishing out your way, and since you're willing to pay all my expenses while I do it... Huh? <laughs> well, why are you fishing over at that Lake Mojave Resort? Well, as an old friend of mine by the name of Jake Hessler said just a minute ago, why not? Well, you come out here and, um, and we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jake. I'll fly out to Las Vegas, rent me a car, and see you sometime in the morning. The CBS 
Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Greater Southwest Insurance Company branch office in Kingman, Arizona. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Golden Dream Matter. That's the count item one. 19349 for a plane to New York, then a jet to Las Vegas. Item two, $23 even. That covers a couple of taxi fares, dinner, a good night's sleep at the Hotel Sahara, then breakfast the next morning. Item three is 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I headed southeast through Boulder City and crossed Hoover Dam at the foot of Lake Mead. And again, I marveled at the way man's ingenuity had harnessed the tremendous power of the Colorado River. I headed south on 93. In the town of Kingman, Jake's office is on the main street above the Conroy Mercantile. Tall, lean, lanky, and well-tanned as always, he was wearing a white Stetson cowboy shirt, blue jeans, and fancy boots. Well, now, maybe you will have a chance to get in some fishing over there to Lake Mojave, Johnny. Nothing suit me better, Jake. You know it. You see, the one man who can help you get on the trail of young Kingsley... Kingsley? Myron Kingsley, that uh, young mining engineer I told you about that's disappeared. Oh, I see. And the man who's going to be the most help to you finding out what's happened to him is the manager of that Lake Mojave resort, Mr. H.R. Pratt. Ham Pratt, I know him well, very well. Yes, I know you do. And the old mine that Kingsley come to investigate the Golden Dream is right close by there. Investigate how, Jake? To see if somebody isn't being took, but royally. How do you mean? Well, some old coot name of uh, Marty Spiller has been selling a lot of stock in the Golden Dream. Uh Uh-oh. Mostly to people who live way back east. Mm Mm-hmm. And who aren't in a very good position to see just what they've bought into. hmm? Right. I count of most of them, the suckers who fall for that kind of stock promotion are too poor to come out and have a look. I know what you mean. Go on, Jake. Well, there's one stockholder evidently got suspicious and could afford to do something about it. I mean, he hired young Kingsley to run down from Frisco to have a look-see and then make him a report. Uh Uh-huh. Being a client of our company, Kingsley come around to me for directions. I sent him over there, told him to stay at the Lake Mojave place, and, uh, well, uh, that's the last I saw or heard of him. Uh, When was that, Jake? Been a week now. I see. But only three days since Sam Pratt phoned me that he hadn't showed up in his motel unit there. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, then. As long as Ham is the one who can put me on Kingsley's trail. And I told Ham you'd be over. Good. Then I'll hit the highway again. Excuse me. Hessler. Well, well, we were just talking about... Huh? He sure is. Uh, for you. For me? It's, um, it's Ham Pratt. Oh, here. Thanks. Ham, how are you? Oh, pretty good. Only pretty good? It uh, looks like maybe you've made this trip for nothing, Johnny. What do you mean by that? We found young Kingsley. Or rather, what's left of him. Oh? In the water at the bottom of a deep old abandoned mine shaft. Must have slipped and fallen in. I see I haven't been able to get down to him yet, but, well, I guess there's not much point in your coming over here now. Ham. Yes, Johnny. Did you say an abandoned mine shaft? Yes. One that's just been sitting there accumulating water in the bottom of it for years. Then it's not one of those that he went to investigate. Well, no, not exactly. Well, maybe I had better take a look. back into my car and drove westward across the desert on Route 68 over Union Pass, then down the long 17-mile grade to Davis Dam. 
But instead of crossing it, I swung right for three miles to Lake Mojave Resort. As I got out in front of the office, Ham Pratt pulled up in his Jeep. Leave your bags right there in your car, Johnny. Come on, we'll use it. I am. Okay, whatever you say. Hey, how long have you been packing a gun like that? Well, you know, Johnny, in case we run across some jackrabbits or a coyote or something. Now get aboard. Sure. Or something, did you say? All right. I'll be honest about it. Since I talked to you, I kind of got to thinking about it. Thinking about what, Ham? Oh, about possibilities. Like maybe in case young Kingsley didn't just fall into that old mine shaft. I know what you mean. After all, if Kingsley was a mining engineer... And he was, Johnny. And I mean a practical one, not just a student. He's a good one. He knew his business. Well, then he should have known enough to take care of himself and watch his step. Right. In other words... Well, do you have any ideas, Ham? Plenty. Like maybe the owner of the Golden Dream... Who didn't want it shown up that he was selling stock in a worthless mine? His name is Marty Spiller. He's the sort of character we don't like around here. How do you mean? Hang on now. Not much daylight left, so he'll take a shortcut onto this side road. Okay. Oh, oh, hey! You call this a road? It's an old wagon trail. They used to haul stuff in and out with a mule team. Don't worry. This jeep will make it okay. I hope so. Uh, you were going to tell me about this Marty Spiller. Yeah, but better wait now until we get to the Golden Dream. <laughs> I mean, really ridden one of them? Well, like everyone else, I've seen pictures of the boys in the army plowing through mud and sand, jumping over ditches, taking seemingly impossible hills in them, and so on. But until you have actually been on one of them, and I mean on, not in, until you have driven across this kind of rugged desert country, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing. When the trail gave out, as it frequently did, where spring runoff from the winter rains had washed rocks and boulders and sand across it, we simply bounced across the desert, leaping and straddling the stream bed and washes and anything else that stood in the way. Wow! We'd come to a high, sandy hill, and instead of circling it, we'd go right on up the side in low, low gear, flowing only at the top to make sure that there wasn't a sudden drop-off. Then careen madly down the far side, flipping and skidding all the way. What a ride. But it finally got us on the main route to the Golden Dream, and the sun was getting low. See her up there, Johnny, on the side of that mountain up ahead? And a couple of the shafts go well down below the bottom of that mountain. Uh-huh. Uh, Ham, don't you think maybe we better get out and walk that trail? It's just a ledge on the side of that thing. <laughs> if the mule wagons could hang on to it, we can. Yeah. But now, about Marty Spiller. Yo, tell me about him. He stopped working the golden tree when the vein ran out in the late 30s. Then, long about four years ago, Spiller came along. And he's done only enough each year to keep his right. Just what has he done? Johnny, all he's done is grind up and rewash the tailings. You know, the refuse material left over from the original washing or concentration or treatment of the ground up oil. I guess that's the stuff that I've seen piled up outside all these mine tunnels that we've passed along the way, huh? Yeah, just worthless rock, in which the valuable metal and the coal mostly has been taken out. I see. Anyhow, by rewashing that stuff now and then, he's been able to back his claim that he's got a working mine. Well, tell me, Ham, has he ever got any worthwhile amount of gold out of those tailings? No, sir. 
That hasn't kept him from selling a new issue of stock now and then. Oh, boy, what a record. Yes, sir. No wonder he'd want to get rid of anybody who'd know and be willing to testify that his mine is worthless. Like young Kingsley. But until we can get his body up and prove, I mean prove that... Ah, uh, now wait, here we are. Oh, boy. Make them oh. back. Mm. Oh. All right, let's see. Wait a minute, Ham. Isn't that the golden dream? Still up ahead there? The main shaft and tunnels, yeah. Grab one of those coils of rope and that big flashlight, will you? See you half a mile away with that thing. Uh huh? Besides, it's getting dark. Okay. Yeah. But the hole in this mound over here to the right, well, you, you see it with the timber rigging over it? Yeah. Now, come on now. We'll look over the edge. With that powerful flashlight, you'll be able to see the body down there for yourself. All right. Uh, listen, Ham. Yeah? Where is Spiller? Where's he been all this time? Pretty good alibi, I'm afraid. The day after Kingsley got here, started poking around, Spiller apparently left. Apparently, you say? Yeah. Said he had to go over somewhere in California. Hadn't been seen around here since. Now, hang on to one of these timbers, lean over the edge of this hole, and look down. With the help of the powerful flashlight, I looked. About a hundred feet straight down in that jagged sided hole, floating in the water that filled the bottom of the shaft, was the body. Ham was absolutely certain it was Kingsley. So, job number one was to bring it up. Only then could we determine whether he'd been killed before plunging down there, and if so, how. And if possible, by whom. So if you'll lower me down there, Johnny, on one of these ropes, you can feed it around one of these timbers for a break so you let me down I'll easy. Just, uh, just hold everything for a second, Ham. Huh? Look, you're the one with the big muscles, so uh, I'm the one who's going down that shaft. Well, now, listen. No, no, you... I'd a lot sooner trust you to lower me properly than I'd trust myself to hold that heavy carcass of yours. <laughs> also, it'll give you the job of hauling up the body and, and then me. <laughs> there you say, Johnny. Oh, it'll serve you right if I make you climb back up. I tucked the big flashlight into my belt and hand slowly lowered me into that deep, black, rock-sided shaft. Hanging there on that rope, touching the sides only where there were juttings or ledges, was pretty exciting. I was glad the rope was a long one and that Ham was on the other end. Along the way, there were several small tunnels leading away from the shaft. But with the flashlight, I could see that they were only short ones, ending in piles of rubble. Until just before I reached the water. Ham! Yes, Johnny? Hold it a minute. Right. Have you reached the body? No. What? Not quite. But there's a big tunnel. A clear one leading off from here. A big one. What? Looks like it might lead over to the main shaft of the Golden Dream. Not now. Wait. Huh? Let me snub this line so I can lean over and hear you better. There. There we are. Oh, look. Hey. Forget it for now. I'll investigate on the way back up. I'm only a few feet from the body now, so lower away again. All right, Hank, lower away. Watch it, will you? That one almost hit me. 
All right, now lower away again. Pam? Lower away, you hear me? Wait a minute. What goes up there? Who's pulling off those shots? The rope. The rope is slipping now. It's slipping. No painless way has yet been discovered to extract money from your paycheck. Probably the nearest thing to it goes by the name of the payroll savings plan. Oh, you might notice a shrinkage in your check the first few paydays, but then something happens. You no longer expect to have that extra cash in hand. In effect, you forget all about it, except for those pleasant reminders that come your way periodically in the form of United States savings bonds. The Payroll Savings Plan, the automatic, sure route to a secure future. Okay, so I cheated a little. When the rope that had been holding me suddenly slackened, it wasn't I that splashed into the water at the bottom of that mine shaft. Nope was one of the big rocks at the opening of the tunnel that I'd found down there. One of the two or three I'd grabbed at frantically to pull myself into the tunnel as the hundred feet or so of heavy rope came whipping down past me and I barely made it. I kept the flashlight off so as not to show that I was still alive and kicking. Because then, after the long roar of the gunshots, and then the... Huge boulders were rolled over the edge and plunged down where I was supposedly struggling in the water. Hey, Dollar! Dollar! You still alive down there? Dollar? Okay, man, I'll just have to make sure. Several more huge boulders came crashing down into the shaft, and thank goodness passed harmlessly by the mouth of my tunnel, but I didn't stick around to count them. Instead, using the light again, I tore on up the long, sloping passageway, hoping and praying it would somehow get me back to the surface. Half a dozen times, I had to clear away piles of rubble with only my bare hands, but I was thinking of Ham, of what might have happened to him, what still might happen to him. Finally, a pile of rubble blocked off the passageway entirely. But then through a low, narrow little side tunnel, so filled with debris where the shoring had given way that I had to crawl along on my belly, I reached the surface. It was quite dark by now, but I didn't dare show my light. Instead, I walked slowly, quietly around to get my bearings. And then I saw the jeep, and above it the timbers Ham had used to snub the rope we outlined against the darkening sky. In silhouette, I could faintly see two men up there. But in the dark, I couldn't tell which was which. But at least I knew that Ham was still alive. But for how long? Because one of them was carefully tying the other one down to a ten-by-ten ten that lay only a few feet from the edge of the shaft. Had Spiller gone mad? Was he going to shove that timber with its human cargo into that shaft? No Indian ever crawled along over the floor of the desert any more softly than I did. And I cursed the fact that I hadn't a gun, that I'd left it with hand to cut down my weight. A couple of times a jackrabbit jumped out from under my feet and I hunched over and froze, hoping the man I was stalking wouldn't look around. Or if he did, that he'd mistake me for one of the many boulders scattered about, or a clump of sage. But then I came to a clear space, nearly 20 feet of it, that I had to cross to reach him to reach him before he could shove that timber into the pit. It was so dark now, I could only see him as a blurred shadow. But all he needed was to hear me. Whichever one had the gun. I stopped. Took a deep breath. Then rose up to make the dash across the open space. 
It's okay, Johnny. What? Just take it easy. Sam. So that tunnel you found down there did bring you up and out, huh? Uh-huh. Thank heaven you're okay, Johnny. Ham, the main thing is that you're all right. Except for a bump on the head from the butt of his pistol. Marty Spiller, hmm? Marty Spiller. Sneaked up behind me when I was letting you down there and really laid one on to me. When I came to, I saw him throwing rocks down there at you, so... Well, I figured I'd better get up and stop him. I was tying him up just now, then fastening the line so I could work my way down and help you to get back up. Hey, whatever gave you the idea that I was still alive? Johnny, if a lousy punk like Spiller could kill off a man like you, well, this I gotta see. I hope you never do. We brought up Kingsley's body the next morning. The bullet that had killed him before he'd been dropped from the mine shaft had come from Speller's gun. A simple ballistics test proved that conclusively. So, again, it's up to the courts. Expense account total, four fifty one eighty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, as you listen to it, just remember that old saying. Ike and Mike, they look alike. And join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Cliff Carpenter, Bob Dryden, and Sam Raskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Warren Sweeney speaking. Johnny Dollar. Like to hop aboard the next plane headed for the mighty sovereign state of Texas? Why not? And who that? Jack Price here in Corpus Christi. <laughs> oh, hi, Jackson. How about it? Well, you know I like that town of yours, Jack. I always have. But unless your company plans to pay the freight, forget it. I can't afford it. Now, you don't think for one minute I'd be inviting a character like you down here in just a social call. Why not? I'm a very sociable fellow. Oh, sure. Sure. Especially when you're on expense account. Naturally. Or when your investigation saves us a lot of money and you can pick up a nice commission for it. Sure. But this time, pal, there's no way you can save us anything. As a matter of fact, if what I suspect is true, you'll only cost us money. Now, that doesn't make much sense. Doesn't it? Well, does it? Why don't you come down here and see? On expense account. Yeah, yeah, on expense account. But no extras. Bare minimum expense account. Right. No chance of a commission. Uh, None. But maybe just a nice little service fee... Just for old times' sake? No. Oh, now, Jackson, listen. Do you really think I'd accept an assignment like that from you, of all people? I cannot tell a lie, Johnny. I think you would. You want to know something, pal? Yeah. You're right. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to try Western Life Insurance Company Corpus Christi office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Ike and Mike matter. Expense account item one. 
$5.65 for a taxi out to Bradley Field. As for item two, well, in spite of this demand for economy, I'm sure the company treasurer won't object to my not thumbing my way to Corpus Christi. So item two is $122.23 for a plane ticket. But to make up for it, after I got there, instead of a taxi, I took the airport limousine to the Robert Driscoll Hotel. That's item three, $1.35. There I got myself a room, not a suite, mind you, and unpacked my bag. Yeah, who is it? What do you mean, who is it? Come on, open up. Jackson, come in. All right, Johnny. Now, don't tell me you came around to make sure I didn't take too expensive a room. Sit down. Thanks. It's getting close to dinner time, Jack. Why don't I order up a couple of drinks? No, uh, listen, Johnny. Hmm? You'd uh, better not. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't tell me you were that serious about holding down on the expenses. Well, I was and I wasn't, but something's happened since I talked to you on the phone. Oh? Like what? Well, what I mean is it's... That's too late now. Too late for what? For you to do what I wanted you to do down here to see if you could do What are you talking about? That is to say, look into this thing and see if I wasn't right about thinking maybe the best thing to do would be just to cancel the policy. What policy? I mean because of what happened just a few hours ago after I called you. Look, Jackson, this bush you're beating around is getting pretty big. What policy to whom and for how much and what's the matter with it? Okay. Straight life, Johnny. 25,000 bucks. And with the standard double indemnity clause. Yes, I know, for accidental death. Yes, darn it. Well, who's the insured? Well, Johnny, do you, um, do you remember a character by the name of Lou Livercombe? No, I can't say that. Wait a minute. Little Louie Livercombe, that mm. slippery old stock promoter I chased all over the country a couple of years ago? Yes. And finally caught up with only to have a fast-talking mouthpiece get him off scot-free? The same. Oh, Jackson, don't tell me you issued a policy to a crook like little Louie. No, I didn't. At least uh, give me credit for some sense. But one of the boys in the office, a new kid, sold this policy to oh. a Mr. Isaac Prellinger. Better known around the local pool halls as Smarty Ike. Mm -hmm. And that nickname is a pretty good description of him. No visible means of support, just a smart, fast-talking bum recently in from San Antonio. $25,000 policy, hmm? Yeah. When I found out about it, I, I didn't like it, but, well, I let it go through. Then, this morning, in a routine checkup, I found out who he named as beneficiary. Livercombe? Livercombe. No kidding. No kidding. And when the wheels began to turn in this uh, so-called brain of mine... I mean, the fact that Ike bought a policy that big, uh, though he apparently didn't have much dough. So maybe Livercombe put up the money for it on condition that he be named beneficiary with the idea of having him knocked off. Yes. And it wouldn't be the first time a crook like Louie tried a caper like that. But until I could be sure it's the same Livercombe, and the address we have for him is out in Eugene, Oregon. Oregon? Yeah. Or then he did clear out of where he'd been working when I caught up with him. Well, anyhow, that's why I called you. I figured if it is the same Livercombe, if you could find some evidence that he was paying for Ike's policy and planning to pull a fast one on us... And on Ike Prellinger. You're right. Then I'd have sufficient reason to cancel out the policy. Okay, Jackson. Let me get some dinner and a good night's sleep. No, Johnny. And I'll run out there to Oregon. Did you say no? It's too late. Hmm? The dumpy little shack over on West Maple Street where he lived alone. Yeah, what about it? Just a few hours ago, burned to the ground. Oh? And Ike Prellinger was in it. Oh. Yeah. They're sure? Firemen, authorities, they're sure it was Prellinger's body they found there in the remains of the fire? No question of it, Johnny. Who identified it, Jack? I did. Mm. And I checked against the description on his policy. Oh, well, that's a pretty complete description. Oh, Tri-Western really goes overboard on that, Johnny. Not only a complete physical and medical history, but pictures, x-rays, the works. I know. And then just to make doubly sure, I had the lad who sold him the policy go over and take a look. Mm -hmm. So there's no question of it. The man who died in that fire was Ike Prellinger. So now we'll have to pay off to this Louis Livercombe. Like I said, Johnny, you got here too late. Maybe. Well, what can you do about it now? What started the fire? You remember uh, Pete Frawley. The arson squad? Yeah, one of the best. Yeah, I know. Pete says it was accidental and typical. Ike got himself drunk, fell on the bed with a lighted cigarette. First went the mattress, then everything else. 
Including him. And Pete is sure of that? He's already made out and signed his report. Well, he should know. He does. Well, I think I'll talk to him anyhow. Well, by all means. And I know what you're thinking. If this beneficiary is the same Louis Livercombe, there almost has to be something fishy. Uh, Jack, how about if I rent a car and then meet you over at your office? You uh, want me to have Pete Frawley over there? No, I'll dig him up at headquarters. But first, I'd like a look at the policy involved on this one. Okay? Okay, Johnny. Anything you say. <laughs> Item four, a dollar eighty-five for a quick bite in the Robert Bristol coffee shop. Item five, fifty bucks deposit on a rental car. Then over at Jack's office, despite the late hour, I took a long, careful look at the policy on Ike Prullinger. Especially at the description of him. Jack was right. Tri Weston does do a thorough job. Pete Frawley, the arson squad, had gone home for the night, but didn't hesitate a minute to get out of his robe and slippers, put on his shoes, and meet me at headquarters. We paid a visit to the morgue. Well, there you are, Dollar. Pretty badly burned, no features left, but there's no doubt it's Ike Prellinger. Same height, weight, teeth, build, general characteristics, everything. Mm-hmm. Including fingerprints? From this? Oh, no, impossible. Oh. But, Dollar, I checked him out against the description on the insurance policy, and so did Doc Wyman, the coroner. It's about as positive an ID as we could want. And that young fellow who sold him the policy was sure of it, too. Even he identified the finger ring and the watch. Mm -hmm. Even old Jerry Deeks was certain. Who's Jerry Deeks? He runs a pool parlor where Ike used to hang around. Well, you want me to... Fold down this sheet for a better look at him? No, no, don't bother. Um, what about an autopsy, Pete? <laughs> now, you don't think I'd have made out my report before Doc Wyman did his autopsy. No, Dollar, this is Ike, all right, and there is no doubt about it. Mm. Jack Price tells me, uh, you said the fire was accidental? If you mean any signs of arson, the answer is no, there were none whatsoever. Only all the usual, typical signs of what actually happened. What do you mean, Pete? Well, a flock of empty whiskey bottles around. One of them that dropped out of his hand when he lay down on his bed, same as I've seen it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I was even able to isolate the ashes from the cigarette he'd had in his hand that set off the mattress at the point the fire actually originated. Now, wait a minute, Pete. Yeah, what? I have reason to suspect that somebody might have wanted to kill him to collect his insurance and tried to use the fire as a cover-up. Yeah, yeah, I thought of that, too. But Doc Wyman found absolutely no sign of injury nor any poison in his system. What's more, Dollar, he wasn't killed before the fire because there were signs of smoke in the lungs. And I mean plenty. Mm. Of course, Pete, uh... Yeah? Well, what is it, Dollar? Well, I mean, if somebody smothered him, you know, with a pillow or something... That would leave no marks. Before the fire? Yeah. Well, did you miss my point? Then there wouldn't have been smoke in the lungs. Oh, wait a minute. He would have passed out before he stopped breathing entirely, wouldn't he? Yeah, possibly. In other words, a killer could have smothered him just enough to make him unconscious, then started the fire, let him get his lungs full, and, well, then the fire would have finished the job. <laughs> Are you reaching a little bit, Dollar? Mm, maybe so, maybe no. Well, I mean, unless you can somehow turn up some evidence that he was murdered. No, it's just a hunch, but a potent one. Well, I know that neither Doc Wyman nor I could find anything to indicate it, and believe me, Dollar, I tried. I mean, I have just as suspicious a mind as you have. Okay, Pete. So, you want to look at the autopsy report? I'm sure Doc wouldn't mind. You want me to ask him? No, no, don't bother. But why? Hmm? Well, I mean... Why this powerful hunch? Oh, because of a man I chased halfway across the country a couple of years ago, who now lives in Oregon. I don't get it. He is the beneficiary of Ike's policy. I still don't get it. I think maybe I'd better fly on out there and pay him a visit. <laughs> First, though, I drove around to Jerry Deke's pool room. Just why, I'm not sure now that I've stopped to think about it. But you know something? It was Jerry Deeks who convinced me beyond the shadow of a doubt that my hunch was right. 
100%. What he, what he done for a living, Mr. Dollar? Yes, Mr. Deep. Uh, anything I... Ike Perlinger made, he made it right here. Sir. Yes, sir. You mean with a pool cue? Uh, one of the steadiest shots I, I ever see. Mm-hmm. Most consistent, too. Yes, sir. In spite of the way he liked his liquor? Ike, liquor never would touch him. You sure of that? No, sir. Never, never touch him, sir. And I know. Well, how do you know? Well, uh, Tried to give him some once, like a, like a sort of present for well, the way that he's brought a lot of customers in here. Said no, he did. Said such stuff was nothing but poison. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. For what? You may not know it, but you've said one word to me, loud and clear. Oh, what's that, sir? Murder. Murder. It's a welcome change sometimes to have neighbors drop in unexpectedly for a visit. Weekdays here on the CBS radio network, we have a group of friendly folks who like to drop in on you, cheer your day along, and never once get in the way. They are Arthur Godfrey, Art Linkletter, Gary Moore, Bing Crosby, and Rosemary Clooney, CBS radio's daytime stars. Every weekday, they furnish fun and frolic mixed with music at this lilting location on your radio dial. Tune in the daytime stars. They're good company. Although it was now quite late, item six is ten cents for a phone call to Jack Price at his home. What? You still out and circulating around? I sure am, Jackson. Why don't you get some sleep? What's up? As soon as I can, I'm heading out to Eugene, Oregon. To check up on that beneficiary? Yep, among other things. What do you mean, other things? In the first place, I'm sure now that we have a murder case on our hands. Ike was murdered then? Oh, I didn't say that. What, well, what do you mean? Just got me a wild idea, Jackson. You remember that old saying, Ike and Mike, they look alike? Well, sure, but... Well, just what? give that a thought while you're driving over to your office to meet me. Twenty minutes later, in Jack's office, I took another look at Ike Pellinger's policy. I also went over the original application for it, and particularly the medical report and the x-rays. Well? Okay, Jackson. Now, if you don't mind, I'll use this phone. Sure, go ahead, Johnny. Help yourself. But you still haven't told me what you meant by the Ike and Mike bit. Just a hunch. But if it's the right one, there's a lot more to this case than meets the eye. So like what, for instance? Like the possibility, for instance. Hello? Hello? Johnny Dollar, Pete. Oh, why? Don't tell me you got on out there to Oregon already. No, but listen, I'll call you from there sometime in the morning. In the meantime... And you still think it was murder, huh? Now I'm sure of it. You found some bottles in the remains of that fire, and that made you think Ike had got drunk and made that typical mistake of setting off his mattress with a lighted cigarette. Well, I still think that's what happened. In spite of the fact he never touched the stuff? Yes, sir, in spite of the... What did you say? You heard me. Listen, I've just looked over the x-rays on Ike Prollinger. First thing in the morning, at the crack of dawn, get your Doc Wyman to do a further autopsy on that stiff. A further? Yes. Have him look for marks from an old fracture of the first metatarsal on the right foot. Oh, why? If he doesn't find any, then you get busy and phone a complete description of Ike to the Missing Persons Bureau up in San Antonio. That's where Ike lived one time before he came here. You think they might be looking for him? For him? No. Then I don't get it. But if that description ties in with somebody who is missing from up there... Uh, listen, Pete. Yeah? If it doesn't, then you'll have to try every other town in Texas if necessary until somebody does recognize that description. And if the name turns out to be Mike somebody or other... I still don't get it. Just do it, Pete. Call Missing Persons Bureau until you get a positive reaction to that description. I'll phone you tomorrow from Eugene, Oregon. All right, now, Jack, i got to get me on out to the airport and see what kind of connections I can make. The connections I could make were anything but good. Item 7 is $199.75, and my routing took me to Houston, to Los Angeles, to Portland, and then finally Eugene. 
scheduled a stopover at every point. It was well into the next morning by the time I got there. Item 8, 1250 for a cab to Lou Livercombe's place off Deming Road, out beyond the Ridge Reservoir. It was a kind of modest, well-kept sort of home you'd expect a retired country gentleman to live in, rather than a crook. The reason for that high taxi charge is because I asked the cabbie to wait for me. Remember that. As for Livercombe, he was the same suave, slippery old character I'd known two years before. Yes, I heard from uh, from an old contact of mine that Ike Fellinger died down there in Corpus Christi. Too bad, darling. He was an old friend of mine. Yes, so I understand. As a matter of fact, he made me the beneficiary of his insurance. I've already mailed in a claim. Why did he name you, Livercombe? Why not? We used to work together, Ike and I. You still working together? Don't be ridiculous, Dollar. How could we be if he's dead? Tell me, where have you been the past couple of days? Right here. I haven't gone out beyond the mailbox for nearly a week. Mm -hmm. Can you prove that? Yes, I can prove it. Ask my next-door neighbor, old Morgan. I've seen and talked with him two or three times every day. And Mrs. Teller on the other side. I helped to gather in some wood yesterday morning. Yesterday morning, hmm? Yes. Yesterday afternoon, she brought me over an apple pie she'd made. All of which makes a, a nicely set-up alibi for you, doesn't it? Now, look here, Dollar. I don't know what you're getting at, but if you think you can tie me in with Frelinger's getting knocked off... Did you... I say that? Didn't you learn a couple of years ago that when you try to pin something on me, all you're going to do is fall flat on your face? Suppose we see. Mind if I use your phone? Well? Go ahead. Thanks. The call was to Pete Frawley at police headquarters back in Corpus Christi. And the result of Dr. Wyman's further autopsy and Pete's call to San Antonio? Dollar, I don't know how you do it. Yeah, Pete. No broken bone in the foot of that stiff, so your hunch was right. It wasn't Ike Pellinger at all. It was somebody who was a dead ringer for him. Taken there, planted there by Ike? Well, that we can't be sure of. Anyway, not yet. I'm sure of it. But now listen. Like you suggested, I called the MPB in San Antonio. Now, the missing man on their list fitted Ike's description perfectly. His name was Mike Ringler. So how you figure that one, I'll never know. All right. Now, do you see what it means, Pete? No, you tell me. When Ike found that he had a double there in San Antonio, it gave him an idea. So we moved down to Corpus to carry it out. What was it? He got in touch with and made a deal with his old colleague in crime, Lou Livercombe, out here in Eugene. If Lou would pay the premium on a nice hunk of insurance, then when he supposedly died, they could split it. In this case, with double indemnity, a total of 50000 bucks. Well, I'm a son of a gun. Yeah, it's an old one, but it's worked more than once. Now, wait. We still have to round up Ike Prellinger. Don't give that a second thought, Pete. I'll simply make the most of Lou's hospitality here in his home for a while. You what? For just as long as necessary. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Then when Ike arrives to pick up his cut of the insurance money, he thinks, well, Pete, I'll be right here and ready and waiting. Okay, buddy. Hang it up. Hang it up, I said. Johnny? You hear me? You see this? I'll, uh, talk to you later, Pete. Well, Ike Prellinger, hmm? That's right. Who are you? Who is he, Lou? Don't you know him? That's Johnny Dollar, the insurance detective. Oh, it is, huh? Well, Dollar, you won't be talking to anybody. Not later, not any time. You see this? Haven't you made enough mistakes already, Ike? Plug him, Ike. Let him have it. All right, all right, Lou. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Thank you. Now, listen, mister. Cabby. Hey, out of my way. Hey, what's going on? Look out, Cabby. Watch him. Oh, no, you do. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, I... And now you, Lou. No. Holy mother. Wow. Thanks, Cabby, for barging in the door that way and throwing him off balance. Wow, we. What you done to him? Say, what goes, anyhow? Plenty. I'll tell you all about it while we drive these babies into police headquarters. <laughs> Yep, it was good hunting. Not only because Ike will have to pay for the murder of Mike Ringler, but more important to me, because Lou Livercombe is finally ending up where he belongs, behind bars. Expense account total, 
Oh, why don't you figure it up, Jackson? And uh, don't forget my commission on the insurance that won't have to be paid out. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, only the shadow of a doubt locks up the case for me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were William Redfield as Pete Crawley. Maurice Tarplin as Jack Price. Reynold Osborne as Louis Livercombe. Lawson Zerby as Deeks. Ralph Bell as Ike Prellinger. And Bill Lipton as the cab driver. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Bill Gillian speaking. If someone you know has had an accident or an operation, the chances are he was given blood or blood plasma to prevent shock or to replace lost blood. Or perhaps one of your children came down with the measles and was given a shot of gamma globulin. That required blood for its manufacture. Whenever emergency arises in accidents, operations, or disasters, blood is urgently needed. And there's no time to get it after the emergency arises. It must be there always ready for immediate use. The agency that collects the blood for our military and civilian hospitals and keeps blood banks all over the country well stocked is the Red Cross. This is only one of the countless invaluable services performed by this wonderful organization. One of the ways in which you can help the Red Cross is by giving blood regularly. There are many other ways you can help, too, doing various kinds of other useful volunteer jobs. Right now, during Red Cross Month, join and serve and help the Red Cross stay on the job for you. Johnny Dollar. Dollar, this is Ted Orloff. Orloff? Yeah, you remember Western Indemnity Company out here in Los Angeles? Oh, of course, Ted. How are you? Fine, just fine. Gee, it's been a long time. I know, I know. Uh, now, uh, tell me, are you free to come out here? Come out here right away? I don't know why not. What seems to be the trouble? One of our clients owns a small bottling plant. Yeah? His name is Garrison. Barney Garrison? Go ahead. Called me and told me that somebody's pulled an embezzlement on him, taking nearly $170,000 from his till. Uh-oh. Under the seventy grand, yeah. Well, can you make it? Can you come out here? I'll pick up a plane schedule and call you back, okay? Fine. Okay. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Indemnity Company, Home Office, Los Angeles, California. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the shadow of a doubt matter. Expense account item one, three fifty for the call back to Ted Orlov to tell him the best deal I could make was the flight out of Hartford at seven twenty the following morning. Item two, one eighty five seventy for the plane ticket. When I got to L.A. a few minutes after noon Pacific time, Ted was waiting for me. I piled my luggage into the back of his car and we took off. Now, now. Mr. Bernard Livermore Garrison, Barney Garrison. Own some kind of a bottling plant. That's right, soft drinks. You know, root beer, sarsaparilla, lime, orange, the works. And just now, today, as a matter of fact... Watch it! Okay, it's okay. 
Clint, why didn't she signal that turn? Crazy Southern California drive. Uh, we, uh, we were going pretty fast, Ted. Been out here seven years now. Seven years, Johnny, but I still, well, I can't get used to it. These natives all drive around like an accident, just going somewhere to happen. Yes, they do. But like I started to say... Yeah, Ted. Somehow, somewhere, Barney Garrison raised himself a lot of money. And he really set up this plan. Uh, who is Ralph Betterly? He's vice president, and yikes. Crazy, Kelly. What's the matter with that guy? Hey, Ted, uh, seriously, hadn't you better slow down a little? Now, stop worrying, Johnny. We're about, just... about Ralph Betterly. Vice president and business manager, I guess you'd call him, handles the bookkeeping department, that kind of stuff. It's almost a sort of partnership, Johnny. Kind of a partnership. So why those two would ever get together, I'll never know. Why do you say that? Well, about as opposite as any two people could ever be. Ralph is a quiet, little, ingrown old man. He isn't really old, probably not more than two or three years older than Barney. But he looks and acts a quiet, meek, responsible citizen. Mm -hmm. He and his wife have a nice little home on Pandora Avenue in Westwood. And Barney Garrison? Big, well-fed, back-slapping, hail fellow, well-met sort of a guy. Talks to anybody and everybody. A real salesman. He's a bachelor, has a big eye for the gals, and really lives it up. Gets along with anybody, drives an expensive car, has a showy home in Bel Air, has just bought one in Palm Springs, entertains like mad, and, and, well, you know the type. I think I do. Just the opposite of Ralph Bradley, just the opposite. Well, opposites always attract, they say. Yeah, 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 I guess they... What's the matter with you? You crazy or something? Didn't you see that stop sign? Jerk. You'd think he was the only one on the road. That was, uh, was a little close, Ted. Oh, some of the cooks behind the wheel have absolutely no consideration for anyone else. As I was saying... Yes, uh, let's get back to the embezzlement. Well, huh? Barney called me yesterday, just before I called you. Instead of been going through the books of the, uh, cash on hand. Uh, for some reason, they keep a lot of cash on hand. Mm-hmm. And as near as he can figure it, there's about 170000 gone. I see. But what does this Ralph Betterly think about it? I don't know. I told him we'd call on him after we've seen Barney. So after you've talked to Barney, we'll come back here. Come back from where? Palm Springs. That's where Barney called me from, uh, where he's waiting for him. Oh, I see. Hey, watch the stoplight ahead, with him. Huh? Oh. <laughs> now, instead Ooh. of uh, driving on down there... We'll cut over to Lockheed Airport in Burbank and take a plane. Take his plane. His plane? That's right. His own personal private plane. Well, isn't it just about as fast to drive down there? Yeah, sure it is, but uh, this is the way he wants it. Okay. We'll do it the way Barney wants it. Once at the airport, we hopped aboard Garrison's Twin Engine Beach... The pilot took off, and in almost less time than it takes to tell about it, we sat down at the Palm Springs Airport. Oh, he promised to meet us here, but I don't see any sign of him, not a sign. What time is it, John? Uh, I have exactly 20 minutes past it. After five? Sure. <laughs> That's Eastern time. You forgot to reset your watch. Oh, of course. Well, that makes it 20 after two. Pilot called him, though, so he shouldn't... Huh? What's the matter? Nothing. I, uh... I was surprised to see those long, thin clouds up there in this desert sky. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I... Oh, wait a minute. Those are just the uh, kind of tail end of a sky riding jump. Look there behind you. The sky rider's still at it. Hmm? Oh, yeah. P O P P O Papo? When he's finished, that'll spell Papola. What? That's a fine way to decorate an otherwise clean, clear blue sky. Don't knock it. Why not? That's Garrison's brand new product. Oh. And like I say, today's the first announcement of it. But now, where in the Sam Hill... Oh, here he is. Oh, beat me to it. I'm sorry I have to wait. How are you, Ted boy? Fine, Barney, just fine. And you must be Johnny Dollar. That's right. Uh, How are you, Johnny? Welcome to Palm Springs. Thanks. Just wait till you see the new joint I have down here. Now, listen, Ted, I'm afraid you brought him down for nothing. Why do you say that, Barney? Well, I used the old noodle. I did some thinking about who might have embezzled 170 Gs. And the more I thought, the more sure I got about who did it. Who? And I'm willing to bet that if you face up to him and tell him that I'm on to him, he'll break right down and admit it. 
fool, Barney. That so-called partner of mine, Ralph Beverly. Barney Garrison refused to talk further about the embezzlement until he'd taken us out and showed us through his new home. It was U-shaped and built around the swimming pool and just about as modern as an expensive resort home could possibly be. It was the kind you see written up in the movie fan magazines and only half believe is true until you see it. His pension for entertaining on a big scale was shown by the fully equipped bars. There were three of them. One in the pantry, another in the den, and the third one, poolside. Only one thing marred the attractiveness of that pool. A huge, gaudy, garish, neon sign at one end with the words, Now is the time to... And below it was an electric clock a couple of feet in diameter with the words, Drink Popola on the dial where the numbers should have been. <laughs> you get it, Johnny? Now is the time to... And when you look at the clock, well, sure, you can tell the time, all right, but what you're really reading is now is the time to drink Popola. Yeah, I see. Yeah, sure. I want to get the togs out of here and take shots of the place for all the picture magazines. You know, publicity. So the word Popola's got to show up somewhere, and if they take a picture of me here at the pool, they can't miss it. I see what you mean. Well, just to make sure. Yeah, now, look. Here. Look at these snapshots I took this morning out here myself. Yeah, I used one of those 10-second cameras and rigged a long cable release so as I could get into the pictures, too. <laughs> see here? Yeah, yeah, I, I see. Now, uh, about this embezzlement... Yeah, and see this one? It shows me, shows the clock, shows it was 10.05 a.m., and, uh, and you see, see up there in the background, up in the sky? Oh, yeah, that sky rider we saw, Johnny. Yeah. Today is the first day for that sky riding bit. So I understand. You know, just to announce Popola. Yes, uh, I know. Uh, now, uh, Barney... But now, why don't you guys slip into some trunks and let me get some pictures of you out here by the pool? Well, why don't we get down to business instead? You said you think your partner, Ralph Betterly, took the money? Uh, oh, yeah. Why yeah. do you think that, Barney? Well, it's an awful thing to say, Johnny, after working together on this bottling business, but... Well, there comes a time when a guy's got to face the facts. Well, suppose you give me some of the facts. Well, to begin with, Ralph isn't a full partner with me. The deal we have only cuts him in for about a quarter of the profits. I see. And they've been pretty low, Johnny. Kind of the startup costs on Pop Bola. Like I said, the sky riding's only started today and all the rest of the advertising and promotion. Mighty expensive, too. I'm sure it is. Anyhow, with all the money that he's had to spend on hospitals, why? It, did you know that she died a couple of days ago, Ted? No, I didn't, Barney. Yeah, yeah, too bad. Anyway, he's been having a real tough time of it. Mm. And, um, you think that he would steal from his own company? Ah, he's been pretty desperate. But, Johnny, the real point is, and, well, I hate to say this, but he's the only one who could. Why is that? Two reasons. Don't you have a lot of employees there at your plant? Sure, Johnny, quite a few. But outside of me, Ralph is the only one who has the combination of the safe we keep all the cash in. The only one, Johnny. And if that don't put the finger on him, I don't know what does. Uh, I think you said two reasons. Oh, yeah. Number two, Ralph is the only other one who has any idea how much there was in there. Do you mind telling me why you kept that much cash on hand? Oh, so maybe it did seem like a lot, but it takes a lot to run a business, any kind of business. $170,000? Sure. But don't you see, I got to have cash to pay off the Mexican boys who... Uh, well, that is... Uh, yes, Bunny? Okay. Okay, you're not the cops or the pure food and drug fellas or anything, so you're only a private detective, so I'm going to level with you. Go on. Some of the stuff for the Popolo mix... Uh, yeah, I mean, a secret ingredient... Well, you know what I mean. Go on. Okay, so maybe it doesn't cross the border exactly legal, you know? Ted, did you know about this? I certainly didn't. Now, now, wait a minute. There's nothing poison or narcotic about it, anything like that. It's only that if those wetbacks are willing to bring it in for me, but... well, that's why I've got to keep a lot of cash on hand, okay? Is it? What's okay about running a business like that? Hey, now, wait a minute, buddy. Ted, didn't you know what kind of an outfit you were selling indemnity insurance to? I guess I didn't. Now, don't get up on any pulpit, Johnny. Garrison, have you told the police about the embezzlement? Why should I? You bet you haven't, because you know you'd have an investigation on your hands that would put you out of business so fast you wouldn't know what hit you. Oh, yeah? 
You think I'm not smart enough to cover up if anybody comes poking around? You don't know me, Dollar. I don't think I care to. How do you think where I got where I am today? Answer me that. You know why? Because I'm smart, that's why. Me, I'm smart enough to get away with anything if I want to. Don't be too sure of that. Come on, Ted. Yeah? Now, you listen here, Dollar. Yes? If you think you're going out and make trouble for me... I wouldn't waste the time. Come on, Ted. Let's get on back to L.A. Yes, Johnny, and believe me, I'll cancel out every policy we have on him. Sure, go ahead. But you're still going to have to either recover the money or pay me off on this embezzlement. I'm afraid he's right, Johnny. Well, I'm not. And remember what I said. You tell Ralph Betterly I'm wise to him, and I'm betting he'll break down and confess. If he hasn't got conscience all of a sudden and blown his brains out. But you just get me that money. <laughs> Item three is 50 bucks deposit on a rental car to get us back to Los Angeles, and just as quickly as possible. Because I was really worried now, and I don't mean over that $170,000. About what then, Johnny? You have Ralph Betterly's address, Ted? Sure. Like I told you, he lives in the Westwood section on Pandora Avenue. That's out beyond Beverly Hills. Yeah, I know. Uh... But look, until we get there... Yeah? You better do a little praying, Ted. Praying? That's right. That this hunch of mine is all wrong. Um... But all the prayers in the world wouldn't have helped. By the time we got to 1308 Pandora, out there in Westwood, the police, including a medical and a couple of the lab crew, had done their work and left. All but a Lieutenant Harvey May. As for what had happened there? Well, you see, we got a phone call from his business partner, a man by the name of Garrison, called from Palm Springs. Oh? Yeah. Said he'd been trying to raise Betterly on the phone that he was worried about him, so... One of the boys in a prowl car drove over, got no answer to the doorbell, but the front door wasn't locked. So he barged in, found Betterly dead, a bullet in his head. I come on over with the doc and the lamp crew. I see. But I figure it, Lieutenant. Looks like suicide dollar all the way. Mm -hmm. You know, because of losing his wife and financial troubles and all, and Betterly's prints are on the gun, and only Betterly's suicide. Hmm? Well, maybe. Why do you say that? Well... Had betterly pulled that gun on himself, there should have been clear powder burns on his head, see? But the doc seemed to think he might have been shot from six or uh, seven feet away. Now, he, he could be wrong, of course. Could he? I doubt it. Yeah? Why? When was he, um... Well, when did he die? Doc figures sometime between 9.30 and 11.30 this morning. And nobody in the neighborhood saw who might have done it? Nobody heard any shots or anything like that? No, but if you're thinking of that crooked partner of his... Why not? Uh... Well, he's down there in Palm Springs. You forgetting, Lieutenant? That's not much more than a two-hour drive. But he said he's been down there since late last night. And if he can prove that... Uh, look, I know, uh, Garrison isn't Lily White. Oh, you're so right. But if he can prove he's been down there all day... Well, Lieutenant, I'm sure that he thinks he can. Well, then? And I'm almost sure that I can prove his alibi's a phony. How? Oh, how, Dollar? And if you well, can, that, how... Well, uh, that's out of your jurisdiction down there, isn't it? Oh, well, sure, but all we have to do... No, don't, don't call him. Not yet. Give me time enough to drive to Palm Springs, hmm? Why? Well, you do. Maybe I'll bring you back a killer. Maybe. But if you tip him off by having the police bust in on him, you can bet your bottom dollar that Barney Garrison will think of some way to worm out of this murder. You seem pretty sure it was murder. I'm sure. And that Garrison did it, huh? I'm sure of that, too. Well? Okay, Donna, go ahead. But I better hear from you in a hurry. Don't worry, Lieutenant. You will. Thanks. Can a girl from a small mining town find happiness with a civil service jazz musician from a big city? This problem may never be solved by Betty Furness on the CBS radio network's Dimensions of a Woman's World. But her tips on home improvement, cosmetics, teenagers... Anything of interest to women could help you find a few answers that you've been looking for. The mention of a woman's world is heard three times every weekday with Betty Furness as hostess with the mostess. Information for and about today's woman. And you'll hear the mention of a woman's world only on weekdays and only on CBS Radio. <laughs> I made alone. After all, why stick out Ted Orloff's neck, too, especially when I wasn't as sure of myself as I'd made the lieutenant think? 
but too many things added up. If what Ted had told me about Betterly was true, he was hardly the man to pull an embezzlement. But Garrison, if he thought he could get away with it, sure. And with a home in Bel Air and other in Palm Springs, he could certainly use the money. Then there were some other things, like his call to the police to say that he was worried about not being able to reach Betterly by phone. Really worried about him? Or just to make sure the body would be discovered and a time of death set by a lab crew? And as the lieutenant said, to take away any suspicion from himself. Time of death. That was the key to the whole thing. Garrison's alibi. And that's what got me suspicious. The fact that I'd be called on to back up his alibi. And how? Well, a little over two hours later, the door of his Palm Springs home opened. I thought you went away mad this afternoon. I, uh... A little noisy in here, isn't it? I decided I'd better come back. Yeah, out of boy. Uh, incidentally... Yeah. I tried to call old Ralph after you left, but I got no answer. Oh, well, why call him, Barney? Well, like I said to you, if his conscience ever caught up with him... Yes, I know. You tried to plant the suicide idea with me pretty solidly this afternoon. Huh? Now, why do you say plant that way? Look, where can we talk, uh... Quietly for a few minutes. Oh, Barney, you're not leaving me all alone, are you? Well, just for a little while, sir. Oh. You know, just a little business. Come on, Dollar. In my den, right this way. Uh, first, wouldn't you like a drink? No, let's talk first. All right, sure. Right in here now. Well, sit down, Dollar. Sit down. No, that's better. Thanks. Now, what did you mean about trying to plant the suicide bit with you? Same as you were so careful to set your alibi with me. Alibi? What are you talking about? Now, look, I told you why I think Ralph embezzled that money, and I still think he did. Well, don't you? No. I think you did, Barney. <laughs> uh, now, this is no time to joke, darling. I'm not joking. All right, then, listen. Are you pretending you don't know what happened back there in Westwood this morning? You mean that Ralph... Are you pretending you don't know Ralph is dead? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Suicide, huh? That's too bad. He was murdered, Barney. And you were the first to know because you murdered him. Now, wait a minute. Look here, Dollar. Well? Now, listen. You know that isn't true. Because you know that I was right here in Palm Springs when it happened. Then you know when it happened. Well, you said this morning, didn't you? Yeah, I guess I did. Yeah, I was right here. And I can prove it. Can you? Well, didn't I prove it to you this afternoon? Did you? Okay, when was he killed? Then you admit it wasn't suicide. Well, I don't admit anything because I haven't got anything to admit. I asked a question. When did he die? The medico said between 9.30 and 11 a.m. Hey, see? Well, I was right here at exactly 10.05 a.m. And you know it, and I know it, and I can prove it. So can you. How? By that picture I showed you. That's exactly what I want to see again. All right, then here. I got it right here in this desk here. Yeah. Now, look. You want to argue with this? You see the clock there in back of me? 10.05, it says. And that can be caught. Sure, and I could have taken that picture some other time, like last week, maybe. Except for just exactly one little thing, Dollar. Well, go on. Look. Look at it. I'm looking. You see, up there in the sky, in the background, you see that sky writing? Popola, that's what it says. And the whole population of Palms Bible that that sky riding didn't start until today. Today, do you get it? All right. So you killed him, then tore on out here to reset that clock, take the picture, and have your alibi all ready by the time we arrived. You're crazy. Perfect alibi, Barney, except for exactly one little thing, as you put it. I say you're crazy. Now, you look at the picture. Your swimming pool runs north and south, doesn't it? So what? You face the south into the camera. That's right. So what? So the morning sun coming from the east would have cast your shadow to the west. Over here. Ah. Instead, what little shadow there is east of you from the early afternoon sun. Because you reset the clock and took this picture just before we arrived. I see. Yes. Okay, Dollar. Now look, you see this? And it's loaded, baby. 
Complete with silence, isn't it? That's right. So, Dollar... Oh, uh, uh, hi, Sergeant. Well, looks like Lieutenant May of the West Los Angeles Department was right, huh? Now, look, I, uh... Just let me explain this, huh? Why bother, Barney? Just give the sergeant the gun. Once again, it's up to the courts. But when the West Los Angeles police run down the 170000 wherever Garrison put it, and I'm sure they will, he won't have a leg to stand on. Expense account total, call it 450 bucks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, like a lot of other people, I open the trout season, but in a way I don't suggest you try. (laughs) Believe me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zarato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Bob Dryden as Barney Garrison, Bernard Grant as Lieutenant Harvey May, James Stevens as Ted Orloff, Eugene Francis as the police sergeant, and Jocelyn Summers as the girl at the party. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Pat Cannell speaking. Sportsarama with Red Barber premieres April 6th, putting Major League Baseball in the Sportsarama spotlight with straight-from-the-shoulder talk about our national pastime. April 6th, the first Sportsarama program with Red Barber on the CBS radio network. Do you know a new family just moving to your neighborhood? Welcome Wagon would love to welcome them. Welcome Wagon helps all new neighbors to feel welcome and wanted here in the Capital District. Each gracious Welcome Wagon hostess brings baskets of gifts from Tri-City Merchants. She brings greetings from the community to these newcomers, answers questions everyone wants to know about the Tri-City. You can make sure your new neighbors benefit from Welcome Wagon service. Just call State 59640 and give the Welcome Wagon hostess the name and address of your new neighbors. She'll call on them and present them with a basket of gifts from civic-minded businessmen. You'll be helping your neighbor and your welcome wagon hostess who carries on this valuable community service. In the Albany Troy's Connectedy metropolitan area, call State 59640. That's State 59640 for Welcome Wagon. WROW Albany, fair and cool tonight, gradually diminishing winds, the low 25 to 30. Monday, continued fair and mild, high in the low 50s. Down here in New York at State Unity Live. Phil, how's my one-time fishing pal? Slowly but surely going nuts with this business. All set to open the trout season? Not a chance. I am. Sunrise on opening day is going to find me out in the middle of a stream, gently dropping flies in front of ravenous rainbows. Yeah, And you know where I plan to do it? Yep. Oh? The point is, do you? Well, of course I do. I doubt On a private stream only half an hour's drive from here is the clearest, coldest... What was that? Yeah, you see, I was right. Right about what? You're not knowing where you're going on opening day. What are you talking about? Didn't you hear me? Oh, I heard all right, but you're wrong. Oh, I am, hmm? Sure. Because, Johnny, you're going to do your trout fishing on the Esopus River. Down there in New York State? That's right, near the little town of Mount Tremper. Who says? It's just west of Kingston, the other side of Ashokan Reservoir, about halfway between... Oh, I know where it is, and I've taken some nice, fat, native browns out of the Esopus, and I love it dearly. But what makes you think that's where I'm going to open the season? Well, after all, if we're going to pay your expense account... Oh, you are? Yeah, and for once, you won't have to hold back on it. Hmm, well, that's a little different. I kind of thought you'd see it that way. Tell me all. Come on down here to New York, and I will. I'm on my way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to State Unity Life Insurance Company, New York City office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Blue Rock matter. After carefully packing all my trout fishing gear and clothing to go with, including waders and a set of long johns, expense account item one is five seventy-five taxi fare to Bradley Field. Item two, ten dollars and twelve cents plane fare to New York. Item three, six twenty cab fare into Phil's office at five hundred Fifth Avenue. Sure, sure, Johnny. And I know that old saying just as well as you do. The time that a man spends in fishing is, is not, not deducted, deducted from, from his, his lifespan. Life. Yeah. Right. Right. But I just haven't had the time these last couple of years. Well, why don't you unchain yourself from this desk and join me there on the Asopas? Nope. I'm afraid it's no go. Why not? I wouldn't dare show my face up there where you're going. Why not? Because the man I want you to keep an eye on knows me. Oh, who might that be? Thomas Gerald Aspinwall. And who's he? A man who would stop at absolutely nothing to get his paws on the Emery Archibald fortune. Archibald? Big stockbroker? The same. I thought he was dead. He will be within a matter of weeks. One of those incurable things. Oh? Well, where does this Tom Aspenwald come in? He was married for a while to Nancy Archibald, Emery's daughter, and last of the line, except for little Barry. Who's Barry? Barry Aspenwald, Nancy's five-year-old son. By Tom Aspenwald? Uh, no. Now, in spite of the last name, he's by an earlier husband who died about the time little Barry was born. I see. Go on. Now, in his original will, the old man left half to Nancy, half to Tom. Mm-hmm. But in a brand new will, that's all changed. When old man Archibald goes, and that could be most any day now, the whole of his estate, including nearly a million of insurance, gets divided 50-50 between Nancy and the boy. I see. And Tom doesn't like that. Unless, Johnny. Yeah? Unless the youngster dies before the old man does. In which case his share goes to Tom Aspenwald, as in the earlier will. Ah. Don't ask me why, but that's the way it is. In any event, Tom would like nothing better than to see the youngster out of the way. Right. Before the old man dies. And that's why I suddenly got worried when I learned that Tom's taking the child away for a few days. Do you think he'd try to kill him, his own stepson? I think he would. Hmm. All right. Now, what's all this have to do with my opening the trout season on the Esopus? Or was that just a gag to get me down here? Oh, not a bit of it. Now, I've uh, made a reservation for you up there at Mount Tremper at the farmhouse of Mr. and Mrs. Fritz Hornblock. It's only a couple of hundred yards from the big pool below the bridge over the Esopus. Blue Rock Pool? Yes. Where I've wet many a line, Phil. Uh Oh, but not many people fish that spot anymore. Because unless you know every inch of it, and with the high roily water this time of year especially, it's about as dangerous a place as there is. Right. So, when I tell you that the only other guests the Hornblocks will have for opening day... Tommy Aspenwald and the boy? Yes. Wow. Wow. If there's one place on that river to fake an accident and make it look legitimate, that's it. Yes. You, uh, like to run on up there and keep an eye on things? Maybe prevent a murder? What do you think? Expense account item four is $28 even. Includes cocktails and dinner, a movie, a soft bed at the Lexington, and breakfast the next morning. After which I spent item five. Two seventy-five for a three-day non-resident fishing license. Item six, the usual fifty dollar deposit on a rental car. I drove north on Route 9, crossed the Hudson at Poughkeepsie, north on 9W to Kingston, then west around the Shokin Reservoir to Mount Tremper. By the time I got to the Hornblock farm, it was late afternoon, and the weather had turned very windy and very cold. Yeah. Ah, now, you, you think I'm too old to carry these packages of yours, Mr. Thomas? Well, no, but let me carry some of the fishing gear. Nine, 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 nine. I'm strong as an ox. Uh, are there any other guests, Mr. Hornblock? Uh, here now. Uh, right in here. Okay. Oh, looks fine to me. Good. Uh, a nice warm feather bed for you and... If you like it, I built you a nice big fire here in the fire. Place. Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary. Or maybe while the mama is out, you like maybe a little schnapps <laughs> <laughs> to keep the cold away. Well, yeah. now, it just happens, Mr. Hornblock, that I brought a bottle along with me. Oh. You know, just in case of snake bite. Oh, 
snake bite this time of year. <laughs> what kind? Well, if uh, eight-year-old scotch doesn't offend your finer sensibilities. Well, uh, why don't we see? Why don't we? There you are. To your heart's content. Ah, now, let me see. Well, 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 what's going on here? <laughs> well, hey, just what are you up to, Fritz? <sighs> Ah, oh, that was good, Mr. Dollar. Well, oh, good. Uh, will you join us? Oh, with that cold wind coming up out there, maybe I'd better. Uh, my name is Tom Aspen. Ah, oh, yes, Mr. Aspen, Walt. This is Johnny Dollar. Hi, Tom. Oh, well, hi. Dollar, did you say? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that sounds vaguely familiar. I don't know why it should. I'm just a fisherman up here for the opening. Yeah, uh, yeah, so is Mr. Aspenwald. Him and his little boy, that cute little Perry. Oh, your son, Tom? A stepson. I figure if a youngster learns to fish at that age, he'll be forever grateful for sure, it. Sure, sure he should. Even I might learn sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, by the way, where is he, Tom? Uh, my wife, she took him in to do the shopping in the village. Uh, yeah. And she promised to buy some more rocks for him. Rocks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he's crazy about those little hard candies, sugar candies, red and blue and yellow candies. Yeah, rocks, he calls them. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, I hope she doesn't give him too many, though. Make him sick. Oh, so isn't the little boy entitled now and again? Eh? Uh, even if it gives him a terrible stomach ache sometimes? Ah, uh, for a little boy, it, it always passes away. Mm -hmm. Except last time, I thought the poor kid was going to die. Oh, line, line. You just let him lie still for a while on the bed, and he'll be all okay again. No matter how sick he thinks he is. <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose you're right, but... Well, this time I've brought him up here to learn to fish, not to lie around with a stomach ache because of the way you and your wife spoil it. Ah, now, Mr. Aspenwald. And, uh, didn't you say there isn't a doctor this side of Kingston? No, 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 we take care of him. Now, don't you worry about him. You going out first thing in the morning, Tom? Yeah, I certainly am. Uh, uh, Johnny, did you say? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't, uh, missed an opening day in years. Where do you plan to fish? Oh, I don't know. Somewhere along the river. You? I'm not sure yet. Well, uh, I will tell you, boss. Yes, Fritz? You know where is the big hole below the bridge? Oh, you mean where the blue rock is? Yeah, sure. Oh, of course. It's an ideal spot. And nobody else will be fishing there. Right, that's for me. Uh, only one thing, though, Mr. Ashtonwalt. Yeah. Uh, I won't let you take that little boy there. Oh, why not? It's too dangerous, all those slippery rocks. Oh, now, look. And with all that ice on them in the early mornings, nine. Well, with me alone. Uh, maybe later in the day after it gets warm. <laughs> okay, okay, Fritz. We'll see. Now, you don't take him there. Okay, Fritz. Hey, now, wait a minute. Yeah? If that's such a hot spot... <laughs> sure it is. Well, Tom, why don't you and I hit it at the crack of dawn? <laughs> well, now, uh, just wait a minute, Johnny. Sure, that's a good idea. Sure, what difference would it make to a youngster of five? Well, it's simply that I promised him. I mean, a place where he'd be sure to get some fish. What's more, it'll be a lot warmer later in the day. Of course. And after, after you've caught your limit, <laughs> we hope... You'll feel a lot more like taking the time to teach him. Yeah, yeah. You you leave him with us in the morning. <laughs> now listen. He can you play around right. this place the way he likes to. Does he really care about fishing at that age? Well, he will once I've shown him how. Well, he'll enjoy learning a lot more if he's warm and comfortable. Uh, I suppose you know all about kids. No, not very much. But if he does enjoy playing around the farm the way Fritz says he does... Sure, sure. That's what he really likes. And, uh, you want the truth, Tom? Truth. Well, apparently you're the expert around these parts. I'm not, so I'll use whatever arguments I can to make you help me get a limit tomorrow morning. <laughs> Johnny, now... And don't you think that would be the sporting thing for him to do, Fritz? Sure, sure it would. All right, then it's all set. You and I open the season with a bang at this hot spot of yours, then later, when it's warm and the rocks are dry, we can both take Barry out and teach him how. <laughs> well, thanks, but I prefer to teach him myself. Okay, okay. Um... Would you care for a little snort out of this jug? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. No, thanks. I've uh, got to run over to Kingston to pick up some dry flies I forgot to bring along. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's much, much better. Yes, um, yes, I think so, too. Say, more trout flies, did he say? That's funny. Is it? 
You should see what he bought. Every fly that was ever made. Well, uh, more to the point, Fritz. Yeah. Purist though he may be, and I like to think I'm one too, doesn't he know that dry flies would be ridiculous this time of the year? Sure, sure he does. Some wet flies or nymphs or streamers, maybe, or even when you come to being practical about yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some of the nice fat worms that I have already for you, eh? <laughs> and he knows that's the way to fish this water at this time of year, as well as you do, if you want to catch the fishes. But there he goes. Yeah. Oh, and look, from the window... Here comes Mama back with the little boy. It was obvious from the way he spoke of him that Barry wasn't overly fond of his stepfather. But he was a cute little tyke, and I didn't blame Mrs. Hornblock, a sweet, typical housefrau, for wanting to spoil him just a little. <laughs> a little? Judging by the size of the sack of hard candies he clutched in his hand... Blue rocks, he called them. She was doing a pretty good job of it. The kind he likes the very best, his stepfather says. There was something, something about those candies, though, that vaguely, vaguely reminded me of... I wondered. Yeah, yeah. And the blue ones, huh? those are his favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any kind that's blue, he loves it. <laughs> Fritz, where's the stepfather? Oh, uh, just to Kingston to make a nail. Uh, uh, tell me, Barry. Uh-huh? You looking forward to fishing tomorrow? Oh, I'd rather stay here and play with the pigs and chickens. <laughs> sure you would. <laughs> I'd eat rocks. <laughs> you want one, mister? No, thanks. Now, come, Leachin. You must wash off all the sticky. Uh -huh. uh, so much happier the boy is with the pigs and chickens. But he's bound. He teach him how to fish. And so he will. Will he? Huh? I wonder. It was only too obvious how Aspenwald planned to get rid of Barry. And I made up my mind to be among those present whenever he headed for the river with the youngster in tow. But you know something? That turned out to be a nearly fatal mistake for two people. Pardon me, mister. She said... Do you have a match? The old gag... Sure, I said. Do you have a cigarette? She had one. Newport. Newport filters cigarettes. We lit up. Some smoke. Finest, rich tobacco flavor I'd ever tasted. Real tobacco. The way I like them. The right touch of menthol and just a hint of mint. A great combination. She suggested. Makes Newport... More refreshing to begin with. More refreshing all the way. She wasn't kidding. Been smoking them ever since. Newports. Newport filters cigarettes. from Kingston, decked out in a new fishing jacket. And judging by the way one of his pockets bulged, he'd added to his collection of flies and lures. During the meal, his annoyance a couple of hours earlier seemed to have disappeared. You must really like the new coat, Mr. Ashmanwald, wearing it to the table, huh? <laughs> Would you like some more pig's knuckles? Oh, no, thanks. No, I, I just want to make sure it's broken in, Mrs. Hornbach, before Johnny and I hit the river in the morning. Oh. That's a good-looking jacket, Tom. I like those bellows pockets. Yeah, they're nice and roomy. Mm-hmm. Looks like you bought a pocket full of new lures, too. 
Oh, nothing of any consequence. Uh, Mama, please, uh, some more sour cream. Yeah, here you are, Papa. Uh, and did you buy me some more rock? <laughs> now, Barry, don't you think these folks gave you enough of that hard candy? Oh, no. Well, it seems to me that everywhere I turn, there's some of it lying around waiting for you to find it. I know, and I look for it. And every time I get a stomach ache, too. <laughs> you sure do. Well, I don't care. No, of course you don't. <laughs> and he always gets always. <laughs> uh, you're still set for the crack of dawn, aren't you, Johnny? I sure am. Uh, but just the two of you. Why, sure, Fritz. Just the two. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Barry, while we're gone, you can uh, fool around the barnyard. Go on. Can I dessert now? Yeah, yeah, in a minute. Uh, Papa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you go to the village in the morning, you'll buy my, my little boy some more blue candy. Oh, blue candy. Yeah. Sure. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, there isn't enough of it around here. Oh, oh, and I must take some butter over to Mrs. Hilga after breakfast. And, and I'll stay here and watch your chickens. That's right. Are you leave him alone? Oh, just for a little while. He will be all right. Sure. If you say so. Oh, by the way, Tom, I'm guaranteeing that we'll bring in the limit tomorrow. Uh, you mean if we're lucky? Oh, luck won't even enter into it. Oh, no? No. Papa Hornblocks promised me a secret weapon. <laughs> Haven't you, Papa? Yeah, yeah, that's it. A secret weapon. Uh, like what? You just wait. I'll show you tomorrow morning after you're through beating the river to a froth with no results. <laughs> The temperature was in the mid-twenties. But, after fortifying ourselves with uh, pork chops, hotcakes and bacon, three fried eggs apiece, and plenty of steaming hot coffee, Tom and I set out for the river, leaving the horn blocks to their errands, and little Barry to play around the farmyard. We crossed the bridge, then worked our way down to the Blue Rock Pool. Fritz had been right. There was a slick coating of ice on all the rocks and ledges. And, uh, incidentally, I noticed the pocket of Tom's jacket wasn't bulging the way it had the night before. And I meant to ask him about it. I wish I had. But having given up on lures, I'd resorted to Papa Hornblock's secret weapon. A can of fat, sassy earthworms. Then precariously perched on a slippery rock, I tied into the first trout of the season. Yo-ho! Hey, good boy, Johnny. Looks like you've got one. Oh, I sure have. This one's a dilly. Well, and here I come for some of that secret weapon. Just watch your footing, Tom. Oh, don't worry. My hand's free. I can hang on to bushes along the side. There he goes again. Oh, he's a good one. Yeah. Johnny Dollar, huh? What? You think I didn't know why you came up here? Man, wait a minute. Oh, look at him go. Yeah. Yeah, well, look at you. Go! Hey! Things happened fast. As Tom, holding onto a bush, gave me the shoulder... My feet went out from under me on the icy rock, and I fell sideways into that treacherous, frigid pool. But in twisting around, I grabbed at one of his legs and managed to hang on, and then the two of us went in. From then on, all I can see is that it's a miracle we ever got out of that freezing, rushing torrent alive. But somehow we did. Then up on the bank, the water on our clothing freezing into ice. All right. All right, Dollar. So you think you've won, huh? Just because you got me. And you did bring that youngster up here to kill him. You bet I did. All right. Come on now. Back to the house before we freeze to death. And we'll make sure that Barry's still okay. Johnny, Dollar, it's no use. Because you gave yourself away. Why? You knew that he was only five. You said so before you even saw him. So I knew you were on something when you came here. All right, so I goofed. Now, come on. Uh, I remembered who you are, and I knew you wouldn't let me get him down to the river alone. So that's why I made other plans. You what? Yeah. Wait a minute. That pocket on your jacket. Yeah, that's right, Dolly. 
from the wetting. There's a blue-green stain all over uh, Huh? Blue vitriol, <laughs> copper sulfate that you bought in Kingston. Oh, so you're smart now, huh? And the little chunks of blue vitriol <laughs> look just like the chunks of the hard candy that that kid likes. Yeah, and they both have a kind of sour taste. <laughs> you see? Yes, I see. <laughs> Come on. Ah, no, it's too late, Dollar. <laughs> because I left enough of that stuff around for him to find and kill him ten times over. Said, Come on. <laughs> When he sees it, he'll think the horn box left it for him. And even if they're there, you think they'll worry over his stomach ache before it kills him? Barry! Barry! Ah, you're too late, Dolly! You're too late! Barry! So, maybe you caught me, but at least that lousy kid will never get the money! Barry! Barry! big dramatic ending. Oh, I'm sorry. Not this time. Thanks to the fact that Mrs. Hornblock had changed her mind and had taken Barry along on her morning errand. By the time they got back, I'd cleaned up every chunk of the blue vitriol that Aspenwalt had planted. Mostly around the chicken coop. So the only casualty? Aspenwalt who nearly frozen to death in his wet clothes on the frozen ground where I'd knocked him out. And he was a very docile prisoner when I handed him in at the Kingston Hooskow. Expense account total, including a bit extra for the horn blocks. Oh, call it 200 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a lesson in how to crack a safe. And I'm perfectly serious about that. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were William Mason as Tom Aspenwald, Carl Weber as Phil Taylor, Louis Van Ruten as Fritz Hornblock, Rainer Rayburn as Mrs. Hornblock, and Sarah Fussell as Barry. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speak. This is the CBS. Johnny Dollar. I don't think you're going to like this, Johnny. No? No, sir. Oh, it can't be that bad. Can't, huh? What you don't know won't hurt you, they always say. Oh, they do. And since I don't know what you're talking about or even who you are... Huh? Oh, sorry. I kind of got ahead of myself. A little ahead of me, too. This is Tim Harrington, Johnny. Down in Knoxville, Tennessee? Yes, sir. Eternity Mutual Insurance Company. Well, how are you, Tim? What's this I'm supposed to start losing sleep over? Alpheus Brannigan. Brannigan? Now, don't tell me you've forgotten him. Wait a minute. At least I hope you haven't. That hot-headed young kid who got five to seven for embezzlement a while back. That's right. About three years ago. You yourself ran him down for us. Sure, I remember now. On a tip you got from that pretty young wife of his. Yes, Mary, uh, Marilyn was her name. Nice girl and pretty, too. And do you remember what Alpha had to say when the judge tossed that sentence at him? Oh, the usual yak about getting even, wasn't it? That sort of thing? Getting even not only with you, Johnny, but with her. And that poor kid has been worried about the day he'd get out ever since the day he went in. Well, he still has a couple of years to go, hasn't he? So what's the big rush? He has not. What? Alfred Brannigan got out of the pen a couple weeks ago. No kidding. Made a break? 
A smart kid like that? No, sir. He just made like an angel for a while, and they gave him all that time off for so-called good behavior. You ask me, Johnny, they were suckers. Because if you really remember that boy... Yeah, I, um, I see what you mean. And his wife is a client of ours. You mean he's already got to her? I don't know. Well, somebody better contact her and find out. That's why I'm calling you, Johnny. What do you mean? Haven't you been in touch with her? No, we can't find her. But if he does get to her before you do, I... Say no more, Timmy. I'm on my way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Knoxville, Tennessee office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wrong idea matter. Expense account item one. Six dollars for a cab to the airport and fifty-eight thirty-six for a plane ticket. Four and a half hours later, we sat down at McGee Tyson Airport some 12 miles southeast of Knoxville. So, item two is $1.35 for limousine service that dropped me off at Tim Harrington's front door. Hi, Johnny. Glad you could make it. Hi, Tim. Sit down. Sit down. I'll get right to this. All right. Now, Tim, let's get one thing straight. I know. I know, Johnny. Marilyn Brannigan's policy has a face value of only $7,500. And on account of what happened with her husband, she's named her brother Charlie over in Memphis beneficiary. Well, that isn't what I was about. But a client's a client, and we got to protect her if we aren't too late. Too late for what? For what? Johnny. Now, listen, Tim. When you've heard as many of those wild courtroom threats as I have, well, after a while, you just don't pay too much attention to them anymore. Well, I do. I was right there in that courtroom. So was I. I not only heard what Alfred Brannigan said, but I saw the way that he said it. He was just a hot-headed kid. You know that, Tim. I can see it in my mind's eye right now. After the judge hit him with that sentence, he turned around real slow. And with a look on his face like I've never seen before. It was cold as ice, Johnny. Like, like a snake. Not a body in the courtroom made a sound. Tim. He looked across at that brand new little wife of his, Marilyn. She was sitting there in the front row with her head down. He just stared at her until she looked up at him. I know, Tim. And then without moving a muscle except in his mouth, he said... Now look, Tim. He said, just remember one thing, Marilyn. One of these days I'm going to get out again. And when I do, he said, you'll see. Well, okay, but... Then he turned over to where you sat. And that goes for you too, Dollar. For you too, he said. Just a red-headed, hot-headed, excitable kid. Not when he said that, he wasn't. He was cold as ice, Johnny. He wasn't kidding. All right, Tim, so what? The first time she paid him a visit there at the pen, he told her he was sorry. No, sir. He tried to be a good boy. He said somehow make up for what he'd done. No, sir. It always happened. No, sir, you're wrong, Johnny. 100% wrong. Am I? Because in all that time up there, she never saw him once. Not once? Not once. And you know why? Why? Because he wouldn't let her. Because he wouldn't see her. Wouldn't have anything to do with her. No letters, no nothing. And that's why in all these last couple of years, when I've talked to her, she's been just plain worried sick. And a couple of weeks ago when he got out, well, that's when she called me up and asked me what she ought to do. You mean that she still hadn't heard anything from him? Even when he got out? Not a word. Well, what'd you tell her, Tim? To notify the police. Mm -hmm. And I notified him, too. And then late yesterday, I got this call from Sergeant Piper. Yeah. And he tells me that she's suddenly gone, disappeared, to parts unknown. Has there been any sign of him around? No, sir. And don't you worry. If he had been around, Sergeant Piper and his boys would have known it. Are you sure of that? Well, they were gunning for Alpha Brannigan like nobody they ever gunned for before. But she got away without their knowing how or where. Well, yes, but, Johnny, you got to find that girl and keep her alive. Well, look, Tim. Yes? Yes, Johnny? Well, I'll do the best I can. Good. And, uh, Johnny. Yeah? Now, just you remember one thing. What's that? You better look out for yourself, too. Oh, sure. Well, 
Winston Burdett in Rome, Arthur Godfrey in New York, Miami, Las Vegas, or who knows where next. Alexander Kendrick in London, Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney in Hollywood, the Philharmonic in New York. These are some of the exclusive sounds of CBS Radio. From all over the country, all over the world, news, music, and entertainment is brought to your homes by experts to create the most unique, interesting, and exciting sound in radio today, the sound of CBS Radio. Heard only at this spot on your radio dial. I walked over to the precinct headquarters where Tim said I could find Sergeant Seymour Jefferson Piper. Unlike any police officer I dealt with in the past there in Knoxville, Piper was a big, lazy, florid man of about... 50 and 220 pounds who sat with his feet on the desk chewing a stale, unlighted cigar. Uh, sure, Miss Dollar. I'm completely in charge of that Brannigan thing. And um, you have found no trace at all of the girl? Now, I know, Miss Dollar. I know exactly what you're thinking. But just because she got out of town without our knowing it don't mean that he could have gotten himself in without our knowing it. And I wondered... Well, I don't. I don't wonder at all. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Not a single lead on her, hmm? Well, you see, she had her own car. She was a kind of accountant, you know, for one of the big markets. And doing pretty good for herself. Had her own car. You know the license number of that car? Well, sure. It's U double L one six six. Did you put out an APB right away all over the set? Well, no, sir. Why not? Well, she ain't guilty of any crime, Miss Dollar. I mean, like he was once. What's the matter with you, Sergeant? Isn't it just as important to find her and protect her as it is to run her down if she's done something wrong? Well, yes, sir. Well, of course it is. And we did try to protect her as long as she was around here. Well, Sergeant... But when, uh, when he didn't even show up, and after all that time, two whole weeks, Miss Dollar... Well, don't you, you know why? Because he was probably smart enough to realize that she'd have some kind of protection for a while. He may not be any mental giant, but he isn't any dumbbell either. Well, I know. To have a clear field, he'd wait until people stopped worrying about him. Until they get tired of waiting for him and ease up. And that's exactly what you did, Sergeant. Ease up. Get lackadaisical. I'll just hold on there a minute. Well, isn't we'll... that why she was able to leave him right under your nose? Well, and you know what else I think? Now, you look here. One of you two were... things. Either she realized you're watching over her was getting more casual, more slipshod, and she'd have to look out for herself. Oh, now, miss. Or else, you... Sergeant, and I'm afraid it's a lot more probable, Alfie Brannigan did get through to her and haul her away. But if he's got to her, sir, well, don't you remember what he said there in court? Did you forget it? Up till just now? Well, of course not. Well, why haven't you done something about her disappearance? Well, I told you, sir. You haven't told, told me anything that makes any sense. Let me have the telephone. Now, just a minute. What are you fixing to do? Well, first I'm going to call the state police. And if they can't find her somewhere in the state, I'll call in the FBI. Did you, you don't think much of this department, do you? Well, I have to answer that. Let me have the phone. You sure don't know how to ask for cooperation, do you? Listen, Sergeant. Over the years, I've had cooperation from the Maxwell Police Department second to none. By acting up this way? By dealing with members of the force who have a little sense of responsibility beyond that involved in chasing crooks. Now, just... By men who can think beyond what's right under their noses. Uh... By men who... Uh, I'm just wasting my time here. What's the name of your lieutenant? Now, now just, just a minute, sir. Yes, what for? I guess, uh, I guess maybe you're right, sir. I, I mean about an APB. It isn't too late. So I'll, uh, well, believe me, Miss Dollar, I'll get one out right away. And I'll include in the state police, like you say, as well as all the other big cities in the state. You will? Hmm? Yes, sir. And I, uh... I apologize, Miss Dollar, for... Well, I was wrong, and I'm admitting it, so just give me a chance, uh, if you please. Sergeant? And where do I get in touch with you when I get some word? If you do. Yes, sir. Mr. Dollar? No, I... I'll be staying at the Andrew Johnson. Thank you, sir. And I'll call you, sir. You better. I don't know whether to kick myself for letting him go ahead again or for having nearly lost my own temper over his obvious bumbling. Instead, I spent item three, 580, smoothing my ruffled feathers with a dinner at the Rapscaller. 
Then I signed into the Andrew Johnson. But before I could unpack my bags... Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Sergeant Piper, sir. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Uh, you were sure right, sir. Miss Brannigan's uh, license number did it. You know where she is? 21270 South Peachtree Street. And where's that? Over to Jefferson City. You've told the police over there to keep an eye on her, Sergeant? Well, no, I guess it didn't. Oh, brother. What, sir? Item four is $50 deposit on a drive-your-own car. In almost less time than it takes to tell about it, I covered it 29 miles to Jefferson City and, after inquiries at the gas station, went immediately to the address on South Peachtree. In front of the nondescript little rental cottage was her car. And inside, once I'd got inside, was a very young, very pretty, but badly frightened young woman, Marilyn Brannigan. I, uh, I hope you'll forgive me not letting you in right away, Mr. Dollar. But it's so dark and black outside, and I... I'm so... Oh, I don't know what to do. Uh, how did you find me? Well, the point is that if I could find you, uh, so could your husband. I know. I know. And you haven't heard anything from him or of him since he got out of the pen? Don't you see? That's just it. I haven't heard from him since he went into that terrible place. Three years, Mr. Dollar. Three years I've been... Sitting alone at night, wondering and wondering what he meant by what he said in that courtroom before they took him away. Well, um, isn't it pretty obvious what he meant? If only I knew. If only I really knew. He never says anything without really meaning it, Mr. Dollar. And he never changes his mind once he's made it up. Mm. You know what I mean? Once he says he'll do something, he never changes from it. And if he did mean to threaten me... Well, what else could he have meant? But it wasn't like him. I loved him, and he loved me, Mr. Dollar. I'm sure of it. Even though it was your information that helped me find him and turn him in? I had to do what was right. Even he wouldn't have had it any other way. Well, I wouldn't be too sure of that. And that money he took, that wasn't like him either. But he didn't... He didn't realize what he was doing. He only meant to borrow it for a Christmas present for me, and... All of us young folks act so foolish, Mr. Dollar. Marilyn. Yes? In spite of what you've just said, you're still afraid of him, aren't you? I don't know. I don't know. We we knew so little about each other. Well, you married him. We'd only been married a couple of weeks. And we'd only known each other a couple of months before that. Oh, boy. But I had so much confidence in him. I was so sure that if he faced up to this wrong thing he did, we could make a new start together. Mm-hmm. But when he wouldn't see me or answer my letters, and after what he said in that court, oh, if I only knew, Mr. Dollar, if I only really knew, and if he does come here and find me and... Now, listen, Marilyn. Are you staying here in Jefferson City, Mr. Dollar? No, I'm at the Andrew Johnson over in Knoxville. Why? Because if he does come and I'm here alone... Now, you just listen. Yes. Until we find him, until we know what his intentions are, you have got to have some protection... Now, if things had been handled properly, one of the local police would be here right now. But since he isn't, uh, where's your phone? Oh, I haven't any here. The nearest one is at the filling station two blocks down. Oh. All right. I'm going over there and call the police. And meantime, if I were you, I would keep this door closed and locked. Yes, I will. And, Mr. Dollar? Yeah? When you do find him, at least find out before you do anything to him or hurt him. Oh, sure. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now, that's the first kiss I've had since, uh... I'm sorry. I guess I shouldn't have. But you're the first one that... Sure, uh... sure. That's okay. I'll, uh, I'll get everything set up and see you later. Thank you. Oh, boy, it is dark out here. Use a street lamp or two. And... Just a minute, Mr. Flynn. Alfie. Who are you? Alfie Brannigan. Yeah. That's right. Ah, it's me. Um. <laughs> I like 
that idea. Newport filter cigarettes. Newport menthol cigarettes. I like that idea. Good, rich tobacco flavor. The right amount of menthol and just a hint of cool, refreshing mint. That's the thing about Newport. That's the combination that makes Newport more refreshing to begin with. More refreshing all the way. Just enough menthol to make Newport so refreshing while you're smoking. Without hiding the rich taste of great tobaccos. George. George. Can I have a Newport, too? seat of my rental car. The young policeman was gently slapping me with one hand, with the other shoving a bottle of smelling salts, I guess, under my nose. <laughs> That's it, Mr. Dom. You have another sniff of this and you'll be just oh, no. fine. Oh, no, thanks. That's, <coughs> That's fine. Whatever you say. Y'all oh. okay now? Oh, wow. Well, I don't know. I, uh... Yes, sir. Somebody yeah. must have hit you pretty hard. You just take it easy for a little bit. No, no. Uh, listen, officer. Yes, sir? Uh, inside there, in that house. Sergeant must have been wrong. Nobody in that house, Mr. Dollar. What? Well, you see, Sergeant Piper over to Knoxville, he called me. Yeah? He said that Miss Marilyn Brannigan... And that he got her. He got to her. You mean Alfie, her husband? That's right. He's been here? Yes. Well, then I'll shoot myself because a car pulled away when I come down the street. Must have been him. And he must have had her in it. All right, now look. Yes, sir? You have a radio in your car? Uh, doggone transmitter blew out when I tried to call in about finding you here all beat up. All right, listen. Oh, here. What? Your wallet with your credentials. It was a lie in there beside you. Oh. Alfie must have taken it out of my pocket when he found out who I was. Oh, thanks, anyway. All right, look, get on back to headquarters, will you? And get on the horn and... Oh, uh, do you have a license number and description of that car? Oh, yes, sir. Good. And go to it and get the word out. I'll either be with Sergeant Piper at his precinct or at the Andrew Johnson Hotel over in Knoxville. Yes, sir. <laughs> was torture. By the time I got back to Knoxville, I was feeling pretty shaky. I dropped in on Sergeant Piper, thanked him for having finally alerted the Jefferson City Police, told him to get on the ball again, and then, just barely able to navigate, got up to my room at the Andrew Johnson. Oh, I guess I left the lights on. Yes, sir, you did. What? And you left the door wide open, too. Alfie. And me, Mr. Dollar. What? All right now, Brannigan. No, no, please, please, sir. I'll let me explain about why we came here. He came back to me, Mr. Dollar, to the cottage. Oh, you're telling me. Well, I didn't know. I, I didn't know who you were when you when you came out of the cottage. I'm, and I'm sorry. You didn't know him. No, I Mr. Know. Dollar. But I, I saw you there in the doorway, and, and well, I, I saw her kiss you, and, and, and I heard you say you'd get everything all set and be back, and... Well, after all I'd done for her and thinking maybe she'd taken up with somebody else while I was gone... But I'd explain to him now. After all you've done for her, Alfie? Oh, he's wonderful, Mr. Dollar. He's so wonderful. I knew he was. I knew it all the time. It just had to be that way. Uh, don't, don't you see, sir, it was the least I could do after the way I'd let her down by taking that money three years ago. Look, uh, what do you say we try and make a little sense around oh, here? Maybe I was wrong not seeing her and not answering her letters, but I had to do it alone. I had to work it out for myself. I had to prove I could be worthy of her all by myself. And he has, Mr. Dollar. Mm -hmm. Alfie. You see, I meant it, sir, uh, what I said back there in court. Uh, that I'd show her and I'd show you, too. That I could make up for that crazy embezzling? Don't you understand? That's what he meant. And I did it, sir. I, I worked. I studied there in prison every day. I worked to improve myself. And when I got out, so I, I could prove to her I'd done right by her, I went to her brother over in Memphis. My brother Charlie. Mm -hmm. Because he'd always liked me, and I knew he'd help me, and, and without letting on to her until I was ready. <laughs> you see, I knew he'd understand, and he did. And you know what Alfie's done in just these last two weeks? A steady job over there. A decent place for us to live, the way we ought to. And away from all, all these memories. Now we can start out married all over again, the, the right way. Like I should have made it for us before. 
It's a whole new start, Mr. Dollar. And a clean start. And it's still only half of what a girl like Marilyn deserves. Isn't it wonderful, Mr. Dollar? <clears throat> well, yes, Alfie, sir. Sir, you um, you want to be sure of uh, keeping it that way? Um, oh, believe me, sir, I-, I will keep it that way. All right. Then um, one thing: remember to keep that temper of yours in check, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Even when you see your wife kissing another man. I will, sir. I promise. I hope so. And I'm I'm sorry. I'm really terribly sorry for what I did. Well, that's all right. To have a case end like this for a change, maybe it was worth it. Thank you, sir. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Now, um, how would you two like to help me over onto that bed? <laughs> younger than they realize, but I think maybe those kids will do all right. I hope so. Anyway, expense account total, including a doctor who came in to make sure that I was all in one piece. Hotel, mileage on the car, and uh, the trip back to Hartford. $229.57. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the most clever device for covering up a murder I have ever seen. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Serrato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Jim Z. Summers as Marilyn, Lawson Zerby as Sergeant Piper, Richard Holland as Alfie Brannigan, Herb Duncan as Tim Harrington, and Bill Lipton as the policeman. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. The Peace Corps needs farm skills. Volunteer today. This is the CBS Radio. Johnny Dollar. Jack Price. Well, how come, Jackson? Uh, What do you mean? Things getting slow down there in Corpus Christi? I haven't heard from you in nearly a month. Well, that makes you mad? Sure it does, because you're one of the few insurance agents in this country who's sucker enough to pile a nice extra fee on top of my expense account whenever I handle a case for you. Oh, I am, huh? Sure, and I love you dearly for it. Not this time, Johnny. Oh? <laughs> Why not? Well, brother, you don't need any extra fees. And uh, speaking oh, of... Oh, now, Jackson, you touched me to the quick. Speaking of brother, Johnny... Yes? Doug Johnstone. Doug Johnstone. Kid brother, the man who writes up those cases you handle for CBS Radio. Oh, sure. What about him? Well, it seems he has a little problem. Of course, if you won't come down here unless you can pick up some ridiculous extra fee, uh, even though Doug has suffered considerable loss already. Jackson, what's it all about? Just don't worry about it, Johnny. We'll somehow... Jackson! Somehow... I'll get hold of somebody who really cares about the misfortunes of his old friend. <laughs> I'll find somebody. You do, and I'll break your neck. And my faith in human nature is restored. What's the problem? I'll be waiting for you at the airport. Jackson! Uh, now, according to this uh, timetable on my desk, you can pull in here about noon. Hey, I asked a question. See you later, Johnny. Look, I said what? Hello. Hello. Oh, okay, Stinky, I'll be there. <laughs> Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Western Life Insurance Company Corpus Christi office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Skidmore matter. Expense count item one, ten dollars and twelve cents, plane fare to New York. Item two, one hundred and fourteen oh two for the rest of the trip. As promised, Jack Price was waiting at the Corpus Christi Municipal Airport. He picked up my luggage, led the way out to a car at the curb, threw the stuff into the back, and... That's one of those rental jobs, Johnny. No? How come? Because you're going over to the little town of Skidmore. Uh, hop in. That's where uh, Doug Johnstone is? What's happened to him? To Doug? Nothing. Well, you told me over the phone... Well, he's that... happily running that home for old folks, the heart, doing a bang-up job of it. He said to give you his regards. He'll see you later. But uh, as long as this problem's really ours, uh, the insurance company. Now, 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 wait one minute. You said over the phone. I said as little as possible uh, to be sure you'd hike on down here. Jackson, you're a dog. Sure I am. But anyhow, here's what goes. Yeah. A dog has been pretty well in the stock market since he came here to Corpus and uh, some other investments. Didn't he go for some oil properties, too, somewhere in these parts? Yeah, and a lot of other things, uh, including a smart buy of heavy machinery and parts for it. Mostly tractors, bulldozers, graders, that kind of equipment. Mm -hmm. you know, stuff that's used around the oil fields uh, and for road building. Oh, good for him. It was. What? Until he began losing some of it. Losing it? Well, that is... I heard of a man losing a bass drum once, but isn't losing a bulldozer a little ridiculous? Oh, you know what I mean. Somebody's been stealing a lot of those big parts from out of the big, uh, well, warehouse, I guess you'd call it, that he rents over by the little town of Skidmore. And because of the insurance, every piece of equipment gets taken, we have to pay for it. Hmm. Uh, where is Skidmore? North and west of here, about 60 miles. Uh, there's a map with the route marked out for you there on the seat. So if you want to hire yourself over to Skidmore... Jackson? Yeah? Well, tell me, hasn't Doug some kind of a guard or a watchman, uh, you know, looking over the stuff? He has now. What about the police? Have you any idea how big a place Skidmore is? Or I should say, isn't? No. Just follow the route on this map, and you can't miss it. Okay. And the old watchman will be glad to help, I'm sure. What's his name, by the way? Uh, Joe Hernandez. All right, Jackson. I'll be in touch. I drove the freeway to Gregory, then west on 181. Jack was right. The actual town of Skidmore wasn't much more than a crossroads. South of it, on the road to Tynan, I found the sprawling warehouse that he mentioned. As I pulled up in front of it, the door of a nearby tool shed opened quickly, and out came a man about... Oh, maybe four feet ten, I'd say, and perhaps a hundred pounds, ringing wet. His deeply wrinkled face as brown as a proverbial berry. Atop it was an oversized, beat-up old sombrero. Then as I shouted toward him, from somewhere under his ragged shirt, he pulled out the biggest old-fashioned six-gun that I had seen in years. You do not come any closer, senor. Uh, I guess not, if, uh, if you're going to wave uh, that thing in my face. Who are you? What do you want? I'm looking for a man by the name of Joe Hernandez. Huh? My name is Dollar. Juanito Dollar? The famous what you call the investigate? You are Senor Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. Now, uh, would you mind putting down that... Ah, uh... Juanito, Juanito. Senor Price from the insurance, he say he would come. Permit me to introduce myself. I am a Jose Elguerra de Santiago, my first and Julio Hernandez. How do you Senor? Uh, would, uh... <laughs> Would you like to start that over again? Jose Elguerra de Santiago McPherson, Julio Hernandez. Oh, uh, did I hear a, uh, a McPherson thrown in there somewhere along the line? See? He's the most very honorable name of my most very honorable, what you call, ancestor. Oh, I'm sure he was. Oh, see, but there was no need for you to come here, senor. No? With me, Jose Elguerra de Santiago McPherson, Julio Hernandez on the job. <laughs> the senor Johnson will lose no more of his fine equipment. This I personally, I guarantee. Oh, you do? 24 hours a day. I'm here now, and with this, my 45 pistola, 
Nobody would dare to challenge me, not me, Jose El Guerrero. Yes, 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 Julio Julio Hernandez, Hernandez. yes, well, um... So you may leave now, senor, with the most very peace of mind. I bid you adios. Now, uh, just wait a minute, uh, Jose. Si? Uh, Do you mean to say that since you've come on the job, there has been no more stuff taken out of this place? Only the one, what you call, skip loaded. The skip loader? That is all. Well, that's all. Maybe ten or fifteen thousand dollars worth. Huh? I wonder Jack Price seems to think you need some help. Well, senor, I have it now. What kind of help? Oh, you see? The pistol. Look. Holy... What's the matter with you? Did you see what you've done with that cannon? You knocked the side window out of my car. I am sorry, senor. But you see what I mean. Now I have this. Look, just, uh, tuck that back into your shirt, huh? I see, of course. But everything is safe now. You may go now, there is nothing to worry about. Nothing. You know something, Jose? I think that's a matter of opinion. Can you provide skilled assistance on a farm cooperative? Teach reading and writing to people who want to learn? assist in industry management, or nurse the sick. These are a few of the many jobs open to members of the Peace Corps. Dozens more countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America are asking for help from the Peace Corps. To find out if you can qualify for this exciting work, write to Peace Corps, Washington 25, D.C. Before showing me through the huge, windowless warehouse, Jose introduced me to his wife, Carmela, who was living there with him in this kind of tool shed. It was she who'd insisted that he buy the gun after the last robbery. Then he took me in for a look at the heavy equipment parts Doug Johnstone was storing there until it could be sold. Can't you wait, senor? When I turn on my life. Buena. You see? Wow. I don't blame Doug for wanting this stuff protected. See? And that is why you select me, Jose Alguero de Santiago. Yeah, yeah, for... I'm, I'm sure. Sure. <clears throat> Not only tractors, graders, bulldozers, power shovels, skip loaders. Enough spare parts here to sink a ship. See? And I, Jose Alguero de Santiago. A couple of hundred thousand dollars worth. And like I say, that is the reason Senor Johnson has selected me, Jose Alguero de Santiago. Yes, yeah, okay. Part. All right, Jose. Now, uh, tell me, uh, when did you say the last robbery was? The night before last. Right after the day of the wedding, Senor. What wedding? Fernando Ignacio Poverio Ortiz. My, uh, my 32nd, what do you call it, cousin. Cousin? And the party I make here in Divina. Oh, <laughs> The winner, ah, you should have been here. Ah, so that's it. Huh? By the time you and your wife got to bed that night, Jose, you were boiled to the ears. Senor? How else could you have slept through somebody moving this kind of stuff out here? Look, Jose, um, I don't know who picked you for this job or why. This cousin I tell you about, Fernando Ortiz. He, he, he gave me what you call the recommend to the Senor Johnson. No, he didn't. Because he knows all about these things, his equipment. This uh, 32nd cousin of yours? See? What's he do for a living? He's operating this uh, kind of machine. What? And he sometimes he uh, fix it up in his shop in the town of Tres Rios. What you call uh, Tres Rivas. You mean that he operates and repairs this kind of stuff? In his own shop? She is a very smart hombre. My 32nd cousin. I'll oh, bet he is. No wonder he recommended you for the job. Senor? So why Doug Johnstone would fall for anything so obvious. Okay, Jose. See? Si? I'm going back to Corpus Christi to see Mr. Johnstone at the hearth. When? And you said to him that I, Jose, Jose Huh? You and your wife had better pack up to leave. To leave? Senor? Because after I talk with him, I suspect there'll be some changes made around here. Juanito, you mean... I'm sorry, Jose. I'll see you later. Sorry that I couldn't meet you.
meet you at the airport, Johnny, but this really has me tied down here. I know, Doug. It's perfectly all right. What isn't all right, though, is the guard you have at that building over at Skidmore. I know. Tell me, didn't you smell a rat when this 32nd cousin recommended him, if there is such a thing? Cousin? Yes, this Ortiz. Well, I didn't know they were related, even that distantly. Point is, Johnny, that I just found out that Ortiz owns a piece of a repair business for road building machines and the like. Well, sure he does. All I'd known about him before was, well, he did some odd jobs around here, mostly earth moving. Now, of course. Well, of course. All he has to do is get old Jose and his wife drunk, then help himself to your warehouse full of parts. It certainly looks that way. And this Ortiz is a sort of sharp sort of character. Have you called in the police? No, because meantime, Jack Price promised to get you down here, and, well, I figured you'd handle it. Yeah, well, I'll try. Uh, the first thing, of course, will be to replace old Jose. Do you think he's wise to this caper? No. He's such a sweet old man. No, I don't think he's wise, but that's beside the point. Yeah, I know. The main thing now is to get somebody smart out there before this Ortiz can hit you again. Well, I'm sure he won't tonight. Why? Because he's coming in here to see me. Oh, what about? I don't know. Probably looking for some more odd jobs. I told him I don't need him again, but he's coming anyway. Mm. Uh, do you mind if I'm among those present? Oh, it might be a good idea. You can look him over. He's due at 8.30. Good. I'll be here. Purely on a hunch, I drove on over to Skidmore again just to make sure that old Jose was on his toes and would stay that way. Have no fear, senor, as long as I, Jose, will get to Santiago McPherson. Then I drove on back to town, checked in at the Robert Driscoll, unpacked my bags, changed and ran up item three, 580, for one big delicious dinner. By then, it was time to meet Doug, and more important, Fernando Ortiz. Sharp character is right. In spite of his working clothes, and uh, regardless of how good a job he might have done for Doug and the rest home, I just didn't like him. No, I'm sorry, Ortiz. There just isn't a thing we need you for at the moment. But, Mr. Johnstone, not uh, a single thing. Now, if you don't mind, but if something does come up that I can do for you, will you call me? Sure, sure. As I told you nearly an hour ago when you first got here. But now my uh, my wife is waiting for Mr. Dollar and... Oh, oh of course. Uh, I am sorry to hold you up this way. Uh, but just one more thing. Ortiz. If uh, you decide to level off the recreation area... Some other time, Ortiz. Uh, very well, whatever you say. Uh, Mr. Dollar, it has been nice to meet you. Thank you. Good night. Uh, good night. Uh, good night. Well, Johnny, what do you think? I don't know, this this visit tonight. The way he kept thinking of just one more thing to discuss. Mm. Almost as though he was stalling. I got that feeling, too. Yeah, but why? In the first place, Doug, he didn't seem a bit surprised to see me here. I know. He arrived at 8.30 on the nose. It is now 9.02. What are you thinking of? His real reason for coming here, for the stalling around. Oh, uh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, yes, Jackson. Sure he is. Uh, for you. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny. Jack Price. Thank goodness I finally ran you down. Oh, yes, Jack. Uh, I'll meet you there right away. We're going over to Skidmore at the warehouse. Why? What's happened? That poor old man, Jose. Yes? Somebody just murdered him. Or it is. I'll be right over, Johnny. Bye. Wait a minute, Jackson. Yeah? Just murdered, did you say? When? What time? Well, according to his wife, it was 8.25, 8.30. That's too late. Well, what? That's when he was here with us. Well, Jose? No, Ortiz. Ortiz? Well, what do you mean? I mean that he couldn't have. Johnny. A dunk gun it, I think he did. Will you make some sense? Come on over, Jackson. We'll be waiting for you. It's like that with Newport Filter Cigarettes. That special combination of good, rich tobacco flavor, the right amount of menthol, and just a hint of mint makes a difference a man can notice because it freshens up his taste. 
No wonder Newport's more refreshing to begin with, more refreshing all the way. It's so refreshing while you're smoking Newport filter cigarettes. Newport filter cigarettes. Newport. Governor Skidmore was crawling with state police. Fortunately, Sergeant Billy Roscoe, an old friend of mine, was in charge. No. Now, Johnny, Mr. Johnstone, Mr. Price, see here? Mm-hmm. Whoever plugged him with that old gun of his got him real close up. Because if he used Jose's clothing to muffle the sound. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Sure. Tell me, uh, are there any prints on the gun? Mm, all wiped off. Mm. Jose's wife, Carmela. Did you see anybody around? Only oh, you. And then later some uh, cousin Fernando. Uh, Fernando... Ortiz. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was it. Where is she, Roscoe? Asleep. Asleep? Sure, she was in bad shape. The doc gave her a sedative. Oh. One of my boys who understands Mexican got the whole story from her. Oh? Yeah, this, uh, this Ortiz talked with the old man a while and tried to give him a couple of jugs of wine. But Jose wouldn't have it. Chase him away. What time was that? Do you know Mm, around five o'clock, she said, just before supper. Oh, no, but now about this or tea. Now, tell me just what happened, Russell. Well, when they had supper, then the old man said he was in the house. He was a watchman. Yes, I know. And after a while, she got a phone call from Ortiz. Now, what time was that? Exactly 8.25. You're sure of that time? Oh, only because he asked her the time. And that clock of hers in the shack is right. Mm. You happen to know what he said to her? He said to get Jose to the phone. She told him Jose was out around the warehouse, but she'd come out and get him. 8.25. Yeah, so she came on over here to the big sliding door, the one Mr. Price is looking at. Jose always came in by it. Yeah. And she started pushing it open. Bang, she heard the shot. Well, then, Johnny. Yes, Dad? It couldn't have been Ortiz. Well, why, Mr. Johnstone? Well, because he met us at my office in Corpus at exactly 8.30. He couldn't possibly have been over here only five minutes before. Yeah. Looks as though we were wrong about him. Well, right. you suspected Ortiz of this, Johnny? Or else he's a lot smarter than we think. Anyway, what happened then, Roscoe? Well, she came in and found the body and put in the call to us. No sign of anyone else in here? Hmm? Well, of course, a man could have hidden away in all this junk. Yeah. Listen, if he was heisting these machine parts, if he knew that Jose had been talking to me, that I might get on his trail... Oh, sure, he'd have reason to kill off Jose. Yeah, but he couldn't, Sergeant, because he was in Corpus at 8.30 with us. Now, where was he when Jose was killed? Well, like I said, on the telephone. He must have been in Corpus waiting for Jose to get on this end. Was he still on the phone when she got back to call you fellows? Well, no, I don't know. No, I'm betting he wasn't. If he talked to Jose after I was here, he knew I told Jose to keep an eye on this place tonight. To be here inside this warehouse. Okay. Then why did he make that call? Well, I'm sure that I don't know. So that she would come out here and find the body? At about the time he'd be walking into Doug's office? No, no, no. Wait, Johnny. You sound as though he's the only possible killer. I think he is. Suppose he'd killed him earlier. Oh, well, Carmella heard the shot. A great big bang as she touched the sliding door. Even so, I... Wait a minute. You can't lick it, John. Did you say a great big bang? Yeah, like it was just inside of the door. But look, his body's over here. And the way that gun was shoved into his clothing, it should have been a... Well, it should only have been kind of a, a muffled sort of a thug. Well, now, say, you're right. Hey, that shot must have been here at the door, Johnny. What's that, Jackson? Look, this funny mark on the door kind of burn. Yes. And the smell, you smell it? Like iodine. Yes. Yes, you're right. What the... What is it, Johnny? The answer, Doug. I'm sure of it. The answer to what? How Ortiz killed him. Sometime after I left, as soon as Jose came out here to this warehouse, Ortiz killed him and then went to keep the date with you, Doug. Yeah, with the shot at 8.30. Sounded like a shot. It would to an untrained ear... And she set it off when she pushed against this door about the same time that he walked into your office, Doug, for an alibi. I don't get it, Johnny. A crazy kid caper. High school chemistry class. What? Do you remember, Doug? Like, like, like making stink bombs? 
produced carbon disulfide, but this one was the best one of all. Wait, now. Nitrogen iodide. Remember, you made a kind of a soup, real carefully, out of iodine crystals and yeah, ammonium of something? of course I remember. Sure, then we'd, we'd filter it then, you know, and get, get, a, get a sort of a paste out of it and spread it around. Sure, sure, on the door hinges, on the, on the seat hinges, in the assembly hall, under a book on somebody's desk, and, and we'd let it dry. And when it was disturbed, even the least little bit, the stuff went off with a bang. <laughs> yeah, and the girls all squealed, and we boys had a ball. But in this case, Ortiz's alibi. If, that is. Uh, Roscoe, you want to scrape off some of that and have a lab man see if it's the residue of nitrogen iodine? Well, I sure do. That's really all there is to the case. It was nitrogen iodide, all right. And a rundown on Fernando Ortiz brought out the fact that he'd been quite a prankster in his high school days. But you know what gave me a big surprise? The way that he made a full confession after I told him exactly how he'd set up his alibi. Expense account total... 276.28. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the most beautiful spots on Earth that really shouldn't be the site for a murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zarato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Joseph Cabibbo. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Featured in our cast were Santos Ortega as Jose Hernandez, Maurice Tarplin as Jack Price, Richard Keith as Doug Johnstone, Ralph Camargo as Ortiz, and also heard were Bill Lipton and Sam Rapkin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Gaylord Avery. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. My golly, I knew it. What? Yes, sir, I knew darn well you'd still be here in Vegas. Pete. That's right, Pete Brenneman. And just how did you know I was still around and here at the Stardust? Simple process of elimination. When I called the airlines, they said you hadn't bought a ticket, Johnny. Their flights were all full up. Oh, yeah? That's right. Or did you just decide to stay over and partake of some of the joys of living that Las Vegas offers? No. The only reason I'm still here is that... Yeah, well, I started calling the big hotels, and sure enough, the Stardust said you're among those present. Having yourself a gay old time, Johnny? Oh. Losing your shirt at the gaming table? Pete, I told you, the only reason I'm still here Johnny, is that... Johnny, I hate to put a damper on your fun. Please. But I sure am glad you did stay over. Because little problems come up. Oh? Not another murder case, I hope. Oh, just little problem. Arson, embezzlement, burglary, what? Unless you don't care about a possible extra fee on this trip, why don't you come over here to the office and let me tell you all about it? Okay. Why not? The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Las Vegas office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the zip matter. In spite of what I had said to Pete Brenneman on the phone, I was glad to have the chance for another good look at this fabulous, exciting town in the middle of the Mojave Desert. There is something almost incredible about its wide-open gambling 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even the drug and candy stores groceries and gas stations are equipped with slot machines to quickly relieve you of any loose change that you might have. Parts of Fremont Street, 
the main drag, have one big casino after another where you can play at the roulette and crap tables, blackjack, bingo, chemin de fer, poker, baccarat, you name it. And where you can also bet on the nags at any horse track in the country. And every one of the big, fancy, glamorous hotels has its own private casino. And nightclubs where you can rub elbows with broken-down miners or famous Hollywood stars all gathered to watch the floor shows featuring the finest, best-paid entertainers in the country. I've seen men in rumpled denim shirts and faded blue jeans wager $100 bills on a single number at roulette, lose it, and walk away without a whimper. I've seen a sweet little gray-haired old lady, somebody's grandmother, win over 5,000 bucks of craps and give it all back via the slot machine route or on the flip of a card at the blackjack table. As for me, well, I've lost a little, won a little, and I'm thankful that gambling has never been a compulsion with me or given me the false hope that in the long run I could ever come out ahead. Naturally, I wondered if it had anything to do with this new case Pete Brenneman had for me. Expense account item one, a dollar even for a taxi from the Stardust to Pete's office. Here, Johnny. Here, take a look at this. Hmm. Willard Rayfield Swift. Yeah. Well, Pete, since when has your company been attaching the picture of a beneficiary to an insurance policy? Johnny, Western Maritime and Life will attach anything to a policy. Information on anything or anybody even remotely connected with the insured. Well, what about this, uh... Willard Rayfield Swift. Ever see him in the flesh? Not that I know of. Haven't you been doing any gambling over there at the Stardust? <laughs> oh, a little. Well, then you should have run into Swifty at one of the roulette wheels. Well, after all, Pete, I've only been in town a few hours. Long enough, Johnny. Long enough. That's his favorite place, and Swifty is a confirmed incurable gambler. At, uh, let's see, what's it say here? The ripe old age of 31? Yeah. Ever since his papa died about six years ago and left him a lot of dough. Hmm. Which, I suppose, didn't last very long. Oh, Papa was smart and provided that the money be dealt out to Swifty in small amounts. If you can call 300 a week, small amounts. I'd call it a real nice legacy. But he's carefully, steadily gambled away every cent of it. Yeah, and then so. You mean he's borrowed? That's exactly what I mean. And without the loaners knowing, the legacy to him is about to stop now. Ouch. Yep, even more to the point. These loaners don't know the true facts about this policy. What do you mean, Pete? This policy is Uncle Fred's. And old Frederick Payton died only day before yesterday, leaving no estate except this insurance, $120,000 worth. Hundred and twenty. Well, that should hold your boy Swifty for a while. Except for one thing. Yeah? It's to be divided up three ways. Here, look at these other beneficiaries. Uh-huh. <laughs> Doreen Janice Clayford. Wow. Pretty name, too. A niece. Is she really as good looking as this picture? Sure is. Where do you see her? My, my. All that beauty and all that money. Hmm. My tie straight, Pity. My hair look all right. You look gorgeous, Johnny, but you're too late. Doreen's married to a fellow with a feed store. Oh, you killed Joy. This other picture is another nephew, the other beneficiary. Kenneth Kermit. Uh huh. Ken's the oldest one of the three. Oh, born in 1922, it says here. That's it. Makes him about 40, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. He has a little, uh, I mean, a little cattle ranch up near Glendale. Mm -hmm. That's north of here. Does some well drilling and odd jobs in his spare time. Real hard worker. Nice guy. Well, now, what about him, Pete? All three are equal beneficiaries, Johnny. Oh? 40000 apiece, then? Mm-hmm. And that's just about what I understand Swift deals. But. Yes? If one of them dies before this money is paid out, the remaining two will split 50-50. 60000 It's a big difference. Sure is, especially if a guy needs dough. And, of course, if two of them were to go so that only one of them would be left to collect. And remember this, Johnny. Yeah. There never was any love lost between those two. I mean, between the nephews, Ken Kermer and Willard Swift. What about the girl? Oh, she's been pretty much a part problem. You know, married and all. Those boys have always been at each other's throats. Hated each other's guts. Would even go out of their way to make trouble. Especially Swifty. You think maybe one of them would go so far as to kill the other to grab a bigger share of the insurance? Ken Kerman? Go that far? No. But Swifty? Yeah, I think he would. And Johnny? Well? If you didn't see Swifty around the tables there at the Stardust, and you would have noticed him. No, I think I wouldn't. Well, Johnny, if you ask me, that means he's up to something. And you'd better get on this right away. Well, Pete? I think you're right. have to stay alert. 
Don't let drowsiness slow you down. Perk up. Perk up with no dose. The safe way to stay alert without harmful stimulants. Remember, when you're driving, working, studying, and monotony makes you feel drowsy. Perk up. Perk up with no dose. No dose. There's a second reason for not wasting any time, Johnny, one I just found out about. What's that, Pete? The fact that Shorty Callahan is breathing down Swifty's neck. Who's Callahan? The punk he owes the nearly 40000 to. And what's more, Swifty knows that if he doesn't pay off Callahan and Pronto, well, nobody can prove anything, at least nobody has yet. But it's been rumored around that people who try to welch on Callahan can end up very, very dead. Hmm, what nice people you know. I wish I didn't. Now, am I supposed to save Swifty from Callahan? Why bother? Just Ken Kermer from Swifty. Yeah. If one of Callahan's boys were to knock off Swifty, nobody would complain one bit. It'd be a case of good riddance. Where did you say that Ken Kermer lives? This side of Glendale, about 45 miles north of here. Mm -hmm. Then a Swifty isn't at his usual place at the Stardust if it turns out that he isn't even here in town. Right, Johnny. You and I would better hop into my car and... Oh, excuse me. Brenneman. Mr. Brenneman? Yeah. Mr. Brenneman, this is Doreen Clayford. Hey, Johnny, get close. Listen to this. I'm right in. Mr. Brenneman. Yeah, go on, Doreen. Well, I'm here at the house in North Vegas. Yeah. Well, out on the highway, well, only a couple of minutes ago... Yeah. Well, I, I met Swifty. Willard Swift? He was in a car he must have borrowed from someone. Uh-huh. Well, he was on his way up to Glendale to see Ken. You're sure about that? Yes, he told me so. And he'd been drinking. He was nasty. And he told me not to follow him, but I'm going to anyway. Now, now, wait, Doreen. No, no, I must, because... Well, don't you see? Don't you see what might happen up there? I certainly do. I mean, with Uncle Fred's insurance still to be paid and all that money he owes. Well, I told you about that. Yeah, I know. And the way Swifty feels about Ken. Well, you know yourself about how he hates him and because won't, Ken won't give him the money to pay off his debt. Yes, I know, I know. Swifty might do anything. In the mood he's in and all, the drinks he's had. Doreen... So if you want to be to get some help the police or something and, and drive up on there, will you, Mr. Brenneman? Yeah. Thank you. Now, don't, don't, don't you go, Doreen. You let me take care of... Hello? Hello? Oh, no. Johnny. Do you have a car handy, Pete? It's right out front. Let's go. With Pete at the wheel, we swung right at the end of Fremont Street then barreled down north on 91 toward the town of Glendale. In North Las Vegas, he stopped at a little house on one of the side streets, but only for a minute in the hope that Doreen was still there and had not gone on ahead. But apparently she had. So, out on the highway again, he really burned up the road, hoping a cop would spot us, would come along and give us a hand. But darn it, when you need him, they're never around. Well, I wouldn't say that, Pete. But look ahead. Yeah, I see. Looks like it's coming across the mountains from the east, too. If you know what these sudden easters can do in this country, Johnny... I'm afraid I do. Let's just hope we can get there ahead of it. Hang on. About 30 miles later, the storm came with a vengeance. Believe me, it really clobbered us, and we had to slow to almost a crawl, even with the headlights on. Here and there in low spots, rivers of mud roared across the road, and half a dozen times we passed cars with their engines drowned out. Or maybe the drivers were simply smarter than we were and decided to sit out the storm because visibility was almost nil. Now and then we had to make our way cautiously around sizable boulders that had rolled onto the road. Yeah, it's just just no use, Johnny. Doreen's gotten there, gotten there way ahead of us. And you think her life might be in danger, too, hmm? You Swifty as well as I do. Oh. Hey, slow down and take it easy or we'll end up in a ditch. You know, you know what I wish, Johnny? What? One of Callahan's boys had taken care of Swifty. Well, who knows? Maybe that's the real reason for his heading out of Vegas. I sure hope so. But if he has gone out to Ken's ranch... Now, wait. Here's a turnoff. Thank goodness this side road is paved. Pete? Yeah, Johnny? You seem pretty sure that Ken wouldn't try to get rid of one of the others. Sure, I'm sure. Absolutely. Why? Oh, I just... I'm just sort of thinking about the whole situation, all the possibilities. And uh, Doreen? Doreen? Mm. Oh, now, Johnny. How's her husband's feed business? You know something? 
That poor guy's had more bad luck since he took over that... No, 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 John, no. That. There's no reason in the world to suspect she might be up to... Up to what we suspect. They've been married long? Sure, a couple of years. What'd she do before then? Old dancer in one of the nightclubs. But now, listen, John. All right, all right. Looks uh, like the storm's letting up. Yeah, and there's Ken's ranch right ahead. There's two cars parked there. One right next to the porch is Doreen's. Well, she got here all right. I just hope she's still all right. Isn't that Doreen standing there in the doorway? Yeah, 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 she's okay. Thank goodness. I wonder. Look. Yeah, she's waving at us kind of frantically. Come on, Johnny. Hurry! Hurry, please! What is it, Dory? What's the matter? I only got here a minute ago, Mr. Brenneman. Yeah? Swifty's car was here, and this front door was wide open, and... Yeah, well? Oh, who's this man? He's Johnny Dollar, a special investigator. Oh, thank heaven. What's happened, Doreen? Well, I, I heard a voice, shouting like he was mad, from back in there where that little door is. The door of the shop where Ken has all his well drilling tools. Yes. Whose voice, Doreen? Oh, I don't know. They always sounded so much alike, but, but then... Then I heard a shot. From inside the tool shop? I don't know. But when I tried that door, it was locked. And nobody answered when I called. All right, come along now. Then I heard your car coming up, so I went out to meet you. That's locked, all right. All right. Stand away now. All right. Johnny. Look, both of them. Yeah. Let's see now. This one is... Um, maybe over here. Johnny? This one's not like a light. And this one is dead. theme again, comes through like the taste of a Newport filter cigarette. Fresh and clear. Like the voice of a girl you used to know. Listen. There's a difference, all right. Like when you light up your first Newport. Man, you've never tasted anything like this. Good, rich tobacco flavor. The right amount of menthol and just a hint of cool, refreshing mint. Hmm. Uh, what is it the fellow in the commercial says about Newport? Are there any questions, ma'am? <laughs> questions? No. I got the message. Newport's more refreshing to begin with, more refreshing all the way. Newport. the older of the two, Ken Kerman. He'd been shot through the chest with a 38 slug, which had then bounced off the wall in back of him and lay on the floor. While Pete and Doreen, with a wet towel and some whiskey they found, went to work on the other on Swifty, I went over that tool shop with a fine-tooth comb. I looked around outside, too, and very thoroughly, but found nothing of any help. Then, when Swifty was feeling better and able to talk... And this awful lump on your head, Swifty. What happened? But what happened in here? <sighs> A lot you care, don't you, Doreen? Don't give me that. You wish it was me laying here dead. Oh. Well, I care. What did happen? Well, Swifty? Okay, okay. Give me a second to... to muster my thoughts, and I'll, I'll give it to you straight. I think you'd better... Well, I came here to... Oh! You'd better not try to move yet. I, I came here to see if there was any possibility that... Ken had let me have some money... Again, Swifty? So what? What's it to you? All right, Swifty, just tell your story. Okay, okay. At first, he didn't even want to let me out of the rain. He he blocked the door. But then he saw Doreen's car make the turn off on the highway. So he brought me in here and locked the door on us. Now, you see it? He locked it with the key. Yeah, on the inside here. Yeah. Then what happened? And we had a big argument. Brother, I mean, a real big one. That's when he hit me. He didn't? Hit you with what? How do I know? Like a jerk and against my mama's...
best instructions. I turned my back on him. This little piece of pipe lying here beside his hand. Maybe so. Don't touch it, Pete. We may have to look for prints. Right. All right, Swift, go on. What happened next? How should I know? Don't you get a dollar? He knocked me out. Cold as a pancake. The next thing I knew, I... This loving Doreen here was splattering water all over me just now. You didn't hear the shot that killed him? How could I? When I was laying here on the floor, out cold... Say, listen. Listen, you know what I think, darling? What? This little sweetness and light character here must have done it. What? You mean me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean you. Oh, Oh, and then locked the door on the outside, on the inside, and crawled out the keyhole. It's no good, Swifty. So you'd better think of a better one. Callahan, Callahan. Like maybe you did it your own self? After he hit you? Wait a minute. Wait. Then maybe threw the gun out of the window. And that's why it's broken. Why the window is broken. No, wait, I said. Shorty Callahan. It had to be. One of him or one of his boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After Kenny knocked me out. Possibility, Johnny. Sure. Through the window. He must have followed me up here. In the rain and all, he thought it was me that he saw through the window. Only it wasn't. It was Ken. He could be right, Johnny. I don't think so. Well, now, look, Johnny. Yes, Pete? Well, you know what I think, much as I hate to. What? That he's right about Callahan. Sure I am. You didn't find any sign of a gun, did you? I didn't find any footprints outside either. So the storm must have washed him away. The storm was over, Pete. There was still a lot of water draining off out there. You see how the window was broken? From the outside in. All the glass is here on the floor. Broken that way by a bullet? Why not? But only have left a hole. Maybe some cracks. Oh, you're crazy, Dollar. It must have been busted by the bullet. All you had to do was raise the sash and strike it from the outside. Me? Oh, now listen. I think you killed him, Swift, in for a very obvious reason. The insurance money. And I say you're crazy. Because like he says, Dollar, where's the gun? Did you find one? Inside or outside or wherever you looked. Answer me that. No, I didn't. But how did you, lying here supposedly unconscious, know that I was looking around outside? Well? What are you, dumb? Because of the fresh mud all over your feet, that's how I know. You've got nothing on me. Mm-hmm. Not even your lie about Kermer seeing Doreen's car down at the turnoff? That's nearly half a mile, Swift, and it was raining then and raining hard. Yeah, then what about this? You think I slugged myself on the head? That's exactly what I think, so that nobody would suspect you. Then where's the gun I'm supposed to have used? Yeah, yeah, tell me that. Dig that up, and maybe somebody will believe this crazy accusation of yours. But until you find a gun, you hear me? Afraid he's right, Johnny. You bet I'm right. Or maybe you think I could have swallowed it. (laughs) Maybe a zip gun. That would take a thirty-eight. Don't make me laugh. You sure you looked through everything, Johnny? Zip gun. So it had to be somebody outside. Because only Kenny and me were inside here. You're sure of that? Yeah, I'm sure. I'd swear to it on a stack of Bibles. So it had to be somebody outside. Maybe Doreen here stepped out before you got here. With no mud on my shoes. So what? She got here after the storm, parked up close to the porch. No, Swifty, you did it. Without a minute ago, you told me how. And I tell you, unless you can find a thirty-eight, but you can't. And then prove it belonged to me. A zip gun, you said. What? Here in this shop, this World River's plumbing shop is material enough for a dozen of them, a hundred of them. What do you mean, Johnny? I knew there was something wrong about this bullet that went through Kermer, and you gave me the answer, Swifty. I say you're crazy. Johnny? No marks from the rifling of a barrel on it. All right, Pete, here. Take this gun of mine and hold it on him. Sure, but I still don't get it. Well, I take a look through this stuff here, this pile of pipes. Until I find one that fits a thirty-eight. Johnny. And that still smells of gunpowder. And maybe a hammer with powder burns on it that he used to fire the cartridge. Maybe the cartridge case still in it. Then when I find Swifty's fingerprints on him and a zip gun he improvised so that nobody would find a pistol around... Well, Swifty? Watch it, Swifty. It's okay, Pete. Okay, Dollar, I'll cooperate. It won't do you any good, Swifty. It's still murder. I know, but maybe a judge would... Or a jury would... Well, anyhow, it's that short one, that hunk of steel pipe on the workbench. And the hammer beside it. So, 
once again, it's up to the courts. And I'm sure that Swifty will go up for life. At the least. Expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford? Call it 200 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the fastest jailing of a murder suspect you ever saw. Me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Joseph Cabibbo. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Jim Stevens as Pete Brenneman, Leon Janney as Swifty, and Rita Lloyd as Doreen. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. Johnny Dollar. Dollar, this is Adolph Dorfman at Amalgamated Life Association. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Dorfman. Where the devil have you been? I've been trying to get you for days. Well, I've been out of town, sir, in Las Vegas on a special oh, assignment. never mind, never mind. Just get yourself over to this office, Dollar, and right away. Well, now, Mr. Dorfman... what do you think you're up to, anyway? This is absurd. This is ridiculous. If you say it is, I'm sure it must be. Of course it is. Do you mind telling me what you mean by it? The Cleet Martin case. What did you think I was talking about? I wasn't quite sure. But don't tell me you have solved it and just haven't bothered reporting to me. No, Mr. Dorfman, I have not solved it as yet, but I think I'm on the right track. You think? You think? Don't you know? No, because there is one possible clue to be checked out before I can be certain. Yes? Certain of what? That it actually is a clue to that murder. What? Do you mean to say you've been wasting valuable time and a lot of company money on just... just... Just theories about that killing? That you haven't really accomplished a thing? Mr. Dorfman... Oh, that's ridiculous. And what about this expense account you've sent in and the fact it's marked incomplete, no total given? Does that mean I'm to expect another one? Yes, it does, Mr. Dorfman. Maybe more than one by the time I'm through. Oh, that's ridiculous. Whatever gave you the idea we'd pay you before the case is closed? Why do you expect us to pay you now? I don't. Then why send in these itemized expenses? Because you yourself demanded I send in my expense account on Friday of each week, whether complete or not. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, now look here. Some of these, these, these items you've listed, these charges you've run up... When it's all over, all wrapped up, I'll be glad to explain every one of them to you. Not a bit of a Dollar. You get yourself on over here and start explaining them now. Why, I, 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 I've been trying to reach you for days. As I tried to tell you, Mr. Dorfman, if I... If you w- have anything to tell me, you can say it to my face, not waste my time on this telephone. Well, you're coming over here? I certainly am. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wayward gun matter. Adolf Dorfman always had been, always would be a short-tempered, crotchety old maid. Nothing but trouble on a case. But Amalgamated Life Mostly through Al Spangler, a VP and a very nice guy, has done mighty well for me over the years. So when Dorfman called me in on the Martin case, I couldn't very well turn him down in spite of resenting his high-handed manner. Expense account item one, $1.10 for a cab to his office. Oh, all right, all right, I'll accept that one. But look at this item right here. Four eighty for a tank full of gasoline. Because I used my own car to go over there to Lakewood. Yeah, but four eighty. When you could have made the trip on a bus for less than two dollars. Sure, sure I could. Then why didn't you? Then we'd have had to spend eight or ten dollars in taxi fares between the Martin home and police headquarters. Is that what you would have preferred? Yeah, well, no, 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 of course not. But just the same, Look, Dollar. We're you just can't... wasting time here. If you'll excuse me. Yeah, we're well, wasting time. And you, huh? in the beginning, you'd question every single item in this expense account. You always do. And why not? And that's why, instead of handing one in that would give you some real cause for worry, I decided for once to keep expenses down. 
the barest minimum, but it hasn't done the least bit of good. So if you don't mind... Uh, minimum, eh? What about this? 175 for lunch. What about it? Do you deny that it included an over-generous tip to some pretty waitress? The tip was exactly 25 cents, and it came out of ah, my... Ah, there, you see? A 25-cent tip and a dollar and a half meal. That's ridiculous. I started to say the tip came out of my own pocket, Mr. Dorfman. If you don't believe me, take a look at the cash register slip. It's right there. Go ahead, look at it. All right, all right, all right. I'll take your word for it. The fact remains that you still haven't solved the case. I think I have. You think you have. But I'd rather not talk about it just yet. Well, I don't know why not. You either know who killed Mr. Cletus Martin or you don't. Now, which is it? I'll be able to give you the whole story, I hope, after I get a phone call from New York and not before. New York? Yes. From a friend of mine at 18th Precinct Police Headquarters. Oh, so that explains this item here. Return ticket to New York and several cab fares. That's right. But why? What possible connection can they have with the Martin matter? They just happen to have a top ballistics technician. Ballistics? What's the matter with the police in Lakewood? Not a thing. Or with their county police over there? Not a thing. Then why go all the way to New York? Because once I got hold of the picture of the bullet that killed Mr. Martin, I didn't want Lakewood or Lakewood County to know what I intended doing with it. Why? I'd rather not say... Now, you've had these items explained, so if you'll excuse no, me... No, 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 Wait, wait, Dollar. Sit down, sit down. There is Say. nothing further I can do until I get my call from New York. Oh, but there is. Uh, there's a... Uh, something else I want to talk to you about. The really important reason I sent for you. Well, I hope it's a lot more important than quibbling about this expense account. Oh, it is. It then is. why the big stall? Why all the waste of time? A stall? Yes. I don't know why, Mr. Dorfman, but that's all you've been doing for the last ten minutes, stalling me. Oh, no, 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 not a bit of it, not a bit. I was merely, I, I was only, uh, uh... Now, sit down, please, sit down. All right. Well, what is it? You, uh, say you were out of town? I was in Las Vegas, but it had nothing whatsoever oh, yes, to do with... Oh, yes, 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 yes. No, that's it. That's the reason we couldn't find you anyway. We? I mean, I. I couldn't find you. Yes, that's, uh... Very pleasant out there at this time of year, isn't it? Look, will you please quit stalling again and tell me what this other important matter is? Well, all right. All right, all right, all right. Eh, uh, have you seen the papers? Did you know another client of ours just met a violent end? Mr. Barryman, here in Hartford? Yes, Alfred W. Barryman. You didn't know him? No. Nor that he was a client of yours. Nor that he was a big contractor like Mr. Martin? No. Nope. Now, uh, do you plan to assign me to that case, too? Do we have to? Of course you don't. And if you want the truth, Mr. Dorfman, if you're the company contact on it, so why wait until now to tell me? Why waste all that time picking away at the expense account? Don't you know? I certainly don't. Now, what goes, I would give... Ah, uh, now you may know. Come in, Sergeant. All right, Mr. Dorfman. How about this? Johnny Dollar, huh? That's right, Sergeant, uh... Sergeant Bill Hansett. I told you I'd find him for you, Sergeant. I don't know how you did it. What is this? All we know was he'd left town, Mr. Dollar. Wait a minute. Why the gun, Sergeant? You ought to know. Up in your feet, Dollar. You mind telling me what this is all about? Just hand me your gun, Dollar. That nice big thirty-eight you carry. Well, what's the matter? I'm sure I don't know. It's for my thirty-eight. I don't happen to have it on me at the moment. I know. What? Because we got it. Dollar serial number and all down at headquarters. And maybe that's the reason I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. Pardon me, mister. She said... Do you have a man? gag. Sure, I said. Do you have a cigarette? She had one. Newport. Newport filters cigarettes. We lit up. Some smoke. Finest, rich tobacco flavor I'd ever tasted. Real tobacco. The way I like it. The right touch of menthol and just a hint of mint. A great combination. She suggested. Makes Newport more refreshing to begin with. More refreshing all the way. She wasn't kidding. Been smoking them ever since. Newport's. Newport Filters Cigarettes. My reaction. 
reaction to the snide sergeant's bombshell wasn't repeatable. Me, Johnny Dollar, arrested on suspicion of murder by a cop with a grudge, fingered by a tight-fisted people hater named Amalgamated Life Dorfman. Thanks, Mr. Dorfman, for latching on for us. Yeah, pleasure, Sergeant. Now, wait a minute, Sergeant. If you're talking about the Martin matter... Now, don't try and kid me, Johnny. We got you nailed down for the murder of that other contractor, Barryman. What? <laughs> and he pretended not to know much about it. It was almost evasive when I brought it up. That explains all your stalling. Waiting for this man to get here. I think I did very well. Oh, you were great. Next week, East Lynn. Now, look, son. No time for talk, John. We're on to headquarters now, and I kind of you happen to be under arrest. I am. Quite so. In which case, I'm entitled to one phone call, am I not? Sure, if you want to call a mouthpiece, you're entitled. You mind if I use your phone, Mr. Dorfman? No, not at all, not at all. Thank you so much. Provided, of course, you pay for the call. Don't bank on it. I beg your pardon? Don't be surprised if you end up paying for it. Through the nose. My call was to Lieutenant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct, New York Police Department. Now, he still had no word for me, but he promised to call the minute he did, so I told him where to try if I wasn't at my apartment. Okay, now, Johnny, you ready? Look, are you sure this isn't some kind of a gag? Are you kidding? Because if it is, it's a pretty bad one. Sergeant, don't you know who I am? I mean, what my job yeah, is. Yeah, 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 Donald. Oh, I know all about you. What a great guy you are. Thanks. And nobody wasn't any more surprised than me. But Lieutenant Bartley don't go off half-cocked, and you know it. Bartley? So when he says to bring you in, well, baby, in you go. He sent you after me, Harry Bartley? Lieutenant Bartley. Now, come on. <laughs> Okay, now, Lieutenant, you want me to book him now, lock him up? In a couple of minutes, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well, Johnny, I'll say this for you, Harry. Yeah? When you pull a boner, you really do. Wasn't that one of the gentlemen of the press outside there? Yep, no doubt he's on the phone to his paper right now. Harry, this is ridiculous. Is it? You know me better than to think I could have killed this, this barryman, is it? When your own gun was found beside the body, when a bullet from it killed him... Just oh, let me, me handle this, Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. All right. Look at the facts, Johnny. You've been on the Martin case up in Lakewood, haven't you? That's right. But you've been stalling on it. But there is reason for that. You even left town, went to Vegas, presumably on another investigation. It was on another investigation. Would you like some verification? No, no, I'll take your word for it. Thanks a lot. But you found no real clue to the Martin murder, did you? Have you forgotten the microphoto of the bullet that you got for me? No, but you didn't tell me why, Johnny. Why'd you want that? Because maybe it was his gun did that kill him. Sergeant. So he figured on changing the barrel. So the markings wouldn't look like that for him. Okay, Sergeant. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Let me go on, Johnny. Please do. Then Barrowman got killed here in Hartford. And he's also a contractor bidding on that redevelopment project there in Lakewood County. Is there a tie-up, Johnny? Are you kidding, Lieutenant? Sergeant. Don't you say there's some other contractor wants that business and hires Dollar to knock him off. Well, Johnny, Harry, if you'll get rid of Big Mouth here for a couple of minutes. Hey, now, just a minute, baby. Okay, okay, Sergeant. I'll call you when I watch you. But didn't you hear when he just called me? Yes, I heard. Just close the door quietly. Go on. Yes, sir. All right, now, Harry. I've held out on things, but for good reason. Don't you know about the rotten political situation up there in Lakewood? Well, I've heard some things. Well, then you know the contracting job on that redevelopment project is going to be one big juicy plum for somebody. I know. And who gets it depends, unfortunately, on one man. On one politician whose own brother just happens to be in the contracting business. Do you know the man I mean? This Mr. Politics I'm talking about? Yes, I'm afraid I do. And he's powerful enough to make things pretty rough for you or me or anybody else who might cross him. Are you saying that he might have killed Martin? Exactly. Killed off one of his brother's competition. And the same for Barrowman's death? Yes. And for the same reason. Because there is no doubt that Mr. Barrowman or Mr. Martin could have underbid Mr. Dirty Politics' brother if they stayed alive. So with that in mind, I call him Mr. On this politician. On what excuse, Johnny? Just to suggest some possible changes in his insurance. He fell for it and he let me in. And Harry, there in his study on the wall, he had quite a collection of guns. Most of them flintlocks. Very old and very well cared for. Flintlocks? But I also spotted one half hidden behind some books on a shelf that was a dead ringer for the gun I always carry. Same make, same model, same caliber and finish. Oh, so by the simple device of dropping a lighted cigarette into his wastebasket, starting a little fire, well, while he was throwing it outside, I switched guns on him. Why, Johnny? 
so that I could have his checked against the microphoto you gave me of the bullet that killed Mr. Martin. Checked there in Lakewood? Oh, no. Why not? Because if my hunch was wrong, Harry, and if it got around, that man could make more trouble, could hurt more people than you or I ever dreamed of. And his first target would be the Lakewood police who made the checkup. You can be thankful that you don't have that kind of politics to contend with. I am. But if you're right, if his gun matches that bullet... Then he's through, Harry. The big construction job will be handed out legitimately. And more important, Lakewood and Lakewood County will be clean for the first time in years. And you will have your killer. Yes, if this story of your switching guns is true. If it's true? Yeah. Harry, you've got to be kidding don't you see now why I've had to go this thing alone? If it was his gun that killed Martin. If not, the story about your gun, why it was used for the Barrowman killing, is going to sound pretty fishy. What do you mean? Johnny, we know only one thing. It was your gun that killed Alfred Barrowman. And I've told you why. Yeah, but what if the tests show your gun also killed Martin? Harry, that's impossible. When Martin died, I had my gun in my own possession. That's exactly what I mean. Now, wait a minute. Sergeant, answer. Harry, will you wait a minute? Yeah, Lieutenant. You can lock him up now. What? Yes, sir. It'll be a pleasure. Only first I better book him, hadn't I? Oh, uh, just leave that to me. Harry, you're out of your ever-loving mind. Am I? Come along, Dollar. Hey, shut up. You like a car with plenty of pep. A car with reserve power for safe passing. Most good drivers do, but they don't like to pay extra for premium gasoline. Listen, in three out of five cars, regular-priced Sinclair Dino Gasoline matches performance of premium gasolines, saves you up to four cents a gallon. Almost anywhere you see the Sinclair Dinosaur sign, you can save up to four cents a gallon with Dino. Drive with care and buy Sinclair Dino Gasoline. Okay, Lieutenant. Thanks, Hanley. I'll call you. Yes, sir. Well, seems to me the least you can do is ask me to sit down, Johnny. Sure, jail, Harry. Make yourself at home. Thanks. <laughs> Cigarette? No, thanks. I have one. Now, what goes, Harry? Well, don't you believe what I told you last night? You seen the morning paper? Yes, and I'm sure you went out of your way to have it brought into me. That's right. And the cigarettes and extra coffee and the reporters who call on you. Did you tell him anything? You know darn well I didn't. Yeah, I thought you'd clam up, huh? Harry, don't you see what you've done to me to my reputation in this town? You think so? I'll never live down this boo-boo of yours. And worst of all, you're letting a killer run around loose. I am? Well, wasn't it your idea to try to pin the Martin murder on him, too, as a clincher? Well, of course it was, but... Look, Harry, will you listen to me? Sure, if you think it'll do you any good. Now, I'm expecting a call. A very important one. Yeah, from where? From whom? Well, you wouldn't like it if I told you because I didn't contact you instead. But I had to stay away from this territory to prevent even the remotest possibility of a leak. But if you'll let me out long enough to take that call when it comes in, and I told him to try to reach me here... Don't you mean if it comes in? No, I mean when. It'll be a ballistics report on the gun. His gun. As compared to the photo of that bullet that killed Martin. But what if they don't tell you what you've hoped for? Harry, don't you see there is still a matter of my gun? I know. Well, don't you believe what I told you about it, about the switch? Lieutenant, got an urgent one for you, real urgent, up in your office. Okay, Hanley, thanks. Harry, listen to me. You've got to let me out of here to get that call. We'll see. Behave yourself, Johnny. Well, what is it this time, Hanley? I don't get it, Dollar, but out you go. Well, thank you. Come on, I'll lead the way. You uh, mind telling me where we're going? Sure. Up to Lieutenant Bartley's office. Phone call for me? Uh, gee, how should I know? Come on, let's find out. This could be very important. Now take it easy. Huh? My feet hurt. Hey, listen. Yeah? Tell me one thing. How come a smart man like you didn't get a lawyer to spring you? Only one reason. I know your Lieutenant Bartley a little better than he thinks. Huh? At least I hope I do, because if I don't, if he's pulled the boo-boo, it looks as though he's pulled. Well, come on in, Johnny. I have a little surprise for you. Oh, uh, that's all, Hanley, and thanks. Yes, sir. Now, this had better be good, Harry. Believe me, Johnny, it is. Oh, uh, sit down. Thanks, but that's all I've been doing for the last 15 now, hours. Listen. 
Now, that urgent call I got when I had to leave you a couple of hours ago? Yeah. Well, it was a phone call for you. Randy Singer in New York? Have you forgotten? He's an old friend of mine, too. But look. Okay, see? This is a transcript of his call. Let me see. Kind of proves you were right, Johnny. It was that gun of Mr. Dirty Politics that killed Cletus Martin. I knew it, Harry. It had to be. And, of course, that gives full credence to what you told me about switching with him. And that means that he also killed Alfred Berriman. No doubt about it. So, once again, Johnny, one of your crazy hunches paid off. That hunch was based on plenty of known facts. Anyway, you're a hero again. Oh, some hero after spending a night in the clink, after being booked in a murder charge? My name is Mud. Uh, booked? Well, certainly, by you. Well, you know, you know, I must have forgotten to. What? Yeah, so if you want to sue me for holding you illegally... Oh, if I had any sense, I probably would. <laughs> but now, would you make with a good reason for all this, Harry? Well, it's a trick I learned a long time ago from a fellow. A man I've admired for a long time, Johnny. You. Me? Yeah, I suspected Mr. Dirty Politician, too. As would anybody who really knew about his methods and his machinations. All his shady deals up there in Lakewood. So? So, stealing a page from your book, I decided that the best way to throw him off, make him careless, keep him around here feeling smug, was to broadcast that we had absolute proof of your guilt. Uh Uh-huh. And don't you see, with not only the papers, but even the boys here on the force believing it, he couldn't possibly smell a rat. Mm. As a result, instead of running away, well, we picked him up right here in Hartford. Well, that's all very fine for you, Harry. And when I faced him with a report on his gun that killed Martin, and then told him about the switch with your gun that he then used on Barrowman, well, believe it or not, Johnny, and so help me, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was that surprised. Yeah. Johnny, this smart, clever old crook, got so rattled, so completely confused, he broke down and made a full confession. Congratulations, Harry. <laughs> you have made a real hero of yourself. Uh, of myself? Hmm. But I just wonder how long it's going to take me to live down that phony newspaper story. But you have, Johnny. You have. I have, huh? Sure. And just wait till you see that afternoon edition. Giving you full credit for the whole stunt. Oh? That's right, Johnny. The only hero on this case is you. Well, now, wait a minute. (laughs) I mean, after all, Harry, you're the one who wrapped it all up. Oh, yeah? But where would I be if you hadn't laid all the groundwork? I hadn't got the idea for this little trick from some of those cases of yours. Absolutely nowhere. No, Johnny. It's yours. All yours. After this, I think I'd better keep my tricks to myself. Now, wait a minute. How can I? When every case I handle gets broadcast all over the country... Well, I guess it just can't win. Expense account total? Well, all I want now is one big fat apology from meddling old Adolf Dorfman at Amalgamated Life for having trapped me into that night in jail. He owes truly Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, San Francisco and a ship. A most unusual ship. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson, music supervision by Ethel Huber, sound patterns by Joseph Cabibbo. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Robert Dryden as Adolph Dorfman, Ralph Bell as Sergeant Anseth, Martin Blaine as Lieutenant Bartley, and Nat Poland as Hanley the Guard. Though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. My name is Trudy Peebles. I'm your welcome wagon hostess in Albany. How well we realize there's no place like home. If you're moving to a new city, home can be a little strange. 
New faces, new places. It's our job in Welcome Wagon to make newcomers feel at home. Won't you call us when there's a newcomer on your street? Welcome Wagon hostesses are charming ambassadors of goodwill. Won't you call Welcome Wagon at state 59640 and give them the name and address of any newcomer you know. Each newcomer will receive greetings and warm wishes. From civic-minded businessmen, your call will help your neighbor, and it will help your Welcome Wagon hostess who carries on this valuable community service. Call state 59640. That's state 59640 for Welcome Wagon. WRW Music, roll 50. Johnny Dollar. Oh, hiya, Johnny. Hiya, boy. Well, I'm fine. Who's Johnny, this? you been out here to sunny Southern California lately? No, as a matter of fact, sure I haven't. You out here. How's about hopping on a plane? Well, that depends. Who are you? Huh? <laughs> oh, sorry, Johnny. This is Will Burnett. Trinity Mutual Insurance. Right. And the reason we need you is a couple of fish. A couple of what? Two mammals. <laughs> Look, Willie, I haven't the least idea what you're talking about. I'm beginning to wonder if you have. Sure I have. Petey and Sue, uh, dolphins. What happened? They are what? Dolphins? That's right. Now, don't tell me you've insured the lives of two dolphins. An important client wants it. I think we ought to, but the whole uh, fishy deal needs looking into You know what I think? What, Johnny? I think you're nuts. Dolphins. But as long as you're willing to pay the freight. Okay, I'll see you sometime tomorrow. <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Trinity Mutual Insurance Company, Los Angeles office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the vociferous dolphin matter. Expense account item one. At the crack of dawn the next morning, $224.43. That's for a wire to Willie Burnett, a taxi to Bradley Field, and a jet going west. Then at L.A. International, while I was picking up my luggage... Yo, Johnny, right over here. Oh, hi, Willie. Oh, pardon me, please. Excuse me, ma'am. Ah, glad to see hi, you, Willie. Boy. Glad you can make it so fast. Oh? Here, I've got a rental car all gassed up and ready for you. You can stuff that stuff in the back. All right, good enough. There we are. Huh? Well, now what? I got a client waiting for me in the office, so I can't go along with you the way I've planned. Go along to where? Shelter Point, just this side of San Diego. Oh? Now, here's a map all worked out for you. And see, right here is where Professor Dr. Eurientha Eurydice Estwell has her private ocean area. Professor who? Estwell. No, 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 those first names again. I couldn't say them again if I tried. I'll bet not. She's an eccentric, uh, nonconformist. Call her an oddball, if you like. Mm-hmm. But she once held down chairs of zoology and ichthyology at two important colleges. And like I said, she's an important client of ours. Zoology? Uh Uh-huh. And her own private oceanarium. You were serious about wanting to insure the lives of a couple of dolphins. Well, why not? I mean, if they can do what she thinks they can. Which is what? Uncurl that lip, Johnny. This (laughs) is based on scientific knowledge. But it's the wildest, the most... The most... Well, get yourself on down there and see for yourself. I think I'd better... I cut on over through Inglewood to Route 101, the freeway, and then about 40 miles later hit the Pacific Coast Highway at Capistrano Beach. There I plowed into a cold, wet fog, real pea super. By the time I passed through the usually colorful town of La Jolla, I began to wonder if I shouldn't stop somewhere and wait for it to clear. But it was still early afternoon, traffic wasn't too bad, so I kept on. By the time I finally found the unpaved road that cut over to Shelter Point, I wished that I had stopped. But a sudden, very short-lived breeze gave me a quick look at my destination. Down near the edge of the Pacific was a home, and leading out over the ocean was a long, wide pier with lockers lining one side of it. On the other side of the pier, rising out of the sea, was a tremendous tank. Boy, I could use a seeing-eyed dog in this fog. Sunny Southern California, hmm? (laughs) 
somebody down there in the pier must have caught a glimpse of me. A very good glimpse of me. That last shot was too close for comfort. But the fog, now a solid wall again, was to my advantage. Moving without a sound, I felt my way out of the pier, and by pressing close to the lockers, I showed no silhouette. Finally, I saw the hazy outline of the marksman who was not looking my way. I waited. After what seemed like an hour of hardly daring to breathe, I jumped. All right, let me have it. Let me have that gun. Come on. Well, who are you? What are you doing out here? Wait a minute. Do you always shoot at people? Now, I ask you a question, mister. Who are you and what are you doing out here? As a matter of fact, I had come here to see a Professor Estwell. What about? My name is Johnny Dollar. Uh, Johnny Dollar? That's right. Oh, Johnny, I'm so glad to see you. Well, cheers. Now, look. I, I'm Penelope Wyman. Penelope? Well, let's, let's call you Penny, hmm? <laughs> well, I like that better, You too. mind telling me why you were pulling off those shots at me? At you? Oh, but I wasn't. It must have been a ricochet. Oh, sure. Oh, really, Johnny? I was aiming at those sharks. You see them? Around the big big tank where Aunt Yuri keeps her two dolphins? Oh, you were, hmm? Honestly. So come on, Johnny. Let's go up to the house where it's warm and we can talk. Because, well, Johnny... Yeah? Why have you come here? Is it because you're worried about Aunt Yuri, too? Should I be? Yes, Johnny. Yes. This ever happened to you? You're driving down a long highway or working late, and then monotony makes you feel drowsy. Perk up with no dose. No Dose keeps you alert with the same safe refresher found in coffee. Yet No Dose is faster, handier, more reliable. Absolutely not habit forming. The safe way to stay alert without harmful stimulants. No Dose. Here, Johnny, we can sit in here. After you. Hmm? Thank you. Uh, would you like a drink or something? No, no, thanks. Now, Penny, tell me, does this worry about your aunt have something to do with your standing down there on the pier with a rifle? Well, no, I, I, I told you I'd thought of going swimming. In all this fog? Well, sure, any time. But when I, I, I saw all those sharks nosing around the dolphin tank, I... I... Uh, well, all right, no, Johnny. I did have the rifle there because of Aunt Yuri. Why? Her experiments with the dolphins. What kind of experiments? Did you ever hear one of them? Well, I've heard the funny little noises they give out. That's about all. Well, most, well, most of the sound they make is too high in pitch for the human ear. But scientists believe they communicate the same as we do with a regular language. It seems to me I read something about that recently. Well, Aunt Yuri, with all her money, hopes to prove it. Prove that the dolphins, she calls them her children... Hmm. That Petey and Sue can actually talk. That their intelligence is almost as high as ours. That's a possibility, I suppose. But is that all that worries you about her? Well, no, Johnny. It's that... Well, I think that somebody's trying to stop her. How? Well, she's old. Quite old. And... Well, there have been too many near accidents lately. Like the night one of the planks on the pier gave way. And just think if there'd been sharks around then... And she still insists on doing everything alone out here, in spite of the fact that she could afford all kinds of help. But she, she does it all alone, except for Carl and me. Who's Carl? Oh, Carl Petermel. He's a... Well, he, he was my fiancé. Uh, Johnny, are you... Uh, are you going to stay long? Well, I don't know. Tell me, uh, what does Carl do for your aunt? Oh, he handles the recording equipment for the funny sounds that Petey and Sue make when they, uh, talk to her, she calls it. I don't really know how it all works, Johnny, and I don't think she does either, but that's her big project. Well, do you think she's getting anywhere with it? Of course I am, young man. Carl, set those tape recordings over there in the corner. Right you are, Professor. Who are you? My name is Johnny Dollar. Well, I don't care who you are. What business have you coming in here at... Dollar? From the insurance company? That's right. Good. This is Carl Petermill, my assistant. How are you, Carl? 
friend of yours, Penny? Oh, no, Carl. Mr. Dollar, I want some insurance on my children, Petey and Sue. The dolphins, you mean? I said my children. Haven't you showed him, Penelope? Haven't you let him hear them talk? Now, come along, all of you. But first, Penelope, go in and put on a decent dress. Yes, Aunt Yuri. Come along, Mr. Dollar. Yes, ma'am. While Carl fooled around with a mess of complicated electronic equipment over at one side, we climbed onto a platform across the big tank, and the two dolphins came flipping up out of the water like a couple of playful puppy dogs demanding Come attention. On. Splashing Don't around, you, squeaking uh, like mad, then leaping high uh, into the air, clear over the platform and yeah, down into the water on the other side. The thing that really stopped me was when one of them, leaping out of the water onto the platform, just lay there for a moment until the professor gave it a few bats on the head like you would a playful dog. It was amazing. And a far more personal kind of play than I'd ever seen at Marineland or any other oceanarium where they train small whales and dolphins. They really seemed to understand her. Then at her command, they quit and stayed below, swimming around. Of course, coming up for a breath of air now and then and watching us all the time. There you are. Do you see, Mr. Dollar? They are my children. Completely obedient. And they love me, too. Almost unbelievable, Professor. Well, that alone is reason enough to ensure their lives. Well, now, But uh... there's a far more important reason, Mr. Dollar. One of tremendous scientific value to the whole world. At least it will be when I've given them more training to prove my point. I'm going to show you demonstrate to you how they talk. Is the recording equipment ready, Carl? All set up to go, Professor. You get one of them up to the surface, and I'll handle the mic from here. Very well. Sue, Susie, come here. Come here, Peck. Got the machine, Carl. Okay, we're rolling, Professor. All right, Susie. Talk to me. Talk to me, dear... Come on, Sue. That's right. Talk to me. That's a good girl. Do you love me? Do you love your mother? Say, mother. Mother. Mother, did you hear it, Mr. Dollar? I heard it, but I'm afraid I don't exactly understand her. Then we'll show you, won't we, Carl? Down you go, Susie. And thank you, dear. Uh, these tape recorders, Professor. How come? What's the matter with you, Mr. Dollar? Can't you see what we're doing? I'm not quite sure. It's obvious. We make a recording at ultra-high speed of sounds that are almost too high for the human ear to register properly. Yes, that must then be... Then uh... Carl puts it on another of those, those machines like he's doing now... And plays it back at a very slow speed. I see. That will make it not only audible, but understandable. Understandable, hmm? Well, of course. You'll see. Already, Professor. Then go ahead, Carl. Go ahead. Now, listen. Do you hear it now, Mr. Dunn? Now it's at a pitch that we can understand. that. She said, Mother. She did, hmm? Well, yes, of course she did, because I taught her to. Well, didn't you hear it? She said, Mother. Well, didn't she? Or was it something else, Professor Aswell? What? Something else? Yes. Like maybe murder. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Smoke Kent, the Micronite filter cigarette. Yes, people who want to get away from harsh, rough-tasting cigarettes know that the one to switch to is Kent. And there's a very good reason why. Kent, with the Micronite filter, refines away harsh flavor, refines away rough taste, for the mildest taste of all. Yes, that's your reward for smoking Kent. 
the cigarette that made the filter famous. So when you want to get away from harsh, rough-tasting cigarettes, remember, the finer the filter, the milder the taste. And you'll decide to treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Smoke Kent, the Micronite filter cigarette. I'm no salesman, I guess, because the minute I questioned the so-called words from her pet dolphin, those that came out of the tape recorder, the professor politely but firmly ordered me to leave. Her timing was just exactly right, for as I drove on past the house... Oh, Johnny! Johnny! Hi, Penny. Hi. Are you going back to L.A.? Well, uh, maybe into San Diego. You like a ride? Oh, no, thanks, but, um... Well, I'm driving in, too, for some shopping. You know, uh, I was thinking that I might hang my hat at the El Cortez tonight. Oh? Well, that'll be uh, right close to where I'll be. Well, if you're shopping late, Penny, you'll have to have dinner somewhere. Oh, I was hoping you'd say that, Johnny. It's a date. Good. I'll be waiting. Just holler when you're ready. After phoning Willie Burnett and reporting no sale as yet... That's item two, $1.45. I checked into the El Cortez, shaved, showered, dressed, then waited until Penny called. Then, a night on the town with that beautiful girl. Only once during dinner at Blueback's did we make with any serious talk. Mmm, wonderful, Johnny. Oh, good. But I shouldn't leave her alone, even for a few hours this way. Even with Carl out there with her? Your, um, your engagement to him is really off, hmm? Yes, and I guess he hates me now because of the reason for it. Oh, I knew he hadn't had much formal education, but when I found out about the only life he really cared for... Well, Penny, let's not worry too much about him. But, Johnny, all his life, he'd worked in carnival. Well, that's a pretty colorful life, oh, you know. a barker, a spieler for a freak show, two-headed snakes, that sort of thing. And that's what he hopes to do again. <laughs> let's forget about him, then. <sighs> Johnny? Hmm? Do you think Aunt Yuri really has anything with those dolphins? Well, those tapes are pretty, uh, provocative. Oh, why doesn't she just relax and enjoy her money? Tell me, who gets her money when she dies? You? Yes, everything. Except for the dolphins, they'll go to. Mm -hmm. Hey, now you're the one who said to stop worrying. What do we do next, Johnny? You just wait till I pay this check and you'll see. Waiter. We did the nightclub route. All stops. It was one of the greatest evenings I ever had. Penny, not only clever, beautiful, charming, witty, but... Well, I was sorry when it was all over. And sometime after 4 a.m., I piled her into her car, kissed her goodnight, and watched her head on back to the beach. It was almost an hour later when... Oh, Johnny Dollar. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Hold everything. Hello? Johnny, please, come out here. Penny? Yes, Johnny. Well, Penny, what's the matter? What's happened? Aunt Yuri... She's dead. Penny was waiting for me at the turnoff from the highway. Oh, Johnny, I don't know what to do. And there's nobody else around. Where's Carl? I'd forgotten when I left her alone out here. Last night was a night off for him. He won't be back till six. Well, it's almost that now. Listen, when I came in... I found Aunt Yuri wasn't in her bedroom. Yes? And it wasn't a feeding time for the dolphins, but I, I looked around anyhow. No, no, don't stop at the house. Well, where is she, Penny? Down there, at the pier. In the tank with her... with her children. Her body was floating there, and the dolphins... Her children were beside her, protecting her. I rigged up a sling and brought her body up onto the platform. And I could see where she'd been struck on the head. 
Just then, Carl came running out onto the pier. I must say that his reaction was wholly unexpected. I knew it, Penny. I knew you'd get her sooner or later. Carl! Just a minute, Carl. Couldn't wait for her to die, could you, to get all her money? You had to help her along. I said just a minute. Hit her over the head, did you? Then pushed her in. Is that what you did? Oh, Carl, you're terrible. It's true, Dollar. It's true, because of her money. Now, look here, both of you. And listen. Yeah, the doctors. I can prove it. I think I can prove it. Because they'll know. They must have seen and they can talk. Dollar, they can talk. And I can understand them, and they can understand me. Oh, yeah. You'll see. He rigged up the microphone again. Then after starting the ultra-high-speed tape machine, he talked to one of them. He asked that dolphin who had killed her. And when he finished, he moved the tape to the other machine. And now we'll play it back slow, and we'll see, Dollar... We'll see. What's that? It's my voice when I asked him. So low at this speed, it's only a rumble. The high squeak of that dolphin went slow down this way. Listen. Listen. I knew it. She killed her. Oh, no. Penelope. All right, turn it off. Carl, drive into La Jolla. Get the police. You bet I will. If it was true about Dolphin's intelligence... This might be no actual proof at all, but it was pretty damaging evidence against the girl who would inherit all of the professor's money. But from the time of the professor's first demonstration, I've been thinking about a man who knows every electronic trick. Bob McKinney, an engineer for CBS. So the minute Carl left to get the police and the medical examiner, I pulled the tape off the machine and we left. Then, at McKinney's home, Penny and I waited four or five hours while Bob experimented with different playback speeds, with filters, equalizers, a variac, and heaven knows what all. And then, finally... Well, Johnny, I can't be sure. Yes, Bob? But if the tape recording was faked up the way you think it might have been, this should be the way the voice on it sounded originally. And it wasn't any dolphin. Go ahead, play it, Bob. Uh, no. Penelope Kill Kill Murder Johnny Me see Penelope Kill All right, turn it off Well, Penny Carl It was Carl Yes Yes Carl faked that, like he faked all the other dolphin voices. But what? Why kill her? Weren't the dolphins and the aquarium to go to Carl? Oh, yes. Yes, they were. Well, apparently he was afraid that your aunt would find out about his electronic tricks. This way he'd have his sideshow, the life that he wanted. But instead... He's booked himself a one-night stand. And its blackout is permanent. Thanks to Carl, the police and he were still there at Shelter Point waiting for us. Expense account total, including hotel and the trip home, 53180. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the calm, blue, beautiful waters of the Pacific almost hide the work of a clever team of killers. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Do you like a car with plenty of pep? A car with reserve power for safe passing? Most good drivers do, but they don't like to pay extra for premium gasoline. Listen, in three out of five cars... Regular-priced Sinclair Dino Gasoline matches performance of premium gasolines. Saves you up to four cents a gallon. Almost anywhere you see the Sinclair Dinosaur sign, you can save up to four cents a gallon with Dino. 
Drive with care and buy Sinclair Dino Gasoline. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Larry Robinson, Ethel Everett, Joan Laser, Bill Lipton, and Ben Yaffe. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hanna speaking. Johnny Dollar. Danny Nixon, Johnny. Mono Guarantee Insurance. Hi, Danny. What's up? Remember Amos Crutchfield? Sure, former city attorney. Right. Retired in a blaze of glory a couple of years ago after he clamped the lid on the policy racket. Well, he's also the one who had Skimpy Dingle sent up, Johnny, about four years ago. Dingle? Yeah, Peter Foreman Dingle. Sure, I remember him. Well, he's out. That soft-headed parole board let him off early. He fell for that good behavior bit. Oh, too bad. You bet it is, because you know what it means. Do I? Well, you don't remember what he said to you in Crutchfield when the judge hit him with the sentence? Oh, look, Danny, not one of those courtroom threats in a thousand. Oh, no? Huh? Well, that's not the way Crutchfield thinks, and you ask me, I agree with him. And what's more, Johnny... Yeah? We just happened to have written a policy on Crutchfield's life, 75000 Oh? Yeah. Well, want to go talk to him? Okay. <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the skimpy matter. <laughs> Expense account item one. 480 for a tank full of gas for my car. Instead of heading straight for Mr. Crutchfield's home over in Lakewood, I made a slight detour to the local parole office. And you know something? I'd have been perfectly content to stay there and forget all about Amos Crutchfield because the parole officer I talked to turned out a little different than I'd expected. We got the official notice of Peter Foreman Dingle's release just this morning, Mr. Dollar. It's uh, Johnny, Miss Barlow. Sure. My name's just plain old Mary. Well, now, the name may be plain, but... Uh... Yes? <clears throat> Perhaps we'd better talk about uh, Skimpy Dingle first, hmm? Well, there isn't really too much to tell you because he hasn't reported into it. You have no local address for him? No. Well, that's too bad. That was really my reason for stopping by. Uh, speaking of addresses, though, Mary... Uh... Well, I'll be glad to let you know <clears throat> as soon as he does check in. Good. And meantime, Johnny... Yes? Be careful, huh? Why do you say that? Because of what he said in court. That could apply to you as much as to Mr. Crutchfield, you know. Oh, I doubt it. Would you like to act as my bodyguard? <laughs> you know something, Johnny? You're pretty fresh. <laughs> my mother... I know, always... I know, I know. But uh, did she tell you how come a man like Skimpy Dingle got out so soon? I mean, after all, the parole board is a pretty intelligent group. His older brother, Johnny. Hmm? Percy Dingle. He's a psychologist of sorts, the, the bookworm type. Oh? It's Percy who kept Skimpy out of jail on a lot of earlier lesser charges. I see. And you think he convinced the parole board? <laughs> I'm sure of it. A man like that who can... Toss around seven-syllable technical terms can be pretty convincing. Apparently, it's worked before. Maybe. Do you have his address? Mm, yes, I think so. Let's see. Oh, yes, here it is. The Kingston Plaza on Walnut Avenue. Good. But why bother with him? You won't like him. A couple of reasons, Mary. If Skimpy is in these parts, Percy ought to know where. Mm, that's true. What's the second reason, Johnny? Well, if Percy, a psychologist, has any influence over him, and apparently he does... Maybe together we can show him the light. Thanks, Mary. I'll see you again. Some 20 minutes later, I pulled up in front of Crutchfield's home in the pretty little community of Lakewood. Parked in front of it was one of the new compact cars. I should have taken a better look at it or at least let the air out of the tires. Instead... Crutchfield? 
Mr. Crutchfield. One way to get in there. Mr. Crutchfield. Hello, Mr. safe way to stay alert without harmful stimulants. Remember, when you're driving, working, studying, and monotony makes you feel drowsy. Perk up. Perk up with no dose. No dose. Though unconscious, Amos Crutchfield was still alive. Whoever had done it had broken into one of the windows there in the den, fired the shots, and left by the window all in a matter of seconds. One of the bullets had creased the old man's skull, but how the other missed his heart, I'll never know. As I carefully lifted him up onto a couch, I heard the car I'd seen pull away. I cussed myself for not having made note of its license, but I hadn't. And to try to pick it out from all the hundreds, perhaps thousands, like it in that area would be impossible. Come on, come on, operator, come on. Operator. Operator, listen, my name is Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. I'm at the home of Mr. Amos Crutchfield, and we need a doctor here right away. It's an emergency. Well, I believe that Dr. Edwards usually takes care of him. All right, call him, get him over here, and then get hold of the police. Police? Yes. Tell them to get here immediately. A few minutes later, Dr. Franklin Edwards arrived, looked over Mr. Crutchfield, bandaged him up, Gave him a tetanus shot and a sedative while the old man remained unconscious. I feel confident he'll recover, Mr. Dollar. Good. Now, Dr. Edwards... I must say, though, he was very lucky. Another inch to the left, and that one bullet would have snuffed out his life. I don't doubt it. Now, listen, Doctor. Yes? Uh, I've told you exactly what happened. Yes? Would you uh, stick around and tell the police when they get here? Well, yes, of course. I'll, I'll be glad to, but... Well, are you leaving now, Mr. Dollar? You bet I am. adequacy of the police force in that quaint, quiet, ordinarily peaceful little town, I realized it was up to me to find Skimpy Dingle and fast. And his brother Percy back in Hartford was the one who might be able to give me some information. But exactly two blocks later, as I approached an intersection with a stop sign on the cross street, a car came barreling out of it and heading straight for me. The devil's the matter with you? Didn't you see the stop sign? Skimpy, put down that gun. Oh, uh, yeah? Well, here's for you. like as Skimpy sent four shots at me at close range before I could even make a grab for my own gun? Did you ever see a magician that put somebody inside a basket and then ran swords through it? By some miracle, only one of the slugs grazed me, took a bite out of my left arm, enough to draw blood. I tore a piece off my shirt, improvised a pad to stop the bleeding, then drove back to my apartment in Hartford. After a quick cleanup on the arm and a Boy Scout type dressing I hoped would stop any chance of infection, I put on a clean shirt and reached for the telephone. Hmm. Uh, just a minute. Be right there. As soon as I get this jacket on. Oh. Coming. Coming. Who is it? Mr. Dollar? That's right. Who are you? My name is Dingle. Dingle? Percival Dingle. All I have to say is you better be alone, Mr. Dingle. Hey, what is this? Come inside. I beg your pardon. Okay, so you're Percy Dingle, hmm? Yes. I can see that my brother was right. Oh? That gun you're holding. You're a killer, aren't you? I am. Are you kidding? And this, this completely unnecessary strong arm welcome into your apartment. Just take it easy, Mr. Dingle. Take it easy? After this sort of treatment? I had hoped you might be the sort of person with whom I could rationate. You'd be surprised at how reasonable I can be when the occasion warrants it. And I assure you, this one does. All right, then sit down, Mr. Dingle. Sit right there. Thank you. But uh, won't you put that gun away, please? Hmm? Oh, sorry. Until I could be certain that you'd come here alone, Mr. Dingle. You were expecting someone with me? Well, I wasn't expecting you. 
Now, what's it all about? Well, when you speak gently as now, you do appear to be a man of intelligence. Well, I thank you. And I hope that I can reason with you, Mr. Dollar. Awaken some understanding in your heart. Some well-deserved sympathy for one who has been less fortunate than yourself. Like whom? As if I need to ask. Peter, my younger brother. Skimpy, hmm? Well, if you choose to call him by that rather disparaging sobriquet... I choose. And I'm afraid you're not going to get much sympathy out of me, Dingle. That brother of yours is riding for a fall. About as hard and as fast as he can. He was a hot-blooded, hot-headed young tough when he got himself in trouble a few years back, and I have good reason to think that he hasn't changed one bit. Now, if you'll excuse me... Will you listen to me? Please. Afraid it won't do you any good. Or him. Peter has been in trouble more than once. I know it just as well as you do. But do you know why? <sighs> All right. Suppose you tell me. Simply because of his lack of the education that you and I were fortunate enough to receive. Mm -hmm. And the guidance the constructive behavioristic influences that inevitably are a part of Oh, sure. The social adaptability and relationships that are so necessary to conformation with our scheme of living. Didn't Skimpy have just as good a chance for an education of some kind as you did? Yes, but he rebelled against it. And who was to tell a child what the lack of it would do to him? The social and emotional instability it would engender in him. The hatred of such as you who were contributory to his incarceration in that prison. Well, his uh, incarceration apparently didn't do him much good. Why do you say that? What about his hatred for the lawyer, Amos Crutchfield? You and he, Mr. Dollar. What? You and Mr. Crutchfield, the particular two people he feels have persecuted him. You two are the ones, and the only ones who can help him now. You must be joking. I'm very serious. I'm a psychologist, Mr. Dollar. Uh, so I understand. I know the human mind. More important, I know Peter's mind. Oh, you do? Then why haven't you made some attempt to get him off of this crime kick? All of his earlier offenses were relatively minor. Little more than the mischievous pranks of any youngster. Oh, they were. Hmm? But this last one that sent him to prison. Mr. Dolly, you must believe me, because I know what I'm talking about. Well? That was the fulcrum that finally provided me with enough leverage. That enabled me to convince him of the error of his ways. Oh, you think he's convinced now? Well, isn't the fact that he was released for good behavior sufficient proof that he's made definite progress? Isn't it proof that with a little help, the kind of help and understanding you can give him, Mr. Dollar? I? Yes, you. Particularly you. Because up until now, Mr. Dollar, you have been a symbol of only one thing to him. Persecution. I see. And what about Amos Crutchfield? <laughs> That doddering old fool? You must be joking. Do you think that he could understand that a man so narrowed in his regard for a boy who made a mistake that he persuaded the judge to impose a completely unjust sentence on Peter? Do you think that a prejudiced, bigoted old man like him could be of any help? Unjust sentence, hmm? Yes, Mr. Dollar. It was utterly unjust. Uncalled That's for. That's right. Instead of five to seven with time off, the judge should have given him 20 solid or maybe 30... You can't mean that. Look, I've known this kind before, Mr. Dingle. I've known a lot more of them than you ever have or ever will. If only you were a psychologist, Mr. Dollar. Uh, maybe I am. Just the purely practical kind. Not with any head up in the clouds, full of lovely, impractical theories, the way yours seem to be. Or is it? What? Or is all this just a bluff? Now, wait, sir. Because I... the more I think about it, Percy, the more convinced I am that, one, your brother is rotten clear through. No. That, two, he got out of prison only because a smart pitch like this when you're handing me caught the parole board in a weak moment. No. They saw the wisdom in what I told them. I think you're all wrong in what you say about Skimpy, about any chance of his ever straightening out, and I think you know it. I know that if you will see him, we'll talk to him, Mr. Oh, come off it. Tell me the truth. Isn't all of this just a little stunt that you've dreamed up to lead me to him? To get me in range of his gun so that he can polish me off the way he tried to kill Mr. Crutchfield? What? You are saying that he, Peter, who skimpy, whatever you wish to call him, that he actually tried to kill a man? No, I don't believe it. All right, then you go and see Crutchfield in here. Have a look at this. If I can get my sleeve up, move this bandage a bit. Here. There you are. Mr. Dell? Yes, one of his bullets just a few minutes ago. What do you think of your poor, misguided little brother now? All right, all right. It, it, it happens simply because he feels that you not only have, but will continue to persecute him. Sure. But once he learns otherwise, finds out that you were on his side, willing to help him, 
Oh, please, Mr. Dowler, see him. Talk with him. Believe me, sir, if you'll do that... Will you? Please? You know where he is, where I can find him? Yes. And we'll do as I ask. I'll see him for only one reason, Mr. Dingle. Yes? To turn him over to the police. No. No, Mr. Dollar, I couldn't do that to him. So unless you agree to talk to him first, to at least try to understand him, I won't tell you where he is. All right, then we'll have to find him ourselves, and we will. Goodbye, Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dollar, let... Let me do this. Yes? I'll go to him. I'll tell him that you're willing to see him. I'll tell him why. And then, if his reaction is the right, the proper one, I'll telephone you where he'll be, waiting for you, to listen to you. You really honestly believe there's a cure for him, don't you? Yes. All right, then go ahead and contact him. We'll see. <laughs> tail with Percy Dingle when he left. But the bullet wound in my arm was really kicking up. And I felt kind of groggy. Maybe that's why I let him talk me into a pointless meeting with his brother. Or was it possible that it hadn't been Skimpy who tried to kill Mr. Crutchfield, that it was somebody else? No, no. And I was sure, absolutely sure, that it was Skimpy there in the compact car who'd taken the shots at me. And yet... Uh, but I was groggy, and I, I wasn't thinking straight. So after napping for a couple of hours, I uh, got up, poured myself a drink, and ordered some dinner sent over from a nearby restaurant. That's item two, by the way, six dollars plus a dollar tip. By then, I began to feel a little better. Hmm. Johnny Dollar. This is Percy Dingle, Mr. Dollar. Well? I told you my faith in him is entirely warranted. You think so, hmm? I'm certain of it. More certain than ever. He's waiting for you now. I'll bet he is. You'll find him in room four on the ground floor of a rooming house at 1217 North Chala. Okay, Mr. Dingle. I'll run on over and see him. And Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Thank you. I drove to 1217 North Chala. Apparently, Skimpy was the only one home in the rather decrepit-looking old boarding house. Through the open window of his room, I could see him slowly pacing the floor, his head down, thoughtfully, a finger to his lips, the perfect picture of a repentant man. Nonetheless, after entering the building before knocking on his door, from well at one side of the door frame, I drew my gun. Yes, who is it? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, I'm glad you've come. Well, just in case. No, no. No, you didn't need to, to kick it open, Mr. Dollar. Can you blame me for taking no chances, Skimpy? No, sir, I guess I can after what I... Oh, look, you can, uh, you can put your gun away, too, honest. Sure, why not? But just remember that it'll still be handy. Look, you gotta believe me, you got no worries, Mr. Dollar. You see, my brother was here all afternoon, and he... Well, he, he told me about talking to you. Well, then? Listen, Dollar, and I mean it. I was wrong, see? I was all wrong. 
I mean, when I tried to shoot you there in your car, and I'm... I'm awful glad I missed. Honest. Well, I'm kind of glad you're such a lousy shot, but uh, what about Mr. Crutchfield? Oh, I only hope and pray the old guy will live. Don't you see, Dollar, I was wrong. I mean, all along, too, but I didn't know it, you see? I mean, I couldn't believe it. Until I seen you come in the door here just now and and to, to help me, just like my brother promised you would. Skippy, I promised him only one thing, that if he'd tell me where to find you, I'd turn you over to the police. No, 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 no. No, look, you... Don't you understand? I understand your brother's living in a dream world. No, no, Dollar, that... That isn't what I mean. What do you mean? Well, I mean he is. Sure, sure he is. You better make up your mind. <laughs> well, I mean that's why the dope was stupid enough to get you here. Right here. Where I can't miss. You're still a lousy... Ah! Ah! That was a big mistake, Skimpy. Okay. Okay, so I... So I missed you. Get up on your feet. Okay, okay. You... <laughs> you win, I guess. Sit down over there. A chair against the wall. Okay, okay. What else can I do? Not a thing. Your little act wasn't good enough. Now stay there while I pick up this gun of yours. Don't bother, Dollar. What? Don't move another step, you hear me? Don't move. I see. Him. Yeah. You see. But now face around the other way. Go on! I had a feeling you might get rough when I pulled that gun. So I had this other one, see? And, Dollar, it's aimed right for the back of your head. Thanks, Percy. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I... How did you... Oh, then you... You saw me outside this window. That's right. And you knew that I would pull this trigger before he... Before he could... After you'd seen what he was up to? After hearing what he said? Percy, I hoped you would. My own brother. Did I kill him, Mr. Dollar? No, Percy. Just like him... You're a pretty lousy shot. Skimpy? And without his brother's support anymore? He'll be lucky if he ever gets out of the pen. Percy? Well, I hope he never forgets his lesson in practical psychology. Expense account total... $10.80? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a very bad case of not knowing enough about your friends. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Do you like a car with plenty of pep? A car with reserve power for safe passing? Most good drivers do, but they don't like to pay extra for premium gasoline. Listen, in three out of five cars, regular price Sinclair Dino gasoline matches performance of premium gasolines. Save up to four cents a gallon. Almost anywhere you see the Sinclair dinosaur sign, you can save up to four cents a gallon with Dino. Drive with care and buy... Sinclair Dino Gasoline. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson, music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Rosemary Rice, Larry Haynes, Jack Arthur, Melville Ruick, and William Redfield. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical direction, Michael Shoskis. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Stuart Metz speaking. 
Get in the game with Phil Rizzuto Sports Time every night but Sunday. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Dennis Taylor, Star Mutual Insurance Company here in Colorado Springs. Yes, Mr. Taylor. An important client of ours, Mr. Dollar. His name is Melvin Lockerty. Yes? Well, he's spending the summer at one of our nearby guest ranches. And he's having some visitors for a week or so. He's invited them. They'll be his guests. So? A dollar, Mr. Lockerty believes that given half a chance, one of them will try to murder him. Murder him? So if you're free, if you can find the time to come out here... Mr. Taylor, I'm on my way. <laughs> The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Star Mutual Insurance Company, Colorado Springs office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Fours a Crowd matter. <laughs> Expense account item one. 146.20 for a cab to Bradley Field, a plane to New York, and a jet the rest of the way to Denver. A mile high city in the middle of the most beautiful mountain country I know of. And the home of radio station KLZ. Item two, 7.30 for a ferry plane to Colorado Springs. Taylor was there to meet me. He's a short, stocky, gray-haired man of about 50 who takes himself a bit too seriously in spite of the funny way his glasses keep slipping down his pudgy little nose. I have one of my own cars right over there, Mr. Dollar. If you will drive me back to my office, it's yours for as long as you're here. Good enough, Mr. Taylor. Now, about this man, uh, Lockerty, did you say? Uh, yes, Melvin Lockerty. And he's convinced, Mr. Dollar, that one of these relatives coming to see him wants to murder him. Relatives, hmm? The only surviving ones he has. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, <clears throat> here we are. Oh, all right. You see, they're the children of his younger brother, Henry died a few weeks ago at the age of 71. Oh, I see. Now, how old is he? Uh, well, according to his policy, 74. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'll point the way to go. Right. And uh, his beneficiaries? Uh, these three who are coming here. Mm -hmm. When? Uh, they're due today. So you'd best get over to the no-name ranch where he's staying just as quickly as possible. Uh, turn here, please. All right. Uh, tell me, uh, how much do you know about these relatives, these heirs of his? Not very much, I'm afraid, outside of their names. Are they crooks or something that he's so scared of them? Hmm. Any crook in that family, it's Lockerty himself. How do you mean? Well, now, how do you think he ever got hold of enough money to afford nearly a half million worth of insurance? <laughs> I'm sure I don't know. Well, then let me tell you. By hornswoggling his brother Henry out of some mining properties over near Cripple Creek. That's how. Oh? Properties that Henry spent a whole lifetime developing to the point where they finally began to uh, pay off. I see. Tricked his brother out of them and then sold them and kept the money himself. A rotten thing to do, Mr. Dollar. And Henry had been a very close friend of mine. This Lockerty sounds like a nice fellow. He's a crook of the first water. And if you ask me, Lockerty was completely responsible for his brother's death. You see, it was by his own hand. And you want me to protect a man like that? I know, I know, but with the company, it's purely a matter of dollars and cents. Personally, I don't care what happens to him. You really hold a grudge against him, don't you? No, 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 I did not say that. You didn't need to. This ranch was on a broad, level spot packed out of the side of a mountain, part of the Rampart Range, about a half mile up from Highway 24. It consisted of about a dozen neat, modern, comfortable cabins, and from the front window of mine, I had a view of not only pikes, but several other peaks that hemmed in colorful Ute Pass. All very beautiful. Yes? Oh, hi. Hello. My name's Lockerty. Taking you long enough to get here. Why haven't you been to see me? Well, uh... Well, I want one thing understood, Dollar, right from the beginning. When these relatives of mine get here... They haven't arrived yet? Well, I'm still alive, ain't I? Now, I don't want them to know what you're here for, you understand? Yes, but Mr. Lockerty... Now, uh... look. You look and listen. I invited them up to spend a week with me to try and make peace with them. After all, they're the only relatives I got. 
Uh, so I understand. And uh, to try to find out once and for all which one of them is out to get me. To get you? Why? Why? Because their father, just before he died, he made one of them promise to get even with me for, um, for um, well, I, I, I sort of done him out of some money once. Your own brother, wasn't it? Yes, my own brother. What of it? What difference does that make? Well, how do you know about that promise? Because he told me before he died. Mm-hmm. And which one of the three do you suspect? Well, how should I know? I haven't even seen them, not for years. But now I've been getting letters telling me my time is about up. Threatening letters? Yes. I hope you've kept them. No, I haven't. But I'm worried. So that's the reason I've called them here for a showdown. I, I mean to, to, to patch it up or, or something. Mm-hmm. Oh. Take... Here they are now. Wait a minute, Mr. Lockerty. Are you trying to tell me that... That those three who just got out of that car... Yes. That one of them might be plotting to murder you? Yes, yes, yes. Ooh, somebody is crazy. New part, filthy cigarettes. New part, menthol cigarettes. A hint of me. The difference, so fresh that you know the difference. Yes, smoking with cool menthol. It's so refreshing while you're smoking. You want filters, cigarettes. While you're smoking a new port, remember this hint. Coolness of menthol. Freshness of mint, rest up the battles, flavor that's bright. Smoking a new part, smoking is right. So refreshing while you're smoking, new part filter cigarettes. New part filter sneaked out the back door of my cabin. I stood there by the window and looked long and carefully at the new arrivals while they pulled their luggage out of the car there in front of the ranch office. And all I can tell you is that it was a pleasure. The one who'd been driving was... 26 or 7, tall, blonde, and beautiful. Another, perhaps a couple of years younger, was a brunette, a real doll with a mischievous sparkle in her eyes. As for the third, well, I won't even try. Beyond saying that in spite of her heavy horn-rimmed glasses, a plain cotton dress, and hair done up in a bun, she was one of the loveliest, most naturally beautiful girls I've ever seen. So, as, uh, as casually as possible, I walked out of my cabin and sauntered over to them. Well, hello. We're here. I'm Kitty Lockerty. Oh, we all met in Colorado Springs, and Marion had her car, so that's why we all got here together. Well, hi. I, I'm Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought the manager's name was... Uh, what did you say it was, Thecla? Oh, Mr. Crawley McClary or something. Who cares now? Hi, Johnny. Thecla? Mm-hmm. Like it? Unusual name. Oh, I'm an unusual girl, Johnny. <laughs> yes, I can see that. You paddle your own canoe, Thec. I saw him first. So what, darling? Mm-hmm. So you can just... Oh, now stop it, you two. Is the manager about Mr. Dollar? Uh, it's Johnny. Hmm? And I'm Marion. Marion Lockerty. Hi. And the answer's no. He drove into Manitou Springs right after I got here. But, uh, if I can be of any help... Would you, Johnny? Cut it, Dick. I think we're supposed to have cabins 8, 9, and 10, Johnny. At least that's what Uncle Melvin said on the phone. Well, why don't we see if they're open? Here, let me grab some of this luggage. <laughs> Hmm? Now, of course, you never can tell. After getting them settled in their respective cabins and calling attention to the square dance posted for that evening, I went back to my own cabin and simply waited, watching. A while later, the three of them got together and went over to Mr. Lockerty's cabin. Then, even with his door closed, I could hear him shouting at them. And finally, the girls went back to their own cabins separately and not speaking to each other. Then I dropped in on Lockerty. Crazy dollar. 
Suppose one of them saw you come in here. What were all the fireworks about, Mr. Lockerty? I was nice to them, Dollar. I said I'd pay all the bills and give them anything they want up here. And then I told them. Yeah? I told them that I knew one of them was after me. And what'd they say to that? What do you think? They acted like they never heard of such a thing. But I knew better, Dollar. I knew better. I know that Harry, before he died, made one of them promise to kill me. Yes, but which one? Well, how should I know? I told you I don't know, but look at him. That peckler, the blonde one. Ah, quite a dish. He's all wrapped up in herself and nobody else. Don't care about nobody else. You think she wouldn't kill me? Huh? Because of her promise and to get her share of the money in addition? Do you think she would? And so would Catherine. Kitty, that black-haired one. Hot-tempered little minx with those dark, shifty eyes. And the way she tried to laugh it off when I said I was wise to them. Hmm. And uh, how about Marion, the one with the glasses? Yeah, sure. The quiet one, but smart. Just don't you forget that old saying, Dollar, that still waters run deep. Mm. Anyhow, I, I told them. You told them just exactly what, Mr. Lockerbie? That whichever one thinks she's going to kill me, she won't get away with it. So she'd better admit it, that's what. Don't you see, darling? I can't sleep. I can't rest. This, this, this thing is driving me crazy. That's the understatement of the week. No. What? Well, what? Look, if it's rest you want, Mr. Lockerty, I see by the bulletin board that there's a barn dance tonight, so at least you can get some sleep while that's going on. Yeah, yeah, if they go to it. A... I'll try to see that they do. Uh, okay, but, but 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 don't you worry. Now, I'll be sleeping with a gun at my side. You carry a gun? I always do. No, well, no. if you ask me, Mr. Lockerty. Well, yeah, well, if I ask you what? <sighs> Nothing. Forget it. <laughs> my money, this selfish, twisted little old man was out of his mind, was far more dangerous than any of the girls. And yet, if one of them had made a promise to kill him, well, there was only one way to find out, or at least to try. I sashayed on over to the barn dance. Down there in the barn that night was quite an affair. Far more than just the guest population of the ranch were there. And by lying mightily about my ability as a square dancer, I'd persuaded all three of the girls to be present. Then, although it took a bit of an eggling, Kitty and Seckler were having a high old time with some of the local boys. I managed to get them aside. Separately, of course, for a little walk in the clean, cool mountain air. I know, Johnny. I, I guess the whole ranch must have heard him ranting and raving at us, there in his cabin. Why, Tessa? Oh, he has the silly notion that one of us promised to Daddy to kill him for something that happened once. But did you? One of you? Well, I know I didn't. But I'll tell you this, darling. That if I had, I would have done it. I mean, after what he did to Daddy. Oh, and what's he living for, anyhow? I mean, well, just think how nice it'll be when he leaves us all his nice money, hmm? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it's getting chilly out here, darling. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, should we go back in and dance some more? Well, if you want to, but it might not seem so cold, Johnny, if, uh, Johnny... You know, come to think of it, I promised another fling with your sisters, too. Oh. Okay, Johnny. Okay, if you want to go back in, let's go back in. But later, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Better feel that with a kiss. Why not? Kitty was the next one I managed to get away from the dance. Well, it's the least that could happen to Uncle Melvin after what he did. You know, all I have to say is I wish somebody would get rid of that old coot. Well, why don't you do it then, Kitty? Well, then, don't talk like that, Johnny. You're talking about murder. Weren't you? Well, I know it may have sounded that way, but I, I didn't mean it. No, I hope not. Well, what are we talking about him for, hmm? Such a beautiful night. With all the moonlight through the trees and... Hmm, Johnny? She would be kind of ashamed to waste it now, wouldn't it? Hmm. You know, it's kind of chilly, too, isn't it? <laughs> Boy, that's an old line. Oh, well, then it must be a good one, huh? Johnny! I mean, if it works, and does it? Johnny? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Are you, are you out there, Johnny? Oh, Mary, and you spoiled for it. You're like an old mother hen. Well, that's what you think. But Johnny promised to teach me the Texas star, and that's what they're going to dance next. You did promise, Johnny. 
You got to keep a promise, Kitty. Oh, John. Maybe later, hmm? Yes. I never dreamed that a hard-boiled insurance investigator could... Wait a minute now, Marion. What did you say? Oh, now look, dear. Didn't you think I'd know the minute I heard your name? And I suppose that you're here because old Uncle Melvin has this ridiculous idea that one of us is going to kill him. Is it ridiculous, Marion? Don't you know why the three of us met in Denver and came here when he asked us to? Why? To humor him. So he wouldn't get silly and write us out of his insurance and his will. That's all. Can you see a pretty little secretary like Kitty committing a murder? Or a softy like Thecla who wouldn't hurt a fly? How about you, Marion? Me? An old maid school teacher? <laughs> now, what do you think, John? Well. Johnny, isn't it a shame to waste all this lovely moonlight? Oh, now, why couldn't I have had a teacher like you? <laughs> After the barn dance, the local folks went home and the ranch guests went back to their cabins. Except for Kitty and Thecla, who'd left me flat and paired off with a couple of boys with a fancy car. After delivering Marion to her cabin, I sat watching at the window of my own until her lights went out. Then I dropped in on Mr. Lockerty again. Yes, yes, I get plenty of sleep. But if you're going to bed now, Dollar, I'm going to stay up. Now, look, Mr. Lockerty. I'm going to sit here and read the rest of the night. All right. Whatever you say, but Thecla and Kitty are out somewhere with a couple of boys, and Marion's going to bed, so if you ask me... Oh, she has, has she? Huh? What about the light that just went on again there in Marion's cabin? Hmm? Look. See it. Oh. Okay. All right, then I'll stick around until she goes to bed again, and the others come in. Well, look, uh, if you are going to sit here for the rest of the night, why don't I pull down this window shade? Yes, that's a good idea. Okay, here we are. Get down. Get down. That shot was just outside the window. Whether it was meant for you or for me, it... Mr. Lockerty. Mr. Lockerty. He's dead. The shot that killed Mr. Lockerty brought the ranch guests out of their cabins just as quickly as they could throw something on them with their pajamas. Except for Kitty and Thecla and their boyfriends, who were there within minutes. A short time later, Marion appeared in bathrobe and slippers. I had the ranch manager phone for the sheriff, and then... Oh, Johnny, this is terrible, terrible. And in spite of the way I was talking tonight... Uh, Kitty. Well, I don't think it's so terrible. It's about time, I think. Thecla, that's no way to talk, regardless of how we may have felt about Uncle Melvin. Kitty, Thecla, you two got here in quite a hurry. Where were you when it happened? Johnny... You don't think that either of no, us... No, 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 don't get emotional, Feck. And Johnny, Feck and I and Pete and Wally... Oh, excuse me, Johnny Dollar. This is Pete McKenzie and, and Wally Thatcher. Hi, Mr. Dollar. Uh, well, didn't I see you four take off a while back? Yes. Yes, sir, we took the girls down the road for a beer after the dance. Yes, Johnny, we, we just got back and were on our way to the cabins and we heard the shot. So we came over here instead. Yes, sir, that's just the way it was. I see. And aren't you going to ask about me, Johnny? What do I need to, Marion? No, no, Johnny, you don't. What's that, Kitty? As we came up the drive, we saw Marion's light go on there in her cabin. I couldn't sleep, Johnny, so I decided to make some cocoa and read a while. But before I could even... Well, what's the matter, Johnny? Motive. Who else around here could possibly have a motive? But, Johnny, honey, surely you didn't think that one of us... I'm afraid I did, Thakla, but with... Pete and Wally with you two, and both Mr. Lockerty and I saw the light go on in your cabin, Marion. Wait a minute. There's another possibility. <laughs> Item three, 35 cents for a phone call to Colorado Springs to the one other person, the man who said he didn't care what happened to Lockerty. Yes, Dollar? Oh, then you are at home. Well, I've been home all evening. Why? Then you couldn't possibly have fired the shot and got all the way back there by now. Shot? What's that? Tell me, what's happened, Dollar? The sheriff and his men arrived, and I'll say this for them. They were very thorough. Also, they convinced me that disposal of the murder weapon could have been a cinch. 
in a deep, mucky little pond in back of the row of cabins. By the time it was fished out, if it was there, fingerprints, if any, wouldn't mean a thing. And nobody, but nobody, was able to give any clue to the killer. A hunch? Okay. Maybe so. But one of those girls, one of them had recognized me. The only really clever one. The one who'd know the value of an airtight alibi. And she'd made a couple of points to me before it happened. Like their reason for coming. And she pointed a finger at the others while seemingly defending them. The only trouble was, darn it, that not only I, but others had seen that she was in her cabin when it happened. That she'd just turned on her light in there. We'd seen it. I'd seen it. Then I remembered. A little device that people use to protect their homes. So item four in Manitou Springs that morning, 11.25 for a gadget I hoped would turn the trick. Then that night, the girls and I sat together on the porch of the office unit. Uh, what did you say, Johnny? A check on your powers of observation, Thecla. I don't get it, Johnny. You will, Kitty. Now, look in through this window into the office. See the wall clock? Well, sure. Okay. Now, look over there at my cabin. I left the lights off, right? Well, yes, they're up in my cabin, too. All right, now, I'm going to leave you. And I want to know to the second what time I get inside my cabin and turn on the light in it. Sure, and then, Johnny? Then you'll see. Well, it's certainly taking Johnny long enough to get over there. Oh, just relax, Peck. I think he has something up his sleeve. If you want the truth, though, I can think of nicer things with Johnny than playing games. Well, it was for you two. Oh, look, look, his lights are on, see? Okay, so he got there at exactly... Um, the time is exactly four and a quarter, four and a half minutes Don't after... bother, Kitty, I'm right here. Johnny! Oh, just, Johnny, I... Well, just now, sir, you turn on your lights way over there on your cabin. So you would have sworn that's where I was, wouldn't you? Well, of course. So would I, Johnny. The way you and the boys swore that Marion was in her cabin when your uncle was killed. But she wasn't. What? My lights went on over there just now because of a simple clockwork device that I put on the lamp cord earlier. An automatic switch? That's right. People use them to put on the lights in their homes while they're away and then turn them off in the mornings to make the house look occupied when they're not there. The way Marion made it look. Made it look as though she were in her cabin. Oh, John. Oh, no. Marion. That's right. Marion? But Johnny... Johnny, he didn't deserve to live. Maybe not, Marion. But nobody deserves to be murdered. Expense account total, including the trip home? Call it $400 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case with a real switch to the finish. Tune in, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Can you get premium gasoline performance at regular gasoline price? Find out what so many other car owners have found. In three out of five cars, regular priced Sinclair Dino Gasoline matches performance of premium gasoline, saves you up to four cents a gallon. Almost anywhere you see the Sinclair sign, you can save up to four cents a gallon with Dino and still get premium performance and mileage. Drive with care and buy Sinclair Dino Gasoline. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Bill Smith, Edgar Staley, Freddie Chandler, Nettie Galen, Constance Simons, and Reynold Osborne. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical supervision by Mike Shostakis. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. 
Johnny Dollar. My name is Bartley, Mr. Dollar. Tom Bartley. Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company here in Des Moines. What can I do for you, Mr. Bartley? Case Paper Products Company. One of our pretty important clients. It looks like somebody's trying to blow them off the map. Blow them off the map? Explosions and fires in a couple of their chain of warehouses. Oh? Yes. That have so far cost us over $120,000. And if they have any more of them, or if their main plant here in Des Moines gets hit... I see what you mean. Okay, Mr. Bartley. If I get any kind of break on plane schedules, I'll see you sometime late this afternoon. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company, Des Moines office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the case of trouble matter. Expense account item one, $102.65, plane fare to New York, to Chicago, to Des Moines, Iowa. And thanks to good connections, we circled the transmission tower of KRNT, passed over the Raccoon River, and set down at Municipal Airport shortly after 4 p.m. Item two, out of force of habit, $50 deposit on a rental car. I headed north on Fleur Drive, that's Route 123, and a few minutes later walked into Tom Bartley's office on Mulberry Street in town. I beg your pardon. Yes, Mr. Case. What? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, well, may I help you, sir? Well, I don't know. My name is Johnny Dollar, and is something wrong, miss? No, 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 I'm sorry. And Mr. Bartley is expecting you, Mr. Dollar, but he isn't here now. Oh? He's gone to Indianola. Where's that? Eighteen miles south of here, and he wants you to meet him there, Mr. Dollar, just as quickly as possible. Okay, but where down there? He says you'll know when you get there, and that you'll have no trouble finding him. Well, I've never met him, you know. Just the same, he says you'll know when you get there. Funny. And to, uh, please see him right away, immediately. Okay, whatever you say. Indianola's a little town, about 7,000. And that secretary was right. I had no trouble at all finding Tom Bartley, much less his reason for being there. A thick pall of smoke hung over the place. It came from the smoldering remains of a big building just a block off Highway 69 near the edge of the South River. A sign at one edge of the property said the building had belonged to Case Paper Products Company. I pulled up next to a group of firemen who were busy with a hose killing the last of the hot spots. Bartley. Tom, I'm glad to know you. Well, there you are. There it is, number three, what's left of it. And this one will cost us 50, 60,000 more at least. You think this and the others you called about have been arson, hmm? So does Albert Case. He and his brother Ed own the business. Main plant in Des Moines and a lot of warehouses scattered around. Why scattered around, Tom, instead of close to the main plant? No room up there. Also, it saves money because of cheaper property in these small towns. Where are the others? Well, those that are left are in Knoxville, Osceola, Colfax, and Grinnell. But who knows for how long? On the phone, you said explosions and fires. That's the way they've all started, with an explosion. Yeah. That would indicate arson, all right. Also a pattern by one man. Right. But paper burns so hard and fast and hot, there's never any concrete evidence after a fire's over. How about these case brothers, Tom? Now, look, there's no point in hanging around this mess. It's all over and done with, but our insurance payoff. So why don't you pile into your car and follow me home, Johnny? We can talk about it there over a stiff drink that I can well use. Okay, if you like. Besides, it's getting late, and I promised Millie I'd bring you home for dinner. Lead the way. Thanks. We like it. Oh, hi, darling. Have a busy day at the... What? Ed! Huh? Well, yes, I guess Johnny does look like Ed Case at that. 
Well, J- Johnny. Uh, Mildred, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh. Well, hi, Johnny. And, um, welcome. Uh, hi, Millie. And now you two can go in there and relax, and I'll bring you a drink. Uh, scotch and soda, all right, Johnny? It's what Tom always drinks. Oh, that'll suit me fine. Uh, uh, sit down, Johnny. Make yourself comfortable. Thanks, Tom. Mighty attractive little wife you have there. Millie used to be a singer and dancer in a sister act. Oh? Now, uh, about the case, brothers, Tom. Well, Albert actually runs the business. Ed just shares the profits. Kind of a black sheep of the family, I've heard. I see. Here we are, boys. One for you, Johnny. One for you, darling. And one for me. Well, thank you, ma'am. Well, to the gods and goddesses and us. <laughs> a drink to that. <laughs> Oh, Tom, darling, yeah. uh, before I forget, Albert Case promised to drop in. Oh, good, good. I want Johnny to meet him. As a matter of fact, he ought to be here right now. He only lives a few blocks away. Uh, he's been up in the town of Madrid, Johnny, cleaning up after a previous fire so he can sell the property. You mean he's planning to just just pocket the insurance money? I guess so. Incidentally, he himself discovered that fire. He did, not hmm? Tom, tell me... Um... How has business been with the Case brothers lately? Well, not so good, I guess, but then that's true of a lot... Now, now, wait a minute, Johnny. Possibility, isn't it? But Albert Case burned down his own... Oh, now, listen, you don't know him. I know, but maybe you don't either, Tom. At least as well as you think you do. Oh, no, Johnny, you're wrong in what you're thinking. Well, I've known Al Case for years. I've known him well. Mm Mm-hmm. What about his brother, Ed, the black sheep? Well, now, Ed, of course, is a different... Oh, excuse me a minute. Hello? Tom, this is Albert Case. It's Al, Johnny. Come listen. Right. Tom. Yes, Al? I told you. I told you those fires were set. All of them. I know you did. Well, I have proof. You have, huh? Then we'll be right over. No. What? No, no, you mustn't come here. Uh, And I mustn't stay here. What? What do you mean? Because I... Because I... Hello? Hello? Al! I don't get it. You know where he lives, Tom? Well, sure, but why did he hang Come up? Come on, a... let's go. As we pulled up at his house, we could see Albert Case through a picture window, sitting at a desk, telephone in hand. Hey, Al, we're here. Darling, can't you see he's on the phone I know, but he acts as though he doesn't even hear us. Wait, Tom. What's the matter, Johnny? Stand back. Hmm? Oh, what's that? Stand back. Here we go now. Johnny. What is it? What's the matter? Don't you see from out there? Now do you see? Oh, no, what's wrong with... Oh, no. Well, Johnny... Right through the forehead, Tom. Looks like it was done by a thirty-eight. You know, sometimes late at night when business gets slack here in a diner and I'm listening to the radio, I think to myself... Heine, suppose that Newport dame should walk in right now, sit down at the counter and say, Heine, from now on I want you to smoke Newport filter cigarettes. You know they have the soothing coolness of menthol, a hint of mint and wonderful rich tobacco. It's that exclusive pleasant smoking combination that makes Newport more refreshing to begin with, more refreshing all the way. Will you do this for me, Heine? <laughs> Lady, I'd say, take the place. The whole joint, the steam table, the coffee maker, it's all yours. I'm a Newport smoker forever. Tom took the telephone out of the dead man's hand and called the police. Millie turned pale and slumped into a chair, and I gave the place a quick rundown, checked the doors and windows. A 
few minutes later, a young policeman arrived. Now, were you all here when it happened, Mr. Bartley and Mrs. Bartley? And uh, yeah, who are you? Uh, he's working for me, officer. He's Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Uh, you insurance guys work pretty fast, don't you? Maybe too fast. Are uh, you related to Mr. Case? Well, are you? No. Why? Uh, you look a little like him. All right, now, who busted in the front door? I did, officer, when I saw through the window that something was very obviously wrong with Mr. Case. Oh, just took things in your own hands and busted in, huh? That's right. All right, let's see what I can find out here. Uh, sure, here it is. A bullet hole through this window. You know what that means? It means somebody plugged them from outside there. You're sure? Yeah, yeah, sure, I'm sure. So go on, you three, huh? Now, where'd your wife go, Bartley? Well, out to the car. Yeah, well, who told her she could leave? Who told her she had to sit here looking at a corpse? He wasn't shot by somebody standing outside, Johnny? Well, how do you know? I saw that bullet hole in the window, too. Yeah? But there were no particles of glass on the inside of the sill. But there were on the outside? That's right. So the shot was fired inside by somebody that Albert Case let in or who had normal access to the house. Remember when Albert's phoning to you was cut off? Yes. Because somebody was there and had to stop him from talking about his proof of arson or from naming the arsonist. Hmm. Was Albert married? Uh, no. Well... Yeah. So his death means that his brother Ed would own the business now. Hmm? Yes, I guess so. Where does he live? It's in the town of Brennell, the other side of Colfax. Both those towns have warehouses in them, right? Yes, that's right. Now, now, wait a minute. I'll pick John. up my rental car at your house and take off. For where? Grinnell, by way of Colfax. <laughs> Question some of the people standing around another big warehouse fire. Yes, the Case Paper Products Warehouse. But in walking toward it in the semi darkness, I stumbled over a little old man quietly sobbing to himself. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to walk all over you like that. Oh, what difference will it make? I knew it would happen. I knew this was going to happen. You mean this fire? Yes, and I told Mr. Albert it was going to happen, too. Wait a minute. You mean Mr. Albert Case? Yes, I've been his night watchman for years, I have. And I told him it would happen, I did. Ever since that car started coming around here every night, prowling around, I know it wasn't up to any good, and I told him so. I told Mr. Albert about it. What kind of a car was it? A big, white, fine car. A Parati with no top onto it. Yes? And when I told him about that car this afternoon, you know what Mr. Albert said? What? He said he knew then. He knew who it was that's been trying to burn him out. He said he knew him. Did he tell you who he meant? Only that now he was sure. And he'd give me this, this gun, this pistol to carry in case it'd come around again. A white parati convertible, hmm? uh, Yes, sir. And I think I know the man he means, too, that drives one. And if he does come around here, Mr... Hey, let me help you, Arthur. Yeah. I, I... You! What? It's you! Well, you're, you're the one. Now, listen, please. Uh, after what you've done, I'm going to kill you. Now, wait a minute. Put down that I'm gun. I'm going to kill you. Thank goodness it was a bad shot. There was no point hanging around to explain things to the fireman. I grabbed his gun and took off. He thought that I was someone else. Millie Bartley had, too. Matter of fact, even I had noticed a sort of family-type resemblance between myself and the dead man, Albert Case. All right. I'd hoped to make the rest of the trip in something under legal time, but after having the fuel pump of my car conk out on me, then spending literally hours at an all-night service station getting a new one, incidentally, that's item three, 1580, the sun was up by the time I got to Grinnell. At police headquarters there, I barged into the office of Lieutenant Cal Golden without waiting to be announced. Ah, you're an early bird. Sit down for a minute while I finish up this report, Mr. Case. What? Oh, sure. Tried all night to phone you, Mr. Case, but got no answer. You did, hmm? That's very interesting. I'm afraid I have bad news for you about your brother, Albert. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Seems that last night somebody... Wait a minute. Yeah? 
Well, I'll be... You look like Ed Case. Don't worry, Lieutenant. You're not the first one to make that mistake. But who are you, then? My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. By golly, you look enough like Ed Case to be his twin brother. And you sound like it. Tell me, you haven't been able to contact him yet? No, sir. Then let me throw one at you, Lieutenant. Yeah? I have good reason to believe Ed Case is not only the firebug we're after. What? But the man who killed his brother. <laughs> It took a little convincing, but the lieutenant finally agreed to put out an APB on Ed Case. And he gave me Ed's address. 1217 LaCroix Place. There was no answer to the doorbell there, so I went to the house next door. Yes? Oh, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Oh, it's you, Ed Case. I beg your pardon. No, wait. You're not Ed Case. You're somebody else. That's right, ma'am. My name is Dollar. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have known because of your car. That's right. He drives a white one, doesn't he? Yes, just one of them fancy foreign things with the top down all the time. Mm -hmm. Like the one that he gave to that blonde hussy that comes around to see him all the time. A blonde, ma'am? Comes up from Des Moines all the time. In and out of that house of his like she belonged there. It's disgusting. From Des Moines, did you say? If there's anything I don't like, it's a little blonde with green eyes and one of those olive type of complexions they don't deserve Thank to you, have. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. That description of Ed's girlfriend. It was Millie Bartley, Tom's wife. Petite, olive complexion, green eyes, and she lived in Des Moines. And I remembered her momentary surprise when she first saw me. Item four, 90 cents for a phone call. Why, no, Johnny. I don't know where Millie is. I heard her talking on the phone to her friend Bernice. They used to be in a sister act, you know. Well, then, Tom... But then she ducked out of the house and left in the car. I see. Okay, Tom, thanks. But how are you doing? Anything new that I ought to know about this arson murder thing? No, Tom. Nothing you need to worry about. Not yet. I drove back to LaCroix Place, parked a block away, and walked to 1217. There was no answer again, so I went around to the back door, slipped the lock with a business card, and walked in, leaving it open for a possible quick exit. That was a mistake, because a couple of minutes later, as I rounded a corner to the living room, I felt the barrel of a gun in my back. Oh, so you're out of town, huh? Well, now I know different. Now, wait a minute. Don't move, Eddie boy. Trying to stall on that five grand you owe me won't work. You think I met Case? What do you mean, think? Now, listen, I... You know what happens when you try and stall me, Eddie. This hot. <laughs> have really done a job on me because when I came to it, it was dark. And I felt a little bit rocky, to say the least. What roused me was the sound of steps, a woman's steps quietly coming in the back door. There were no lights, remember. Then briefly silhouetted against a window, I saw the all too familiar trim, petite figure coming toward me. Annie? Oh, no, you're hurt. Oh, honey, you're hurt. What happened? Oh, you don't know, Ma. Oh, yeah, with Louie getting even because you didn't pay him soon enough for that last fire. Oh, here, Eddie, let me turn on the lights and help no, you. No, 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 just let me let me rest a minute. Oh, I knew that was him I passed on the highway. Why did you come over here from Des Moines? To make sure you'd play dumb when the cops told you about poor dear old Albert getting knocked off. Why did you come here to the house? Uh, because I hoped that you'd come here, I guess. Well, you should have waited until I could get up the money to pay Louie. You mean for killing Albert, too? Yeah. Huh? I mean, no. You killed Albert. I saw you from the outside in the car. Oh, you'd swear to that, wouldn't you? Eddie, what a thing to say. You sound like you don't trust me. Look, we're in this thing together. And whose idea was it to knock off Albert? Well, like I told you, you had to because he was getting wise to you about the fires. You had it figured out that way right from the beginning, didn't you? Baby, now look. First, burn up the warehouses, collect the insurance on them. Well, sure. Then get Al out of the way so you and I would have it all. Well, yeah, that's right. Eddie, what, what are you talking this way for? I don't understand you. I wish to heaven I didn't understand you, Millie. Millie? Come on, let's turn on the lights in here. Eddie? Eddie, you... You're not Eddie. Who are you? Don't try to kid me, Millie. Wait a minute. Who are you? Oh, you're the dick. 
That insurance investigator Millie told me about Johnny Dollar. Let me out of here. Sorry, Let go of me. You're going to stay right here. Millie Barkley's sister Bernice. Oh, well, sister. well. Sister. Yes. On account of we looked like we did a sister act once before she married that Bartley guy. Will you let me go? Not a chance, Bernice. Let me go. I think maybe you better, Dollar. What? Eddie. Uh, me, Eddie. Don't move, Dollar. Get his gun, Bernice. Take his gun away. Yes, yeah, sure, Eddie. Here. Here, here it is. Ed Case, hmm? That's right. I guess maybe we do look like each other, don't we? It fooled Bernice, Eddie. Before I put the lights on, she told me everything. Eddie, Eddie, don't believe him. It's a lie. No, it isn't, baby. I heard. But listen, I thought he was you. Don't you understand? I thought he was you. Why don't you drive on over here anyway? Because Millie told me Dollar was coming here. You been here. shooting up your mouth to Millie, too? I could tell she was getting wise about the fire. You told her. No, Eddie, honest. But she was my friend. She thought maybe she could help me out of this mess. Yeah, you're too late, Bernice. Eddie, what, what are you going to do? I'm going to get rid of the both of you. No. And figure out some way to shut up Louie. But you two are first. Eddie. You'll never get away with this, Eddie. <laughs> no, even when I use this gun of yours to knock you off. Eddie, please, you're drunk or you're crazy or something. Well, crazy to save my own life to keep you and Louie and Dollar here from putting a noose around my neck. It's there already, Eddie, and you know it. <laughs> Shut up. It won't be after I kill you. Eddie, please, That's please. That's going to be right now. Wait a minute. Who's that? The cops. It must be the cops. Oh, yeah? Well, if it is, you wait here. You wait. Ah, <laughs> oh, no, you don't. <laughs> You shouldn't have turned toward that door. <laughs> Out of my way. Ah! Oh, Eddie, you hit me. Now you, Dollar. Wrong, Eddie. You may have killed her, but you're not going to... Johnny, what is it? What's happening? No, no, Millie. Don't go in there. Bernice? Yes. Eddie killed her. I'm sorry. She was my friend. I'm sorry, Millie. Where's Tom? I, uh, I came alone, Johnny. Why? When I talked to Bernice on the phone, I, I knew I could tell that your suspicion of Eddie was right, and I hoped that somehow I could help her. Maybe you better call Tom and tell him where you are and what's happened. As for the insurance and the estate, Iowa law will have to take care of that. Expense account total, including the trip home, two fifty six ten. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. tell you about next week's story. Next week, a story with a twist that will surprise you as much as it did me. Tune in, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If you drive a car, remember this. Almost anywhere in the country where you see the Sinclair sign, you can save up to four cents a gallon on gasoline by using Sinclair Dino. That's because in three out of five cars... Regular price Sinclair Dino matches the performance of expensive premium gasolines, costing up to four cents more a gallon. Drive with care and buy Sinclair Dino gasoline. Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were John Seymour, Abby Lewis, Terry Keene, Edgar Staley, Jack Grimes, Jim Stevens, and Gilbert Mack. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical direction by Fred Cusick. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Stuart Met speaking. Hear the Dean of Newscasters, Lowell Thomas, weeknights on the CBS Radio Network. CBS for Durham, WDNC. It's 634. When the headache strikes, headache tension builds up. 
You feel terrible. You become irritable. When this happens, here's what you should do. Take Standback powders or tablets. The secret of Standback's effectiveness is its combination formula of several medically proven pain-relieving ingredients in one easy-to-take dose. A combination of ingredients that brings you comforting relief from pain. What's more, Standback's gentle and effective action relieves tension which usually accompanies pain. Standback has earned both the Good Housekeeping and Parents Magazine seals. You can take Standback with complete confidence. For pains of headache, neuralgia, muscular aches, and cold discomforts, test Standback against any other preparation you've ever used. See for yourself how fast, yet how gently, Standback gives comforting relief. Just trade your headache for a smile. Snap back with Standback, tablets, or powders. Johnny Dollar. Morris Barkley, Johnny. New Jersey State Mutual. Well, it's about time. Morris, how are you? Bad. I've got troubles, Johnny. $40,000 worth. Don't give it another thought. Just mail me a check. Yeah, I wish it were that easy. Also, I wish it was a check. What do you mean? I mean, it's all in cash. Oh, okay. Then I'll fly on down there and pick it up. Yeah, I wish you could. But there's a hitch. His name is Walter P. Doniger. Who's he? Policy beneficiary. We can't find him. Well, maybe I'll get lucky and not be able to find him either. Then with 40 G's in my hot little hand. Yeah, I'll be breathing right down your hot little neck. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Now, uh, Mari, the commission on 40000 for me if I find this man. You want to come down and talk about it? Why, sure. <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Jersey State Mutual Life Insurance Company Home Office, Trenton, New Jersey. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of... The Donninger Donninger matter. <music> Expense account item one, twenty six ninety for a cab to Bradley Field Airport, a plane to Trenton, then a taxi into Morris Parkley's office. It was lunchtime, so Mari dragged me over to lunch at Hildebrecht's. Look, are you just going to sit here and stop yourself, or can I tell you about this case? Mari, so help me. Nobody, but nobody knows how to fix soft-shell crabs like a South Jerseyite. So I'm going to make the most of it. Going to? You have. <laughs> now listen. Mm -hmm. His name is Walter P. Doniger the Seventh. The what? The whole family was a bunch of screwballs, bums, except for Walter P. the First, mm -hmm. who cleaned up on gunpowder and cannonballs about the time Georgie Washington rode across the Delaware. <laughs> Well, that's that, and it was delicious. But his descendants haven't done a lick of work since. And that makes them screwballs, huh, Maury? Sure. But nothing to do but loaf their lives away. Bums. Crack uh, would there be anything more, gentlemen? Well, I... Uh, uh, no, uh... thanks, Waiter. We've got to get out of here. Just All right. a check. Yes, sir. Here you are. Anyhow, Johnny, this Walter P. the Seventh is the last of the line. Now that his sister Minnie has died, here you are, Waiter. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. She left him this 40000 insurance you mentioned. Right. So you've got to find him, Johnny, and pay it to him. But in cash? That's what the policy reads. In cash, in hand. Just like that $5 tip you just gave the waiter. Hmm? Right, Johnny, that's it. What? $5? Hey, wait oh, a minute. Come on, I come on, or you can tack it out of my expense yeah, account. $5. Come hey. on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyhow, that money has to be paid within 10 days of her death, Johnny. So that gives you just less than a week from now. Well, Maury, that... Uh... Otherwise, we pay him an additional thousand for every additional week or fraction thereof. You issued a policy like that? No, I personally. And you call him a screwball. The point is that he's disappeared. Yeah. You think he might be dodging you, Maury, just to build up his take? Possibility. I wouldn't put it beyond him. Mm. What's the address given on the policy? Addresses, Johnny. Eight of them. Eight. Every time he'd move, his dying sister would give us a new one. So we list it. Well, all right, then. If she only died recently, then his no, last no, address no, would... No, no, no. He isn't there. And he left no word about where he'd go next. Hey, hey, hey you better watch it. Yeah. All right, lights change. Come on. Well, uh, 
Tell me, Mari, is there any pattern to the way that he's moved around? A pattern? Hmm. I hadn't thought of that. Well, you should have. It may give us an answer. Yeah. Well, here's the office. We'll take a look. Right. Here we are. Now, he started here in Trenton. Mm-hmm. And he lived down in Atlantic City for a while. And Bloomfield, Cranford, Dumont, East Rutherford, Franklin, Gibstown, and Highbridge. In other words, all over the state. You know, that makes any kind of a pattern, Johnny. Well, it sure does, Marty. It does? Sure. Don't you see? Atlantic City, Bloomfield, Cranford, and so on, ending up with Highbridge right through the alphabet, Marty, from A to H. Hey, you're right. So it's easy. Whatever he's gone now begins with the letter I. If he sticks to the pattern. Yeah. But why all the wandering around? Is he running away from something, or is it just a matter of building up the insurance he'll get? I don't know. Anyhow, now, you have the answer. Find a town beginning with the letter I, if there is one, and you've got him. Yeah, thanks a lot. But which town beginning with an I, if there's more than one? Oh, yeah. I didn't think of that. You got an atlas, Morgan? Hmm? Yeah. yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, right in front of my nose. Help yourself. All right, now let's see. Okay, here we are. Hmm. Oh, great. Now, what's the matter? Listen. Imlay's Town, Indian Mills, Interlaken, Iona, Iceland, plus about a half dozen more from one end of the state to the other. Yeah, yeah, no good. Well, it's all right with me if you want to pay me plenty of travel money to prowl around after oh, him. Oh, fine. That's fine. And he'd be in the very last town that you would hit. <laughs> it's a possibility. Well, I guess the only thing we can do is write the city hall in every place beginning with an I and hope he'll cooperate. Meantime, time is running out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe there's a better pattern for us. Well, sure. Like you say, the alphabetical one. It'll either cost that extra thousand a week or you'll run up too big an expense account. No, wait a minute. Look, don't you see? There's more to the pattern. Like what? And how much will it cost? Stop looking smug. Murray, I'll make you a proposition. Oh, you will? Mm -hmm. Let me try just one of these towns. This one here. Interlocker? Mm -hmm. Why pick that one? If I don't find Mr. Walter P. Doniger, the seventh there, you won't owe me a cent. But if I do... Then what? Then you tack an extra thousand onto my commission. Okay? What? Even above your expense account and all of... Okay. It's a deal. And now, Johnny... Good. Now, now, look. Do you mind telling me what this magical key is that you found? The pattern of his wanderings? Not at all. Look, Mari, it's right here in front of your nose. Right here in the atlas. This ever happened to you? You're driving down a long highway or working late, and then monotony makes you feel drowsy. Perk up with No Dose. No Dose keeps you alert with the same safe refresher found in coffee. Yet No Dose is faster, handier, more reliable, absolutely not habit forming. The safe way to stay alert without harmful stimulants. No Dose. No, Johnny. All I can see is the old hunter is going through the alphabet and his wanderings. That leaves you with 11 towns beginning with the letter I to investigate. All right, look here at the population figures. The population? Mm-hmm. Huh? Now, first was Atlantic City with something over 60,000. Uh-huh. That's not including the annual summer vacation mob that always descends on the place. So? Then came Bloomfield, 49,000. Uh-huh. Less than Atlantic City. In mm-hmm. spite of the fact that a couple of other towns beginning with B have more. Well? Then here we have Cranford, 17,500. Less again. Don't you see now, Maury? Oh, sure. Sure, Johnny. <laughs> You're right. Great. Sure, each time he's moved up one notch in the alphabet, he has moved down one notch in population. <clears throat> what a caper. And see here, after Cranford, he was in Dumont. Sure, sure thing. 
After two months, he, he could have gone to Elizabeth or East Orange or East Patterson. Yes, but they have more people than Dumont, so he picked East Rutherford with a population just under Dumont. Right. And so on, all the way to the letter H for Highbridge. It's the last address you have on him. Mm. And if you carry on just one more step, here, yeah. it has to be interlocking. He's got to be an interlocking if he's stuck to this crazy pattern. Well, I'll be done. Now, you think... Uh... You think I'm still wrong about calling him a screwball? Well, unless he's running away from something, Maury. The law, maybe? Walter P. the Seventh? Never. Well, then I'd say he's kind of cute. Cute? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, he knows that every week you fail to pick up his trail, he puts you on the spot for another grand. I think he's bats. Maybe. But at least he's got a sense of humor. Pretty expensive one for us. Just the sort of thing you'd expect of him. Well, Maury, if the pattern holds... And it's his own gag, so he's got to play fair with it. Yeah. I will find him smugly sitting around in the town of Interlaken. Okay. Sounds fine. Great. But what if the Sherlock Holmes deduction of yours turns out to be all wrong? <laughs> There's only one way to find out, Murray, isn't there? Yeah. Good luck. You'll need it. Expense account item two, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I headed east then on 33, a main highway through Heightstown, Freehold, and Ocean Grove, and then north in a roundabout way to Interlaken, a small but very nice resort town that isn't much heard of because it's so completely overshadowed by nearby Asbury Park. In uh, trying to find a city hall, I ended up at the old New York and Long Branch Railroad Station. I pulled to a stop beside a group of men loading stuff onto a freight car. The most intelligent looking of the lot was the character of, oh, maybe 35 and badly in need of a shave. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Uh, say that again, buddy. I asked for directions to City Hall, that's all. Uh, I thought I'd recognize that voice of yours. Uh, your name is Johnny Dollar, ain't it? That's right. Makes any difference. Ah, uh, how about that? Johnny Dollar, the big insurance investigator, huh? No well, I'm pleased to meet you, Johnny. Thank you. Now, uh, what's a big shot like you doing around a place like this, huh? Well, does that make any difference? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, you want to know what I think? I'm betting you tailed somebody here, huh? <laughs> Am I right? Well, possibly. But look, where sure is... Sure, I'm right. Well, look, Johnny, uh, you want to know anything about this burg, you ask me. You're Bill McGrogan. I know all about it, see? Okay. I know everybody ever comes into this town. Yes, sir, you need help? You couldn't have come to a writer party. Good. And me? Well, I'll be glad to give a guy like you a hand, see? And, uh, <clears throat> Johnny, uh, know something else? Now, look, uh, McGrogan. Oh, just call me Bill, Johnny. Your name is Bill. Uh, you know something else? I uh, understand you pay out pretty good for information. Like, I mean, uh, you can lay it out on that uh, expense account of yours, huh? Yeah. Am I right, Johnny? Well, now, that depends. Ah, uh, look, why don't you try me, huh? Anything you want to know about interlocking or anybody in it, even just the summer people, you know, to come here for the summer, all you got to do is ask me. So what do you want to know, huh? And what's it worth, huh? Well, come on, come on, Johnny. You want my help, don't you? <coughs> Who are you looking for, huh? Well, why don't you come here, Hey, you don't say much, do you? <laughs> All right, Bill. Yeah, yeah? I am looking for someone. A man. Ah, now what's it worth if I lead you right to him, Johnny? Fifty? Maybe you see no, huh? Hey, Ma. Because if you don't think I can lead you to him, well, you just try me, see? Yeah, 25, maybe. Now look, you better come down a little bit, Bill. Let's see, uh... How about a ten spot? Okay, thanks. What? Now, uh, who do you want to meet, huh? Who's the guy you're looking for? The name is Walla Doniger. Hey, you see, I told you to come to the right... Uh-huh. What's the matter? Who, uh, who'd you say, Johnny? I said a man by the name Walt of... Walt Doniger? That's right. Well, you know where I can find him, or don't you? Well, oh, come on, Bill, what's the matter? Doniger, huh? <laughs> that crazy Walt Doniger. And you want to give me only ten bucks, huh? All right, I'll make it twenty. If you really know where he is. Yeah, yeah, sure, I do, sure. But a guy that's loaded the way that he is, uh, you know that, don't you? And it sounds like Walla Donegan. Okay, Johnny, okay. Fifty bucks and I fix it up. What do you mean you fix it up? I'll deliver, I'll deliver. All right, guys. So uh, where are you going to be staying? Well, matter of fact, I don't know. I uh, yeah. I hadn't really planned Well, a to... Larchmont. So you go to Larchmont. It's that uh, nice, fancy place about uh, three blocks over that way. Yeah, well, look, well, look uh, over there. Turn your head, huh? You can see the top of it with the flag on it. See over there? <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, I see. Ah, that's good. Now, you get yourself a room, see? And, Johnny, I guarantee I'll get the word to Donaga, and he'll be there and see you by sometime tonight. Okay? Now, look, Bill, wouldn't it be a lot easier just to tell me where I can find him? With the way that he moves around? Oh, sir. That's the deal. Fifty bucks, Johnny. All right. Here's 15 more. And the other half you get after I see Donegan. Oh, yeah. Well, now, listen, Johnny. That's, that's my deal. Just be sure you get him there to my room at the Larchmont. What if he shouldn't come through and bring me Donegan? Well, after all, it would go on the expense account. As soon as I'd registered at the Larchmont, I went to police headquarters and talked with a Sergeant Holloway. And you know something? Maybe it was lucky that I had run into Bill McGrogan. Maybe. Well, uh, sure, sure, Dollar. I'll try to find that crazy old man for you. Uh, be at the Larchmont, you say, huh? That's right. But the way he gets around, you know, uh... Well, in a couple of weeks, ever since he got the word of his sister passing away, he's lived in a half a dozen different Roman houses. Sometimes only two or three days in one place at a time. Mm. Well, he is playing a cozy little game with the company. Uh, what's that? Oh, nothing. I certainly hope you can find him for me. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Maybe in a couple of days. Maybe in a half an hour. <laughs> but I'll find him all right. I mean, uh, sometime. Sometime, huh? Well, I'll be waiting. I had cocktails and dinner at item three, four seventy. Then I spent item four, half a dollar on a phone call to Maury Parkley to let him know where I was. What if that policeman doesn't find them for you, Johnny? Or that railroad bum you talked to? And with time running out for us... Then I'll just have to prowl around myself and see what I can learn about Doniger. Oh, of course, the post office. Huh? Well, if he moves from place to place, Maury, the way the sergeant says he does, he may have himself a post office box. And you'll sit by him until he shows? That's right. But what if he's left the lock? Well, then I'll dig me up an atlas and figure out his next destination. Maury, don't worry about it. We've proved the atlas theory works, and now it's just a matter of time before... Well... What? Looks like it's going to be a matter of no time at all. Well, Johnny... Maury, I'll be in touch. Coming, coming. Yes? Inside, buddy, and shut up. Wait, what... Well, I know they'd get you on me, Dollar, but I didn't think you'd show up this soon. Well, now, look. Don't move. The gun works. Ooh. Complete with silencer, no? That's right. So I'm not as crazy as some people think. And you're Walter Doninger? That's right. Scrappy Doninger. I'll move over there, Dollar, next to the bed. So when you fall, it won't make any noise. What do you mean, fall, Doninger? I've taken no chances with you. So from here on, Dollar... You're going to be dead. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Smoke Kent, the micronite filter cigarette. Yes, people who want to get away from harsh, rough-tasting cigarettes know that the one to switch to is Kent. And there's a very good reason why. Kent, with the Micronite filter, refines away harsh flavor. Refines away rough taste for the mildest taste of all. Yes, that's your reward for smoking Kent, the cigarette that made the filter famous. So when you want to get away from harsh, rough-tasting cigarettes, remember, the finer the filter, the milder the taste. And you'll decide to treat your taste kindly with Kent. Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Smoke Kent, the Micronite filter cigarette. Wait a minute, Donegan. You haven't even got time to say a prayer, Dollar. You said you knew I'd be after you? Why not? Pull a heist up there in Hartford? Stuff's going to be insured, isn't it? A heist? So who else would they get to look for me? 
Only how you ever find out that I'd come down here to this little jerkwater summer resort. And I only been here for a day, too. And only you pulled a boo boo coming here, Dollar. It looks like I've pulled a couple. Yeah, wise man. You sure picked the wrong guy to buy information from. You think that Bill McGrogan was on your side? When for a hundred bucks he let me set you up this way? I see. You do, huh? Well, you're not going to be seeing for long a hearing either. Get over there next to the bed where you'll drop real easy when I pull this trigger. Huh? Who's that? Who is it? Who is it? The split second when he turned to the door was all I needed. I charged across the room swinging and caught him with a hard right to the face. And I chopped across the back of his neck with the of my hand and I got him with everything I had. The last in a heap. And he lay very still. All right, now, Mr. Scrappy Donahue, we'll take this gun of yours. And... Yes, who is it? Who's there? Walter B. Donahue, the seventh, Mr. Dollar. Oh, now, wait a minute. Yes? Here I am. The police and you and the insurance company have finally found me. So, Mr. Do... Oh, my goodness. Who's he? What happened to him? Your name is Walter P. Donninger the Seventh. Why, yes, of course it is. Would you like to see some identification, Mr. Dollar? Here. Yeah, I have plenty of it. But I certainly didn't think even a clever man like you could trade me here to interlock so quickly. It's amazing, Mr. Dollar. Simply amazing. Sit down, Mr. Donninger. You see, I had hoped I could delay you a bit, therefore increase the insurance payment. But I was fair in my little game now, wasn't I? Just sit down there, Mr. Donegan. Well, surely, Mr. Dollar, anything you like. Uh, but this man here on the floor. Yes, this man. Just just wait. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Morris. Now listen. Now listen very carefully. I, I told him I have you already tied up on a case. Maury. A tri-state insurance up there in Hartford, I mean. But you'd never guess why they called, Johnny. Oh, wouldn't I? Why they want you. And right away, you'd never guess if you live to be a thousand. Don't be too sure, Maury. There's been a big burglary job up there, Johnny. And now listen. I'm listening. Talk about coincidence. The man I... I mean the crook thereafter has the same name as this client of ours. Walter, Walter P. Donegan. Donegan. Yeah, yeah. Only the P stands for something else. They call him Scrappy Donegan. And he has a record from here to there. Murray. There's a $10,000 reward on him, too. So as soon as you find our ah, Mr. Donnick... Murray, would you listen to me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have him, Murray, right here. Oh, yeah. Oh? Oh, uh, oh, well, good. Uh, fine. Good for you, Johnny. Uh, I knew you'd find him and save us that extra money. Good man. Now, would you like to do me a favor and save me a phone charge? Well, sure. All right. Call Tri-State back. Tell them the job is done. Their job, and they can I... mail me the check for that reward. What? That's a fact, Maury. I'm up to here in Donegar's. <laughs> so for once, I got real lucky. And now you can see why I've called this report the Donegar Donegar matter. Expense account total, including the trip home with Scrappy Doniger in tow, one fifty-five seventy plus commission, of course, plus the extra thousand on Walter the seventh. Oh, uh, and I couldn't find Bill McGrogan again, so he'll never get that other twenty-five bucks. Maybe just a jail term someday for the kind of company that he keeps. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Jack Arthur, Jack Grimes, Ian Martin, Santos Ortega, Melville Ruick, and Neil Fitzgerald. Music supervision by Eugene Sines. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical supervision by Mike Shoskis. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hannah speaking. <laughs>